Chapter 5 The Fenadiri and His Friends The last chapter is hardly such as to call for a recapitulation of its principal contents, and I venture to submit instead of any such repetition an abstract of some very pertinent notes on it by Miss M. G. W. Peacock who compares with the folklore of the Isle of Man the old beliefs which survive in Lincolnshire among the descendants of Norse ancestors 143. She was attracted by the striking affinity which she noticed between them, and she is doubtless right in regarding that affinity as due in no small degree to the Scandinavian element present in the population alike of Man and the East of England. She is, however, not lavish of theory, but gives us interesting items of information from an intimate acquaintance with the folklore of the district of which she undertakes to speak. Somewhat in the following order. 1. Whether the water bowl still inhabits the streams of Lincolnshire she regards as doubtful, but the deep pools formed, she says. By the action of the downflowing water at the bends of the country becks are still known as bull holes. 2. As to the Glashton, or water horse, she remarks that the Tatterfoal, Tattercolt, or Shagfoal, as he is variously called, is still to be heard of. Although his visits take place less often than before the fens and cars were drained and the open fields and commons enclosed. She describes the Tatterfoal as a goblin of the shape and appearance of a small horse or yearling foal in his rough, unkempt coat. He beguiles lonely travelers with his numberless tricks, one of which is to lure them to a stream, swamp, or waterhole. When he has succeeded he vanishes with a long outburst of mockery, half nay, half human laughter. 3. The Fenadiri, one is told, has in Lincolnshire a cousin, but he is diminutive, and, like the Yorkshire Hob or Robin Round Cap, and the Danish Nis, he is used to befriend the house in which he dwells. The story of his driving the farmer's sheep home is the same practically as in the Isle of Man, even to the point of bringing in with them the little grey sheep. As he called the fine hare that had given him more trouble than all the rest of the flock, CPP. 286 to 7 above. 4. The story of this mannequin's clothing differs considerably from that of the Fenadiri. The farmer gives him in gratitude for his services a linen shirt every New Year's Eve. And this went on for years, until at last the farmer thought a hemp shirt was good enough to give him. When the clock struck twelve at midnight the mannequin raised an angry wail, saying. Harden, harden, harden hemp I. I will neither grind nor stamp. Had you given me linen gear. I would have served you many a year I. He was no more seen or heard, he vanished forever. The Cornish counterpart of this brownie, twelve, reasons in the opposite way. For when, in gratitude for his help in threshing, a new suit of clothes is given him, he hurries away, crying 144. Pisky new coat, and Pisky new hood. Pisky now will do no more good. Here, also, one should compare William Nicholson's A. Count of the Brownie of Blednock 145, in Galloway, who wore next to no clothing. Rune, his hairy form there was nothing seen. But a philobeg oh, the rush is green. So he was driven away forever by a newly married wife wishing him to wear an old pair of her husband's breeches. But a new-made wife, foo, oh, rippyish freaks. Fond, oh, a, uh, thing's feet for the first five weeks. Laid a moldy pair, oh, her iron man's breeks. By the bros, oh, aching drum. Let the learned decide, when they convene. What spell was him and the breeks between? For fray that day forth he was Neymar seen. And Sare Mist was Akendrum. The only account which I have been able to find of a Welsh counterpart will be found in Bukar Trwin, in Chapter 10, he differs in some important respects from the Fenadiri and the Brownie. 5. A twig of the Rowan tree, or Wiccan, as it is called, was effective against all evil things, including witches. It is useful in many ways to guard the welfare of the household, and to preserve both the livestock and the crops, while placed on the churn it prevents any malign influence from retarding the coming of the butter. I may remark that Celts and Teutons seem to have been generally pretty well agreed as to the virtues of the Rowan tree. Bits of iron also are lucky against witches. 6. Fairies are rare, but witches and wizards abound, 
and some of them have been supposed to change themselves into dogs to worry sheep and cattle, or into toads to poison the swine's troughs. But they do not seem to change themselves into hares, as in man and other Celtic lands. 7. Witchcraft, says Miss Peacock, is often hereditary, passing most frequently from mother to daughter. But when a witch has no daughter her power may appear in a son, and then revert to the female line. This appears far more natural than the Manx belief in its passing from father to daughter and from daughter to son. But another kind of succession is mentioned in the Welsh triads, 1. 32, 2. 20, 3. 90, which speak of Mathab Mathenwi teaching his magic to Gwydion, who as his sister's son was to succeed him in his kingdom. And of a certain Rutland dwarf teaching his magic to Cot, son of Colfrey, his nephew. Both instances seem to point to a state of society which did not reckon paternity but only birth. 8. Only three years previous to Miss Peacock's writing an old man died, she says, who had seen blood drawn from a witch because she had, as was supposed, laid a spell on a team of horses, as soon as she was struck so as to bleed the horses and their load were free to go on their way again. Possibly no equally late instance could be specified in the Isle of Man, see page 20 above. 9. Traces of animal sacrifice may still be found in Lincolnshire, for the heart of a small beast, or of a bird, is necessary, Miss Peacock says, for the efficient performance of several counter-charms. Especially in torturing a witch by the reversal of her spells, and warding off evil from houses or other buildings. Apparently Miss Peacock has not heard of so considerable a victim as a sheep or a calf being sacrificed, as in the Isle of Man, but the objects of the sacrifices may be said to be the same. 10. Several pin and rag wells are said to exist in Lincolnshire, their waters being supposed to possess healing virtues, especially as regards eye ailments. 11. Love spells and prognostications are mentioned, some of them as belonging to All Hallows, as they do partly in the Isle of Man, she mentions the making of dumb cake, and the eating of the salt herring. Followed by dreams of the future husband bringing the thirsting last drink in a jug, the quality of which indicates the bearer's position in life. But other Lincolnshire practices of the kind seem to oscillate between All Hallows and St. Mark's Eve, while gravitating decidedly towards the latter date. Here it is preferable to give Miss Peacock's own words, Professor Rees' mention of the footmark in the ashes reminds me of a love spell current in the Wapentake of Manly in North Lincolnshire. Properly speaking, it should be put in practice on St. Mark's Ian, that eerie springtide festival when those who are skilled may watch the church porch and learn who will die in the ensuing twelvemonth. But there is little doubt that the charm is also used at Hallow Ven, and at other suitable seasons of the year. The spell consists in riddling ashes on the hearthstone, or beams on the floor of the barn, with proper ceremonies and at the proper time. With the result that the girl who works her incantation correctly finds the footprint of the man she is to marry clearly marked on the sifted mass the following morning. It is to be supposed that the spirit of the lover is responsible for the mark, as, according to another folk belief, any girl who watches her supper honesty. Marks Ian will see the spirit of the man she will wed come into the room at midnight to partake of the food provided. The room must be one with the door and windows in different walls, and both must be open. The spirit comes in by the door, and goes out by the window. Each girl who undertakes to keep watch must have a separate supper and a separate candle, and all talking is to end before the clock goes twelve, for there must not be any speaking before the spirits. From these superstitions, and from the generally received idea that the spirits of all the parishioners are to be observed entering the church on St. Mark's Ian, it may be inferred that the Manx footprint is made by the wraith of the person doomed to death. What Miss Peacock alludes to as watching the church porch was formerly well known in Wales 146, and may be illustrated from a district so far east as the Golden Valley, in Herefordshire, by the following story told me in 1892 by Mrs. Powell of Doorstone, on the strength of what she had learned from her mother-in-law, the late Mrs. Powell, who was a native of that parish. On All Hallows' Eve at midnight, those who are bold enough to look through the church windows will see the building lighted with an unearthly light. 
and the pulpit occupied by his satanic majesty clothed in a monk's habit. Dreadful anathemas are the burden of his preaching, and the names of those who in the coming year are to render up their souls may be heard by those who have courage to listen. A notorious evil liver, Jack of France, once by chance passed the church at this awful moment, looking in he saw the lights and heard the voice, and his own name in the horrid list. And, according to some versions of the story, he went home to die of fright. Others say that he repented and died in good repute, and so cheated the evil one of his prey. I have no list of places in Wales and its marches which have this sort of superstition associated with them, but it is my impression that they are mostly referred to All Hallows, as at Doorstone. And that where that is not the case they have been shifted to the beginning of the year as at present reckoned. For in Celtic lands, at least, they seem to have belonged to what was reckoned the beginning of the year. The old Celtic year undoubtedly began at All Hallows, and the day next in importance after the Calends of winter, in Welsh Calangdief, was, among the Celts, the beginning of the summer half of the year, or the Calends of May, in Welsh Caldenmai. Which is T. Mark's Eve approaches too nearly for us to regard it as accidental. With this modified agreement between the Lincolnshire date and the Celtic one contrast the irreconcilable English date of St. John's Eve, and see Tyler's primitive culture, I. 440, where one reads as follows of, the well-known superstition, I that fasting watchers on St. John's Eve may see the apparitions of those doomed to die during the year come with the clergyman to the church door and knock. These apparitions are spirits who come forth from their bodies, for the minister has been noticed to be much troubled in his sleep while his phantom was thus engaged. And when ain of a party of watchers fell into a sound sleep and could not be roused, the others saw his apparition knock at the church door. With an unerring instinct for the intelligent colligation of facts, Miss Peacock finds the nearest approach to the yearly review of the Moritures, if I may briefly so call them, in the wraith's footprint in the ashes. Perhaps a more systematic examination of Manx folklore may result in the discovery of a more exact parallel. For want of knowing where else to put it, I may mention here in reference to the dead, a passage which has been copied for me by my friend Mr. Gwenig Van Evans, from Manuscript T63 in the Peniarth Collection. I understand it to be of the earlier part of the 16th century, and P. Io has the following passage. Yn year when ys han, mana, y care gwelado i w d y d d bobble a vescent barrel. Re guidi tori penef. Ariel guidi tori i haloed. A C O S diathread a disaffint i gwield h w n t. Send a r dri g z v y r or tier a c veli h w n t a. Gent weld year h y n a wellsent wintav. In this island, man, one beholds in the light of day people who have died, some with their heads cut off and others with their limbs cut off. And if strangers desire to see them, they have to stand on the feet of the natives of the land, and in that way they would see what the latter had seen. A similar instance of the virtue of standing on the feet of another person has been mentioned in reference to the farmer of Dunant, at page 230 above. The foot, however, on which he had to stand in order to get a glimpse of the fairy world, was a fairy's own foot. Lastly, the passage in the Peniarth manuscript has something more to say of the Isle of Man. As follows. Mar oed arfer o swinian a shiveridian jint yn year wen ys han. Canis graged vydd went eno yn gwnef for gwn i longwer gwider gav mian tri chwlm o edav afen vi ic gwn arnant dat tod kwlm or edav anant. Great was the practice formerly of spells and sorceries in this island, for there used to be their women making wind for sailors, which wind they confined within three knots made on a thread. And when they had need of wind they would undo a knot of the thread. This was written in the 16th century, and based probably on Higdon's Potty Chronicon, Book I, Chap 44, equals 2. 42-3, but the same practice of wind making goes on to this day, one of the principal practitioners being the woman to whom reference was made at page 299. She is said to tie the breezes in so many knots which she makes on the purchasing sailor's pocket handkerchief. This reminds one of the Sibyl of Werenzi, or the island of Guernsey, who is represented by an ancient Norse poet as, fashioning false prophecies. 
Civic Fussen and Powell's Cortus Poeticum Boreal, I, 136. Also Mela's first century account of the virgins of the island of Sena, which runs to the following effect, Sena, in the Britannic Sea, opposite the coast of the Osismi, is famous for its oracle of a Gaulish god, whose priestesses, living in the holiness of perpetual virginity, are said to be nine in number. They call them Galazanu, and they believe them to be endowed with extraordinary gifts to rouse the sea and the wind by their incantations, to turn themselves into whatsoever animal form they may choose. To cure diseases which among others are incurable, to know what is to come and to foretell it. They are, however, devoted to the service of voyagers only who have set out on no other errand than to consult them. 147 It is probable that the sacrosanct 148 inhabitants of the small islands on the coasts of Gaul and Britain had well nigh a monopoly of the traffic in wind 149. In the last chapter one made allusion to several wells of greater or less celebrity in the Isle of Man, but I find that I have a few remarks to add. Mr. Arthur Moore, in his book on Manx surnames and place names, p. 200, mentions a chibber unjin, which means the well of the ash tree, and he states that there grew near it formerly a sacred ash tree, where votive offerings were hung. The ash tree calls to his mind Scandinavian legends respecting the ash, but in any case one may suppose the ash was not the usual tree to expect by a well in the Isle of Man. Otherwise this one would scarcely have been distinguished as the ash tree well. The tree to expect by a sacred well is doubtless some kind of thorn, as in the case of Chibur Undin in the parish of Malu. The name means foundation well, so called in reference probably to the foundations of an ancient cell, or keel as it is called in Manx, which lie close by, and are found to measure 21 feet long by 12 feet broad. The following is Mr. Moore's account of the well in his book already cited, p. 181, the water of this well is supposed to have curative properties. The patients who came to it, took a mouthful of water, retaining it in their mouths till they had twice walked round the well. They then took a piece of cloth from a garment which they had worn, wetted it with the water from the well, and hung it on the hawthorn tree which grew there. When the cloth had rotted away, the cure was supposed to be effected. I visited the spot a few years ago in the company of the Rev. E. B. Savage of St. Thomas, Parsonage, Douglas, and we found the well nearly dried up in consequence of the drainage of the field around it. But the remains of the old cell were there, and the thorn bush had strips of cloth or calico tied to its branches. We cut off one, which is now in the Pitt Rivers Museum at Oxford. The account Mr. Savage had of the ritual observed at the well differed a little from that given by Mr. Moore, especially in the fact that it made the patient who had been walking round the well with water from the well in his mouth, empty that water finally into a rag from his clothing, the rag was then tied to a branch of the thorn. It does not appear that the kind of tree mattered much, nay, a tree is not, it seems to me, essential. At any rate, St. Mackle's well has no tree growing near it now, but it is right to say, that when Mr. Kermode and I visited it, we could find no rags left near the spot, nor indeed could we expect to find any, as there was nothing to which they might be tied on that windy headland. The absence of the tree does not, however, prove that the same sort of ritual was not formerly observed at St. Mackle's well as at Chiburun Din, and here I must mention another well which I have visited in the island more than once. It is on the side of Brada Hill, a little above the village of Brada, and in the direction of Fleshwick, I was attracted to it by the fact that it had, as I had been told by Mr. Savage, formerly an old cell or keel near it, and the name of the saint to which it belonged may probably be gathered from the name of the well, which, in the Manx of the south of the island, is Chibert Voltaine. Pronounced approximately Chivert Volten or Zero One Dame. The personal name would be written in Moda Manx in its radical form as Voltaine, and if it occurred in the genitive and agam inscriptions I should expect to find it written Balagni or Baltagni 150. It is, however, unknown to me, though to be placed possibly by the side of the name of the saint after whom the parish of Santon is called in the southeast of the island. This is pronounced in Manx approximately 151 Santane or Sandane, and would have yielded an early inscriptional nominative sanctums, which, in fact, occurs on an old stone near Landudno on the Welsh coast, 
see some notes of mine in point in the Archaeologia Cambrensis, 1897, pp. 140-2, to return to the well, it would seem to have been associated with an old cell, but it has no tree growing by. Mr. Savage and I were told, nevertheless, that a boy who had searched the well a short time previously had got some coins out of it, quite recent ones, consisting of halfpennies or pennies, so far as I remember. On my observing to one of the neighbors that I saw no rags there, I was assured that there had been some. And, on my further saying that I saw no tree there to which they could be tied, I was told that they used to be attached to the brambles, which grew there in great abundance. Thus it appears that, in the Isle of Man at any rate, a tree to bear the rags was not an essential adjunct of a holy well. Before leaving these well superstitions the reader may wish to know how they were understood in Ireland not long ago, so I venture to quote a passage from a letter by the late Mr. W. C. Borlase on rag offerings and primitive pilgrimages in Ireland, as follows. Among the Mises of the late Mr. Windell, of Cork. I find a passage which cannot fail to interest students of folklore. It relates to the custom of affixing shreds of rag to the hawthorn tree, which almost invariably stands by the brink of the typical Irish holy well, and it gives us the meaning of the custom as understood, some half-century since. By the inhabitants of certain localities in the province of Munster. The idea is, says the writer, that the putting up these rags is a putting away of the evils impending or incurred by sin, an act accompanied by the following ritual words, er impide in tyarna mo chuit tenis du figent er in eight so, i.e. By the intercession of the Lord I leave my portion of illness on this place. These words, he adds, should be uttered by whoever performs the round, and they are, no doubt, of extreme antiquity. Mr. Windell doubtless took down the words as he heard them locally pronounced, though, to be correct, for Tyarna should be read Tigerna, for Tainis, Tinis, and for Fagent, Fagame 152. From the less known saints Boltain and Santain I wish to pass to the mention of a more famous one, namely, St. Catherine, and this because of a fair called after her, and held on the sixth day of December at the village of Colby in the south of the island. When I heard of this fair in 1888, it was in temporary abeyance on account of a lawsuit respecting the plot of ground on which the fair is wont to be held. But I was told that it usually begins with a procession, in which a live hen is carried about, this is called St. Catherine's Hen. The next day the hen is carried about dead and plucked, and a rhyme pronounced at a certain point in the proceedings contemplates the burial of the hen, but whether that ever takes place I know not. It runs thus. Kiark Katrinamaru. Catherine's hen is dead. Gausen Kion as Goim's New York Cassin. The head take thou and I the feet. As ver made ee -e fo n W. E shall put her under the ground. A man who is found to be not wholly sober after the fair is locally said to have he plucked a feather from the hen, tayer gol fed jag as y chiark. So it would seem that there must be such a scramble to get at the hen, and to take part in the plucking, that it requires a certain amount of drink to allay the thirst of the overzealous devotees of St. Catherine. But why should this ceremony be associated with St. Catherine? And what were the origin and meaning of it? These are questions on which I should be glad to have light shed. Manx has a word quail, Irish comtail, meaning at the meeting, and from it we have a derivative qualtag or qualtag, meaning, according to Kelly's dictionary, the first person or creature one meets going from home. Whereby the author can have only meant the first met by one who is geoing from home. Kelly goes on to add that, this person is of great consequence to the superstitious, particularly to women the first time they go out after lying in. Cregeen, in his dictionary, defines the qualtag as, the first person met on New Year's Day, or on going on some new work, and before proceeding to give the substance of my notes on the qualtag of the present day I may as well finish with Cregeen. For he adds the following information, a company of young lads or men generally went in old times on what they termed the qualtag, at Christmas or New Year's Day, to the houses of their more wealthy neighbors. Some one of the company repeating in an audible voice the following rhyme. Alec genel eriu as blame fair vi. 
Seal as slain the end slain loot thee. B as Genelis EU bio reshelly. Ski as grey edam rain as dane. Coid as Cowton, stock as Stoyer. Halchi Fudes, as Skadden Dewilior. Aaron as Kashi Eam as Roert. Base, Mir Luff, Eins Ullen New York Salt. Cadley Sachi Tra V's Shu New York Lie. As Fecal Y Jargon, Nagla Bri Dy Mia. It may be loosely translated as follows. A Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year. Long life and health to all the household here. Food and mirth to you dwelling together. Peace and love to all, men and women. Wealth and distinction, stock and store. Potatoes enough, and herrings galore. Bread and cheese, butter and gravy. Die like a mouse in a barn or haggard. In safety sleep while you lie to rest. And by the rees tooth be not distressed. At present New Year's Day is the time when the qualtag is of general interest, and in this case he is, outside the members of one's own household, practically the first person one sees on the morning of that day. Whether that person meets one out of doors or comes to one's house. The following is what I have learnt by inquiry as to the qualtag, all are agreed that he must not be a woman or girl, and that he must not be spaga or splay-footed, while a woman from the parish of Moran told me that he must not have red hair. The prevalent belief, however, is that he should be a dark-haired man or boy, and it is of no consequence how rough his appearance may be, provided he be black-haired. However, I was told by one man in Russian that the qualtag or first foot need not be a black-haired person, he must be a man or boy. But this less restricted view is not the one held in the central and northern parts of the island, so far as I could ascertain. An English lady living in the neighborhood of Castletown told me that her son, whom I know to be, like his mother, a blonde, not being aware what consequences might be associated with his visit, called at a house in Castletown on the morning of New Year's Day, and he chanced to be the qualtag. The mistress of the house was horrified, and expressed to the English lady her anticipation of misfortunes, and as it happened that one of the children of the house died in the course of the year, the English lady has been reminded of it since. Naturally the association of these events are not pleasant to her, but, so far as I can remember, they date only some eight or nine years ago 153. By way of bringing whales into comparison with man, I may mention that, when I was a very small boy, I used to be sent very early on New Year's morning to call on an old uncle of mine, because, as I was told, I should be certain to receive a Kalanig or a Kalan's gift from him, but on no account would my sister be allowed to go, as he would only see a boy on such an occasion as that. I do not recollect anything being said as to the color of one's hair or the shape of one's foot, but that sort of negative evidence is of very little value, as the qualtag was fast passing out of consideration. The preference here given to a boy over a girl looks like one of the widely spread superstitions which rule against the fair sex. But, as to the color of the hair, should be predisposed to think that it possibly rests on racial antipathy, long ago forgotten. For it might perhaps be regarded as going back to a time when the dark-haired race reckoned the Aryan of fair complexion as his natural enemy, the very sight of whom brought with it thoughts calculated to make him unhappy and despondent. If this idea proved to be approximately correct, one might suggest that the racial distinction in question referred to the struggles between the inhabitants of man and their Scandinavian conquerors. But to my thinking it is just as likely that it goes much further back. Lastly, what is one to say with regard to the spaga or splay-footed person, now more usually defined as flat-footed or having no instep? I have heard it said in the south of the island that it is very lucky to meet a spaga in the morning at any time of the year, and not on New Year's Day alone. But this does not help us in the attempt to find the genesis of this belief if it were said that it was unlucky to meet a deformed person, it would look somewhat more natural, but why fix on the flat-footed especially? For my part one have not been trained to distinguish flat-footed people, so I do not recollect noticing any in the Isle of Man. But, granting there may be a small proportion of such people in the island, does it not seem strange that they should have their importance so magnified as this superstition would seem to imply? I must confess that I cannot understand it, unless we have here also some supposed racial characteristic, 
let us say greatly exaggerated. To explain myself I should put it that the non-Aryan aborigines were a small people of great agility and nimbleness, and that their Aryan conquerors moved more slowly and deliberately, whence the former, of springier movements. Might come to nickname the latter the flat-footed. It is even conceivable that there was some amount of foundation for it in fact. If I might speak from my own experience, I might mention a difficulty I have often had with shoes of English make, namely, that I have always found them, unless made to measure, apt to have their instep too low for me. It has never occurred to me to buy ready-made shoes in France or Germany, but I know a lady as Welsh as I am, who has often bought shoes in France, and her experience is, that it is much easier for her to get shoes there to fit her than in England. And for the very reason which I have already suggested, namely, that the instep in English shoes is lower than in French ones. Again, I may mention that one day last term 154, having to address a meeting of Welsh undergraduates on folklore, I ventured to introduce this question. They agreed with me that English shoes did not, as a rule, fit Welsh feet, and this because they are made too low in the instep, I ought to have said that they all agreed except one undergraduate, who held his peace. He is a tall man, powerful in the football field, but of no dark complexion, and I have never dared to look in the direction of his feet since, lest he should catch me carrying my comparisons to cruel extremes. Perhaps the flatness of the feet of the one race is not emphasized so much as the height of the instep in those of the other. At any rate I find this way of looking at the question somewhat countenanced by a journalist who refers his readers to W.M. Henderson's Notes on the Folklore of the Northern Counties, page 74. The passage relates more particularly to Northumberland, and runs as follows, in some districts, however, special weight is attached to the first foot being that of a person with a high-arched instep, a foot that water runs under. A flat-footed person would bring great ill luck for the coming year. These instances do not warrant the induction that Celts are higher in the instep than Teutons, and that they have in here, Ted that characteristic from the non-Aryan element in their ancestry. Perhaps the explanation is, at least in part, that the dwellers in hilly regions tend to be more springy and to have higher insteps than the inhabitants of flatter lands. The Statement of Dr. Carl Blind on this point does not help one to a decision when he speaks as follows in Folklore for 1892, p. 89, as to the instep, I can speak from personal experience. Almost every German finds that an English shoemaker makes his boots not high enough in the instep. The northern Germans, I am from the south, have perhaps slightly flatter feet than the southern Germans. The first part of the comparison is somewhat of a surprise to me, but not so the other part, that the southern Germans inhabiting a hillier country, and belonging to a different race, may well be higher in the instep than the more northern speakers of the German language. But on the whole the more one examines the qualtag, the less clearly one sees how he can be the representative of a particular race. More data possibly would enable one to arrive at greater probability. There is one other question which I should like to ask before leaving the qualtag, namely, as to the relation of the custom of New Year's gifts to the belief in the qualtag. I have heard it related in the Isle of Man that women have been known to keep indoors on New Year's Day until the qualtag comes, which sometimes means their being prisoners for the greater part of the day. In order to avoid the risk of first meeting one who is not of the right sex and complexion. On the other hand, when the qualtag is of the right description, considerable fuss is made of him, to say the least, he has to accept food and drink, possibly more permanent gifts. Thus a tall, black-haired native of Kirk Michael described to me how he chanced on New Year's Day, years ago, to turn into a lonely cottage in order to light his pipe, and how he found he was the qualtag, he had to sit down to have food. And when he went away it was with a present and the blessings of the family. Now New Year's Day is the time for gifts in Wales, as shown by the name for them, Kalanig, which is derived from Kalan, the Welsh form of the Latin Kalendi, New Year's Day being in Welsh White Kalan, the Kalends. The same is the day for gifts in Scotland and in Ireland, except in so far as Christmas boxes have been making inroads from England, I need not add that the Jour de Ian is the day for gifts also in France. My question then is this. Is there any essential connection of origin between the institution of New Year's Day gifts and the belief in the first foot? 
Now that it has been indicated what sort of a qualtag it is unlucky to have, I may as well proceed to mention the other things which I have heard treated as unlucky in the island. Some of them scarcely require to be noticed, as there is nothing specially manx about them, such as the belief that it is unlucky to have the first glimpse of the new moon through glass. That is a superstition which is, I believe, widely spread, and, among other countries, it is quite familiar in Wales, where it is also unlucky to see the moon for the first time through a hedge or over a house. What this means I cannot guess, unless it be that it was once considered one's duty to watch the first appearance of the new moon from the highest point in the landscape of the district in which one dwelt. Such a point would in that case become the chief center of a moon worship now lost in oblivion. It is believed in man, as it used to be in Wales and Ireland, that it is unlucky to disturb antiquities, especially old burial places and old churches. This superstition is unfortunately passing away in all three countries, but you still hear of it, especially in the Isle of Man, mostly after mischief has been done. Thus a good Manx scholar told me how a relative of his in the Ron Nag, a small valley near South Barul, had carted away the earth from an old burial ground on his farm and used it as manure for his fields, and how his beasts died afterwards. The narrator said he did not know whether there was any truth in it, but everybody believed that it was the reason why the cattle died, and so did the farmer himself at last, so he desisted from completing his disturbance of the old site. It is possibly for a similar reason that a house in ruins is seldom pulled down, or the materials used for other buildings. Where that has been done misfortunes have ensued, at any rate, I have heard it said so more than once. I ought to have stated that the non-disturbance of antiquities in the island is quite consistent with their being now and then shamefully neglected as elsewhere. This is now met by an excellent statute recently enacted by the House of Keys for the preservation of the public monuments of the island. Of the other and more purely Manx superstitions I may mention one which obtains among the Peel fishermen of the present day, no boat is willing to be third in the order of sailing out from Peel Harbour to the fisheries. So it sometimes happens that after two boats have departed, the others remain watching each other for days, each hoping that somebody else may be reckless enough to break through the invisible barrier of bad luck. I have often asked for an explanation of this superstition, but the only intelligible answer I have had was that it has been observed that the third boat has done badly several years in succession. But I am unable to ascertain how far that represents the fact. Another of the unlucky things is to have a white stone in the boat, even in the ballast, and for that I never could get any explanation at all. But there is no doubt as to the fact of this superstition, and I may illustrate it from the case of a clergyman's son on the west side, who took it into his head to go out with some fishermen several days in succession. They chanced to be unsuccessful each time, and they gave their Jonah the nickname of Claff Vane, or White Stone. Now what can be the origin of this taboo? It seems to me that if the Manx had once a habit of adorning the graves of the departed with white stones, that circumstance would be a reasonable explanation of the superstition in question. Further, it is quite possible they did, and here Manx archaeologists could probably help as to the matter of fact. In the absence, however, of information to the point from man, I take the liberty of citing some relating to Scotland. It comes from Mr. Gom's Presidential Address to the Folklore Society- See Folklore for 1893, pp. 13-4. Near Inverary, it is the custom among the fisher folk, and has been so within the memory of the oldest, to place little white stones or pebbles on the graves of their friends. No reason is now given for the practice, beyond that most potent and delightful of all reasons in the minds of folklore students, namely, that it has always been done. Now there is nothing between this modem practice sanctioned by traditional observance and the practice of the Stone Age people in the same neighborhood and in others, as made known to us by their grave relics. Thus, in a cairn at Acnacree opened by Dr. Angus Smith, on entering the innermost chamber, the first thing that struck the eye was a row of quartz pebbles larger than a walnut. These were arranged on the ledge of the lower granite block of the east side. Near Creenan, at Duncraigagag and at Rudy, the same characteristic was observed, and Canon Greenwell, who examined the cairns, says the pebbles must have been placed there with some intention, and probably possessed a symbolic meaning. 
See also Bughead, by Mr. H. W. Young, Inverness, 1899, p. 10, where we read that at Bughead the eye smooth white pebbles, sometimes five or seven of them, but never more, have been usually arranged as crosses on the graves which he has found under the fallen ramparts. Can this be a Christian superstition with the white stones of the Apocalypse as its foundation? Here I may mention a fact which I do not know where else to put, namely, that a fisherman on his way in the morning to the fishing, and chancing to pass by the cottage of another fisherman who is not on friendly terms with him, will pluck a straw from the thatch of the latter's dwelling. Thereby he is supposed to rob him of his luck in the fishing for that day. One would expect to learn that the straw from the thatch served as the subject of an incantation directed against the owner of the thatch. I have never heard anything suggested to that effect. But I conclude that the plucking of the straw is only a partial survival of what was once a complete ritual for bewitching one's neighbor. Unless getting possession of the straw was supposed to carry with it possession of everything belonging to the other man, including his luck in fishing for that day. Owing to my ignorance as to the superstitions of other fishermen than those of the Isle of Man, I will not attempt to classify the remaining instances to be mentioned. Such as the unluckiness of mentioning a horse or a mouse on board a fishing boat, I seem, however, to have heard a similar taboos among Scottish fishermen, and, according to Dr. Blind, Shetland fishermen will not mention a church or a clergyman when out at sea, but use quite other names for both when on board a ship, Folklore for 1892, page 89. Novices in the Manx fisheries have to learn not to point to anything with one finger, they have to point with the whole hand or not at all. This looks as if it belonged to a code of rules as to the use of the hand, such as prevail among the Neapolitans and other peoples whose chief article of faith is the belief in malign influences, see Mr. Elworthy's volume on the evil eye. Whether the Manx are alone in thinking it unlucky to lend salt from one boat to another when they are engaged in fishing, I know not, such lending would probably be inconvenient, but why should it be unlucky, as they believe it to be? Does not appear. The first of May is a day on which it is unlucky to lend anything, and especially to give any one fire, one. This looks as if it pointed back to some druidic custom of lighting all fires at that time from a sacred hearth, but, so far as is known, this only took place at the beginning of the other half-year, namely, Sawin or All Hallows, which is sometimes rendered into Manx as La LL Muar New York Saints, the day of the great feast of the saints. Lastly, may I mention that it is unlucky to say that you are very well, at any rate, I infer that it is regarded so, as you will never get a Manxman to say that he is fair vi, very well. He usually admits that he is middling. And if by any chance he risks a stronger adjective, he hastens to qualify it by adding, now, or, just now, with an emphasis indicative of his anxiety not to say too much. 1. With this compare what Mr. Gong has to say of a New Year's Day custom observed in Lanarkshire, see page 633 of the ethnographic report referred to above, and compare Henderson, page 74. His habits of speech point back to a time when the Manx mind was dominated by the fear of awaking malignant influences in the spirit world around him. This has had the effect of giving the Manx peasant's character a tinge of reserve and suspicion, which makes it difficult to gain his confidence, his acquaintance has, therefore, to be cultivated for some time before you can say that you know the working of his heart. The pagan belief in a nemesis has doubtless passed away, but not without materially affecting the Manx idea of a personal devil. Ever since the first allusion made in my hearing by Manxmen to the devil, I have been more and more deeply impressed that for them the devil is a much more formidable being than Englishmen or Welshmen picture him. He is a graver and, if I may say so, a more respectable being, allowing no liberties to be taken with his name, so you had better not call him a devil, the evil one, or like names, for his proper designation is Noid New York Hanmi. The enemy of the soul, and in ordinary Anglo-Manx conversation he is commonly called, the enemy of souls. I well remember getting one day into a conversation with an old soldier in the south of the island. He was, as I soon discovered, laboring under a sort of theological monomania, and his chief question was concerning the Welsh word for, the enemy of souls. I felt at once that I had to be careful, 
and that the reputation of my countrymen depended on how I answered. As I had no name anything like the one he used for the devil, I explained to him that the Welsh, though not a great nation, were great students of theology, and that they had by no means neglected the great branch of it known as Satanology. In fact that study, as I went on to say, had left its impress on the Welsh language, on Sunday the ministers of all denominations, the deacons and elders, and all self-respecting congregations spoke of the devil trisyllabically as diaphol. While on the other days of the week everybody called him more briefly and forcibly diol, except bards concocting an odal for an estevlad, where the devil must always be called diaphol, and excepting also sailors, farm servants. Postboys and colliers, together with country gentlemen learning Welsh to address there wouldn't be constituents for all these the regulation form was jol, with an English J. Thus one could, I pointed out to him, fix the social standing of a Welshman by the way he named the enemy of souls, as well as appreciate the superiority of Welsh over Greek, seeing that Welsh, when it borrowed. From Greek, quadrupled it. While Greek remained sterile. He was so profoundly impressed that I never was able to bring his attention back to the small fry, spiritually speaking, of the Isle of Man, to wit, the fairies and the fenidiri, or even the witches and the charmers. Except that he had some reserve of faith in witches, since the witch of Ender was in the Bible and had ascribed to her a terribly great power of raising spirits, that, he thought, must be true. I pointed out to him that a fenidiri, see page 288, was also mentioned in his Bible, this display of ready knowledge on my part made a deep impression on his mind. The Manx are, as a rule, a sober people, and highly religious. As regards their tenets, they are mostly members of the Church of England or Wesleyan Methodists, or else both, which is by no means unusual. Religious phrases are not rare in their ordinary conversation. In fact, they struck me as being of more frequent occurrence than in Wales, even the Wales of my boyhood, and here and there this fondness for religious phraseology has left its traces on the native vocabulary. Take, for example, the word for anybody, a person, or human being, which Cregeen writes Pyak or Piak, he rightly regards it as the colloquial pronunciation of Pekka, a sinner. So, when one knocks at a Manx door and calls out, Vel Piak thy, He literally asks, I is there any sinner indoors? The question has, however, been explained to me, with unconscious irony, as properly meaning, is there any Christian indoors? And care is now taken in reading to pronounce the middle conso, nance of the word pekka, sinner, so as to distinguish it from the word for a Christian anybody, but the identity of origin is unmistakable. Lastly, the fact that a curse is a species of prayer, to wit, a prayer for evil to follow, is well exemplified in Manx by the same words, we 155, plural Guigan, meaning both kinds of prayer. Thus I found myself stumbling several times, in reading through the Psalms in Manx, from not bearing in mind the sinister meaning of these words, for example in Psalm 14. 6, where we have Ta, North Beale O C Lane D Y Guigan as D Y Harriot, which I mechanically construed to mean, their mouth is full of praying and bitterness, instead of cursing and bitterness, and so in other cases, such as P.S. X. 7 and 6. 27. It occurred to me on various occasions to make inquiries as to the attitude of religious manxmen towards witchcraft and the charmer's vocation. Nobody, so far as I know, accuses them of favoring witchcraft in any way whatsoever. But as to the reality of witches and witchcraft they are not likely to have any doubt es so long as they dwell on the biblical account of the witch of Ender, as I have already mentioned in the case of the old Crimean soldier. Then as to charmers I have heard it distinctly stated that the most religious men are they who have most confidence in charmers and their charms. And a lay preacher whom I know has been mentioned to me as now and then doing a little charming in cases of danger or pressing need. On the whole, I think the charge against religious people of consulting charmers is somewhat exaggerated. But I believe that recourse to the charmer is more usual and more openly had than, for example, in Wales, where those who consult a dine hyspys or wise man have to do it secretly. And at the risk of being expelled by their co-religionists from the seat or society. 
There is somewhat in the atmosphere of man to remind one rather of the whales of a past generation whales as it was at the time when the Rev. Edmund Jones could write a relation of apparitions of spirits in the county of Monmouth and the Principles of Wales, as a book designed to confute and to prevent the infidelity of denying the being and apparition of spirits, which tends to irreligion and atheism, see above. The Manx peasantry are perhaps the most independent and prosperous in the British Isles. But their position geographically and politically has been favorable to the continuance of ideas not quite up to the level of the latest papers on Darwinism and evolution read at our church congresses in this country. This may be thought to be here wide of the mark. But, after giving, in the previous chapter, specimens of rather ancient superstitions as recently known in the island, it is but right that one should form an idea of the surroundings in which they have lingered into modern times. Perhaps nothing will better serve to bring this home to the reader's mind than the fact, for which there is proof, that old people still living remember men and women clad in white sheets doing penance publicly in the churches of man. The following is the evidence which I was able to find, and I may state that I first heard in 1888 of the public penance from Mr. Juffin, who was an aged man and a native of Kirk Bride. He related how a girl named Mary Dick gave an impertinent answer to the clergyman when he was catechizing her class, and how she had to do penance for it at church. She took her revenge on the parson by singing, while attending in a white sheet, louder than everybody else in the congregation. This, unless I am mistaken, Mr. Juffin gave me to understand he had heard from his father. I mentioned the story to a clergyman who was decidedly of opinion that no one alive now could remember anything about public penance. Not long after, however, I got into conversation with a shoemaker at Kirk Michael, named Dan Kelly, who was nearly completing his 81st year. He was a native of Balaf, and stated that he remembered many successive occupants of the Episcopal See. A long time ago the official called the Sumner had, out of spite, he said, appointed him to serve as one of the four of the chapter jury. It was, he thought, when he was about twenty-five. During his term of office he saw four persons, of whom two were married men and two unmarried women, doing penance in the parish church of Balaf for having illegitimate children. They stood in the alley of the church, and the Sumner had to throw white sheets over them, on the fourth Sunday of their penance they stood inside the chancel rails, but not to take the communion. The parson, whose name was Stoll or Stoll, made them thoroughly ashamed of themselves on the fourth Sunday, as one of the men afterwards admitted. Kelly mentioned the names of the women and of one of the men, and he indicated to me some of their descendants as well known in the neighborhood. I cross-examined him all the more severely, as I had heard the other view of the remoteness of the date. But nothing could shake Kelly, who added that soon after the date of the above-mentioned cases the civil functionary, known as the Vicar General, put an end to the chapter jury and to public penance, according to his reckoning the penance he spoke of must have taken place about 1832. Another old man, named Cooley, living now near Kirk Michael, but formerly in the parish of Lazare, had a similar story. He thinks that he was born in the sixth year of the century, and when he was between eighteen and twenty he saw a man doing public penance, in Lazare church, I presume, but I have no decided note on that point. However that may be, he remembered that the penitent, when he had done his penance, had the audacity to throw the white sheet over the Sumner, who, the penitent remarked, might now wear it himself, as he had had enough of it. Cooley would bring the date only down to about 1825. Lastly, I was in the island again in 1891, and spent the first part of the month of April at Peel, where I had conversations with a retired captain who was then about seventy-eight. He is a native of the parish of Dalby, but he was only a lump of a boy when the last couple of immorals were forced to do penance in white sheets at church. He gave me the guilty man's name, and the name of his home in the parish, and both the captain and his daughter assured me that the man had only been dead six or seven years, that is, the penitent seems to have lived till about the year 1884. May here mention that the parish of Dalby is the subject of many tales, which go to show that its people were more old-fashioned in their ways than those of the rest of the island. It appears to have been the last, also, to be reached by a cart road. And I was amused by a native's description of the men at Methodist meetings in Dalby pulling the tapag, or forelock, 
at the name of Jesus, while the women ducked a curtsy in a dangerously abrupt fashion. He and his wife appeared to be quite used to it, the husband was an octogenarian named Quirk, who was born on the coast near the low-lying peninsula called the Narbo, that is to say, the tail. To return to the public penance, it seems to us in this country to belong, so to say, to ancient history, and it transports us to a state of things which we find it hard to realize. The lapse of years has brought about profounder changes in our greater Isle of Britain than in the smaller Isle of Man, while we ourselves, helpless to escape the pervading influence of those profounder changes, become living instances of the comprehensive truth of the German poet's words. Omnia mulanter, no city mutarner in illis. Chapter 6 The Folklore of the Wells Luvat integros exedir fontis lucretius. It is only recently 156 that I heard for the first time of Welsh instances of the habit of tying rags and bits of clothing to the branches of a tree growing near a holy well. Since then I have obtained several items of information in point, the first is a communication received in June, 1892, from Mr. J. H. Davies, of Lincoln College, Oxford since then of Lincoln's in relating to a Glamorganshire holy well, situated near the pathway leading from Coychurch to Bridgend. It is the custom there, he states, for people suffering from any malady to dip a rag in the water, and to bathe the affected part of the body, the rag being then placed on a tree close to the well. When Mr. Davies passed that way, some three years previously, there were, he adds, hundreds of such shreds on the tree, some of which distinctly presented the appearance of having been very recently placed there. The well is called Finan Cae Mach, Swinefield Well, which can hardly have been its old name, and a later communication from Mr. Davies summarizes a conversation which he had about the well, on December 16, 1892, with Mr. J. T. Howell, of Pencoid, near Bridgend. His notes run thus, Finan Cae Mach, between Coy Church and Bridgend, is one mile from Coy Church, one and a quarter from Bridgend, near Tremaines. It is within twelve or fifteen yards of the high road, just where the pathway begins. People suffering from rheumatism go there. They bathe the part affected with water, and afterwards tie a piece of rag to the tree which overhangs the well. The rag is not put in the water at all, but is only put on the tree for luck. It is a stunted, but very old tree, and is simply covered with rags. A little less than a year later, I had an opportunity of visiting this well in the company of Mr. Brimner Jones, and I find in my notes that it is not situated so near the road as Mr. Howell would seem to have stated to Mr. Davies. We found the well, which is a powerful spring, surrounded by a circular wall. It is overshadowed by a dying thorn tree, and a little further back stands another thorn which is not so decayed, it was on this latter thorn we found the rags. I took off a twig with two rags, while Mr. Brynmore Jones counted over a dozen other rags on the tree, and we noticed that some of them had only recently been suspended there, among them were portions undoubtedly of a woman's clothing. At one of the hotels at Bridgend, I found an illiterate servant who was acquainted with the well, and I cross-examined him on the subject of it. He stated that a man with a wound, which he explained to mean a cut, would go and stand in the well within the wall. And there he would untie the rag that had been used to tie up the wound and would wash the wound with it, then he would tie up the wound with a fresh rag and hang the old one on the tree. The more respectable people whom I questioned talked more vaguely, and only of tying a rag to the tree, except one who mentioned a pin being thrown into the well or a rag being tied to the tree. Native of the My next informant is Mr. D. J. Jones, Aranda Valley, in the same county of Glamorgan. He was an undergraduate of Jesus College, Oxford, when I consulted him in our 892. His information was to the effect that he knows of three interesting wells in the county. The first is situated within two miles of his home, and is known as Finan Pen Rees, or the Well of Pen Rees. The custom there is that the person who wishes his health to be benefited should wash in the water of the well, and throw a pin into it afterwards. He next mentions a well at Lancarvin, some five or six miles from Cowbridge, where the custom prevails of tying rags to the branches of a tree growing close at hand. Lastly, 
he calls my attention to a passage in Haynes Morgan, The History of Glamorgan, written by Mr. D. W. Jones, known in Welsh literature as Daffod Morgan. In that work, p. 29, the author speaks of Finn and Mark Rose, the well of Mark Rose, to the following effect It is the custom for those who are healed in it to tie a shred of linen or cotton to the branches of a tree that stands close by. And there the shreds are, almost as numerous as the leaves. Mark Rose is, I may say, near Nash Point, and looks on the map as if it were about eight miles distant from Bridgend. Let me here make it clear that so far we have had to do with four different wells 157 three of which are severally distinguished by the presence of a tree adorned with rags by those who seek health in those waters. But they are all three, as the reader will have doubtless noticed, in the same district, namely, the part of Glamorganshire near the main line of the Great Western Railway. There is no reason, however. To think that the custom of tying rags to a well tree was peculiar to that part of I cannot say for certain whether it was customary in any of the cases to which I have called attention to tie rags to the well tree as well as to throw pins or other small objects into the well. But I cannot help adhering to the view that the distinction was probably an ancient one between two orders of things. In other words, I am inclined to believe that the rag was regarded as the vehicle of the disease of which the ailing visitor to the well wished to be rid, and that the bead, button, or coin deposited by him in the well, or in a receptacle near the well, formed alone the offering. In opposition to this view Mr. Gom has expressed himself as follows in Folklore, 1892, p. 89.1 There is some evidence against that, from the fact that in the case of some wells, especially in Scotland at one time, the whole garment was put down as an offering. Gradually these offerings of clothes became less and less till they came down to rags. Also in other parts, the geographical distribution of rag offerings coincides with the existence of monoliths and dolmens. As to the monoliths and dolmens, I am too little conversant with the facts to risk any opinion as to the value of the coincidence, but as to the suggestion that the rag originally meant the whole garment, that will suit my hypothesis admirably. In other words, the whole garment was, as I take it, the vehicle of the disease, the whole was accursed, and not merely a part. But Mr. Gom had previously touched on the question in his presidential address, Folklore F6 R 1892, page 13. And I must at once admit that he succeeded then in proving that a certain amount of confusion occurs between things which I should regard as belonging originally to distinct categories witness the inimitable Irish instance which he quotes, to St. Column kill I offer up this button, a bit o oh, the waistband o oh, my own breeches, and a taste o oh, my wife's petticoat, in remembrance of us having made this holy station, and may they rise up in glory to prove it for us in the last day. Here not only the button is treated as an offering, but also the bits of clothing, but the confusion of ideas I should explain as being, at least in part, one of the natural results of substituting a portion of a garment for the entire garment. For thereby a button or a pin becomes a part of the dress, and capable of being interpreted in two senses. After all, however, the ordinary practices have not, as I look at them, resulted in effacing the distinction altogether the rag is not left in the well, nor is the bead, button, or pin attached to a branch of the tree. So, in the main, it seemed to me easier to explain the facts, taken altogether, on the supposition that originally the rag was regarded as the vehicle of the disease, and the bead, button, or coin as the offering. My object in calling attention to this point was to have it discussed, and I am happy to say that I have not been disappointed. For, since my remarks were published 158, a paper entitled Pinwells and Rag Bushes was read before the British Association by Mr. Haitland, in 1893, and published in Folklore for the same year, pages 451 to 70. In that paper the whole question is gone into with searching logic, and Mr. Hartland Finn D.S. the required explanation in one of the dogmas of magic. For, if an article of my clothing, he says, in a witch's hands may cause me to suffer, the same article in contact with a beneficent power may relieve my pain, restore me to health, or promote my general prosperity. A pin that has pricked my wart. Has by its contact, by the wound it has inflicted, acquired a peculiar bond with the wart, 
the rag that has rubbed the wart has by that friction acquired a similar bond. So that whatever is done to the pin or the rag, whatever influences the pin or the rag may undergo, the same influences are by that very act brought to bear upon the wart. If, instead of using a rag, or making a pilgrimage to a sacred well, I rub my warts with raw meat and then bury the meat, the wart will decay and disappear with the decay and dissolution of the meat. In like manner my shirt or stocking, or a rag to represent it, placed upon a sacred bush. Or thrust into a sacred well my name written upon the walls of a temple a stone or a pellet from my hand cast upon a sacred image or a sacred cairn is thenceforth in continual contact with divinity. And the effluence of divinity, reaching and involving it, will reach and involve me. Mr. Hartland concludes from a large number of instances, that as a rule, where the pin or button is dropped into the well, the patient does not trouble about the rag and vice versa. This wider argument as to the effluence of the divinity of a particular spot of special holiness seems to me conclusive. It applies also, needless to say, to a large category of cases besides those in question between Mr. Gom and the present writer. So now I would revise my position thus, I continue to regard the rag much as before. But treat the article thrown into the well as the more special means of establishing a beneficial relation with the well divinity, whether it could also be viewed as an offering would depend on the value attached to it. Some of the following notes may serve as illustrations, especially those relating to the wool and the pin, fin and gwingy, or the well of gwingwy, near Langelinen, on the river Conway, appears to be partly in point. For it formerly used to be well stocked with crooked pins, which nobody would touch lest he might get from them the wart supposed to attach to them, whence it would appear that a pin might be regarded as the vehicle of the disease. There was a well of some repute at C.A.E. Garw, in the parish of Pistil, near the foot of Carnguch, in Lane, or West Carnarvonshire. The water possessed virtues to cure one of rheumatism and warts. But, in order to be rid of the latter, it was requisite to throw a pin into the well for each individual wart. For these two items of information, and several more to be mentioned presently, I have to thank Mr. John Jones, better known in Wales by his bardic name of Merton Fard, and as an enthusiastic collector of Welsh antiquities, whether in the form of manuscript or of unwritten folklore. On the second day of the year 1893 I paid him a visit at Chwilog, on the Carnarvon and Avon Wynn Railway, and asked him many questions, these he not only answered with the utmost willingness. But he also showed me the unpublished materials which he had collected. I come next to a competition on the folklore of North Wales at the London Esteathvot in 1887, in which, as one of the adjudicators, I observed that several of the competitors mentioned the prevalent belief. That every well with healing properties must have its outlet towards the south, Iarda. According to one of them, if you wish to get rid of warts, you should, on your way to the well, look for wool which the sheep had lost. When you had found enough wool you should prick each wart with a pimp and then rub the wart well with the wool. The next thing was to bend the pin and throw it into the well. Then you should place the wool on the first white thorn you could find, and as the wind scattered the wool, the warts would disappear. Fear was a well of the kind, the writer went on to say, near his home, and he, with three or four other boys, went from school one day to the well to charm their warts away for he had twenty-three on one of his hands. So that he always tried to hide it, as it was the belief that if one counted the warts they would double their number. He forgets what became of the other boy's warts, but his own disappeared soon afterwards. And his grandfather used to maintain that it was owing to the virtue of the well. Such were the words of this writer, whose name is unknown to me. But I guess him to have been a native of Carnarvonshire, or else of one of the neighbouring districts of Denbyshire or Merionethshire. To return to Merkton Fart, he mentioned Finn and Sefn Leithfan, or the well of the Leithfan Ridge, on the eastern slope of Mynddy Rye, in the parish of Brinkrose, in the west of Lane. In the case of this well it is necessary, when going to it and coming from it, to be careful not to utter a word to anybody, or to turn to look back. What one has to do at the well is to bathe the warts with a rag or clout which has grease on it. 
When that is done, the clout with the grease has to be carefully concealed beneath the stone at the mouth of the well. This brings to my mind the fact that I noticed more than once, years ago, rags underneath stones in the water flowing from wells in Wales, and sometimes thrust into holes in the walls of wells, but I had no notion how they came there. On the subject of pinwells I had in 1893, from Mr. T. E. Morris, of Portmadoc, Bannister at Law, some account of Finn and Faglin, or Baglin's Well, in the parish of Lanfaglin, near Carnarvon. The well is situated in an open field to the right of the road leading towards the church, and close to it. The church and churchyard form an enclosure in the middle of the same field, and the former has in its wall the old stone reading Philly Loverniae Anatomori. My friend derived information from Mrs. Roberts, of Sefnwy Coed, near Carnarvon, as follows, the old people who would be likely to know anything about Finn and Faglin have all died. The two oldest inhabitants, who have always lived in this parish of Lanfaglin, remember the well being used for healing purposes. One told me his mother used to take him to it, when he was a child, for sore eyes, bathe them with the water, and then drop in a pin. The other man, when he was young, bathed in it for rheumatism. And until quite lately people used to fetch away the water for medicinal purposes. The latter, who lives near the well, at Tan Y. Greg, said that he remembered it being cleaned out about fifty years ago, when two basinfuls of pins were taken out, but no coin of any kind. The pins were all bent, and I conclude the intention was to exorcise the evil spirits supposed to afflict the person who dropped them in, or, as the Welsh say, dadwitzio. No doubt some ominous words were also used. The well is at present nearly dry, the field where it lies having been drained some years ago, and the water in consequence withdrawn from it. It was much used for the cure of warts. The wart was washed, then pricked with a pin, which, after being bent, was thrown into the well. There is a very large and well-known well of the kind at Clinic, Finn and Buno, St. Buno's well, which was considered to have miraculous healing powers, and even yet, I believe, some people have faith in it. Finn and Faglin is, in its construction, an imitation, on a smaller scale, of St. Buno's well at Clinic. In the cliffs at the west end of Lane is a wishing well called Finn and Fair, or St. Mary's Well, to the left of the site of Egoese Fair, and facing YNYS Entley, or Bardsey. Here, to obtain your wish, you have to descend the steps to the well and walk up again to the top with your mouth full of the water, and then you have to go round the ruins of the church once or more times with the water still in your mouth. Viewing the position of the well from the sea, I should be disposed to think that the realization of one's wish at that price could not be regarded as altogether cheap. Merton Fark also told me that there used to be a well near Cricketh Church. It was known as Finn and Y Saint, or the Saint's Well, and it was the custom to throw keys or pins into it on the morning of Easter Sunday, in order to propitiate St. Catherine, who was the patron of the well. I should be glad to know what this exactly meant. Lastly, a few of the wells in that part of Gwynd may be grouped together and described as oracular. One of these, the big well in the parish of Lambadrog in Lane, as I learned from Merton Fard, required the devotee to kneel by it and avow his faith in it. When this had been duly done, he might proceed in this wise, to ascertain, for instance, the name of the thief who had stolen from him, he had to throw a bit of bread into the well and name the person whom he suspected. At the name of the thief the bread would sink, so the inquirer went on naming all the persons he could think of until the bit of bread sank, when the thief was identified. How far is one to suppose that we have here traces of the influences of the water ordeal common in the Middle Ages? Another well of the same kind was Finn and Sathan, in Lanfahangel Bacheteth Parish, also in Lane. Here it was customary, as he had it in writing, for lovers to throw pins, pino, into the well, but these pins appear to have been the points of the blackthorn. At any rate, they cannot well have been of any kind of metal, as we are told that, if they sank in the water, one concluded that one's lover was not sincere in his or her love. Next may be mentioned a well, bearing the remarkable name of Finn and Gwynet, or the Well of Gwynd, which is situated near Mynydd Mar. In the parish of Aberch, 
it used to be consulted in the following manner when it was desired to discover whether an ailing person would recover, a garment of his would be thrown into the well. And according to the side on which it sank it was known whether he would live or die. Finan Jibai, or St. Saibai's well, in the parish of Langibi, was the scene of a somewhat similar practice. For there, girls who wished to know their lover's intentions would spread their pocket handkerchiefs on the water of the well, and if the water pushed the handkerchiefs to the south in Welsh PRD they knew that everything was right in Welsh ODD and that their lovers were honest and honourable in their intentions. But, if the water shifted the handkerchiefs northwards, they concluded the contrary. A reference to this is made B.V. a modern Welsh poet, as follows. Ambled dine, Gmailden, a G.Y.R.C.H. I bent Goris Mol Banaf. Mien go bath my hen G. Dodd for Sid Twido R. Lee. Some folks, worthless 159 folks, visit. A hollow below Mol Benturch. In hopes that ancient Kaibi of noble fame blesses the flood. The spot is not far from where Merton Fard lives. And he mentioned, that adjoining the well is a building which was probably intended for the person in charge of the well, it has been tenanted within his memory. Not only for this but also for several of the foregoing items of information am I indebted to Merton, and now I come to Mrs. Williams Ellis, of Glass for Nutchaff, who tells me that one day not long ago, she met at Langibi a native A.O. had not visited the place since his boyhood, he had been away as an engineer in South Wales nearly all his life. But had returned to see an aged relative. So the reminiscences of the place filled his mind, and, among other things, he said that he remembered very well what concern there was one day in the village at a mischievous person having taken a very large eel out of the well. Many of the old people, he said, felt that much of the virtue of the well was probably taken away with the eel. To see it coiling about their limbs when they went into the water was a good sign, so he gave one to understand. As a sort of parallel I may mention that I have seen the fish living in Finan Beris, not far from the parish church of Lanberis. It is jealously guarded by the inhabitants, and when it was once or twice taken out by a mischievous stranger he was forced to put it back again. However, I never could get the history of this sacred fish, but I found that it was regarded as very old 160. I may add that it appears the well called Finn and Fair, Mary's Well, at Landwin, in Anglesey, used formerly to have inhabiting it a sacred fish, whose movements indicated the fortunes of the love sick men and maidens who visited there the shrine of Esti. Dwinwin 161. Possibly inquiry would result in showing that such sacred fish have been far more common once in the principality than they are now. The next class of wells to claim our attention consists of what I may call fairy wells, of which few are mentioned in connection with Wales, but the legends about them are of absorbing interest. One of them is in Merton Fard's neighborhood, and I questioned him a good deal on the subject, it is called Finn and Grassy, or Grace's Well, and it occupies, according to him. A few square feet he has measured it himself of the southeast comber of the lake of Glasfernuchaf, in the parish of Langibi. It appears that it was walled in, and that the stone forming its eastern side has several holes in it, which were intended to let water enter the well and not issue from it. It had a door or cover on its surface. And it was necessary to keep the door always shut, except when water was being drawn. Through somebody's negligence, however, it was once on a time left open, the consequence was that the water of the well flowed out and formed the Glassfern Lake, which is so considerable as to be navigable for small boats. Grassy is supposed in the locality to have been the name of the owner of the well, or at any rate of a lady who had something to do with it. Grassy or Grace, however, can only be a name which a modern version of the legend has introduced. It probably stands for an older name given to the person in charge of the well, to the one, in fact, who neglected to shut the door. But though the name must be comparatively modern, the story, as a whole, does not appear to be at all modern, but very decidedly the contrary. So I wrote in 1893. But years after my conversation with Merton Fard, my attention was called to the fact that the Glassfern family, of which the Reverend J. C. William Zealous is the head, have in their coat of arms a mermaid, who is represented in the usual way, holding a comb in her right hand and a mirror in her left. 
I had from the first expected to find some kind of undine or liban story associated with the well and the lake, though I had abstained from trying the risky effects of leading questions, but when I heard of the heraldic mermaid I wrote to Mr. William Zealous to ask whether he knew her history. His words, though not encouraging as regards the mermaid, soon convinced me that I had not been wholly wrong in supposing that more folklore attached to the well and lake than I had been able to discover. Since then Mrs. William Zealous has taken the trouble of collecting on the spot all the items of tradition which she could find, she communicated them to me in the month of March, 1899, and the following is an abstract of them. Preceded by a brief description of the ground. The well itself is at the foot of a very green field bank at the head of the lake, but not on the same level with it. As the lake has had its waters lowered half a century or more ago by the outlet having been cut deeper. Adjoining the field containing the well is a larger field, which also slopes down to the lake and extends in another direction to the grounds belonging to the house. This larger field is called C.A.R. Lady, I the Lady's Fila, and it is remarkable for having in its center an ancient standing stone, which, as seen from the windows of the house, presents the appear. Ants of a female figure hurrying along, with the wind slightly swelling out her veil and the skirt of her dress. Mr. William Zealous remembers how when he was a boy the stone was pofficially whitewashed, and how an old bonnet adorned the top of this would-be statue, and he thinks that an old shawl used to be thrown over the shoulders. Now as to Grassy, she is mostly regarded as a ghostly person somehow connected with the lake and the house of Glassfren. One story is to the effect, that on a certain evening she forgot to close the well, and that when the gushing waters had formed the lake, poor Grassy, overcome with remorse, wandered up and down the high ground of C.A.R. Lady, moaning and weeping. There, in fact, S.H.E. is still at times to be heard lamenting her fate, especially at two o'clock in the early morning. Some people say that she is also to be seen about the lake, which is now the haunt of some half a dozen swans. But on the whole her visits appear to have been most frequent and troublesome at the house itself several persons still living are mentioned, who believe that they have seen her there, and two of them, Mrs. Jones of Talifon, and old Sidney Griffith of Tyddyn Bach, agree in the main in their description of what they saw, namely, a tall lady with well-marked features and large bright eyes, she was dressed in white silk and a white velvet bonnet. The woman, Sidney Griffith, thought that she had seen the lady walking several times about the house and in C.A.R. Lady. This comes, in both instances, from a young lady born and bred in the immediate neighborhood, and D. studying now at the University College of North Wales, but Mrs. William Zealous has had similar accounts from other sources, and she mentions tenants of Glassfren who found it difficult to keep servants there, because they felt that the place was haunted. In fact one of the tenants himself felt so unsafe that he used to take his gun and his dog with him to his bedroom at night. Not to mention that when the Williams Elisas lived themselves, as they do still, in the house, their visitors have been known to declare that they heard the strange plaintive cry out of doors at two o'clock in the morning. Traces also of a very different story are reported by Mrs. William Zealous, to the effect that when the water broke forth to form the lake, the fairy seized Grassy and changed her into a swan, and that she continued in that form to live on the lake six score years, and that when at length she died. She loudly lamented her lot, that cry is still to be heard at night. This story is in process apparently of being rationalized. At any rate the young lady student, to whom I have referred, Remer fibers perfectly that her grandfather used to explain to her and the other children at home that Grassy was changed into a swan as a punishment for haunting Glassfren. But that nevertheless the old lady still visited the place, especially when there happened to be strangers in the house. At the end of September last Mrs. Reese and I had the pleasure of spending a few days at GLASFRYN, in the hope of hearing the plaintive wail, and of seeing the lady in white silk revisiting her familiar haunts. But alas L. Our sleep was never once disturbed, nor was our peace once troubled by suspicions of anything uncanny. This, however, is negative, and characterized by the usual weakness of all such evidence. It is now time to turn to another order of facts, in the first place may be mentioned that the young lady student's grandmother used to call the well Finn and Griffith. 
As she had always heard that Gra was the daughter of a certain Shown Gruffied, John Griffith, who lived near the well. And Mrs. William Zealous finds that Gra was buried, at a very advanced age, on December 14, 1743, at the parish church of Langibe, where the register describes her as Grace Jones, alias, Grace Jones Griffith. She had lived till the end at Glasfern, but from documents in the possession of the GLA, SFRYN family it is known that in 11728 Hugh Lloyd of Tratwin purchased the house and estate of Glasfern from a son of Grace's, named John of Cadwallader. And that Hugh Lloyd of Traltwin's son, the Rev. William Lloyd, sold them to Archdeacon Ellis, from whom they have descended to the Reverend J. C. William Zephelis. In the light of these facts there is no reason to connect the old lady's name very closely with the well or the lake. She was once the dominant figure at Glasfern, that is all, and when she died she was as usual supposed to haunt the house and its immediate surroundings. And if we might venture to suppose that Glasfern was sold by her son against her will, though subject to conditions which enabled her to remain in possession of the place to the day of her death, we should have a further explanation, perhaps. Of her supposed moaning and lamentation. In the background, however, of the story, one detects the possibility of another female figure, for it may be that the standing stone in C.A.R. Lady represents woman buried there centuries before Grace ruled at Glasfern. And that traditions about the earlier lady have survived to be inextricably mixed with those concerning the later one. Lastly, those traditions may have else associated the subject of them with the well and the lake. But I wish to attach no importance to this conjecture, as we have in reserve a third figure of larger possibilities than either Grace or the Stone Woman. It needs no better introduction than Mrs. Williams Ellis' own words, Our younger boys have a crew of three little Welsh boys who live near the lake, to join them in their boat sailing about the pool and encamping on the island, and they asked me once who Morgan was, whom the little boys were always saying they were to be careful against. An old man living at Tal Llyn, Lake's End, a farm close by, says that as a boy he was always told that naughty boys would be carried off by Morgan into the lake. Others tell me that Morgan is always held to be ready to take off troublesome children, and somehow Morgan is thought of as a bad one. Now as Morgan carries children off into the pool, he would seem to issue from the pool, and to have his home in it. Further, he plays the same part as the fairies against whom a Snowdonian mother used to warn her children, they were on no account to wander away from the house when there was a mist. Lest the fairies should carry them to their home beneath LLYNDWYTHWCH. In other words, Morgan may be said to act in the same way as the mermaid, who takes a sailor down to her submarine home. And it explains to my mind a discussion which I once heard of the name Morgan by a party of men and women making hay one fine summer's day in the neighborhood of Ponterwit, in North Cardiganshire. I was a child, but I remember vividly how they teased one of their number whose style was Morgan. They hinted at dreadful things associated with the name. But it was all so vague that I could not gather that his great unknown namesake was a thief, a murderer, or any kind of ordinary criminal. The impression left on my mind was rather the notion of something weird, uncanny, or non-human. And the fact that the Welsh version of the Book of Common Prayer calls the Pelagians Morganiade, Morgans, does not offer an adequate explanation. But I now see clearly that it is to be sought in the indistinct echo of such folklore as that which makes Morgan a terror to children in the neighborhood of the Glasfern Lake. The name, however, presents points of difficulty which require some notice. The Welsh translators of Article 9 in the prayer book were probably wrong in making Pelagians into Morganiade. As the Welsh for Pelagius seems to have been rather Morian 162, which in its oldest recorded form was Morgan, and meant seaborn, or offspring of the sea. In a still earlier form it must have been Morigenos, with a feminine Morigena, but when the endings came to be dropped both vocables would become Morgan, later Morian. I do not remember coming across a feminine Morgan in Welsh, but the presumption is that it did exist. For, among other things, I may mention that we have it in Irish as Muir Gen, one of the names of the Lake Lady Liban, who, when the waters of the neglected well rushed forth to form Loch Nee, lived beneath that lake until she desired to be changed into a salmon. 
The same conclusion may be drawn from the name Morgane or Morgan, given in the French romances to one or more water ladies. For those names are easiest to explain as the Brythonic Morgan borrowed from a Welsh or Breton source, unless one found it possible to trace it direct to the goidels of Wales. No sooner, however, had the confusion taken place between Morgan and the name which is so common in Wales as exclusively a man's name, then the aquatic figure must also become male. That is why the Glassford Morgan is now a male, and not a female like the other characters whose role he plays. But while the name was in Welsh successively Morgan and Morian, the man's name was Morkant, Morgant, or Morgan 163, so that, phonologically speaking, no confusion could be regarded as possible between the two series. Here, therefore, one detects the influence, doubtless, of the French romances which spoke of a lake Lady Morgane, Morgan, or Morgue. The character varied, Morgane Le Fay was a designing and wicked person. But Morgan was also the name of a well-disposed lady of the same fairy kind, who took Arthur away to be healed at her home in the Isle of Avalon. We seem to be on the track of the same confusing influence of the name, when it occurs in the story of Geraint and Enid, for there the chief physician of Arthur's court is called Morgan Tut or Morgant Tut, and the word Tut has been shown by M. Loath to have meant the same sort of non-human being whom an eleventh-century life of St. Maudes mentions as quidem daemon quem Britons to the pellant. Thus the name Morgan Tut is meant as the Welsh equivalent of the French Morgan Le Fay or Morgan La Fay 164. But so long as the compiler of the story of Geraint and Enid employed in his Welsh the form Morgan, he had practically no choice but to treat the person called Morgan as a man. Whether that was or was not the sex in the original texts on which he was drawing. Of course he could have avoided the difficulty in case he was aware of it, if he had found some available formula in use like Mary Morgant, said to be a common name for a ferry on the island of Uessant, off the coast of Brittany. Summarizing the foregoing notes, we seem to be right in drawing the following conclusions, 1. The well was left in the charge of a woman who forgot to shut it, and when she saw the water bursting forth, she bewailed her negligence. As in the case of her counterpart in the legend of Cantor Arguelet. 2. The original name of the glass friend Morgan was Morgan, later Morian. 3. The person changed into a swan on the occasion of the glass friend well erupting was not grassy, but most probably Morgan. And, 4, the character was originally feminine, like that of the mermaid or the fairies, whose role the Glassfern Morgan plays, and more especially may one compare the Irish Muir Gen, the Morgan more usually called Libin. For it is to be noticed that when the neglected well burst forth she, Muir Gen or Libin, was not drowned like the others involved in the calamity, but lived in her chamber at the bottom of the lake formed by the overflowing well until she was changed into a salmon. In that form she lived on some three centuries, until in fact she was caught in the net of a fisherman, and obtained the boon of a Kostayan burial. However, the change into a swan is also known on Irish ground, take for instance the story of the children of Lyre, who were converted into swans by their stepmother, and lived in that form on Loch Derbreach, in Westmeath, for three hundred years. And twice as long on the open sea, until their destiny closed with the advent of a ST. Patrick and the first ringing of a Christian bell in Aaron.165. The next legend was kindly communicated to me by Mr. Wynne. Davies already mentioned at p. 147 above, he found it in Cyphale year Elwood 166, the friend of the hearth, where it is stated that it belonged to David Jones' storehouse of curiosities, a collection which does not seem to have ever assumed the form of a printed book. David Jones, of Trefry, in the Conway Valley, was a publisher and poet who wrote between 1750 and 1780. This is his story, in 1735 one had a conversation with a man concerning Tejid Lake. He had heard from old people that near the middle of it there was a well opposite Langour, and the well was called Tfinan Jaiwar, Cowers Well, and at that time the town was round about the well. It was obligatory to place a lid on the well every night. It seems that in those days somebody was aware that unless this was done it would prove the destruction of the town. But one night it was forgotten, and by the morning, behold the town had subsided and the lake became three miles long and one mile wide. They say, moreover, 
that on clear days some people see the chimneys of the houses. It is since then that the town was built at the lower end of the lake. It is called Waibala 167, and the man told me that he had talked with an old Bala man who had, when he was a youth, had two days mowing of hay 168 between the road and the lake. But by this time the lake had spread over that land and the road also, which necessitated the purchase of land further away for the road. And some say that the town will yet sink as far as the place called Eleven Anfer, others call it Landfocht, Drown Church, or Landfor, Great Church, in Penton. Further, when the weather is stormy water appears oozing through every floor within Bala, and at other times anybody can get water enough for the use of his house, provided he dig a little into the floor of it. 13. In reference to the idea that the town is to sink, together with the neighboring village of Lanfer, the writer quotes in a note the couplet known still to everybody in the neighborhood as follows. Why Bala ADH, Ar Bala AIFF. Bala old the lake has had, and Bala new. A Lanfer AIFF YN Lin. The lake will have, and Lanfer too. This probably implies that old Bala is beneath the lake and that the present Bala is to meet the like fate at some time to come. This kind of prophecy is not very uncommon, thus there has been one current as to the Montgomeryshire town of Pool, called, in Welsh, Traftwing Retratwing, and in English, Welshpool, to distinguish it from the English town of Pool. As to Welshpool, a very deep water called Llyn Du, lying between the town and the Castell Cock or Powys Castle, and right in the domain of the castle, is suddenly to spread itself, and one fine market day to engulf the whole place 169. Further, when I was a boy in North Cardiganshire, the following couplet was quite familiar to me, and supposed to have been one of Merlin's prophecies. Care Ferdin, C.E.I. Ower 4. Carmarthen, a cold morn awaits thee. Dear A.T.H.H.W.N.C., D.W.R. If lo. Earth gapes, and water in thy place will be. In regard to the earlier half of the line, concerning Balagon, the story of Finn and Jaiwar might be said to explain it, but there is another which is later and far better known. It is of the same kind as the stories. For the next legend belonging here I have to thank the Reverend J. Fisher, a native of the parish of Landabai, who, in spite of his name, is a genuine Welshman, and what is more a Welsh scholar. The following are his words, dash llyn lech owen, the last word is locally sounded W-N, like O-O-N in English, as is also the personal name Owen, is on M-Y-N-Y-D-D Mar, in the ecclesiastical parish of Gors Dis, and the civil parish of Lanarthney. Kamathinsha. It is a small lake, forming the source of the Gwendraith Four. I have heard the tradition about its origin told by several persons, and by all, until quite recently, pretty much in the same form. In 1884. I took it down from my grandfather, Rees Thomas, born in 1809, d. 1892, of Sill Call Landaby a very intelligent man, with a good fund of Old World Welsh lore who had lived all his life in the neighbouring parishes of Landilo IV and Landaby. The following is the version of the story, translated, as I had it from him, there was once a man of the name of Owen living on Mynyd Mar, and he had a well, Finnan. Over this well he kept a large flag, Flagin new tech for, flagin, is the word in common use now in these parts for a large flat stone. Which he was always careful to replace over its mouth after he had satisfied himself or his beast with water. It happened, however, that one day he went on horseback to the well to water his horse, and forgot to put the flag back in its place. He rode off leisurely in the direction of his home. But, after he had gone some distance, he casually looked back and, to his great astonishment, he saw that the burst out and was overflowing the whole place. He suddenly bethought him that he should ride back and encompass the overflow of the water as fast as he could, and it was the horse's track in galloping round the water that put a stop to its further overflow. It is fully believed that, had he not galloped round the flood in the way he did, the well would have been sure to inundate the whole district and drown all. Hence the lake was called the Lake of Owen's Flag, Llyn Lech Owen. I have always felt interested in this story, as it resembled that about the formation of Loch Nee, and, and, happening to meet the Reverend D. Harwood Hughes, B.A., 
the Vicar of Gore's Loss, St. Lyons, last August, 1892, I asked him to tell me the legend as he had heard it in his parish. He said that he had been told it, but in a form different from mine, where the Owen was said to have been Owen Glyndwr. This is the substance of the legend as he had heard it, Owen Glyndwr, when once passing through these parts, arrived here of an evening. He came across a well, and, having watered his horse, placed a stone over it in order to find it again next morning. He then went to lodge for the night at Ditgoad Farm, close by. In the morning, before proceeding on his journey, he took his horse to the well to give him water, but found to his surprise that the well had become a lake. 14. Mr. Fisher goes on to mention the later history of the lake, how, some eighty years ago, its banks were the resort on Sunday afternoons of the young people of the neighborhood. And how a Baptist preacher put an end to their amusements and various kinds of games by preaching at them. However, the lakeside appears to be still a favorite spot for picnics and Sunday school gatherings. Mr. Fisher was quite right in appending to his own version that of his friend. But, from the point of view of folklore, I must confess that I can make nothing of the latter, it differs from the older one as much as chalk does from cheese. It would be naturally gratifying to the pride of local topography to be able to connect with the pool the name of Owen G. L. N. D. W. R. But it is worthy of note that this highly respectable attempt to rationalize the legend wholly fails, as it does not explain why there is now a lake where there was once but a well. In other words, the euhemerized story is itself evidence corroborative of Mr. Fisher's older version, which is furthermore kept in countenance by Howell's account, p. io4, where we are told who the Owen in question was, namely, Owen Logok, a personage dear, as we shall see later, to the Welsh legend of the district. He and his men had their abode in a cave on the northern side of Mynyd Mar, and while their Owen used, we are informed, to water his steed at a fine spring covered with a large stone, which it required the strength of a giant to lift. But one day he forgot to replace it, and when he next sought the well he found the lake. He returned to his cave and told his men what had happened. Thereupon both he and they fell into a sleep, which is to last till it is broken by the sound of a trumpet and the clang of arms on Rai Gotch then they are to sally forth to conquer. Now the story is told by how Sand Fisher provokes comparison, as the latter suggests, with the Irish legend of the formation of Loch Ree and of Loch Nee in the story of the death of Eacade McMerida 170. In both of these legends also there is a horse, a kind of water horse, who forms the well which eventually overflows and becomes Loch Ree, and so with the still larger body of water known as Loch Nee. In the latter case the fairy well was placed in the charge of a woman, but she one day left the cover of the well open, and the catastrophe took place the water issued forth and overflowed the country. One of Eacade's daughters, named Liban, however, was not drowned, but only changed into a salmon as already mentioned at page 376 above. In my Arthurian legend, p. 361, I have attempted to show that the name Liban may have its Welsh equivalent in that of Lion, occurring in the name of Llyn Lion, or Lawns Lake, the bursting of which is described in the latest series of triads, 3. 13, 97, as causing a sort of deluge. I am not certain as to the nature of the relationship between those names, but it seems evident that the stories have a common substratum, though it is to be noticed that no well, fairy or otherwise, figures in the Llyn legend. Which makes the presence of the monster called the Afak the cause of the waters bursting forth. So who the mighty, with his team of famous oxen, is made to drag the Afank out of the lake? There is, however, another Welsh legend concerning a great overflow in which a well does figure, I allude to that of Cantor Arguelid, or the Bottom Hundred, a fine spacious country supposed to be submerged in Cardigan Bay. Modern euhumorism treats it as defended by embankments and sluices, which, we are told, were in the charge of the prince of the country, named Sethenin, who, being one day in his cups, forgot to shut the sluices. And thus brought about the inundation, which was the end of his fertile realm. This, however, is not the old legend, that speaks of a well, and lays the blame on a woman a pretty sure sign of antiquity, as the reader may judge from other old stories which will readily occur to him.
The Welsh legend to which I allude is embodied in a short poem in the Black Book of Carmarthen 171, it consists of eight triplets, to which is added a triplet from the Inglinion of the Graves. The following is the original with a tentative translation. Sighton hin sawed Allen. A.C. Edich word Varanris more. Mays gitnev ridos. Bode eman fade y morven. Iheligout gaidi kvin. Finon wenestir 172 twer turuin. Bud amendenrid. Y vaktith. A.E. galigout gaidi gale. Finon wenestir more diff fith. Dias bad verid dot y ar van care. Hid ar do dot y doter. Nod guide utraha at ngrahir. Dias bad merid dot y ar van care hediv. Hid ar do dot y dataluk. Nod guide utraha atragach. Dias bad merivid and gorchuit hino. AC nimhot gorlut. Nod guide utraha trankit. Dias bad merid y ar gwine of kadir. Hidal dov ae garev. Nod guide gormet isev. See the nin, stand thou forth. And see the vanguard of the main. Gwidno's plain has it covered. Accursed be the maiden. Who let it loose after supping? Well, cup bearer of the mighty main. Accursed be the damsel. Who let it loose after battle? Well, minister of the high sea. Merrid's cry from a city's height. Even to God is it directed. After pride comes a long pause. Merrid's cry from a city's height today. Even to God her expiation. After pride comes reflection. Merrid's cry overcomes me tonight. Nor can I readily prosper. After pride comes a fall. Merrid's cry over strong wines. Bounteous God has wrought it. After excess comes privation. Dias bad ntrerid dot and kim hel hino. Why earth yuistel? Nod guidi traha trange pel. Bet seethen hin sinhuer van. Rug kair kenadur a glan. More moridic a kinran. Merrid's cry drives me tonight. From my chamber away. After insolence comes long death. Weak witted Seathenin's grave is it. Between Kenadur's fort and the shore. With majestic moors and kinrins. The names in these lines present great difficulties. First comes that of Mirrid, which is no other word than Margarita, a pearl, borrowed, but what does it here mean? Margarita, besides meaning a pearl, was used in Welsh, e.g. Under the form Merarita 173, as the proper name written in English Margaret. That is probably how it is to be taken here, namely, as the name given to the negligent guardian of the fairy well. It cannot very well be, however, the name belonging to the original form of the legend, and we have the somewhat parallel case of Finn and Grassy, or Grace as well, but what old Celtic name that of Mirid has replaced in the story, I cannot say. In the next place, nobody has been able to identify Care Kenator, and I have nothing to say as to more Moritic, except that a person of that name is mentioned in another of the Inglinion of the Graves. It runs thus in the Black Book, Fall. 33 and. Bet more Moritic dies sick unben. Post Kinhan Hintiak. Mab Periter Penwetic. The Grave of More the Grand. Prince. Pillar of the, Conflict. Son of Periter of Penwetic. The last name in the final triplet of the poem which I have attempted to translate is Kinran, which is otherwise unknown as a Welsh name. But I am inclined to identify it with that of one of the three who escaped the catastrophe in the Irish legend. The name there is Kernan, which was borne by the idiot of the family, who, like many later idiots, was at the same time a prophet. For he is represented as always prophesying that the waters were going to burst forth, and as advising his friends to prepare boats. So he may be set, after a fashion, over against our Seathenhin Sinhuer van, s, of the feeble mind. But one might perhaps ask why I do not point out an equivalent in Irish for the Welsh Seathenin, as his name is now pronounced. The fact is that no such equivalent occurs in the Irish story in question, nor exactly, so far as I know, in any other. That is what I wrote when penning these notes.
but it has occurred to me since then, that there is an Irish name, an important Irish name, which looks as if related to Sethenhin, and that is Satanta Beg, the little Satanchin, the first name of the Irish hero Cuchulain. The NT, I may point out, makes one suspect that Satanta is a name of Brythonic origin in Irish, and I have been in the habit of associating it with that of the people of the Satanchii 174, placed by Ptolemy on the coast of what is now Lancashire. Whether any legend has ever been current about a country submerged on the coast of Lancashire I cannot say, but the soundings would make such a legend quite comprehensible. I remember, however, reading somewhere as to the plain of Murathem, of which CF1 Chulain, our Satanta Beg, had special charge, that it was so called because it had once been submarine and become since the converse, so to say, of Sethenin's country. The latter is beneath Cardigan Bay, while the other fringed the opposite side of the sea, consisting as it did of the level portion of County Louth. On the whole, I am not altogether indisposed to believe that we have here traces of an ancient legend of a wider scope than is represented by the Black Book triplets, which I have essayed to translate. I think that I am right in recognizing that legend in the Mabinogi of Branwen, daughter of Llyr. There we read that, when Bran and his men crossed from Wales to Ireland, the intervening sea consisted merely of two navigable rivers, called Lee and Urchun. The storyteller adds words to the effect, that it is only since then the sea has multiplied its realms 175 between Ireland and Wynysy Kedern, or the Isle of the Kiri, a name which has already been discussed, see pages 279 to 83. These are not all the questions which such stories suggest, for Sethenin is represented in later Welsh literature as the son of one Sethen, associated with Dyft, and the name Sethen leads off to the coast of Brittany. For I learn from a paper by the late M. Le Men, in the Review Archaeologique for 1872 23. 52 that the Isle de Seine is called in Breton in as son, in which son is a dialectic shortening of Sison, which is also met with as Sidehun. That being so, one would seem to be right in regarding Sison as nearly related to our Sethan. That is not all the tradition reminds one of the Welsh legend, M. Lumen refers to the Vie du P. Mounoir by Boschet, Paris, 1697, p. 126, and adds that, in his own time, the road ending on the Point du Raz opposite the Isle de Seine passed Pour Etri Ancient Chemin que conduisait à la ville d'Is, Cairais, la ville de la Partie Basse. Dot. It is my own experience that nobody can go about much in Brittany without hearing over and over again about the submerged city of Is. There is no doubt that we have in these names distant echoes of an inundation story, once widely current in both Britons and perhaps also in Ireland. With regard to Wales we have an indication to that effect in the fact, that Gwydno, to whom the inundated region is treated as having belonged, is associated not only with Cardigan Bay, but also with the coast of North Wales. Especially the part of it situated between Bangor and Landudno 176. Adjoining it is supposed to lie submerged a once fertile district called Tyno Helic, a legend about which will come under notice later. This brings the inundation story nearer to the coast where Ptolemy in the 2nd century located the harbour of the Satantal, about the mouth of the river Ribble. And in their name we seem to have some sort of a historical basis for that of the drunken Selthenin 177. I cannot close these remarks better than by appending what Professor Boyd Dawkins has recently said with regard to the sea between Britain and Ireland. It may be interesting to remark further that during the time of the Iberian Dominion in Wales, the geography of the seaboard was different to what it is now. A forest, containing the remains of their domestic oxen that had run wild, and of the indigenous wild animals such as the bear and the red deer, united Anglesey with the mainland, and occupied the shallows of Cardigan Bay. Known in legend as, the Lost Lands of Wales. It extended southwards from the present sea margin across the estuary of the Severn, to Somerset, Devon, and Cornwall. It passed northwards across the Irish Sea off the coast of Cheshire and Lancashire, and occupied Morecambe Bay with a dense growth of oak, scotch fir, alder, birch, and hazel. It ranged seawards beyond the Ten Fathom Line, and is to be found on most shores beneath the sandbanks and mud banks, as for example at Rill and Cardiff. 
In Cardigan Bay it excited the wonder of Geraldus de Bari. 178. To return to Fairy Wells, I have to confess that I cannot decide what may be precisely the meaning of the notion of a well with a woman set carefully to see that the door or cover of the well is kept shut. It will occur, however, to everybody to compare the well which Undine wished to have kept shut, on account of its affording a ready access from her subterranean country to the residence of her refractory knight in his castle above ground. And in the case of the Glassfern Lake, the walling and cover that were to keep the spring from overflowing were, according to the story, not watertight, seeing that there were holes made in one of the stones. This suggests the idea that the cover was to prevent the passage of some such full-grown fairies as those with which legend seems to have once peopled all the pools and tarns of Wales. But, in the next place, is the maiden in Char Ogre of the Well to be regarded as priestess of the well? The idea of a priesthood in connection with wells in Wales is not wholly unknown. I wish, however, before discussing these instances, to call attention to one or two Irish ones which point in another direction. Foremost may be mentioned the source of the River Boyne, which is now called Trinity Well, situated in the barony of Carberry, in County Kildare. The following is the Ren den and Denkas concerning it, as translated by Dr. Stokes, in the Review Ktik, 15. 315-6, Boned, wife of Nectad and son of Labraid, went to the secret well which was in the green of Sid Nectin. Whoever went to it would not come from it without his two eyes bursting, unless it were Nectin himself and his three cupbearers, whose names were Flesk and LDM and Luam. Once upon a time 136 and went through pride to test the well's power, and declared that it had no secret force which could shatter her form, and thrice she walked with her shins round the well. Whereupon, three waves from the well break over her and deprive her of a thigh. Wounded her thigh, and one of her hands and one of her eyes. Then she, fleeing her shame, turned seaward, with the water behind her as far as Boyne Mouth, where she was drowned. Dot. This is to explain why the river is called Band, Boyne. A version to the same effect in the Book of Leinster, Fall. 191a, makes the general statement that no one who gazed right into the well could avoid the instant ruin of his two eyes or otherwise escape with impunity. A similar story is related to show how the Shannon, in Irish Sinan, Sinan, or Sinand, is called after a woman of that name. It occurs in the same Wren manuscript, and the following is Stokes' translation in the Review Celtique, 15. 457, Sinand, daughter of Loden Lookerglan son of Lur out of Tyr Terngeir, land of promise, fairyland, went to Conla's well, which is under sea, to behold it. That is a well at which are the hazels and inspirations. Of wisdom, that is, the hazels of the science of poetry, and in the same hour their fruit and their blossom and their foliage break forth, and these fall on the well in the same shower, which raises on the water a royal surge of purple. Then the salmon chew the fruit, and the juice of the nuts is apparent on their purple beffies. And seven streams of wisdom spring forth and turn there again. Now Sinand went to seek the inspiration, for she wanted nothing save only wisdom. She went with the stream till she reached Lin Na Fail, the pool of the modest woman, that is Bri Ele and she went ahead on her journey, but the well left its place, and she followed it 179 to the banks of the river Tarkane, Fairback. After this it overwhelmed her, so that her back, Tar, went upwards, and when she had come to the land on this side, of the Shannon, she tasted death. Went Sinan and Lin Na Fail and Tarkane. In these stories the reader will have noticed that the foremost punishment on any intruder who looked into the forbidden well was the instant ruin of his two eyes. One naturally asks why the eyes are made the special objects of the punishment, and I am inclined to think the meaning to have originally been that the well or spring was regarded as the eye of the divinity of the water. Should this prove well founded it looks natural that the eyes, which transgressed by gazing into the eye of the divinity, should be the first objects of that divinity's vengeance. This is suggested to me by the fact that the regular Welsh word for the source of a river is Ligad, Old Welsh Licket, I, as for instance in the case of Licket Amir mentioned by Nennius, Sect, 73. Of Ligad Llychwr, the source of the Lahar River, in the hills behind Carregtsen and Castle, 
and of the weird lake in which the Rido 180 rises near the top of Plinlaminate is called Lin Ligeti Rydal, I the Lake of the Rydal's Eye. By the way, the Rydal is not wholly without its folklore, for I used to be told in my childhood, that she and the Y and the Severn sallied forth simultaneously from Plinlaman one fine morning to run a race to the sea. The result was, one was told, that the Rydal won great honor by reaching the sea three weeks before her bigger sisters. Somebody has alluded to the legend in the following lines. Terrafon Jinta Rifwit. A. R. Dwyfren Pumiamon L. W. I. D. Hafren A. G. W. I. N. H. W. F. R. Y. D. E. I. Gwed. A. R. Rydal for E. I. Hanrheided. Three rivers of yore were seen. On grey Plinlaman's breast. Severn, and Y. of pleasant mien. And Rydal rich in great renown. To return to the Irish legends, I may mention that Eugene Oakery has a good deal to say of the mysterious nuts and the salmon of knowledge. The partaking of which was synonymous with the acquisition of knowledge and wisdom, see his manners and customs of the ancient Irish, too. 142-4, he gives it as his opinion that Conla's well was situated somewhere in Lower Ormond. But the locality of this helicon, with the seven streams of wisdom circulating out of it and back again into it, is more intelligible when regarded as a matter of fairy geography. A portion of the note appended to the foregoing legend by Stokes is in point here, he traces the earliest mention of the nine hazels of wisdom, growing at the heads of the chief rivers of Ireland. To the dialogue of the two sages in the Book of Leinster, Fall. 186b, whence he cites the poet Need Macadnai saying whence he had come, as follows, a Caleb I, a Noi Kalib na Sexa, a Caleb Didiu Asim Benader Klesa na Suad Tanaxa, from Hazels, to wit, from the nine Hazels of the Sagais. From Hazels out of which are obtained the feats of the sages, I have come. The relevancy of this passage will be seen when I add, that Sagais was one of the names of the mound in which the Boyne rises. So it may be safely inferred that B6's transgression was of the same nature as that of sin and, to wit, that of intruding on sacred ground in quest of wisdom and inspiration which was not permitted their sex, certain sources of knowledge. Certain quellen, were reserved for men alone. Before I have done with the Irish instances I must append one in the form it was told me in the summer of 1894, one was in Meath and went to see the remarkable chambered cairns on the hill known as Slyab na Kailai, the Hag's Mountain. Near Old Castle and Loch Crew. I had as my guide a young shepherd whom I picked up on the way. He knew all about the hag after whom the hill was called except her name, she was, he said, a giantess, and so she brought there, in three apronfuls, the stones forming the three principal cairns. As to the cairn on the hill point known as Belrath, that is called the chair cairn from a big stone placed there by the hag to serve as her seat when she wished to have a quiet look on the country round. But usually she was to be seen riding on a wonderful pony she had, that creature was so nimble and strong that it used to take the hag at a leap from one hilltop to another. However, the end of it all was that the hag rode so hard that the pony fell down, and that both horse and rider were killed. The hag appears to have been Kalich Bera, or Kalek Bear, the old woman of Beer, that is, Bear Haven, in County Cork 181. Now the view from the Hag's Mountain is very extensive, and I asked the shepherd to point out some places in the distance. Among other things we could see Loch Rammer, which he called the Virginia Water, and more to the west he identified Loch Sheelan, about which he had the following legend to tell, a long, long time ago there was no lake there. But only a well with a flagstone kept over it, and everybody would put the flag back after taking water out of the well. But one day a woman who fetched water from it forgot to replace the stone, and the water burst forth in pursuit of the luckless woman, fifteen, who fled as hard as she could before the angry flood. She continued until she had run about seven miles the estimated length of the lake at the present day. Now at this point a man, who was busily mowing hay in the field through which she was running, saw what was happening and mowed the woman down with his scythe, whereupon the water advanced no further. Such was the shepherd's yarn, which partly agrees with the Boyne and Shannon stories in that the woman was pursued by the water, which only stopped where she died. On the other hand, 
it resembles the LLYN Lech Owen legend and that of Loch Nee in placing to the woman's charge only the neglect to cover the well. It looks as if we had in these stories a confusion of two different institutions, one being a well of wisdom which no woman durst visit without fatal vengeance overtaking her, and the other a fairy well which was attended to by a woman who was to keep it covered, and who may, perhaps, be regarded as priestess of the spring. If we try to interpret the Cantorar Gwaelid story from these two points of view we have to note the following matters, though it is not said that the Morowin, or damsel, had a lid or cover on the well, the word Galagout or Heligot, I did let run, implies some such an idea as that of a lid or door. For opening the sluices, in the sense of the later version, seems to me out of the question. In two of the Inglinian she is cursed for the action implied, and if she was the well minister or well servant, as I take Finon Wenestir to mean, we might perhaps regard her as the priestess of that spring. On the other hand, the prevailing note in the other Inglinian is the traha, presumption, arrogance, insolence, pride, which forms the burden of four out of five of them. This would seem to point to an attitude on the part of the damsel resembling that of B6 and or Sin and when prying into the secrets of wells which were taboo to them. The seventh Inglin alludes to wines, and its burden is gourmad, too much, excess, extravagance, whereby the poet seems to lend countenance to some such a later story as that of Sethenin's intemperance. Lastly, the question of priest or priestess of a sacred well has been alluded to once or twice, and it may be perhaps illustrated on Welsh ground by the history of Finan Eilian, or St. Elian's well, which has been mentioned in another context, p. 357 above. Of that well we read as follows, S. V. Landrillo, in the third edition of Lewis Topographical Dictionary of Wales, Finn and Elian. Even in the present age, is frequently visited by the superstitious, for the purpose of invoking curses upon the heads of those who have grievously offended them, and also of supplicating prosperity to themselves. But the numbers are evidently decreasing. The ceremony is performed by the applicant standing upon a certain spot near the well, whilst the owner of it reads a few passages of the sacred scriptures, and then, taking a small quantity of water, gives it to the former to drink. And throws the residue over his head, which is repeated three times, the party continuing to mutter imprecations in whatever terms his vengeance may dictate. Rice Rees, in his Essay on the Welsh Saints, London, 1836, p. 267, speaks of St. Elian as follows, I miraculous cures were lately supposed to be performed at his shrine at Lanelian, Anglesey. And near to the church of Lanelian, Denbyshire, is a well called Finan Elian, which is thought by the peasantry of the neighborhood to be endued with miraculous powers even at present. Falks, S. V. Elian, in his Enwogen Simru, published in Liverpool in 1870, expresses the opinion that the visits of the superstitious to the well had ceased for some time. The last person supposed to have had charge of the well was a certain John Evans, but some of the most amusing stories of the shrewdness of the caretaker refer to a woman who had charge of the well before Evans' time. A series of articles on Finn and Eileen appeared in 1861 in a Welsh periodical called Why no Flid, printed by Mr. Aubrey at Manorch Y. Med, in Anglesey. The articles in question were afterwards published, I am told, as a shilling book, which I have not seen, and they dealt with the superstition, with the history of John Evans, and with his confessions and conversion. I have searched in vain for any account in Welsh of the ritual followed at the well. When Mrs. Sylvan Evans visited the place, the person in charge of the well was a woman, and Peter Roberts, in his Cambrian Popular Antiquities, published in London in 18i5, alludes to her or a predecessor of hers in the following terms, p. 246 Near the well resided some worthless and infamous wretch, who officiated as priestess. He furthermore gives one to understand that she kept a book in which she registered the name of each evil wisher for a trifling sum of money. When this had been done, a pin was dropped into the well in the name of the victim. This proceeding looks adequate from the magical point of view, though less complicated than the ritual indicated by Lewis. This latter writer calls the person who took charge of the well the owner. And I have always understood that, whether owner or not, he or she used to receive gifts, not only for placing in the well the names of men who were to be cursed, 
but also from those men for taking their names out again. So as to relieve them from the malediction. In fact, the trade in curses seems to have been a very thriving one its influence was powerful and widespread. Here there is, I think, very little doubt that the owner or guardian of the well was, so to say, the representative of an ancient priesthood of the well. That priesthood dated its origin probably many centuries before a Christian church was built near the well, and coming down to later times we have unfortunately no sufficient data to show how the knight to such priesthood was acquired. Whether by inheritance or otherwise. But we know that a woman might have charge of St. Elian's well. Let me cite another instance, which I unexpectedly discovered some years ago in the course of a ramble in quest of early inscriptions. Among other places which I visited was Landilo Wydarth, near Main Clochog, in the northern part of Pembrokeshire. This is one of the many churches bearing the name of St. Tylo in South Wales, the building is in ruins, but the churchyard is still used, and contains two of the most ancient post-Roman inscriptions in the Principality. If you ask now Forth Landilo in this district, you will be understood to be inquiring after the farmhouse of that name, close to the old church. And I learned from the landlady that her family had been there for many generations, though they have not very long been the proprietors of the land. She also told me of a tea. Tylo's well, a little above the house, she added that it was considered to have the property of curing the whooping cough. I asked if there was any rite or ceremony necessary to be performed in order to derive benefit from the water. Certainly, I was told, the water must be lifted out of the well and given to the patient to drink by some member of the family. To be more accurate, I ought to say that this must be done by somebody born in the house. Her eldest son, however, had told me previously, when I was busy with the inscriptions, that the water must be given to the patient by the air, not by anybody else. Then came my question how the water was lifted, or out of what the patient had to drink, to which I was answered that it was out of the skull. What skull, said I, St. Tylo's skull, was the answer. Where do you get the saint's skull? I asked. Here it is, was the answer, and I was given it to handle and examine. I know next to nothing about skulls. But it struck me that it was the upper portion of a thick, strong skull, and it called to my mind the story of the three churches which contended for the saint's corpse. That story will be found in the book of Land D.A.V., pp. 116-7, and according to it the contest became so keen that it had to be settled by prayer and fasting. So, in the morning, lo and behold! There were three corpses of Asti. Tylo not simply one and so like were they in features and stature that nobody could tell which were the corpses made to order and which the old one. I should have guessed that the skull which I saw belonged to the former description, as not having been much thinned by the owner's use of it. But this I am forbidden to do by the fact that, according to the legend, this particular Landilo was not one of the three contending churches which bore away in triumph a dead Tylo each. The reader, perhaps, would like to take another view, namely, that the story has been edited in such a way as to reduce a larger number of Tylos to three, in order to gratify the Welsh weakness for triads. Since my visit to the neighborhood I have been favored with an account of the well as it is now current there. My informant is Mr. Benjamin Gibby of Eleven and Goldman Mill, who writes mentioning, among other things, that the people around call the well fin in your icon, or the oxen's well, and that the family owning and occupying the farmhouse of Landilo have been there for centuries. Their name, which is Melchior, pronounced Melcher, is by no means the common one in the principality, so far as I know, but, whatever may be its history in Wales, the bearers of it are excellent Kimri. Mr. Gibby informs me that the current story solves the difficulty as to the saint's skull as follows, the saint had a favorite maid servant from the Pembrokeshire Landilo, she was a beautiful woman. And had the privilege of attending on the saint when he was on his deathbed. As his end was approaching he gave his maid a strict and solemn command that in a year's time from the day of his burial at Landilo 4, in Camothensha, she was to take his skull to the other Landilo and to leave it there to be a blessing to coming generations of men, who, when ailing, would have their health restored by drinking water out of it. 
So the belief prevailed that to drink out of the skull some of the water of Tylo's well ensured health, especially against the whooping cough. The faith of some of those who used to visit the well was so great in its efficacy, that they were wont to leave it, he says, with their constitutions wonderfully improved. And he mentions a story related to him by an old neighbor, Stephen Eiffen, who has been dead for some years, to the effect that a carriage, drawn by four horses, came once, more than half a century ago, to Landello. It was full of invalids coming from Penclaw, L., in Gower, Glamorganshire, to try the water of the well. They returned, however, no better than they came, for though they had drunk of the well, they had neglected to do so out of the skull. This was afterwards pointed out to them by somebody, and they resolved to make the long journey to the well again. This time they did the right thing, we are told, and departed in excellent health. Such are the contents of Mr. Gibby's Welsh letter. And I would now only point out that we have here an instance of a well which was probably sacred before the time of Asti. Tylo, in fact, one would possibly be right in supposing that the sanctity of the well and its immediate surroundings was one of the causes why the site was chosen by a Christian missionary. But consider for a moment what has happened, the well paganism has annexed the saint, and established a belief ascribing to him the skull used in the well ritual. The landlady and her family, it is true, neither believe in the efficacy of the well, nor take gifts from those who visit the well. But they continue, out of kindness, as they put it, to hand the skull full of water to anyone who perseveres in believing in it. In other words, the faith in the well continues in a measure intact, while the walls of the church have long fallen into utter decay. Such is the great persistence of some primitive beliefs. And in this particular instance we have a succession which seems to point unmistakably to an ancient priesthood of a sacred spring. End of Volume 1 Volume 2 Chapter 7 Triumphs of the Water World Under legends les plus repandus en Britannia est cel d'une pretende ville DLS, que, a un époque inconnu, orate te inglaudi par la mer. On monter, a divers endroits de, a coat, elen placement de set site fabuleuse, e les pitches vu en font d'étranges recits. Les jours de tempete, assurant ILS, on void, Don les cur de vagues, lo summit de fleches de ses egelses. Les jures de com, on enten moiter de iabum ie sun de ses cloches, modulant el him du jour, renal. More than once in the last chapter was the subject of submersions and cataclysms brought before the reader, and it may be convenient to enumerate here the most remarkable cases, and to add one or two to their number as well as to dwell at somewhat greater length on some instances which may be said to have found their way into Welsh literature. He has already been told of the outburst of the Glasfern Lake and Finnan Jywer, of Llyn Lech Owen and the Crymlyn, also of the drowning of Cantor Arguelet. Not to mention that one of my informants had something to say of the submergence of Caer Arianrod, a rock now visible only at low water between Selenmog 4 and Dinas Dintel, on the coast of Arfon. Rut, to put it briefly, it is an ancient belief in the principality that its lakes generally have swallowed up habitations of men, as in the case of Llyn and Sefactan, page 73, and the Pool of Corian, page 57. To these I now proceed to add other instances, to wit those of Bala Lake, Kenfig Pool Lunkless, and Helig of Glanog's territory including Traithlafan. Perhaps it is best to begin with historical events, namely those implied in the encroachment of the sea in the sand on the coast of Glamorganshire, from the Mumbles, in Gower, to the mouth of the Ogmore, below Bridgend. It is believed that formerly the shores of Swansea Bay were from three to five miles further out than the present strand, and the oyster dredgers point to that part of the bay which they call the Green Grounds, while trawlers, hovering over these sunken meadows of the Grove Island, declare that they can sometimes see the foundations of the ancient homesteads overwhelmed by a terrific storm which raged some three centuries ago. The old people sometimes talk of an extensive forest called Coed Arian, Silver Wood, stretching from the foreshore of the Mumbles to Kenfig Burrows, and there is a tradition of a long-lost bridal path used by many generations of Mansells, Mowbrays, and Talbots, from Penrice Castle to Margam Abbey. 
All this is said to be corroborated by the fishing up every now and then in Swansea Bay of stag's antlers, elk's horns, those of the wild ox, and wild boar's tusks, together with the remains of other ancient tenants of the submerged forest. Various references in the registers of Swansea and Aberavon mark successive stages in the advance of the desolation from the latter part of the 15th century down. Among others a great sandstorm is mentioned, which overwhelmed the borough of Sinfig or Kenfig. And encroached on the coast generally, the series of catastrophes seems to have culminated in an inundation caused by a terrible tidal wave in the early part of the year 1607. 182. To return to Kenfig, what remains of that old town is near the sea, and it is on all sides surrounded by hillocks of finely powdered sand and flanked by ridges of the same fringing the coast. The ruins of several old buildings half buried in the sand peep out of the ground, and in the immediate neighborhood is Kenfig Pool, which is said to have a circumference of nearly two miles. When the pool formed itself I have not been able to discover, from such accounts as have come in my way I should gather that it is older than the growing spread of the sand, but the island now to be seen in it is artificial and of modem make 183. The story relating to the lake is given as follows in the volume of the Iolo manuscripts, p. 194, and the original, from which I translate, is crisp, compressed, and, as I fancy, in Iolo's own words. A plebeian was in love with Earl Clare's daughter, she would not have him as he was not wealthy. He took to the highway, and watched the agent of the Lord of the Dominion coming towards the castle from collecting his lord's money. He killed him, took the money, and produced the coin, and the lady married him. A splendid banquet was held, the best men of the country were invited, and they made as merry as possible. On the second night the marriage was consummated, and when happiest one heard a voice, all ear one listened and caught the words, Vengeance comes, vengeance comes, vengeance comes, three times. One asked, When? In the ninth generation, J.C.H., said the voice. No reason for us to fear, said the married pair, we shall be under the mold long before. They lived on, however, and a Gorsjinid that is to say, a descendant of the sixth direct generation, was born to them, also to the murdered man a Gorsjinid, who, seeing that the time fixed was come, visited Kenfig. This was a discreet youth of gentle manners, and he looked at the city and its splendor, and noted that nobody owned a furrow or a chamber there except the offspring of the murderer, he and his wife were still living. At Cockcrow he heard a cry, Vengeance is, come, is come, is come. It is asked, on whom, and answered, on him who murdered my father of the ninth ACH. He rises in terror, he goes towards the city. But there is nothing to see save a large lake with three chimney tops above the surface emitting smoke that formed a stinking. 184 On the face of the waters the gloves of the murdered man float to the young man's feet, he picks them up, and sees on them the murdered man's name and arms. And he hears at dawn of day the sound of praise to God rendered by myriads joining in heavenly music. And so the story ends. On this coast is another piece of water in point, namely Crwmlyn, or Crumlin Pool, now locally called the Bog. It appears also to have been sometimes called Pwll Sinan, after the name of a son of Rhys of Teuter, who, in his flight after his father's defeat on Herwin Regan, was drowned in its waters 185. It lies on Lord Jersey's estate, at a distance of about one mile east of the mouth of the Taw, and about a quarter of a mile from high water mark, from which it is separated by a strip of ground known in the neighborhood as Crwmlyn Burrows. The name Crwmlyn means Crooked Lake, which, I am told, describes the shape of this piece of water. When the bog becomes a pool it encloses an island consisting of a little rocky hillock showing no trace of piles, or walling, or any other handiwork of man 186. The story about this pool also is that it covers a town buried beneath its waters. Mr. Wirt Sykes' reference to it has already been mentioned, and I have it on the evidence of a native of the immediate neighborhood, that he has often heard his father and grandfather talk about the submerged town. Add to this that Cadrod, to whom I have had already, pp. 23, 376, to acknowledge my indebtedness, speaks in the columns of the South Wales Diby News for February 15, 
1899, of Crwmlyn as follows. It was said by the old people that on the site of this bog once stood the old town of Swansea. And that in clear and calm weather the chimneys and even the church steeple could be seen at the bottom of the lake, and in the loneliness of the night the bells were often heard ringing in the lake. It was also said that should any person happen to stand with his face towards the lake when the wind is blowing across the lake, and if any of the spray of that water should touch his clothes, it would be only with the greatest difficulty he could save himself from being attracted or sucked into the water. The lake was at one time much larger than at present. The efforts made to drain it have drawn a good deal of the water from it, but only to convert it into a bog, which no one can venture to cross except in exceptionally dry seasons or hard frost. On this I wish to remark in passing, that, while common sense would lead one to suppose that the wind blowing across the water would help the man facing it to get away whenever he chose, the reasoning here is of another order. One characteristic in fact of the ways and means of sympathetic magic. For specimens in point the reader may be conveniently referred above, where he may compare the words quoted from Mr. Hartland, especially as to the use there mentioned of stones or pellets thrown from one's hands. In the case of Crymlyn, the wind blowing off the face of the water into the onlooker's face and carrying with it some of the water in the form of spray which wets his clothes, howsoever little, was evidently regarded as establishing a link of connection between him and the body of the water or shall I say rather, between him and the divinity of the water. And that this link was believed to be so strong that it required the man's utmost effort to break it and escape being drawn in and drowned like sinon. The statement, supremely silly as it reads, is no modern invention. For one finds that Nennius or somebody else reasoned in precisely the same way, except that for a single onlooker he substitutes a whole army of men and horses, and that he points the antithesis by distinctly stating that if they kept their backs turned to the fascinating flood they would be out of danger. The conditions which he had in view were, doubtless, that the men should face the water and have their clothing more or less wetted by the spray from it. The passage, section 69, to which I refer is in the Mirabilia, and Geoffrey of Monmouth is found to repeat it in a somewhat better style of Latin, 9. 7 The following is the Nennian version. Aeliad miraculum est, Idest oper lin liguan. Ostium fluminus ilius in Sabrina et quando Sabrina inundator ad sis sam. Et mer inundator similiter in ostio supra dicti fluminus et in stagno ostii recipitur in modum voraginis et mer non vadit sesum et est litus juxta flumen et quam diu Sabrina inundator ad sis sam. Istid litus non tegitur et quando recedit mer et Sabrina. Tunc stagnum leoan eructat omni quat devoravit de mari et litus istit tegifer et in star montis in una unda ericlat et rumpit. Et si furit exercitus totius regionis, in qua est, et directorit facium contra undam, et exercitum trahit unda per vim humor repletus bestibus et equi similiter trahunter. See autumn exercitus turga versus furit contra im dash, non noset ei unda. There is another wonder, to wit Aber Llyn Lewin. The water from the mouth of that river flows into the Severn, and when the Severn is in flood up to its banks, and when the sea is also in flood at the mouth of the above-named river and is sucked in like a whirlpool into the pool of the Aber. The sea does not go on rising, it leaves a margin of beach by the side of the river, and all the time the Severn is in flood up to its bank, that beach is not covered. And when the sea and the Severn ebb, then Eilin Eiliwan brings up all it had swallowed from the sea, and that beach is covered while Eilin Eiliwan discharges its contents in one mountain-like wave and vomits forth. Now if the army of the whole district in which this wonder is, were to be present with the men facing the wave, the force of it would, once their clothes are drenched by the spray, draw them in, and their horses would likewise be drawn. But if the men should have their backs turned towards the water, the wave would not harm them. 187. One story about the formation of Bala Lake, or Llyn Tejid 188 as it is called in Welsh, has already been given, here is another which I translate from a version in Hugh Humphrey's Llyfr Gwybadith Jifredinol, Carnarvon, 2nd Series, Volume. I, Number 2, P, I. I may premise that the contributor, whose name is not given, 
betrays a sort of literary ambition which has led him to relate the story in a confused fashion. And among other things he uses the word ediferch, repentance, throughout, instead of dial, vengeance. With that correction it runs somewhat as follows, tradition relates that Bala Lake is but the watery tomb of the palaces of iniquity. And that some old boatman can on quiet moonlight nights in harvest sea towers in ruins at the bottom of its waters, and also hear at times a feeble voice saying, Dial a da, dial a ta, vengeance will come. And another voice inquiring, Pa bride why da, when will it come? Then the first voice answers, Why n why dryed genhedleth, in the third generation. Those voices were but a recollection over oblivion, for in one of those palaces lived in days of your an oppressive AUD cruel prince, corresponding to the well-known description of one of whom it is said, whom he would he slew. And whom he would he kept alive. The oppression and cruelty practiced by him on the poor farmers were notorious far and near. This prince, while enjoying the morning breezes of summer in his garden, used frequently to hear a voice saying, Vengeance will come. But he always laughed the threat away with reckless contempt. One night a poor harper from the neighboring hills was ordered to come to the prince's palace. On his way the harper was told that there was great rejoicing at the palace at the birth of the first child of the prince's son. When he had reached the palace the harper was astonished at the number of the guests, including among them noble lords, princes, and princesses, never before had he seen such splendor at any feast. When he had begun playing the gentlemen and ladies dancing presented a superb appearance. So the mirth and wine abounded, nor did he love playing for them any more than they loved dancing to the music of his harp. But about midnight, when there was an interval in the dancing, and the old harper had been left alone in a comer, he suddenly heard a voice singing in a sort of a whisper in his ear, Vengeance, vengeance. He turned at once, and saw a little bird hovering above him and beckoning him, as it were, to follow him. He followed the bird as fast as he could, but after getting outside the palace he began to hesitate. But the bird continued to invite him on, and to sing in a plaintive and mournful voice the word I vengeance, vengeance. The old harper was afraid of refusing to follow, and so they went on over bogs and through thickets, whilst the bird was all the time hovering in front of him and leading him along the easiest and safest paths. But if he stopped for a moment the same mournful note of vengeance, vengeance, would be sung to him in a more and more plaintive and heartbreaking fashion. They had by this time reached the top of the hill, a considerable distance from the palace. As the old harper felt rather fatigued and weary, he ventured once more to stop and rest, but he heard the bird's warning voice no more. Hellasand, but he heard nothing save the murmuring of the little burn hard by. He now began to think how foolish he had been to allow himself to be led away from the feast at the palace, he turned back in order to be there in time for the next dance. As he wandered on the hill he lost his way, and found himself forced to await the break of day. In the morning, as he turned his eyes in the direction of the palace, he could see no trace of it, the whole tract below was one calm, large lake, with his harp floating on the face of the waters. Next comes the story of Lunkless Pool in the neighborhood of Zero Swestry. That piece of water is said to be of extraordinary depth, and its name means that a swallowed court. The village of Lunkless is called after it, and the legend concerning the pool is preserved in verses printed among the compositions of the local poet, John F. M. Davaston, who published his works in 1825. The first stanza runs thus. Clerk Willen he sat at King Alaric's board. And a cunning clerk was he. For he'd lived in the land of Oxenford. With the sons of Graham Marie. How much exactly of the poem comes from Devastin's own muse, and how much comes from the legend, I cannot tell. Take for instance the king's name, this I should say is not derived from the story. But as to the name of the clerk, that possibly is, for the poet bases it on Crow's Willen, the Welsh form of which has been given me as Crow's Wylan, that is Wylan's cross, the name of the base of what is supposed to have been an old cross. A little way out of Oswestry on the north side. And I have been told that there is a farm in the same neighborhood called Trey Wylan, Wylan Stead. To return to the legend, Alaric's queen was endowed with youth and beauty, but the king was not happy. 
And when he had lived with her nine years he told Clerk Willen how he first met her when he was hunting, Fair Blodwell's rocks among. He married her on the condition that she should be allowed to leave him one night in every seven, and this she did without his once knowing whither she went on the night of her absence. Clerk Willen promised to restore peace to the king if he would resign the queen to him, and a tithe annually of his cattle and of the wine in his cellar to him and the monks of the White Minster. The king consented, and the wily clerk hurried away with his book late at night to the rocks by the giant's grave, where there was an ogo or cave which was supposed to lead down to fairy. While the queen was inside the cave, he began his spells and made it irrevocable that she should be his, and that his fare should be what fed on the king's meadow and what flowed in his cellar. When the clerk's potent spells forced the queen to meet him to consummate his bargain with the king, what should he behold but a grim ogress, who told him that their spells had clashed. She explained to him how she had been the king's wife for thirty years, and how the king began to be tired of her wrinkles and old age. Then, on condition of returning to the Ogo to be an ogress one night in seven, she was given youth and beauty again, with which she attracted the king anew. In fact, she had promised him happiness. Till within his hall the flag reads tall. And the long green rushes grow. The ogress continued in words which made the clerk see how completely he had been caught in his own net. Then take thy bride to thy cloistered bed. As by oath and spell decreed. And not be thy fare but the pike and the dare. And the water in which they feed. The clerk had succeeded in restoring peace at the king's banqueting board, but it was the peace of the dead. For down went the king, and his palace and all. And the waters now o'er it flow. And already in his hall do the flag reeds tall. And the long green rushes grow. But the visitor will, Davastin says. Find Willen's peace relieved by the stories which the villagers have to tell of that wily clerk, of Crow's Willen, and of, the cave called the Grim Ogo. Not to mention that when the lake is clear, they will show you the towers of the palace below, the Lunkless, which the Brithen of ages gone by believed to be there. We now come to a different story about this pool, namely, one which has been preserved in Latin by the historian Humphrey Lloyd, or Humphrey Llwyd, to the following effect. After the description of Gwynd, let us now come to Powys. The second Kingdom of Wales, which in the time of German Altisiodorensis, St. Germanus of Oser, which preached sometime there, against Pelagius heresy, was of power, as is gathered out of his life. The kinj whereof, as is there read, because he refused to hear that good man, by the secret and terrible iagement of God, with his palace, and all his household, was swallowed vp into the bowels of the earth, in that place, whereas. Not far away from zero swastry, is now a standing water, of an known depth, called Lunkley's, that is to say, the during of the palace. And there are many churches found in the same province, dedicated to the name of German.189. I have not succeeded in finding the story in any of the lives of St. Germanus, but Nennius, section 32, mentions a certain Bunley, whom he describes as Rex Iniquis et Tyrannus Vald, who, after refusing to admit St. Germanus and his following into his city, was destroyed with all his courtiers, not by water, however, but by fire from heaven. But the name Bunley, in modem Welsh spelling Benley 190, points to the Mol Famau range of mountains, one of which is known as Mol Fenitei, between Rithen and Mold, rather than to any place near Oswestry. In any case there is no reason to suppose that this story with its Christian and ethical motive is anything like so old as the substratum of Devastin's verses. The only version known to me in the Welsh language of the Lunkless legend is to be found printed in the Brithen for 1863, p. 338, and it may be summarized as follows, the Ilinkley's family were notorious for their riotous living, and at their feasts a voice used to be heard proclaiming, Vengeance is coming, coming, but nobody took it much to heart. However, one day a reckless maid asked the voice, I when. The prompt reply was to the effect that it was in the sixth generation, the voice was heard no more. So one night, when the sixth heir in descent from the time of the warning last heard was giving a great drinking feast, and music had been vigorously contributing to the entertainment of host and guest, the harper went outside for a breath of air. 
but when he turned to come back, lo and behold! The whole court had disappeared. Its place was occupied by a quiet piece of water, on whose waves he saw his harp floating, nothing more. Here must, lastly, be added one more legend of submergence, namely, that supposed to have taken place some time or other on the north coast of Carnarvonshire. In the Brython for 1863 pp. 393-4, we have what purports to be a quotation from Owen Jones' A Birkenwee A. I. Chifinio, Conway, and its environs, a work which Y. have not been able to find. Here one reads of a tract of country supposed to have once extended from the Gogarth 191, the Great Orn, to Bangor, and from Lanfair Fession to Wyanwaya Serial, Priesthome or Puffin Island. And of its belonging to a wicked prince named Helig of Glanock or Glanog. 192, from whom it was called Tino Helig, Helig's Hollow. Tradition, the writer says, fixes the spot where the court stood about halfway between Penmean Mar and Pen Y. Gogarth, the Great Orm's Head, over against Trwyn Year Wilfa. And the story relates that here a calamity had been foretold four generations before it came, namely as the vengeance of heaven on Helig of Glanog for his nefarious impiety. As that ancient prince rode through his fertile heritage one day at the approach of night, he heard the voice of an invisible follower warning him that, vengeance is coming, coming. The wicked old prince once asked excitedly, when? The answer was, in the time of thy grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and their children. Peradventure Helig calmed himself with the thought, that, if such a thing came, it would not happen in his lifetime. But on the occasion of a great feast held at the court, and when the family down to the fifth generation were present taking part in the festivities, one of the servants noticed, when visiting the mead cellar to draw more drink. That water was forcing its way in. He had only time to warn the harper of the danger he was in when all the others, in the midst of their intoxication, were overwhelmed by the flood. These inundation legends have many points of similarity among themselves, thus in those of I. Linklis, Sifadin, Llyn Tejid, and Tino Helig, though they have a ring of austerity about them, the harper is a favoured man. Who always escapes when the banquetiers are all involved in the catastrophe. The story, moreover, usually treats the submerged habitations as having sunk intact, so that the ancient spires and church towers may still at times be seen, nay the chimes of their bells may be heard by those who have ears for such music. In some cases there may have been, underlying the legend, a trace of fact such as has been indicated to me by Mr. Owen M. Edwards, of Lincoln College, in regard to Bala Lake. When the surface of that water, he says, is covered with broken ice, and a southwesterly wind is blowing, the mass of fragments is driven towards the northeastern end near the town of Bala. And he has observed that the friction produces a somewhat metallic noise which a quick imagination may convert into something like a distant ringing of bells. Perhaps the most remarkable instance remains to be mentioned, I refer to Cantor Arguelet, as the submerged country of GWIC 1 no Garanhir is termed, see above. To one portion of his fabled realm the nearest actual centers of population are Aberdovi and Borth on either side of the estuary of the Dovey. As bursar of Jesus College I had business in 1892 in the Golden Valley of Herefordshire, and I stayed a day or two at Doorstone enjoying the hospitality of the rectory, and learning interesting facts from the rector, Mr. Prosser Powell, and from Mrs. Powell in particular, as to the folklore of the parish, which is still in several respects very Welsh. Mrs. Powell, however, did not confine herself to Doorstone or the Door Valley, for she told me as follows, I was at Aberdovey in 1852, and I distinctly remember that my childish imagination was much excited by the legend of the city beneath the sea. And the bells which I was told might be heard at night. I used to lie awake trying, but in vain, to catch the echoes of the chime. I was only seven years old, and cannot remember who told me the story, though I have never forgotten it. Mrs. Powell added that she has since heard it said, that at a certain stage of the tide at the mouth of the dovey, the way in which the waves move the pebbles makes them produce a sort of jingling noise which has been fancied to be the echo of distant bells ringing. These clues appeared too good to be dropped at once, 
and the result of further inquiries led Mrs. Powell afterwards to refer me to the monthly packet for the year 1859, where I found an article headed Aberdovi Legends, and signed M. B. The initials, Mrs. Powell thought, of Miss Bramston of Winchester. The writer gives a sketch of the story of the country overflowed by the neighboring portion of Cardigan Bay, mentioning, p. 645, that once on a time there were great cities on the banks of the Dovey and the Decini. Cities with marble wharfs, she says, busy factories, and churches whose towers resounded with beautiful peals and chimes of bells. She goes on to say that, Mausna is the name of the city on the Dovey, its eastern suburb was at the sand bank now called Borth, its western stretched far out into the sea. What the name Mausna may be I have no idea, unless it is the result of some confusion with that of the great turbary behind Borth, namely Machno, or Kors Fakno, Bog of Machno. The name Borth stands for Y Borth, the harbour, which, more adequately described, was once Porth Widno, Gwidno's harbour. The writer, however, goes on with the story of the wicked prince, who left open the sluices of the seawall protecting his country and its capital, we read on as follows, but though the sea will not give back that fair city to light and air. It is keeping it as a trust but for a time, and even now sometimes, though very rarely, eyes gazing down through the green waters can see not only the fluted glistering sand dotted here and there with shells and tufts of waving seaweed, but the wide streets and costly buildings of that now silent city. Yet not always silent, for now and then will come chimes and peals of bells, sometimes near, sometimes distant, sounding low and sweet like a call to prayer, or as rejoicing for a victory. Even by day these tones arise, but more often they are heard in the long twilight evenings, or by night. English ears have sometimes heard these sounds even before they knew the tale, and fancied that they must come from some church among the hills, or on the other side of the water, but no such church is there to give the call. The sound and its connection is so pleasant, that one does not care to break the spell by seeking for the origin of the legend, as in the idler tales with which that neighborhood abounds. The dream about the wide streets and costly buildings of that now silent city seems to have its counterpart on the western coast of Erin somewhere, let us say, off the cliffs of Maher 193, in County Clare witnessed Gerald Griffin's lines. To which a passing allusion has already been made. A story I heard on the cliffs of the west. That oft, through the breakers dividing. A city is seen on the ocean's wild breast. In turreted majesty riding. But brief is the glimpse of that phantom so bright. Soon close the white waters to screen it. The allusion to the submarine chimes would make it unpardonable to pass by unnoticed the well-known Welsh air called Clichot Aberdovey, 16, the Bells of Aberdovey, which I have always suspected of taking its name from Fairy Bells 194. This popular tune is of unknown origin, and the words to which it is usually sung make the bells say un, dow, tri, bed war, fump, chwech, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I have heard a charming Welsh vocalist putting on Seth, I-7, in her rendering of the song. This is not to be wondered at, as her instincts must have rebelled against such a commonplace number as six in a song redolent of old-world sentiment. But our fairy bells ought to have stopped at five, this would seem to have been forgotten when the melody and the present words were wedded together. At any rate our story seemed to suggest that fairy counting did not go beyond the fingering of one hand. The only Welsh fairy represented counting is made to do it all by fives, she counts on, dow, try, jodwar, pum. On, dow, try, pedwar, pump, as hard as her tongue can go. For on the number of times she can repeat the five numerals at a single breath depends the number of the livestock of each kind, which are to form her dowry, cp. 8 above, and as to music in fairy tales. Now that a number of our inundation stories have been passed in review in this and the previous chapter, some room may be given to the question of their original form. They separate themselves, as it will have been seen, into at least two groups, one, those in which the cause of the catastrophe is ethical, the punishment of the wicked and dissolute. And, two, those in which no very distinct suggestion of the kind is made. It is needless to say that everything points to the comparative lateness of the fully developed ethical motive. 
and we are not forced to rest content with this theoretical distinction, for in more than one of the instances we have the two kinds of story. In the case of Ayalin Tejid, the less known and presumably the older story connects the formation of the lake with the neglect to keep the stone door of the well shut. While the more popular story makes the catastrophe a punishment for wicked and riotous living. So with the older story of Kantarar Gwalet, on which we found the later one of the tipsy Seethenin as it were grafted, page 395. The keeping of the well shut in the former case, as also in that of Finn and Jaiwar, was a precaution, but the neglect of it was not the cause of the ensuing misfortune. Even if we had stories like the Irish ones, which make the sacred well burst forth in pursuit of the intruder who has gazed into its depths, it would by no means be of a piece with the punishment of riotous and lawless living. Our comparison should rather be with the story of the curse of Pantanas, where a man incurred the wrath of the fairies by ploughing up ground which they wished to retain as a green sward. But the threatened vengeance for that act of culture did not come to pass for a century, till the time of one, in fact, who is not charged with having done anything to deserve it. The ethics of that legend are, it is clear, not easy to discover, and in our inundation stories one may trace stages of development from a similarly low level. The case may be represented thus, a divinity is offended by a man, and for some reason or other the former wreaks his vengeance, not on the offender, but on his descendants. This minimum granted, it is easy to see, that in time the popular conscience would fail to rest satisfied with the cruel idea of a jealous divinity visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. One may accordingly distinguish the following stages. 1. The legend lays it down as a fact that the father was very wicked. 2. It makes his descendants also wicked like him. 3. It represents the same punishment overtaking father and sons, ancestor and descendants. 4. The simplest way to secure this kind of equal justice was, no doubt, to let the offending ancestors live on to see their descendants of the generation for whose time the vengeance had been fixed, and to let them be swept away with them in one and the same cataclysm, as in the Welsh versions of the Sifidan and Kenfig legends, possibly also in those of Lly and Tejid and Tino Helic, which are not explicit on this point. Let us for a moment examine the indications of the time to which the vengeance is put off. In the case of the landed families of ancient Wales, every member of them had his position and liabilities settled by his pedigree, which had to be exactly recorded down to the eighth generation or eighth lifetime in Gwynd, and to the seventh in Gwent and Dyfed. Those generations were reckoned the limits of recognized family relationship according to the Welsh laws, and to keep any practical reckoning of the kind, extending always back some two centuries. Must have employed a class of professional men 195 in any case the ninth generation, called in Welsh Y Nafed DCH, which is a term in use all over the principality at the present day, is treated as lying outside all recognized kinship. Thus if AB wishes to say that he is no relation to CD, he will say that he is not related O Pyun Y Nafed DCH, within the ninth degree, or hide why nafed ach, up to the ninth degree. It being understood that in the ninth degree and beyond it no relationship is reckoned. Folklore stories, however, seem to suggest another interpretation of the word dch, and fewer generations in the direct line as indicated in the following table. For the sake of simplicity the founder of the family is here assumed to have at least two sons, a and b, and each succeeding generation to consist of one son only. And lastly the women are omitted altogether. Tad I, father. I. Brother A. 2. B. Mab, son. 2. I. Cousin A. A. 3. Ba W. I. R., grandson. 3. 2. Cousin of. 4. B. B. Gorwer, great grandson. 4. Cousin A. C. V. B. Esgenid, G. G. Grandson. 5. Cousin Ad. 6. B. F. Gorsgenid, G. 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 Grandson. In reckoning the relationships between the collateral members of the family, one counts not generations or begettings, not removes or degrees, 
but ancestry or the number of ancestors. So that the father or founder of the family only counts once. Thus his descendants Ad and BD in the sixth generation or lifetime, are fourth cousins separated from one another by nine ancestors, that is, they are related in the ninth DCH. In other words, Ad has five ancestors and BD has also five, but as they have one ancestor in common, the father of the family, they are not separated by five plus five ancestors, but by five plus five to minus one, that is by nine. Similarly, one being always subtracted, the third cousins AC and BC are related in the seventh DCH, and the second cousin in the fifth ACH, so with the others in odd numbers downwards. And also with the relatives reckoned upwards to the seventh or eighth generation, which would mean collaterals separated by eleven or thirteen ancestors respectively. This reckoning, which is purely conjectural, is based chiefly on the Kenfic story, which foretold the vengeance to come in the ninth DCH and otherwise in the time of the Gerestjikonid, that is to say in the sixth lifetime. This works out all right if only by the ninth ACH we understand the generation or lifetime when the collaterals are separated by nine ancestors, for that is no other than the sixth from the founder of the family. The Welsh version of the Lunkless legend fixes on the same generation, as it says Yanoes Wirian, Gorwirian, Esgenid a Gorsgenid, in the lifetime of grandsons, great grandsons, ascensors, and their children. For these lasts time is the sixth generation. In the case of the Safadan legend, the time of the vengeance is the ninth Senedlaith or generation, which must be regarded as probably a careless way of indicating the generation when the collaterals are separated by nine ancestors. That is to say, the sixth from the father of the family. It can hardly have the other meaning, as the sinning ancestors are represented as then still living. The case of the Taino Helig legend is different, as we have the time announced to the offending ancestor described as Amzer Dy Wirian, Dy or Wirian, a Dy Esgenidian, the time of thy grandsons, thy great grandsons, and thy ascensors. Which would be only the fifth generation with collaterals separated only by seven ancestors, and not nine. But the probability is that Goris Genidian has been here accidentally omitted, and that the generation indicated originally was the same as in the others. This, however, will not explain the Bala legend, which fixes the time for the third generation, namely, immediately after the birth of the offending prince's first grandson. If, however, as I am inclined to suppose, the sixth generation with collaterals severed by nine ancestors was the normal term in these stories. It is easy to understand that the storyteller might wish to substitute a generation nearer to the original offender. Especially if he was himself to be regarded as surviving to share in the threatened punishment, his living to see the birth of his first grandson postulated no extraordinary longevity. The question why fairy vengeance is so often represented deferred for a long time can no longer be put off. Here three or four answers suggest themselves. 1. The story of the curse of Pantarmas relates how the offender was not the person punished, but one of his descendants a hundred or more years after his time. While the offender is represented escaping the fairy's vengeance because he entreated them very hard to let him go unpunished. All this seems to me but a sort of protest against the inexorable character of the little people, a protest, moreover, which was probably invented comparatively late. 2. The next answer is the very antithesis of the Pantanas one. For it is, that the fairies delay in order to involve all the more men and women in the vengeance wreaked by them, I confess that I see no reason to entertain so sinister an idea. 3. A better answer, perhaps, is that the fairies were not always in a position to harm him who offended them. This may well have been the belief as regards any one who had at his command the dreaded potency of magic. Take for instance the Irish story of a king of Erin called Eacade Aram, who, with the aid of his magician or druid Dallin, defied the fairies, and dug into the heart of their underground station, until, in fact, he got possession of his queen, who had been carried thither by a fairy chief named Midder. Eacade, assisted by his druid and the powerful Ogums which the latter wrote on rods of you, was too formidable for the fairies, and their wrath was not executed till the time of Eacade's unoffending grandson, Konerma, who fell a victim to it. As related in the epic story of Bruden Diderga, 
so called from the palace where Conair was slain. 196. For, lastly, it may be said that the fairies being supposed deathless, there would be no reason why they should hurry. And even in case the delay meant a century or two, that makes no perceptible approach to the extravagant scale of time common enough in our fairy tales, when, for instance, they make a man who has wild ages away in fairyland. Deem it only so many minutes. 197. Whatever the causes may have been which gave our stories their form in regard of the delay in the fairy revenge. It is clear that Welsh folklore could not allow this delay to extend beyond the sixth generation with its cousinship of nine ancestries, if, as I gather, it counted kinship no further. Had one projected it on the seventh or the eighth generation, both of which are contemplated in the laws, it would not be folklore. It would more likely be the lore of the landed gentry and of the powerful families whose pedigrees and ramifications of kinship were minutely known to the professional men on whom it was incumbent to keep themselves, and those on whom they depended. Well informed in such matters. It remains for me to consider the non-ethical motive of the other stories, such as those which ascribe negligence and the consequent inundation to the woman who has the charge of the door or lid of the threatening well. Her negligence is not the cause of the catastrophe, but it leaves the way open for it. What then can have been regarded the cause? One may gather something to the point from the Irish story where the divinity of the well is offended because a woman has gazed into its depths, and here probably, as already suggested we come across an ancient taboo directed against women. Which may have applied only to certain wells of peculiarly sacred character. It serves, however, to suggest that the divinities of the water world were not disinclined to seize every opportunity of extending their domain on the earth's surface. And I am persuaded that this was once a universal creed of some race or other in possession of these islands. Besides the Irish legends already mentioned of the formation of Loch Nee, Loch Ree, and others, witness the legendary annals of early Ireland, which, by the side of battles, the clearing of forests, and the construction of causeways. Mention the bursting fort of lakes and rivers. That is to say, the formation or the coming into existence, or else the serious expansion, of certain of the actual waters of the country. For the present purpose the details given by the four masters are sufficient and I have hurriedly counted their instances as follows. Anno Mundi 2532. Two lakes formed. Anno Mundi 2533. One lake foamed. Anno Mundi 2535. Two lakes formed. Anno Mundi 2545. One lake foamed. Anno Mundi 2546. One lake foamed. Anno Mundi 2859. Two lakes formed. Anno Mundi 2860. Two lakes formed. Anno Mundi 3503. 21 rivers foamed. Anno Mundi 3506. 9 lakes formed. Anno Mundi 3510. 5 rivers foamed. Anno Mundi 3520. 9 rivers foamed. Anno Mundi 3581. 9 lakes formed. Anno Mundi 3656. Three rivers foamed. Anno Mundi 3751. One lake formed. Anno Mundi 3751. Four rivers foamed. Anno Mundi 3790. Nine lakes formed. Anno Mundi 4169. Five rivers foamed. Anno Mundi 4694. One lake for me. This makes an aggregate of 35 lakes and 46 rivers. That is to say a total of 81 eruptions. But I ought, perhaps, to explain that under the heads of lakes I have included not only separate pieces of water, but also six inlets of the sea, such as Strangford Lock and the like. Still more to the point is it to mention that of the lakes too are said to have burst forth at th digging of graves. Thus AM 2535, the four masters have the following, Laylan, son of Partholon, 
died in this year. When his grave is dug, Loch Leyland sprang forth in U.I. Mac Way's Endy from him it is named one. A Donovan, the editor and translator of the Four Masters, supposes it to be somewhere to the southwest of Terra, in Neath. Similarly A.M. 4694, they say of a certain Melg Moldthak, when his grave was digging, Loch Melg burst forth over the land in Carebrae, so that they named from him. This is sad to be now called Loch Mavin, on the confines of the counties of Donegal, Leitrim, and Fermino. These two instances are mentioned by the four masters. And here is one given by Stokes in the Ren Din Senkas, see the Review Celtique, 15. 428-9, it has to do with Loch Garman, as Wexford Harbour was called in Irish, and it runs thus, Loch Garman, whence is it? Easy to say. Garman Glass, son of Dega, was buried there, and when his grave was dug then the lake burst throughout the land. Whence Loch Garman? It matters not here that there are alternative accounts of the name. The meaning of all this seems to be that cutting the green sward or disturbing the earth beneath was believed in certain cases to give offense to some underground divinity or other connected with the world of waters. That divinity avenged the annoyance or offense given him by causing water to burst forth and form a lake forthwith. The nearness of such divinities to the surface seems not a little remarkable. One it is right to say that another account is given by the Ren Din Senkas published by Stokes in the Review Celtique 16. 164, namely that Leglin with fifty warriors, came to the well of Deras son of Sarah. A wave burst over them and drowned Leglin with his fifty warriors, and thereof a lake was made. Hence we say Loch Leglini, Leglin's lake, and it is shown not only in the folklore which has been preserved for us by the four masters, but also by the usual kind of story about a neglected well door. These remarks suggest the question whether it was not one of the notions which determined surface burials, that is, burials in which no cutting of the ground took place. The cysts or chambers and the bodies placed in them being covered over by the heaping on of earth or stones brought from a more or less convenient distance. It might perhaps be said that all this only implied individuals of a character to desecrate the ground and call forth the displeasure of the divinities concerned, and for that suggestion folklore parallels, it is true, could be adduced. But it is hardly adequate, the facts seem to indicate a more general objection on the part of the powers in point. And they remind one rather of the clause said to be inserted in mining leases in China with the object, if one may trust the newspapers, of preventing shafts from being sunk below a certain depth. For fear of offending the susceptibilities of the demons or dragons ruling underground. It is interesting to note the fact, that Celtic folklore connects the underground divinities intimately with water, for one may briefly say that they have access wherever water can take them. With this qualification the belief may be said to have lingered lately in Wales, for instance, in connection with LLYN Bar Fog, near Aberdovey. It is believed to be very perilous, Mr. Pug says, to let the waters out of the lake. And not long before he wrote, in 1853, an aged inhabitant of the district informed him, that she recollected this being done during a period of long drought, in order to procure motive power for LLYN Pear Mill and that long-continued heavy rains followed. Then we have the story related to Mr. Reynolds as to LLYNY Fan Fock, how there emerged from the water a huge hairy fellow of hideous aspect, who stormed at the disturbers of his peace, and uttered the threat that unless they left him alone in his own place he would drown a whole town. Thus the power of the water spirit is represented as equal to producing excessive wet weather and destructive floods. He is in all probability not to be dissociated from the Offeric in the Conwy story which has already been given. Now the local belief is that the reason why the Afank had to be dragged oil to the river was that he caused floods in the river and made it impossible for people to cross on their way to market at Lanwest. Some such a local legend has been generalized into a sort of universal flood story in the late Triad, 3. 97, as follows, three masterpieces of the Isle of Prydain the ship of Nephid Naf Neophion, that carried in her male and female of every kind when the lake of dawn burst. And who the mighty's Iken Bannock dragging the afank of the lake to land, so that the lake burst no more, and the stones of Gwydon Ganabon, 
on which one read all the arts and sciences of the world. A story similar to the Conwy one, but no longer to be got so complete, as far as I know, seems to have been current in various parts of the Principality. Especially around Llyn Safadin and on the banks of the Anglesey Pool called Llyn Yir Wythid Ion, the Pool of the Eight Oxen, for so many is who represented here as requiring in dealing with the Anglesey Afank. According to Mr. Pug of Aberdovey, the same feat was performed at Ellyn Barfog, not, however, by who and his oxen, but by Arthur and his horse. To be more exact the task may be here considered as done by Arthur superseding who, see page 142 above. That, however, is of no consequence here, and I return to the Afank, the fan Falk legend told to Mr. Reynolds makes the lake ruler huge and hairy, hideous and rough-spoken, but he expresses himself in human speech, in fact in two lines of doggerel, cp, ig above. On the other hand, the LLYN cum LLWCH story, which puts the same doggerel into the mouth of the threatening figure in red who sits in a chair on the face of that lake, suggests nothing abnormal about his personal appearance. Then as to the Conwy Afank, he is very heavy, it is true, but he also speaks the language of the country. He is lured, be it noticed, out of his home in the lake by the attractions of a young woman, who lets him rest his head in her lap and fall asleep. When he wakes to find himself in chains he takes a cruel revenge on her. But with infinite toil and labor he is dragged beyond the Conwy watershed into one of the highest tarns on Snowdon, for there is here no question of killing him, but only of removing him where he cannot harm the people of the Conwy Valley. It is true that the story of Pereter represents that knight cutting in a fang's head off, but so much the worse for the compiler of that romance, as we have doubtless in the Afank some kind of a deathless being. However, the description which the Pereter story gives 198 of him is interesting, he lives in a cave at the door of which is a stone pillar, he sees everybody that comes without anybody seeing him. And from behind the pillar he kills all comers with a poisoned spear. Hitherto we have the Afank described mostly from a hostile point of view, let us change our position, which some of the stories already given enable us to do. Take for instance the first of the whole series, where it describes, Pete, 7, the fan fock youth's despair when the lake damsel, whose love he had gained, suddenly dived to fetch her father and her sister. There emerged, it says, out of the lake two most beautiful ladies, accompanied by a hoary-headed man of noble mien and extraordinary stature, but having otherwise all the force and strength of youth. This hoary-headed man of noble mien owned herds of cattle and flocks of sheep, a number of which were allowed to come out of the lake to form his daughter's dowry, as the narrative goes on to show. In the story of Llyn Duar Arklu, p. 32, he has a consort who appears with him to join in giving the parental sanction to the marriage which their daughter was about to make with the Snowdon Shepherd. In neither of these stories has this extraordinary figure any name given him, and it appears prima facie probable that the term Afank is rather one of abuse in harmony with the unlovely description of him supplied by the other stories. But neither in them does the term year Afank suit the monster meant, for there can be no doubt that in the word Afank we have the etymological equivalent of the Irish word Abak a dwarf. Until further light is shed on these words one may assume that at one time a fank also meant a dwarf or pygmy in Welsh. In modern Welsh it has been regarded as meaning a beaver, but as that was too small an animal to suit the popular stories. The word has been also gravely treated as meaning a crocodile 199, this is in the teeth of the unanimous treatment of him as anthropomorphic in the legends in point. If one is to abide by the meaning dwarf or pygmy, one is bound to regard a fank as one of the terms originally applied to the fairies in their more unlovely aspects, compare the use of Crimble, page 263. Here may also be mentioned Pegger, a dwarf or pygmy, which occurs in the book of Taliesin, poem. 7, page 135. Gog 6 and P.Y. Pegger. I know what, sort of, pygmy. Yssyd. Vor. There is beneath the sea. Gogwan eu hi sir i. Know their kind. Pa 6 b wan y dot oscord. Each in his troop. Also the following lines in the 12th century manuscript of the Black Book of Carmarthen, see Evans' autotype facsimile, fo. 9b. 
they are newer pegger. And every dwarf. Why sit why dan more? There is beneath the sea. They are newer edianoch. And every wing thing. Aeric kyoithoch. The mighty one hath made. A C they. They. Pop. And were there to each. Try try chant longed. Thrice three hundred tongues. Nyelent ve tradehard. They could not relate. Kyoeth you trindad. The powers of the Trinity. I should rather suppose, then, that the pygmies in the water world were believed to consist of many grades or classes, and to be innumerable like the Lecorpton of Irish legend, which were likewise regarded as diminutive. With the Lecorpton were also associated two hundred Fomori or Fomoraig, modern Irish spelling Fomore, and Goborchen, horse heads. The etymology of the word Fomori has been indicated above, but Irish legendary history has long associated it with Muir, C. Genitive Mara, Welsh Moor, and it has gone so far as to see in them, as they're suggested. Not submarine but transmarine enemies and invaders of Ireland. So the singular Fomer, now written Fomer, is treated in O'Reilly's Irish Dictionary as meaning, a pirate, a sea robber, a giant, while in Highland Gaelic, where it is written Fomher or Famher, it is regularly used as the word for giant. The Manx Gaelic corresponding to Irish Fomer and its derivative Fomerac, is for, a giant, and forag, gigantic, but also, a pirate. I remember hearing, however, years ago, a mention made of the Fomeray, which, without conveying any definite allusion to their stature, associated them with subterranean places, an undergraduate from the neighborhood of Kilorglan, in Kerry. Happened to relate in my hearing, how, when he was exploring some underground RDTHS near his home, he was warned by his father's workmen to beware of the Fomeraic. But on the borders of the counties of Mayo and Sligo I have found the word used as in the Scottish Highlands, namely, in the sense of giants, while Dr. Douglas Hyde and others inform me that the giant's causeway is called in Irish Cloakin na B.H. Fomerac. The Goborchins or Horseheads have also an interest, not only in connection with the Fornori, as when we read of a king of the latter called Ioka Ichchin 201, or Ioki Horsehead. But also as a link between the Welsh Afank and the Highland Waterhorse, of whom Campbell has a good deal to say in his popular tales of the West Highlands. See more especially 4, 337, where he remarks among other things, that, the waterhorse assumes many shapes, he often appears as a man, he adds, and sometimes as a large bird. A page or two earlier he gives a story which illustrates the statement, at the same time that it vividly reminds one of that part of the Conwy legend which, p. 13 o, represents the Afank resting his head on the lap of the damsel forming one of the dramatis persona. Here follows Campbell's own story, omitting all about a marvellous bull, however. That was in the end to checkmate the water horse. A long time after these things a servant girl went with the farmer's herd of cattle to graze them at the side of a lock, and she sat herself down near the bank. There, in a little while, what should she see walking towards her but a man, who asked her to fask his hair, Welsh Lua. She said she was willing enough to do him that service, and so he laid his head on her knee, and she began to array his locks, as Neapolitan damsels also do by their swains. But soon she got a great fright, for growing amongst the man's hair, she found a great quantity of Lyabagak and Lacha, a certain slimy green weed 202 that abounds in such locks, fresh, salt, and brackish. The girl knew that if she screamed there was an end of her, so she kept her terror to herself, and worked away till the man fell asleep as he was with his head on her knee. Then she untied her apron strings, and slid the apron quietly on to the ground with its burden upon it, and then she took her feet home as fast as it was in her heart 203. Now when she was getting near the houses, she gave a glance behind her, and there she saw her car aide, friend, coming after her in the likeness of a horse. The equine form belongs also more or less constantly to the Kelpie of the lowlands of Scotland and of the Isle of Man, where we have him in the Glashton. Whose amorous propensities are represented as more repulsive than what appears in Welsh or Irish legend, see above and the Lyre Mananach for 1897, p. 139. 
Perhaps in man and the highlands the horsey nature of this being has been reinforced by the influence of the Norse NYKR, a northern Proteus or Old Nick, who takes many forms. But with a decided preference for that of a grey water horse, see Vicfussen's Icelandic English Dictionary. But the idea of associating the equine form with the water divinity is by no means confined to the Irish and the northern nations, witness the Greek legend of the horse being of Poseidon's own creation. And the beast whose form he sometimes assumed. It is in this sort of a notion of a water horse one is probably to look for the key to the riddle of such conceptions as that of March of Merchant, the king with horse's ears, and the corresponding Irish figure of Labraid Lork 204. In both of these the brute peculiarities are reduced almost to a minimum, both are human in form save their ears alone. The name Labraid Lork is distinct enough from the Welsh March, but under this latter name one detects traces of him with the horse's ears in Wales, Cornwall, and Brittany 205. We have also probably the same name in the Mork of Irish legend, at any rate Mork, Mark, or Marg, seems to be the same name as the Welsh March, which is no other word than March, a steed or charger. Now the Irish Mork is not stated to have had horse's ears, but he and another called Conaing are represented in the legendary history of early Erin as the naval leaders of the Fornori. A sort of position which would seem to fit the Brythonic march also were he to be treated in earnest as an historical character. But short of that another treatment may be suspected of having been actually dealt out to him, namely, that of resolving the water horse into a horse and his master. Of this we seem to have two instances in the course of the story of the formation of Loch Nee in the Book of the Dun Cow, F.O. 39-41. There was once a good king named Maird reigning over Munster, and he had two sons, Eacade and Rib. He married a wife named Ebliu, genitive Eblind, who fell in love with her stepson, Eacade. The two brothers make up their minds to leave their father and to take Ebliu with them, together with all that was theirs, including in all a thousand men. They proceed northwards, but their druids persuade them that they cannot settle down in the same district, so Rib goes westwards to a plain known as Tir Kluchi Mitter Acus Maic Oic, the playground of Mitter and the Mac Oc. So called after the two great fairy chiefs of Ireland. Mitter visits Rib's camp and kills their horses, then he gives them a big horse of his own ready harnessed with a pack saddle. They had to put all their baggage on the big horse's back and go away, but after a while the nag lay down and a well of water formed there, which eventually burst forth, drowning them all, this is Loch Re, Ribs Loch, or Loch Re, on the Shannon. Eacade, the other brother, went with his party to the banks of the Boyne near the Brug, where the fairy chief Mac O.C. or Mac Ind O.C. had his residence, he destroyed Eacade's horses the first night and the next day he threatened to destroy the men themselves unless they went away. Thereupon Eacade said that they could not travel without horses, so the Mac O.C. gave them a big horse, on whose back they placed all they had. The Mac O.C. warned them not to unload the nag on the way, and not to let him halt lest he should be their death. However, when they had reached the middle of Ulster, they thoughtlessly took all their property off the horse's back, and nobody bethought him of turning the animal's head back in the direction from which they had come, so he also made a well 206. Over that well Eacade had a house built and a lid put on the well, which he set a woman to guard. In the sequel she neglected it, and the well burst forth and formed Loch Nee, as already mentioned above. What became of the big horses in these stories one is not told, but most likely they were originally represented as vanishing in a spring of water where each of them stood. Compare the account of Undine at her unfaithful husband's funeral. In the procession she mysteriously appeared as a snow-white figure deeply veiled, but when one rose from kneeling at the grave. Where she had knelt not was to be seen save a little silver spring of limpid water bubbling out of the turf and trickling on to surround the new grave, the man sich aber weeder er hob, war die weiss fremd verschwunden. Under stell, was i e geniet hat, Quol eiin silberhels brufinayat aus dem rasen, das reselt und resel fort, bis es den grabfigel de rittersfaskens umzogen hat. Dan ran es turder und ergos sich in einen weiher, der zur seat de gottsackers lag. The late and grotesque story of the Gila de Kair may be mentioned next, he was one of the Fornarak, 
and had a wonderful kind of horse on whose back most of Finn's chief warriors were induced to mount. Then the Gila de Caer and his horse hurried towards Corcagwany, in Kerry, and took to the sea, for he and his horse travelled equally well on sea and land. Thus Finn's men, unable to dismount, were carried prisoners to an island not named, on which Dermot in quest of them afterwards landed, and from which, after great perils, he made his way to Tyr F. O. Thuin, Terra Subunda, and brought his friends back to Erin 207. Now the number of Finn's men taken away by force by the Gila de Caer was fifteen, fourteen on the back of his horse and one clutching to the animal's tail, and the Welsh triads, I, ninety-three equals two. Two, seem to re-echo some similar story, but they give the number of persons not as fifteen but just one half, and describe the horse as do, why, Moroed, the black of, seas, steed of Elidur Mwinfor. That carried seven human beings and a half from Pen Lech Elidir in the north to Pen Lech Elidir in Mon, Anglesey. It is explained that Du carried seven on his back, and that one who swam with his hands on that horse's crupper was reckoned the half man in this case. Du Moroed is in the story of Kulhuch and Owen called Du March Moro, Black the Steed of Moro, the horse ridden in the hunt of TWRCHTRWYTH by Gwyn of Nud, King of the Other World. And he appears as a knight with his name unmistakably rendered into Brun de Morois in the romance of Dermart le Galois, who carries away Arthur's queen on his horse to his castle in Morois 208. Lastly, here also might be mentioned the incident in the story of Perider or Perceval, which relates how to that night, when he was in the middle of a forest much distressed for the want of a horse. A lady brought a fine steed as black as a blackberry. He mounted and he found his beast marvelously swift, but on his making straight for a vast river the knight made the sign of the cross, whereupon he was left on the ground, and his horse plunged into the water, which his touch seemed to set ablaze. The horse is interpreted to have been the Devil 209, and this is a fair specimen of the way in which Celtic paganism is treated by th grail writers when they feel in the humor to assume an edifying attitude. If one is right in setting M.N. Anglesey, over against the anonymous isle to which the Gila de Caer hurries Finn's men away. Anglesey would have to be treated as having once been considered one of the islands of the dead and the home of otherworld inhabitants. We have a trace of this in a couplet in a poem by the medieval poet, David of Gwilym, who makes bloated the owl give a bit of her history as follows. Mare I Argowid, Ail Mirian. Daughter to a lord, son of Merchan. WIFI, MYN Dewey. O Fox 210. MI, by St. David. From Mona. This, it will be seen, connects March of Merchant, as it were, Steed Son of Steeding, with the Isle of Anglesey. Add to this that the Irish for Anglesey or was Min Conaing, Conaing Swamp, so called apparently after Conaing associated with Mork, a name which is practically March in Welsh. Both were leaders of the Fornori in Irish tales, see my Arthurian legend, p. 356. On the great place given to islands in Celtic legend and myth it is needless here to expatiate, witness Brictia, to which Procopius describes the souls of the departed being shipped from the shores of the continent. The Isle of Avalon in the Romances, that of Gwales in the Mabinogen, Wanyas Enlii, or Bardsey, in which Merlin and his retinue enter the glass house 211, and the island of which we read in the pages of Plutarch. That it contains Cronus held in the bonds of perennial sleep. 212. Let us return to the more anthropomorphic figure of the Afank. And take as his more favored representative the virile personage described emerging from the Fan Fock Lake to give his sanction to the marriage of his daughter with the Midfi Shepherd. It is probable that a divinity of the same order belonged to every other lake of any considerable dimensions in the country. But it will be remembered that in the case of the story of Llyn Duar Ardu two parents appeared with the lake maiden her father and her mother and we may suppose that they were divinities of the water world. The same thing also may be inferred from the late triad, 3. 13, which speaks of the bursting of the lake of Lyon, causing all the lands to be inundated so that all the human race was drowned except Dwyf and Dwyfak, who escaped in a mastless ship, it was from them that the island of Prydain was repeopled. A similar triad, 397, but evidently of a different origin, 
has already been mentioned as speaking of the ship of Nephical Naf Neophion, that carried in it a male and female of every kind when the Lake of Yun burst. This later triad evidently supplies what had been forgotten in the previous one, namely, a pair of each kind of animal life, and not of mankind alone. But from the names Dwyfen and Dwyfak I infer that the writer of Triad 3. 13 has developed his universal deluge on the basis of the scriptural account of it, for those names belonged in all probability to wells and rivers, in other terms, they were the names of water divinities. At any rate there seems to be some evidence that two springs, whose waters flow into Bala Lake, were at one time called Dwyfen and Dwyfak, these names being borne both by the springs themselves and the rivers flowing from them. The Dwyfen and the Dwyfak were regarded as uniting in the lake, while the water on its issuing from the lake is called DYFRDWI. Now DYFRDWI stands for an older DYFRDWIF, which in Old Welsh was Dub or Duyu, the water of the divinity. One of the names of that divinity was Donwi, standing for an early form Danuvios or Danuvia, according as it was masculine or feminine. In either case it was practically the same name as that of the Danube or Danuvios, derived from a word which is represented in Irish by the adjective Dana, Audax, Fortis, Intrepidus. The D has in Welsh poetry still another name, Erfin, which seems to mean a martial goddess or the spirit of the battlefield, which is corroborated and explained by Geraldus 2.13 who represents the river as the accredited arbiter of the fort unce of the wars in its country between the Welsh and the English. The name Dyfrdenwy occurs in a poem by I Lywarch Brydydy Mach, a poet who flourished towards the end of the 12th century. As follows 2.14. Nid Kiwi 2.15 a LLWFYR DWFYR DWFYR. With a coward Dyfrdenwy water ill. Don we agrees. Creriest oth yubid gwryd garwi. From thy boyhood hast thou loved. Garwi's valor. The prince praised was Lywelyn of Lorworth, whom the poet seems to identify here with the D. And it looks as if the water of the D formed some sort of a test which no coward could face, compare the case of the discreet cauldron that would not boil meat for a coward. 216. The DWI, DWIF, do you, of the river's Welsh name represent an early form Deva or Diva, whence the Romans called their station on its banks Deva, possibly as a shortening of Ad Devam. But that Deva should have simply and directly meant the river is rendered probable by the fact that Ptolemy elsewhere gives it as the name of the northern Dee, which enters the sea near Aberdeen. From the same stem were formed the names Dwyfn and Dwyfach, which are treated in the triads as masculine and feminine respectively. In its course the Welsh Dee receives a river Siru not far above Corwen, and that river flows through farms called Aardwyfan and H. Endra Aardwyfan, and adjoining Ardwyfan is another farm called Fodi Ardwyfan, Shealings of Ardwyfan. While Hendre Ardwyfan means the old stead or winter abode of Ardwyfan. Ardwyfan itself would seem to mean Ondwyfan, and Hendre Ardwyfan, which may be supposed the original homestead, stands near a burn which flows into the Siru. That burn I should suppose to have been the Dwyfen, and perhaps the name extended to the Siru itself, but Dwyfen is not now known as the name of any stream in the neighborhood. Elsewhere we have two rivers called Dwyfor or Dwyfor and Dwyfak, which unite a little below the village of Lan Istamdwi. And from there to the sea, the stream is called Dwyfor, the mouth of which is between Krikyeth and Afon 1 in Carnarvonshire. Istamdwi, commonly corrupted into Stindwi, seems to mean istim dwi, the bend of the dwi. So that here also we have dwyfak and dwi, as in the case of the d. Possibly dwyfor was previously called simply dwi or even dwyfen. But it is now explained as dwi4, great dwi, which was most likely suggested by dwyfak, as this latter explains itself to the country people as dwi fak, little dwi. However, it is but right to say that in Lywelyn of Gruffids, 17, grant of lands to the monks of Aber Conwy they seem to be called Dwyek and Dwywar. 217. All these waters have in common the reputation of being liable to sudden and dangerous floods, especially the Dwyfor. 
which drains Coombe Stralton and its lake lying behind the Great Rocky Barrier on the left as one goes from Tremadoc towards Aberglaslin Bridge. Still more so is this the case with the Dee and Bala Lake, which is wont to rise at times from 7 to 9 feet above its ordinary level. The inundation which then invades the valley from Bala down presents a sight more magnificent than comfortable to contemplate. In fact nothing could have been more natural than for the story elaborated by the writer of certain of the late triads to have connected the most remarkable inundations with the largest piece of water in the principality. And one liable to such sudden changes of level, in other words, that one should treat Llyn Lion as merely one of the names of Bala Lake, now called in Welsh Island Tejid, and formerly sometimes Island Erfan. While touching at page 286 on Gwain Liffin with its Llyn Pencraig as one of those claiming to be the Llyn Lyphon of the Triads, it was hinted that Lion was but a thinner form of Lilifon. Here one might mention perhaps another Liffin, for which, however, no case could be made. I allude to the name of the residents of the winds descended from Geo Mintroedu, namely, Glen Liffin, which means the river Liffin's Glen. But one could not feel surprised if the neighboring El Lifni, draining the lakes of Nant 1 Te, should prove to have once been also known as a Liffin, with the Nanty waters conforming by being called Llyn Liffin. But however that may be, one may say as to the flood caused by the bursting of any such lake, that the notion of the universality of the catastrophe was probably contributed by the author of Triad 3. 13. From a non-Welsh source. He may have, however, not invented the vessel in which he places Dwyfan and Dwyfak, at all events, one version of the story of the Fan Fock represents the Lake Lady arriving in a boat. As to the writer of the other triad, 3-97, he says nothing about Dwyfan and his wife, but borrows Nefa Tnaf Neophian's ship to save all that were to be saved. And here one may probably venture to identify Nefid with Nem 218 Genitive Nemet, a name born in Irish legend by a rover who is represented as one of the early colonizers of Erin. As to the rest, the name Neophian by itself is used in Welsh for Neptune and the sea, as in the following couplet of D. of Gwillam's poem IV. Nofiad a maith hen Nephon. It is old Neptune that has swam. O Troia, for draw I fawn. From great Troy afar to Mona. In the same way more Neophian, sea of Neophian, seems to have signified the ocean, the high seas. To return to the triad about Dwyfan and Dwyfak, not only does it make them from being water divinities into a man and woman, but there is no certainty even that both were not feminine. In modern Welsh all rivers are treated as feminine, and even DYFRDWYF has usually to submit, though the modern bard Tejid, analyzing the word into DWFRDWYF, water of the divinity or divine water, where DWFR, water, could only be masculine. Addressed El Lin Tejid thus, p. 78. Druayat, or Didior Dry One. Through thee, from the days of the Druids. Y R H W Y F Y D Y F R D W Y F E I Don. The D W F R D W Y F impels his wave. This question, however, of the gender of river names, or rather the sex which personification ascribed them, is a most difficult one. If we glance at Ptolemy's geography written in the second century, we find in his account of the British Isles that he names more than fifty of our river mouths and estuaries and that he divides their names almost equally into masculine and feminine. The modern Welsh usage has, it is seen, departed far from this, but not so far the folklore, the Afank is a male, and we have a figure of the same sex appearing as the father of the lake maiden in the Fan Fox story, and in that of Llyn Duar Ardu. The same, too, was the sex of the chief dweller of Llyn Cum Llwch. The same remark is applicable also to the greatest divinity of these islands the greatest, at any rate, so far as the scanty traces of his cult enable one to become acquainted with him. As his name comes Davin into legend it belongs here, as well as to the deities of antiquity, just as much, in a sense, as the D. I refer to Nudans or Nodans, the remains 219 of whose sanctuary were many years ago brought to light on a pleasant hill in Lydney Park, on the western banks of the Severn. 
In the mosaic floor of the God's temple there is a colored inscription showing the expense of that part of the work to have been defrayed by the contributions, ex stipibus, of the faithful, and that it was carried out by two men. Of whom one appears to have been an officer in command of a naval force guarding the coasts of the Severn Sea. In the midst of the mosaic inscription is a round opening in the floor of nine inches in diameter and surrounded by a broad band of red enclosed in two of blue. This has given rise to various speculations, and among others that it was intended for libations. The mosaics and the lettering of the inscription seem to point to the 3rd century as the time when the sanctuary of Nudans was BULLT under Roman auspices, though the place was doubtless sacred to the god long before. In any case it fell in exactly with the policy of the more astute of Roman statesmen to encourage such a native cult as we find traces of in Lydney Park. One of the inscriptions began with D. M. Nodanti, to the great god Nodans, and a little bronze crescent intended for the diadem of the god or of one of his priests gives a representation of him as a crowned, beardless personage driving a chariot with four horses. And on either side of him is a naked figure supposed to represent the winds, and beyond them on each of the two sides is a triton with the four feet of a horse. The god holds the reins in his left hand, and his right uplifted grasps what may be a scepter or possibly a whip, while the whole equipment of the god recalls in some measure the chariot of the sun. Another piece of the bronze ornament shows another triton with an anchor in one of his hands, and opposite him a fisherman in the act of hooking a fine salmon. Other things, such as oars and shell trumpets, together with mosaic representations of marine animals in the floor of the temple, compel us to assimilate Nudans more closely with Neptune than any other god of classical mythology. The name of the god, as given in the inscriptions, varies between Nudans and Nodans, the cases actually occurring being the dative Nodanti, Nodenti, and Nodant, and the genitive Nodentis. So I should regard O or U as optional in the first syllable, and O as preferable, perhaps, to E in the second, for there is no room for reasonably doubting that we have here to do with the same name as Irish Noadu, genitive Noadat. Conspicuous in the legendary history of Ireland. Now the Nuadu who naturally occurs to one first, was Nuadu Argetlam or Nuadu of the Silver Hand, from Argot, Silver, Argentum, and Lamb, Hand. Irish literature explains how he came to have a hand made of silver, and we can identify with him on Welsh ground a Lud Lawrite. For put back as it were into earlier Brythonic, this would be Ludo, Ns, Lamarginitios, that is to say, a reversal takes place in the order of the elements forming the epithet out of Iraint, for older Urgent, Silvern, Argentius, and Law. For earlier Lama, Hand. Then comes the alliterative instinct into play, forcing Nudo, Ns, Lamargentios to become Ludo, Ms, Lamargentios, whence the later form, Lud Laurite, derives regularly. 220 Thus we have in Welsh the name Lud, fashioned into that form under the influence of the epithet, whereas elsewhere it is Nud, which occurs as a man's name in the pedigrees, W. H. Lee in intermediate form was probably Nudos or Nudo. Of which a genitive NVDI occurs in a post Roman inscription found near Yarrow Kirk in Selkirkshire. It is worthy of note that the modification of Nudo into Ludo must have taken place comparatively early not improbably while the language was still goidelic as we seem to have a survival of the name in that of Lydney itself. It is very possible that we have Ludo, Lud, also in Porthlud, which Geoffrey of Monmouth gives, 3. 20, as the Welsh for Ludus Gata or Ludgate, in London, which Gate, according to him, was called after an ancient king of Britain named Lud. He seems to have been using an ancient tradition, and there would be nothing improbable in the conjecture that Geoffrey's Lud was our Lud, and that the great water divinity of that name had another sanctuary on the hill by the Thames. Somewhere near the present site of Esti. Paul's Cathedral, and occupying a post as it were prophetic of Britain's rule of the waterways in later times. Perhaps as one seems to find traces of Nudans from the estuary of the Thames to that of the Severn and thence to Ireland one may conclude that the god was one of the divinities worshipped by the goidals. With regard to the Brythonic Celts, there is nothing to suggest that he belonged also to them except in the sense of his having been probably adopted by them from the goidals. It might be further suggested that the goidals themselves had in the first instance adopted him from the pre-Celtic natives, 
but in that case a goddess would have been rather more probable 221. In fact in the case of the Severn we seem to have a trace of such a goddess in the Sabrina, Old Welsh Habron, now Hafron, so called after a princess whom Geoffrey, too. 5. Represents drowned in the river, she may have been the pre-Celtic goddess of the Severn, and the name corresponding to Welsh Hafron occurs in Ireland in the form of Sabron, an old name of the river Lee that flows through Cork. Similarly one now reads sometimes of Father Thames after the fashion of classic phraseology, and in the Celtic period Nudans may have been closely identified with that river, but the ancient name Temisa or Temesis 222 was decidedly feminine. And it was, most likely, that of the river divinity from times when the pre-Celtic natives held exclusive possession of these islands. On the whole it appears safer to regard Nudans as belonging to a race that had developed on a larger scale the idea of a patriarchal or kingly ruler holding sway over a comparatively wide area. So Nudans may here be treated as ruled out of the discussion as to the origin of the fairies, to which a few paragraphs are now to be devoted. Speaking of the rank and file of the fairies in rather a promiscuous fashion, one may say that we have found manifold proof of their close connection with the water world. Not only have we found them supposed to haunt places bordering on rivers, to live beneath the lakes, or to inhabit certain green isles capable of playing hide and seek with the ancient mariner, and perhaps not so very ancient either. But other considerations have been suggested as also pointing unmistakably to the same conclusion. Take for instance the indirect evidence afforded by the method of proceeding to recover an infant stolen by the fairies. One account runs thus, the mother who had lost her baby was to go with a wizard and carry with her to a river the child left her in exchange. The wizard would say, crap a r y ratch, grip the hag, and the woman would reply, r h y h w y r, jiferglack, too late, you urchin 223, 18 before she uttered those words she had dropped the urchin into the river, and she would then return to her house. By that time the kidnapped child would be found to have come back home 224. The words here used have not been quite forgotten in Carnarvonshire, but no distinct meaning seems to be attached to them now. At any rate I have failed to find anybody who could explain them. I should however guess that the wizard addressed his words to the fairy urchin with the intention, presumably, that the fairies in the river should at the same time hear and note what was about to be done. Another, and a somewhat more intelligible version, is given in the Gwileated for 1837, page 185, by a contributor who publishes it from a manuscript which Lewis Morris began to write in 1724 and finished apparently in 1729. Hugh is a native of Anglesey, and it is probably to that county the story belongs, which he gives to illustrate one of the phonological aspects of certain kinds of Welsh. That account differs from the one just cited in that it introduces no wizard, but postulates two fairy urchins between whom the dialogue occurs, which is not unusual in our changeling stories. After this explanation I translate Morris' words thus. But to return to the question of the words approaching to the nature of the thing intended. There is an old story current among us concerning a woman whose children had been exchanged by the TYLWYTH tag. Whether it is truth or falsehood does not much matter, RT it shows what the men of that age thought concerning the sound of words, and how they fancied that the language of those sprites was of a ghastly and lumpy kind. The story is as follows, the woman whose two children had been exchanged, chanced to overhear the two fair heirs, whom she got instead of them, reasoning with one another beyond what became their age and persons. So she picked up the two sham children, one under each arm, in order to go and throw them from a bridge into a river, that they might be drowned as she fancied. But hardly had the one in his fall reached the bottom when he cried out to his comrade in the following words. Gripiak Grepsak. Gripiak Grepiak. Dal Diafel Yny Ratch. Keep thy hold on the hag. Hi eth yn rower, faglak. It got too late, thou urchin. Me eisiir muthlak 225. I fell into the. In spite of the obscurity of these words, it is quite clear that it was thought the most natural thing in the world to return the fairies to the river, and no sooner were they dropped there than the right infants were found to have been sent home. The same thing may be learned also from the story of the curse of Pantanas, above. 
For when the time of the fairy's revenge is approaching, the merry party gathered together at Pantanas are frightened by a piercing voice rising from a black and cauldron-like pool in the river. And after a while they hear it a second time rising above the noise of the river as it cascades over the shoulder of a neighboring rock. Shortly afterwards an ugly, diminutive woman appears on the table near the window, and had it not been for the rudeness of one of those present she would have disclosed the future to them, but, as it was. She said very little in a vague way and went away offended. But as long as she was there the voice from the river was silent. Here we have the Welsh counterpart of the Ben side, pronounced Banshee in Anglo-Irish, and meaning a fairy woman who is supposed to appear to certain Irish families before deaths or other misfortunes about to befall them. It is doubtless to some such fairy persons the voices belong. Which threaten vengeance on the heir of Pantanas and on the wicked prince and his descendants previous to the cataclysm which brings a lake into the place of a doomed city, witness such cases as those of Lunclus, Sificlon, and Kenfig. The last mentioned deserves some further scrutiny. And I direct his attention to the fact that the voice so closely identifies itself with the wronged fam LLY that it speaks in the first person, as it cries, Vengeance is come on him who murdered my father of the ninth generation. Now it is worthy of remark that the same personifying is also characteristic of the Sai Hyreth.226. This spectral female used to be oftener heard than seen. But her blood-freezing shriek was as a rule to be heard when she came to a crossroad or to water, in which she splashed with her hands. At the same time she would make the most doleful noise and exclaim, in case the frightened hearer happened to be a wife, FYNGWR, FYNGWR. My husband, my husband. If it was the man the exclamation would be, FY and Greg, FY and Greg. My wife, my wife. Or in either case it might be, FY Mlenton, FY Mlenton, FY Mlenton Bach. My child, my child, my little child. These cries meant the approaching death of the hearer's husband, wife, or CHLLD, as the case might be. But if the scream was inarticulate it was reckoned probable that the hearer himself was the person forewarned. Sometimes she was supposed to come, like the Irish banshee, in a dark mist to the window of a person who has been long alling, and to flap her wings against the glass, while repeating aloud his or her name. Which was believed to mean that the patient must die 227. The picture usually given of the Sihirith is of the most repellent kind, tangled hair, long black teeth, wretched, skinny, shriveled arms of unwanted length out of all proportion to the body. Nevertheless it is, in my opinion, but another aspect of the banshee-like female who intervenes in the story of the curse of Pentanus. One might perhaps treat both as survivals of a belief in a sort of personification of, or divinity identified with, a family or tribe. But for the fact that such language is emptied of most of its meaning by the abstractions which it would connect with a primitive state of society. So it is preferable, as coming probably near the truth, to say that what we have here is a trace of an ancestress. Such an idea of an ancestress as against that of an ancestor is abundantly countenanced by dim figures like that of the dawn of the Mabinogen, and of her counterpart after whom the tribes of the goddess Donu or Danu 228 are known as Tuatha Dé Danann in Irish literature. But the one who most provokes comparison is the old woman of beer, already mentioned, she figures largely in Irish folklore as a hag surviving to see her descendants reckoned by tribes and peoples. It may be only an accident that a poetically wrought legend pictures her not so much interested in the fortunes of her progeny as engaged in bewailing the unattractive appearance of her thin arms and shriveled hands. Together with the general wreck of the beauty which had been hers some time or other centuries before. However, the evidence of folklore is not of a kind to warrant our building any heavy superstructure of theory on the supposition, that the foundations are firmly held together by a powerful sense of consistency or homogeneity. So I should hesitate to do anything so rash as to pronounce the fairies to be all of one and the same origin, they may well be of several. For instance, there may be those that have grown out of traditions about an aboriginal pre-Celtic race, and some may be the representatives of the ghosts of departed men and women, regarded as one's ancestors. But there can hardly be any doubt that others, and those possibly not the least interesting, 
have originated in the demons and divinities not all of ancestral origin with which the weird fancy of our remote forefathers peopled lakes and streams, bays and creeks and estuaries. Perhaps it is not too much to hope that the reader is convinced that in the course of this chapter some interesting specimens have, so to say, been caught in their native element, or else in the enjoyment of an amphibious life of mirth and frolic. Largely spent hard by sequestered lakes, near placid rivers or babbling brooks. Chapter 8 Welsh Cave Legends I in previous chapters sundry allusions have been made to treasure caves besides that of March Lynn Mar, which has been given above. Here follow some more, illustrative of this kind of folklore prevalent in Wales, they are difficult to classify, but most of them mention treasure with or without sleeping warriors guarding it. The others are so miscellaneous as to baffle any attempt to characterize them generally and briefly. Take for instance a cave in the part of Ryeworth Rock nearest to Kumel Lanhafan, in the neighborhood of Langinog in Montgomeryshire. Into that, according to Sindel in the Brithen for 180, page 57, some men penetrated as far as the pound of candles lasted, with which they had provided themselves. But it appears to be tenanted by a hag who is always bustily washing clothes in a brass pan. Or take the following, from J. H. Roberts' essay, as given in Welsh in Edward Simru for 1897, p. 190, it reminds one of an ordinary fairy tale, but it is not quite like any other which I happen to know, in the western end of the Arenic for there is a cave, in fact there are several caves there, and some of them are very large too. But there is one to which the finger of tradition points as an ancient abode of the TYLWYTH tag. About two generations ago, the shepherds of that country used to be enchanted by one of them called Mary, who was remarkable for her beauty. Many an effort was made to catch her or to meet her face to face, but without success, as she was too quick on her feet. She used to show herself day after day, and she might be seen, with her little harp, climbing the bare slopes of the mountain. In misty weather when the days were longest in summer, the music she made used to be wafted by the breeze to the ears of the lovesick shepherds. Many a time had the boys of the Filtier Garrig heard sweet singing when passing the cave in the full light of day, but they were subject to some spell, so that they never ventured to enter. But the shepherd of Bach Y. Rayager had a better view of the fairies one All Hallows night, R. Y. W. Nosan Galangif, when returning home from a merrymaking at Amnod. On the sward in front of the cave what should he see but scores of the TYLWYTH tags singing and dancing. He never saw another assembly in his life so fair, and great was the trouble he had to resist being drawn into their circles. Let us now come to the treasure caves, and begin with Ogoff Arthur, Arthur's Cave, in the southern side of MYDDYCNWC 229 in the parish of Langwifan, on the southwestern coast of Anglesey. The foot of MYDDYCNWC is washed by the sea, and the mouth of the cave is closed by its waters at high tide, but the cave, which is spacious, has a vent hole in the side of the mountain 230. So it is at any rate reported in the Brithen for 1859, page 138, by a writer who explored the place, though not to the end of the Emily which it is said to measure in length. He mentions a local tradition, that it contains various treasures, and that it temper LLY afforded Arthur shelter in the course of his wars with the Gwydalod or Goidals. But he describes also a cromlech on the top of MYNYDDYCNWC, around which there was a circle of stones, WH Lee within the latter there lies buried, it is believed, an iron chest full of ancient gold. Various attempts are said to have been made by the more greedy of the neighboring inhabitants to dig it up, but they have always been frightened away by portents. Here then the guardians of the treasure are creatures of a supernatural kind, as in many other instances, and especially that of Dinah's Emery's to be mentioned presently. Next comes the first of a group of cave legends involving treasure entrusted to the keeping of armed warriors. It is taken from Elijah Waring's Recollections and Anecdotes of Edward Williams, Lolo Morganwood, London, 1850, pp. 95-8 where it is headed a popular tale in Glamorgan, by Iolo Morganwick, a version of it in Welsh WLLL be found in the Brithen for 1858, p. 162, but Waring's version is in several respects better, 
and I give it in his words, a Welshman walking over London Bridge, with a neat hazel staff in his hand, was accosted by an Englishman, who asked him whence he came. I am from my own country, answered the Welshman, in a churlish tone. Do not take it amiss, my friend, said the Englishman, if you will only answer my questions, and take my advice, it will be of greater benefit to you than you imagine. That stick in your hand grew on a spot under which are hid vast treasures of gold and silver, and if you remember the place, and can conduct me to it, I will put you in possession of those treasures. The Welshman soon understood that the stranger was what he called a cunning man, or conjurer, and for some time hesitated, not willing to go with him among devils, from whom this magician must have derived his knowledge. But he was at length persuaded to accompany him into Wales, and going to Craig Wydinus, rock of the fortress, the Welshman pointed out the spot whence he had cut the stick. It was from the stalk or root of a large old hazel, this they dug up, and under it found a broad flat stone. This was found to close up the entrance into a very large cavern, down into which they both went. In the middle of the passage hung a bell, and the conjurer earnestly cautioned the Welshman not to touch it. They reached the lower part of the cave, which was very wide, and there saw many thousands of warriors lying down fast asleep in a large circle, their heads outwards, every one clad in bright armor, with their swords, shields, and other weapons lying by them, ready to be laid hold on in an instant, whenever the bell should ring and awake them. All the arms were so highly polished and bright, that they lumined the cavern, as with the light of ten thousand flames of fire. They saw amongst the warriors one greatly distinguished from the rest by his arms, shield, battle-axe, and a crown of gold set with the most precious stones, lying by his side. In the midst of this circle of warriors they saw two very large heaps, one of gold, the other of silver. The magician told the Welshman that he might take as much as he could carry away of either the one or the other, but that he was not to take from both the heaps. The Welshman loaded himself with gold, the conjurer took none, saying that he did not want it, that gold was of no use but to those who wanted knowledge. And that his contempt of gold had enabled him to acquire that superior knowledge and wisdom which he possessed. In their way out he cautioned the Welshman again not to touch the bell, but if unfortunately he should do so, it might be of the most fatal consequence to him, as one or more of the warriors would awake, lift up his head, and ask if it was day. Should this happen, said the cunning man, you must, without hesitation, answer no, sleep thou on, on hearing which he will again lay down his head and sleep. In their way up, however, the Welshman, overloaded with gold, was not able to pass the bell without touching itit it rang one of the warriors raised up his head, and asked, is it day? No, answered the Welshman promptly, it is not, sleep thou on. So they got out of the cave, laid down the stone over its entrance, and replaced the hazel tree. The cunning man, before he parted from his companion, advised him to be economical in the use of his treasure. Observing that he had, with prudence, enough for life, but that if by unforeseen accidents he should be again reduced to poverty, he might repair to the cave for more. Repeating the caution, not to touch the bell if possible, but if he should, to give the proper answer, that it was not day, as promptly as possible. He also told him that the distinguished person they had seen was Arthur, and the others his warriors. And they lay there asleep with their arms ready at hand, for the dawn of that day when the Black Eagle and the Golden Eagle should go to war, the loud clamor of which would make the earth tremble so much, that the bell would ring loudly. And the warriors awake, take up their arms, and destroy all the enemies of the Kimri, who afterwards should repossess the island of Britain, re-establish their own king and government at Caerleon, and be governed with justice. And blessed with peace so long as the world endures. The time came when the Welshman's treasure was all spent, he went to the cave, and as before overloaded himself. In his way out he touched the bell, it rang, a warrior lifted up his head, asking if it was day, but the Welshman, who had covetously overloaded himself, being quite out of breath with laboring under his burden, and withal struck with terror, was not able to give the necessary answer. Whereupon some of the warriors got up, took the gold away from him, and beat him dreadfully. They afterwards threw him out, and drew the stone after them over the mouth of the cave. 
The Welshman never recovered the effects of that beating, but remained almost a cripple as long as he lived, and very poor. He often returned with some of his friends to Craig Wydinus. But they could never afterwards find the spot, though they dug over, seemingly, every inch of the hill. This story of Iolo's closes with a moral, which I omit in order to make room for what he says in a note to the effect. That there are two HLLLS in Glamorganshire called Craig Y. Dinas nowadays the more usual pronunciation in South Wales is Craig Y. Dinas one in the parish of Lantrasant and the other in Istrad Difod. There was also a HLLL so called, Iolo says, in the Vale of Toei, not far from Carmarthen. He adds that in Glamorgan the tale is related of the Camarthenshire Hill, while in Camarthenshire the hill is said to be in Glamorgan. According to Iolo's son, Taliesin W. Liams 231 or Taliesin of Iolo, the Craig Y. Dinas with which the cave of Arthur, or Owen Logok, is associated is the one on the borders of Glamorgan and Brecknockshire. That is also the opinion of my friend Mr. Reynolds, who describes this Craig and Dinas as a very bold rocky eminence at the top of the Neath Valley, near Pont Ned Fesham. He adds that in this tale as related to his mother, in her very young days by a very old woman, known as Mari Shenson Y. Clockett, Jenkin the Sexton's Mary, the place of Arthur was taken by Owen Logok, Owen of the Red Hand, of whom more anon. The next Arthurian story is not strictly in point, for it makes no allusion to treasure, but as it is otherwise so similar to Lolo's tale I cannot well avoid introducing it here. It is included in the composite story of Buca, RTRZWIN, The Bogey of the Nose, written out for me in Gwentian Welsh by Mr. Craig Fryn Hughes. The cave portion relates how a Monmouthshire farmer, whose house was grievously troubled by the bogey, set out one morning to call on a wizard who lived near Curlian. And how he on his way came up with a very strange and odd man who wore a three-cornered hat. They fell into conversation, and the strange man asked the farmer if he should like to see something of a wonder. He answered he would. Come with me then, said the wearer of the cocked hat, and you shall see what nobody else alive today has seen. When they had reached the middle of a wood this spiritual guide sprang from horseback and kicked a big stone near the road. It instantly moved aside to disclose the mouth of a large cave. And now said he to the farmer, dismount and bring your horse in here, tie him up alongside of mine, and follow me so that you may see something which the eyes of man have not beheld for centuries. The farmer, having done as he was ordered, followed his guide for a long distance, they came at length to the top of a flight of stairs, where two huge bells were hanging. I now mind, said the warning voice of the strange guide, not to touch either of those bells. At the bottom of the stairs there was a vast chamber with hundreds of men lying at full length on the floor, each with his head reposing on the stock of his gun. Have you any notion who these men are? No, replied the farmer, I have not, nor have I any idea what they want in such a place as this. Well, said the guide, these are Arthur's thousand soldiers reposing and sleeping till the Kimri have need of them. Now let us get out as fast as our feet can carry us. When they reached the top of the stairs, the farmer somehow struck his elbow against one of the bells so that it rang, and in the twinkling of an eye all the sleeping host rose to their feet shouting together, Are the Kimri in straits? Not yet, sleep you on, replied the wearer of the cocked hat, whereupon they all dropped down on their guns to resume their slumbers at once. These are the valiant men, he went on to say, who are to turn the scale in favor of the Kimri when the time comes for them to cast the Saxon yoke off their necks and to recover possession of their country. When the two had returned to their horses at the mouth of the cave, his guide said to the farmer, Now go in peace. And let me warn you on the pain of death not to utter a syllable about what you have seen for the space of a year and a day, if you do, woe awaits you. After he had moved the stone back to its place the farmer lost sight of him. When the year had lapsed the farmer happened to pass again that way, but, though he made a long and careful search, he failed completely to find the stone at the mouth of the cave. To return to Iolo's yarn, one may say that there are traces of his story as at one time current in Mirionethshire, but with the variation that the Welshman met the wizard not on London Bridge but at a fair at Bala. And that the cave was somewhere in Marioneth, the hero was Arthur, and the cave was known as Ogoff Arthur. 
Whether any such cave is still known I cannot tell, but a third and interestingly told version is given in the Brithen for 1858, p. 179, by the late Gwynionid, who gives the story as the popular belief in his native parish of Trodier or, halfway between Newcastle Emlyn and Aberporth, in South Cardiganshire. In this last version the hero is not Arthur, but the later man as follows, not the least of the wonders of imagination wont to exercise the minds of the old people was the story of Owen Logok. One sometimes hears sung in our fairs the words. Yero Twain H. W. N. Y. W. Harry R. Nafed. This Owen is Henry the Ninth. S. Y. D. D. Y. N. Trigo Englad Estranid, and Who tarries in a foreign land, and But this Owen Logok, the national deliverer of our ancient race of Brythons, did not, according to the Trodier or people, tarry in a foreign land, but somewhere in Wales, not far from Offa's dyke. They used to say that one Daphid Mayrig of Bet was Bledrus, having quarrelled with his father, left for Logar 232, England. When he had got a considerable distance from home, he struck a bargain with a cattle dealer to drive a herd of his beasts to London. Somewhere at the corner of a vast moor Daphid cut a very remarkable hazel stick. For a good staff is as essential to the vocation of a good drover as teeth are to a dog. So while his comrades had had their sticks broken before reaching London, Daffids remained as it was, and whilst they were conversing together on London Bridge a stranger accosted Daffid, wishing to know where he had obtained that wonderful stick. He replied that it was in Wales he had had it, and on the strangers assuring him that there were wondrous things beneath the tree on which it had grown, they both set out for Wales. When they reached the spot and dug a little they found that there was a great hollow place beneath. As night was spreading out her sable mantle, and as they were getting deeper, what should they find but stairs easy to step and great lamps illumining the vast chamber. They descended slowly, with mixed emotions of dread and invincible desire to see the place. When they reached the bottom of the stairs, they found themselves near a large table, at one end of which they beheld sitting a tall man of about seven foot. He occupied an old-fashioned chair and rested his head on his left hand, while the other hand, all red, lay on the table and grasped a great sword. He was withal enjoying a wondrously serene sleep, and at his feet on the floor lay a big dog. After casting a glance at them, the wizard said to David, This is Owen Logok, who is to sleep on till a special time, when he will wake and reign over the Brythons. That weapon in his hand is one of the swords of the ancient kings of Prydain. No battle was ever lost in which that sword was used. Then they moved slowly on, gazing at the wonders of that subterranean chamber. And they beheld everywhere the arms of ages long past, and on the table thousands of gold pieces bearing the images of the different kings of Prydain. They got to understand that it was permitted them to take a handful of each, but not to put any in their purses. They both visited the cave several times, but at last Daphid put in his purse a little of the gold bearing the image of one of the bravest of Owen's ancestors. But after coming out again they were never able any more to find Owen's subterranean palace. Those are, says Gwynionid, the ideas cherished by the old people of Trodier or in Caradigion, and the editor adds a note that the same sort of story is current among the peasantry of Cumberland, and perhaps of other parts of Britain. This remark WLLL at once recalled to the reader's mind the well-known verses 233 of the Scottish poet, Lydon, as to Arthur asleep in a cave in the Eildon Hills in the neighbourhood of Melrose Abbey. But he will naturally ask why London Bridge is introduced into this and Iolo's story, and in answer I have to say, firstly, that London Bridge formerly loomed very large in the popular imagination as one of the chief wonders of London. Itself the most wonderful city in the world. Such at any rate was the notion cherished as to London and London Bridge by the country people of Wales, even within my own memory. Secondly, the fashion of selecting London Bridge as the opening scene of a treasure legend had been set, perhaps, by a widely spread English story to the following effect a certain peddler of Swatham in Norfolk had a dream. That if he went and stood on London Bridge he would have very joyful news. As the dream was doubled and trebled he decided to go. So he stood on the bridge two or three days, when at last a shopkeeper, 
observing that he loitered there so long, neither offering anything for sale nor asking for alms, inquired of him as to his business. The peddler told him his errand, and was heartily laughed at by the shopkeeper, who said that he had dreamt that night that he was at a place called Swaffham in Norfolk. And that if he only dug under a great oak tree in an orchard the peddler's house there, he would find a vast treasure. But the place was utterly unknown to him, and he was not such a fool as to follow a slly dream. No, he was wiser than that, so he advised the peddler to go home to mind his business. The peddler very quietly took in the words as to the dream, and hastened home to Swaffham, where he found the treasure in his own orchard. The rest of the story need not be related here, as it is quite different from the Welsh ones, which the reader has just had brought under his notice 234. To return to Owen Logok, for we have by no means done with him, on the farm of Sillier Eichen there stands a remarkable limestone hill called Wydinus, the fortress, hardly a mile to the north of the village of Landiby, in Camadenshire. This dinas and the lime kills that are gradually consuming it are to be seen on the right from the railway as you go from El Landilo to El Landibi. It is a steep high rock which forms a very good natural fortification, and in the level area on the top is the mouth of a very long cavern, known as Ogor Dinas, the Dinas Cave. The entrance into it is small and low, but it gradually widens out, becoming in one place lofty and roomy with several smaller branch caves leading out of it. And it is believed that some of them connect Ogor Dinas with smaller caves at Pant Yllyn, the Lake Hollow, where, as the name indicates, there is a small lake a little higher up, both Ogor Dinas and Pant Yllyn are within a mile of the village of Landy B. 235. Now I am informed, in a letter written in 1893 by one native, that the local legend about Ogor Dinas is that Owen Logok and his men are lying asleep in it, while another native, Mr. Fisher, writing in the same year, but on the authority of somewhat later hearsay, expresses himself as follows, I remember hearing two traditions respecting Ogor Dinas, one, that King Arthur and his warriors lie sleeping in it with their right hands clasping the hilts of their drawn swords ready to encounter anyone who may venture to disturb their repose is there not a Dinas somewhere in Kernarvonshire with a similar legend? Two, that Owen Logok lived in it some time or other, that is all that I remember having heard about him in connection with this Ogof. Mr. Fisher proceeds, moreover, to state that it is said of an Ogof at Pant Yllyn, that Owen Logok and his men on a certain occasion took refuge in it, where they were shut up and starved to death. He adds that, however this may be, it is a fact that in the year 1813 10 or more human skeletons of unusual stature were discovered in an Ogoff there. 236. To this I may append a reference to the Geninan for 1896, page 84, here Mr. Lafer Thomas, who is also a native of the district, alludes to the local belief that Owen Logok and his men are asleep, as already mentioned, in the cave of Pant Y.R. Y.N., and that they are to go on sleeping their tlll a trumpet blast and the clash of arms on Rye Gotch rouse them to sally forth to combat the Saxons and to conquer, as set forth by Howells, see above. It is needless to say that there is no reason, as WLLL be seen presently, to suppose Owen Logok to have ever been near any of the caves to which allusion has here been made. But that does not appreciably detract from the fascination of the legend which has gathered round his personality. And in passing I may be allowed to express my surprise that in such stories as these the earlier Owen has not been eclipsed by Owen GLYNDWR, there must be some historical reason why that has not taken place. Can it be that a habit of caution made Welshmen speak of Owen Logok when the other Owen was really meant? The passage I have cited from Mr. Fisher's letter raises the question of a dinas in Kernarvonshire, which that of his native parish recalled to his mind, and this is to be considered next. Doubtless he meant Dinas Emery's formerly called Din Emrius 237, the fortress of Ambrosius, situated near Bedgelert, and known in the neighborhood simply as Y. Dinas, the fort. It is celebrated in the Vortigern legend as the place where the dragons had been hidden, that frustrated the building of that king's castle. And the spot is described in Lewis' Topographical Dictionary of Wales, in the article on Bethgelart, Bedgelert, as an isolated rocky eminence with an extensive top area, 
which is defended by walls of loose stones, and accessible only on one side. He adds that the entrance appears to have been guarded by two towers, and that within the enclosed area are the foundations of circular buildings of loose stones forming walls of about five feet in thickness. Concerning that dinas we read in the Brithen for 1861, p. 329, a legend to the following effect now after the departure of Vortigern, Merton, or Merlin as he is called in English, remained himself in the dinas for a long time, until, in fact, he went away with Emery's Benor. Ambrosius the gold-headed evidently Aurelius Ambrosius is meant. When he was about to set out with the latter, he put all his treasure and wealth into a crotchen or, a gold cauldron, and hid it in a cave in the dinas, and on the mouth of the cave he rolled a huge stone, which he covered up with earth and sods. So that it was impossible for any one to find it. He intended this wealth to be the property of some special person in a future generation, and it is said that the heir to it is to be a youth with yellow hair and blue eyes. When that one comes near to the dinas a bell will ring to invite him to the cave, which will open of itself as soon as his foot touches it. Now the fact that some such legend was once currently believed about Bedgelert and Nanhuanen is proved by the curious stories as to various attempts made to find the treasure. And the thunderstorms and portents which used to vanquish the local greed for gold. For several instances in point see the Brithen, pages 329 to 30, and for others, showing how hidden treasure is carefully reserved for the right sort of air, see above. To prove how widely this idea prevailed in Kernavonshire. I may add a short story which misses. William Zealous of Glasfren got from the engineer who told her of the sacred eel of Langibi, there was on Penterch, the hill above Elangibai, he said, a large stone so heavy and fixed so fast in the ground that no horses. No men could move it, it had often been tried. One day, however, a little girl happened to be playing by the stone, and at the touch of her little hand the stone moved. A hoard of coins was found under it, and that at a time when the little girl's parents happened to be in dire need of it. Search had long been made by undeserving men for treasure supposed to be hidden at that spot, but it was always unsuccessful until L the right person touched the stone to move. The failure of the wrong person to secure the treasure, even when discovered, is illustrated by a story given by Mr. Durfel Hughes in his Antiquities of Landegai and Lanlakid, pp. 35-6, to the effect that a servant man, somewhere up among the mountains near Ogwen Lake, chanced to come across the mouth of a cave with abundance of vessels of brass, pres, of every shape and description within it. He went at once and seized one of them, but, alas! It was too heavy for him to stir it. So he resolved to go away and return early on the morrow with a friend to help him. But before going he closed the mouth of the cave with stones and sod so as to leave it safe. W. H. Lee thus engaged he remembered having heard how others had like him found caves and fall to refine them. He could procure nothing read LLY that would satisfy him as a mark, so it occurred to him to dot his path with the chippings of his stick. Which he whittled all the way as he went back unt LL he came to a fam wire track, the chips were to guide him back to the cave. So when the morning came he and his friend set out, but when they reached the point where the chips should begin, not one was to be seen, the TYLWYTH tag had picked up every one of them. So that discovery of articles of brass more probably bronze was in vain. But, says the writer, it is not fated to be always in vain, for there is a tradition in the valley that it is a guidal, goidal, Irishman, who is to have these treasures. And that it WLLL happen in this wise a guidal will come to the neighborhood to be a shepherd, and one day when he goes up the mountain to see to the sheep. Just when it pleases the fates a black sheep with a speckled head WLLL run before him and make straight for the cave, the sheep will go in, with the guidal in pursuit trying to catch him. When the guidal enters he sees the treasures, looks at them with surprise, and takes possession of them, and thus, in some generation to come, the guidal will have their own restored to them. That is the tradition which Durfel Hughes found in the Vale of the Ogwen, and he draws from it the inference which it seems to warrant. In words to the following effect, perhaps this shows us that the guidal had some time or other something to do with these parts, and that we are not to regard as stories without foundations all that is said of that nation. 
And the sayings of old people to this day show that there is always some spite between our nation and the Guidel. Thus, for instance, he goes on to say, if a man proves changeable, he is said to have become a Guidel, why may Wedi Troyan Guidel, or if one is very shameless and cheeky he is called a Guidel and told to hold his tongue, Toy your hen Guidel. And a number of such locutions used by our people proves, he thinks, the former prevalence of much contention between the two sister nations. Expressions of the kind mentioned by Mr. Hughes are well known in all parts of the principality, and it is difficult to account for them except on the supposition that Goidels and Brithens lived for a long time face to face, so to say, with one another over large areas in the west of our island. The next story to be mentioned belongs to the same Snowdonian neighborhood, and brings us back to Arthur and his men. For a writer who has already been quoted from the Brithen for 1861, p. 331, makes Arthur and his following set out from Dinah's Emery's and cross half at Wye Borth Mountain for a place above the upper reach of Cumlin, called Tregelin, where they found their antagonists. From Tregelin the latter were pushed up the BWLCH or pass, towards Coombe Dylai, but when the vanguard of the army with Arthur leading had reached the top of the pass, the enemy discharged a shower of arrows at them. There Arthur fell, and his body was buried in the pass so that no enemy might march that way so long as Arthur's dust rested there. That, he says, is the story, and there to this day remains in the pass, he asserts, the heap of stones called Carned Arthur, Arthur's Cairn, the pass is called BWLCHY Sethow, the pass of the arrows. Then Ogoff Lancio Arari is the subject of the following story given at P. 371 of the same volume after Arthur's death on BWLCHY Sethow, his men ascended to the ridge of the Lived and descended thence into a vast cave called Ogoff Lancio Arari, the young men of Snowdonia's cave. Which is in the precipitous cliff on the left hand side near the top of Llyn Lido. This is in Cum Dylai, and there in that cave those warriors are said to be STLLL, sleeping in their armor and awaiting the second coming of Arthur to restore the crown of Britain to the Kimri. For the saying is Lancia, Re Au Gwyn Gyll Ai Henel Hai. Snowdonia's youths with their white hazels will win it. As the local shepherds were one day long ago collecting their sheep on the Lywood, one sheep fell down to a shelf in this precipice. And when the Coombe Dylai shepherd made his way to the spot he perceived that the ledge of rock on which he stood led to the hidden cave of Lancio Arari. There was light within, he looked in and beheld a host of warriors without number all asleep, resting on their arms and ready equipped for battle. Seeing that they were all asleep, he felt a strong desire to explore the whole place. But as he was squeezing in he struck his head against the bell hanging in the entrance. It rang so that every corner of the immense cave rang again, and all the warriors woke uttering a terrible shout, which so frightened the shepherd that he never more enjoyed a day's health. Nor has anybody since dared as much as to approach the mouth of the cave. Thus far the Brithen, and I have only to remark that this legend is somewhat remarkable for the fact of its representing the youths of Ararai sleeping away in their cave without Arthur among them. In fact, that hero is described as buried not very far off beneath a carn or cairn on BWLCHY Sethow. As to the exact situation of that cairn, I may say that my attention was drawn some time ago to the following lines by Mr. W. Liam Owen, better known as Glasslin. A living bard bred and born in the district. Jerfla Karnacht Arthur A. R. Y. S. G. W. Y. D. D. Y. Widfa. Y. Gorv Gwadillion Y. E. A. W. R. N. Wag Rika. Near Arthur's cairn on the shoulder of Snowdon. Lie the remains of the famous giant Rika. These words recall an older couplet in a poem by Rhys Gotch Arari, who is said to have died in the year 1420. He was a native of the parish of Bedgelert, and his words in point run thus. A R Y drum o'er dramor. On the ridge cold and vast. Eno gord rica gore. There the giant rica lies. From this it is clear that re Scotch meant that the cairn on the top of Snowdon covered the remains of the giant whose name has been variously written Rica, Rita, and Rita. So I was impelled to ascertain from Glasslin whether I had correctly understood his lines, 
and he has been good enough to help me out of some of my difficulties, as I do not know Snowden by heart. Especially the Nanhuanan and Bejlert side of the mountain, the cairn on the summit of Snowden was the giant's before it was demolished and made into a sort of tower which existed before the hotel was made. Glasslin has not heard it called after Rika's name, but he states that old people used to call it Karnd Y Kor, the giant's cairn. In 1850 Karnd Arthur, Arthur's cairn, was to be seen on the top of BWLCHY Sethau, but he does not know whether it is still so, as he has not been up there since the building of the hotel. BWLCHY Sethau is a lofty shoulder of Snowden extending in the direction of Nanhuanan, and the distance from the top of Snowden to it is not great, it would take you half an hour or perhaps a little more to walk from the one Karn to the other. It is possible to trace Arthur's march from Dinah's Emery's up the slopes of Hafid Wyborth, over the shoulder of the Aran and break your own to Tregolan or Coombe Tregolan. As it is now called but from Tregolan he would have to climb in a northeasterly direction in order to reach BWHY Sethau, where he is related to have fallen and to have been interred beneath a cairn. This may be regarded as an ordinary or commonplace account of his death. But the scene suggests a far more romantic picture. For down below was LLYN Lydaw with its sequestered isle, connected then by means only of a primitive canoe with a shore occupied by men engaged in working the oar of Ararai. Nay with the eyes of Mallory we seem to watch Bedivere making, with Excalibur in his hands, his three reluctant journeys to the lake ere he yielded it to the arm emerging from the deep. We fancy we behold how, you in fast by the bank hoda lytyl barge with many fair ladies in hit, which was to carry the wounded Arthur away to the accompaniment of mourning and loud lamentation. But the legend of the Marchland bids us modify Mallory's language as to the barge containing many ladies all wearing black hoods. And take our last look at the warrior departing rather in a coracle with three wondrously fair women attending to his wounds. 238. Some further notes on Snowden, together with a curious account of the cave of Lancio Erari, have been kindly placed at my disposal by Mr. Ellis Pierce, Ellis 239 or Nant, of Dalwithelan, in the uppermost part of the hollow called Comelton is Tregolan, and in the middle of Coombe. Tregolan is a green hill, or rather an eminence which hardly forms a hill, but what is commonly called a Bonson 240 in Kernervenshire, and between that green Bonson and the Clogwin Dew, black precipice, is a bog. The depth of which no one has ever succeeded in ascertaining, and a town inferred perhaps from train Tregolan is fabled to have been swallowed up there. Another of my informants speaks of several hillocks or bonsons as forming one side of this little coombe, but he has heard from geologists that these green mounds represent moraines deposited there in the glacial period. From the bottom of the Clogwin Dew it is about a mile to BWLCHY Sethau. Then as to the cave of Lancio Erari, which nobody can now find, the slope down to it begins from the top of the Lywood, but ordinarily speaking one could not descend to where it is supposed to have been without the help of ropes. Which seems incompatible with the story of the Kum Dailai shepherd following a sheep until he was at the mouth of the cave. Not to mention the difficulty which the descent would have offered to Arthur's men when they entered it. Then Elliso or Nant's story represents it shutting after them, and only opening to the shepherd in consequence of his having trodden on a particular sod or spot. He then slid down unintentionally and touched the bell that was hanging there, so that it rang and instantly woke the sleeping warriors. No sooner had that happened than those men of Arthur's took up their guns never mind the anachronism and the shepherd made his way out more dead than alive, and the frightened fellow never recovered from the shock to the day of his death. When these warriors take up their guns they fire away, we are told, without mercy from where each man stands, they are not to advance a single step till Arthur comes to call them back to the world. To swell the irrelevancies under which this chapter labors already, and to avoid severing cognate questions too rudely. I wish to add that Ellis or Nant makes the name of the giant buried on the top of Snowden into Rita or Rita instead of Rica. That is also the form of the name with which Mrs. Reese was familiar throughout her childhood on the Lanberis side of the mountain. She often heard of Rita 241 Gore having been buried on the top of Snowden, and of other warriors on other parts of Snowden such as Mole Jingorian and the gist on that mole but Ellis O. Arnant goes further. And adds that from Rita the mountain was called Widfa Rita, more correctly Gwidfa Rita, Rita's Gwidfa. 
fearing this might be merely an inference, I have tried to cross-examine him so far as that is possible by letter. He replies that his father was bred and B.O.M. in the little glen called Uebrunen 242, between Betwas Y. Coed and Pen Machno, and that his grandfather also lived there. Where he appears to have owned land not far from the home of the celebrated Bishop Morgan. Now Ellis' father often talked, he says, in his hearing of Gwidferida. Wishing to have some more definite evidence, I wrote again, and he informs me that his father was very fond of talking about his father, Ellis or Nance's grandfather, who appears to have been a character and a great supporter of Sir Robert W. Lyons. Especially in a keenly contested political election in 1796, when the latter was opposed by the then head of the Penahan fam LLY. Sometimes the old man from Uebernant would set out in his clocks, clogs or wooden shoes, to visit Sir Robert Williams, who lived at Place Y. Nant, near Beckelslert. On starting he would say to his, text missing. Against the evidence just given, that tradition places right as grave on the top of Snowden, a passing mention by Durful Hughes, p. 52, is of no avail, though to the effect that it is on the top of the neighboring mountain called Karn Lywelin, Luland's Cairn, that Rita's Cairn was raised. He deserves more attention, however, when he places Karn Drystan, Tristan or Tristram's Cairn, on a spur of that mountain, to wit, towards the east above Finn and Wyla Faint. 243 For it is worthy of note that the name of Drystan, associated with Arthur in the later romances, should figure with that of Arthur in the topography of the same Snowdon district. Before leaving Snowdon I may mention a cave near a small stream not far from Lly and Gwynane, about a mile and a half above Dinah's Emrys. In the LLWYD letter, printed in the Cambrian Journal for 1859, pp. 142-209, on which I have already drawn, it is called Ogoar GWR Blue, the Hairy Man's Cave. And the story relates how the GWR Blue who lived in it was fatally wounded by a woman who happened to be at home, alone, in one of the nearest farmhouses when the GWR Blue came to plunder it. Its sole interest here is that a later version 244 identifies the hairy man with Owen Logok, after modifying the former's designation YGWR Blue, which literally meant, the hair man, into YGWR Bluewog, the hairy man. This doubtful instance of the presence of Owen Logok in the folklore of North Wales seems to stand alone. Some of these cave stories, it will have been seen, reveal to us a hero who is expected to return to interfere again in the affairs of this world. And it is needless to say that Wales is by no means alone in the enjoyment of imaginary prospects of this kind. The same sort of poetic expectation has not been unknown, for instance, in Ireland. In the summer of 1894, I spent some sunny days in the neighborhood of the Boyne, and one morning I resolved to see the chief burial mounds dotting the banks of that interesting river. But before leaving the hotel at Drogheda, my attention was attracted by a book of railway advertisement of the kind which forcibly impels one to ask two questions, why will not the railway companies leave those people alone who do not want to travel? And why will they make it so tedious for those who do? But on turning the leaves of that booklet over I was inclined to a suaver mood, as I came on a paragraph devoted to an ancient stronghold called the Grianon of A. Leach, or Green and Ely, in the highlands of Donegal. Here I read that a thousand armed men sit resting there on their swords, and bound by magic sleep till they are to be called forth to take their part in the struggle for the restoration of Aaron's freedom. At intervals they awake, it is said, and looking up from their trance they ask in tones which solemnly resound through the many chambers of the Grianon, is the time come? A loud voice, that of the spiritual caretaker, is heard to reply, the time is not yet. They resume their former posture and sink into their sleep again. That is the substance of the words I read, and they call to my mind the legend of such heroes of the past as Barbarossa, with his sleep interrupted only by his change of posture once in seven years. Of Dom Sebastian, for centuries expected from Moslem lands to restore the glories of Portugal, of the Cid Rodrigo, expected back to do likewise with the kingdom of Castle. And last, but not least, of the O'Donoghue who sleeps beneath the lakes of Kailarney, ready to emerge to right the wrongs of Aaron. With my head full of these and the like dreams of folklore, I was taken over the scene of the Battle of the Boyne. 
and the car driver, having vainly tried to interest me in it, gave me up in despair as an uncultured savage who felt no interest in the history of Ireland. However he somewhat changed his mind when, on reaching the first ancient burial mound, he saw me disappear underground, fearless of the farmery, and he began to wonder whether I should ever return to pay him his fare. This in fact was the sheet anchor of all my hopes, for I thought that in case I remained fast in a narrow passage, or lost my way in the chambers of the prehistoric dead, the Jarvie must fetch me out again. So by the time I had visited three of these ancient places, Douth, Nouth, and New Grange, I had risen considerably in his opinion, and he bethought him of stories older than the Battle of the Boyne. So he told me on the way back several bits of something less drearily historical. Among other things, he pointed in the direction of a place called R.D. in the county of Louth, where, he said, there is Gary Geologue's enchanted fort full of warriors in magic sleep, with Gary Geologue himself in their midst. Once on a time a herdsman is said to have strayed into their hall, he said, and to have found the sleepers each with his sword and his spear ready to hand. But as the intruder could not keep his hands off the metal wealth of the place, the owners of the spears began to rouse themselves, and the intruder had to flee for his life. But there that armed host is awaiting the eventful call to arms, when they are to sally forth to restore prosperity and glory to Ireland. That was his story, and I became all attention as soon as I heard of R.D., which is in Irish ADH Fair Dead, or the Ford of Fair Dead, so called from Fair Dead, who fought a protracted duel with Kfishalane in that ford, where at the end. According to a well-known Irish story, he fell by Kfishalane's hand. I was stlll more exercised by the name of Gary Geerlog, as I recognized in Gary an Anglo-Irish pronunciation of the Norse name Godfrader, later Godrod, sometimes rendered Godfrey and sometimes Godred. W. H. Lee in Man and in Scotland it has become Gory, which may be heard also in Ireland. I thought, further, that I recognized the latter part of Gary Geerlog's designation as the Norse female name Geerlog. There was no complete lack of Garys in that part of Ireland in the 10th and 11th centuries. But I have not yet found any historian to identify for me the warrior named or nicknamed Gary Geerlog, who is to return blinking to this world of ours when his nap is over. Leaving Ireland, I was told the other day of a place called Tom na Hurich, near Inverness, where Finn and his following are resting, each on his left elbow, enjoying a broken sleep W. H. Lee waiting for the note to be sounded. Which is to call them forth. What they are then to do I have not been told, it may be that they will proceed at once to solve the crofter question, for there will doubtless be one. It appears, to come back to Wales, that King Cadwallader, who waged an unsuccessful war with the Angles of Northumbria in the 7th century, was long after his death expected to return to restore the Brythons to power. At any rate so one is led in some sort of a hazy fashion to believe in reading several of the poems in the manuscript known as the Book of Taliesin. One finds, however, no trace of Cadwallader in our cave legends, the heroes of them are Arthur and Owen Logok. Now concerning Arthur one need at this point hardly speak, except to say that the Welsh belief in the eventual return of Arthur was at one time a powerful motive affecting the behaviour of the people of Wales, as was felt, for instance, by English statesmen in the reign of Henry II. But by our time the expected return of Arthur or Rex K. Futurus has dissipated itself into a commonplace of folklore fitted only to point an allegory, as when Elvet Lewis, one of the sweetest of living Welsh poets, sings in a poem entitled Arthur Guida and I, Arthur with us. May Arthur for Yn Sisku. Great Arthur still is sleeping. A I Dirian S Y D D Oidilu. His warriors all around him. O Gafail A R Y Cled. With grip upon the steel. Pan Da Y N D D Y D D and Gimru. When dawns the day on Cambry. Da Arahur for I Finu. Great Arthur forth will sally. Y-N-F-Y-W, for I Finu. Alive to work her wheel. Not so with regard to the hopes associated with the name of Owen Logok, for we have it on Gwynionid's testimony, p. 464, that our old Bailedweir or ballad men used to sing about him at Welsh fairs, it is not in the least improbable that they still do so here and there. 
Unless the horrors of the ghastly murder last reported in the newspapers have been found to pay better. At any rate Mr. Fisher, page 379, has known old people in his native district in the LLYCHWR Valley who could repeat stanzas or couplets from the ballads in question. He traces these scraps to a booklet entitled Merlin's Prophecy 245, together with a brief history of his life, taken from the Book of Prognostication. This little book bears no date, but appears to have been published in the early part of the 19th century. It is partly in prose, dealing briefly with the history of Merlin the Wild or Sylvaticus, and the rest consists of two poems. The first of these poems is entitled De Cru Derrigan Merdin, the beginning of Merlin's prognostication, and is made up of forty-nine verses. Several of which speak of Owen as king conquering all his foes and driving out the Saxons, then in the forty-seventh stanza comes the couplet which says, that this Owen is Henry the Ninth, who is tarrying in a foreign land. The other poem is of a more general character, and is entitled The Second Song of Merlin's Prognostication, and consists of twenty-six stanzas of four lines each like the previous one. But the third stanza describes Arthur's bell at Carleon, Curleon, ringing with great vigor to herald the coming of Owen. And the seventh stanza begins with the following couplet. Sir Gwild Owen Logach Yn Dod I Fridain for. Sir Gwild Nuin Saniog Yn Ref Gerfiangor. Owen Logach One Shall to Britain Coming See. And Dearth of Pennies Find at Chester on the D. It closes with the date in verse at the end, to wit, 1668, which takes us back to very troublous times, 1668 was the year of the Triple Alliance of England, Sweden, and Holland against Louis XIV. And it was not long after the plague had raged, and London had had its great fire. So it is a matter of no great surprise if some people in Wales had a notion that the power of England was fast nearing its end. And that the Bailedweir thought it opportune to refurbish and adapt some of Merlin's prophecies as likely to be acceptable to the peasantry of South Wales. At all events we have no reason to suppose that the two poems which have here been described from Mr. Fisher's data represented either the gentry of Wales, whose ordinary speech was probably for the most part English, or the Bardic fraternity, who would have looked with contempt at the language and style of the prognostication. For, apart from careless printing, this kind of literature can lay no claim to merit in point of diction or of meter. Such productions represent probably the Bailedweir and the simple country people, such as STLLL listen in rapt attention to them doing at Welsh fairs and markets what they are pleased to regard as singing. All this fits in well enough with the folklore of the caves, such as the foregoing stories represent it. Here I may add that I am informed by Mr. Craig Fryn hues of a tradition that Arthur and his men are biding their time near Curleon on the Usk, to wit, in a cave resembling generally those described in the foregoing legends. He also mentions a tradition as to Owen Glyndwr so he calls him, though it is unmistakably the Owen of the Bailedweir who have been referred to by Mr. Fisher that he and his men are similarly slumbering in a cave in Craig Girthian, in Camothenshire. That is a spot in the neighborhood of Landisel, consisting of an elevated field terminating on one side in a sharp declivity, with the foot of the rock laved by the stream of the Teophi. Craig Girthian means Vortigern's Rock, and it is one of the sites with which legend associates the name of that disreputable old king. I am not aware that it shows any traces of ancient works, but it looks at a distance an ideal site for an old fortification. An earlier prophecy about Owen Logok than any of these occurs, as kindly pointed out to me by Mr. Gwenid Vern Evans, in the Peniarth MS 94, equals Hanger MS 412, page 23, and points back possibly to the last quarter of the 14th century. See also one quoted by him, from the Mostyn MS 133, in his report on Mises in the Welsh language, I, 106. Probably many more such prophecies might be discovered if anybody undertook to make a systematic search for them. But who was Owen Logok, if there ever was such a man? Such a man there was undoubtedly. For we read in one of the documents printed in the miscellaneous volume commonly known as the Record of Carnarvon. 
That at a court held at Conway in the forty-fourth year of Edward III a certain Gruffy says was adjudged to forfeit all the lands which he held in Anglesey to the Prince of Wales who was at that time no other than Edward the Black Prince for the reason that the said Gruffy had been an adherent of Owen, adherens fuisit a wino logog, or logo, inimico et proditori predicti domini principis et de cons lio predictio wini ad muendum garum in willia contra tradictum dominum principem. 246. How long previously it had been attempted to begin a war on behalf of this Owen Logok one cannot say, but it so happens that at this time there was a captain called Ewains, Ewains, or Yvain de Gales or Gauls, Owen of Wales. Fighting on the French side against the English in Edward's Continental Wars. Froissart in his chronicles has a great deal to say of him, for he distinguished himself greatly on various critical occasions. From the historian's narrative one finds that Owen had escaped when a boy to the court of Flip VI of France, who received him with great favour and had him educated with his own nephews. Froissart's account of him is, that the King of England, Edward III, had slain his father and given his lordship and principality to his own son as Prince of Wales. And Froissart gives Owen's father's name as Eamon, which should mean Edmund, unless the name intended may have been rather Ion. However that may have been, Owen was engaged in the Battle of Poitiers in 1356, and when peace was made he went to serve in Lombardy, but when war between England and France broke out again in 1369, he returned to France. He sometimes fought on sea and sometimes on land, but he was always entrusted by the French king, who was now Charles V, with important commands 247. Thus in 1372 he was placed at the head of a flotilla with 3,000 men, and ordered to operate against the English, he made a descent on the Isle of Guernsey 248, and while there besieging the castle of Cornet. He was charged by the King of France to Saul to Spain to invite the King of Castle to send his fleet again to help in the attack on La Rochelle. Whilst staying at Santander the Earl of Pembroke was brought thither, having been taken prisoner in the course of the destruction of the English fleet before La Rochelle. Owen, on seeing the Earl of Pembroke, asks him with bitterness if he is come there to do him homage for his land, of which he had taken possession in Wales. He threatens to avenge himself on him as soon as he can, and also on the Earl of Hereford and Edward Spencer, for it was by the fathers of these three men, he said, his own father had been betrayed to death. Edward III died in 1377, and the Black Prince had died shortly before. Owen survived them both, and was actively engaged in the siege of Mortain sur Mer in Poitou, when he was assassinated by one lamb, who had insinuated himself into his service and confidence. Partly by pretending to bring him news about his native land and telling him that all Wales was longing to have him back to be the lord of his country et Louis Fist a croire que tout le terre de Gales le desiroyant mount au revoir à seigneur. So Owen fell in the year 1378, and was buried at the church of St. Leger 249, while Lamb returned to the English to receive his stipulated pay. When this happened Owen's namesake, Owen Glwndwr, was nearly thirty years of age. The latter was eventually to assert with varying fortune on several fields of battle in this country the claims of his elder kinsman, who, by virtue of his memory in France would seem to have rendered it easy for the later Owen to enter into friendly relations with the French court of his day 250. Now as to Yvain de Gaulle's, the Rev. Thomas Price, Carnoinoch, in his Haines Simru, History of Wales, devotes a couple of pages, 735-7, to Froissart's account of him, and he points out that Angherit LLWID, in her edition of Sir John Wynne's History of the Guider Family 251 had found Owen Logok to have been Owen of Thomas of Rodri, brother to Llewellyn, the last native prince of Wales. One of the names, however, among other things, forms a difficulty, why did Froissart call Yvain's father Eamon? So it is clear that a more searching study of Welsh pedigrees and other documents, including those at the Record Office 252, has to be made before Owen can be satisfactorily placed in point of succession. For that he was in the right line to succeed the native princes of Wales is suggested both by the eagerness with which all Wales was represented as looking to his return to be the lord of the country, and by the opening words of Froissart in describing what he had been robbed of by Edward III, as being both lordship and principality la seigneurie et principe. 
Be that as it may, there is, it seems to me, little doubt that Yvain de Gauls was no other than the Owen Logok, whose adherent Gruffid says was deprived of his land and property in the latter part of Edward's reign. In the next place, there is hardly room for doubt that the Owen Logok here referred to was the same man whom the Bailedwyr in their jumble of prophecies intended to be Henry IX, that is to say the Welsh successor to the last Tudor king. Henry VIII, and that he was at the same time the hero of the cave legends of divers parts of the Principality, especially South Wales, as already indicated. Now without being able to say why Owen and his analogues should become the heroes of cave legends contemplating a second advent, it is easy to point to circumstances which facilitated their doing so. It is useless to try to discuss the question of Arthur's disappearance. But take Gary Gierlog, for instance, a roving Norseman, as we may suppose from his name, who may have suddenly disappeared with his followers, never more to be heard of in the east of Ireland. In the absence of certain news of his death, it was all the easier to imagine that he was dozing quietly away in an enchanted fortress. Then as to King Cadwallader, who was also, perhaps, to have returned to this world, so little is known concerning his end that historians have no certainty to this day when or where he died. So much the readier therefore would the story gain currency that he was somewhere biding his time to come back to retrieve his lost fortunes. Lastly, there is Owen Logok, the magic of whose name has only been dissipated in our own day, he died in France in the course of a protracted war with the kings of England. It is not likely, then, that the peasantry of Wales could have heard anything definite about his fate. So here also the circumstances were favourable to the cave legend and the dream that he was, whether at home or abroad, only biding his time. Moreover, in all these cases the hope-inspiring delusion gained currency among a discontented people, probably, who felt the sore need of a deliverer to save them from oppression or other grievous hardships of their destiny. The question can no longer be prevented from presenting itself as to the origin of this idea of a second advent of a hero of the past. But in that form it is too large for discussion here, and it would involve a review, for instance, of one of the cardinal beliefs of the Latter-day Saints as to the coming of Christ to reign on earth. And other doctrines supposed to be derived from the New Testament. On the other hand, there is no logical necessity why the expected deliverer should have been in the world before, witness the Jews, who are looking forward not to the return but to the birth and first coming of their Messiah. So the question here may be confined more or less strictly to its cave legend form, and though I cannot answer it, some advance in the direction whence the answer should come may perhaps be made. In the first place, one WLLL have noticed that Arthur and Owen Logok come more or less in one another's way. And the presumption is that Owen Logok has been to a certain extent ousting Arthur, who may be regarded as having the prior claim, not to mention that in the case of the GWR Blue Cave, p. 481, Owen is made by an apparently recent version of the story to evict from his lair a commonplace robber of no special interest. In other words, the Owen Logok legend is, so to say, detected spreading itself 253. That is very possibly just what had happened at a remoter period in the case of the Arthur legend itself. In other words, Arthur has taken the place of some ancient divinity, such as that dimly brought within our ken by Plutarch in the words placed at the head of this chapter. He reproduces the report of a certain Demetrius, sent by the Emperor of Rome to reconnoitre and inspect the coasts of Britain. It was to the effect that around Britain lay many uninhabited islands, some of which are named after deities and some after heroes, and of the islands inhabited, he visited the one nearest to the uninhabited ones. Of this the dwellers were few, but the people of Britain treated them as sacrosanct and inviolable in their persons. Among other things, they related to him how terrible storms, diseases, and portents happened on the occasion of any one of the mighty leaving this life. He adds, moreover there is, they said, an island in which Cronus is imprisoned, with Briarius keeping guard over him as he sleeps, for, as they put it, sleep is the bond forged for Cronus. They add that around him are many divinities, his henchmen and attendants 254. What divinity, Celtic or pre-Celtic, this may have been who recalled Cronus or Saturn to the mind of the Roman officer, it is impossible to say. It is to be noticed that he sleeps and that his henchmen are with him, 
but no allusion is made to treasure. No more is there, however, in Mr. Fisher's version of the story of Ogoar. Dinah's, which, according to him, says that Arthur and his warriors there lie sleeping with their right hands clasping the HLLTS of their drawn swords, ready to encounter any one who may venture to disturb their repose. On the other hand, legends about cave treasure are probably very ancient, and in some at least of our stories the safekeeping of such treasure must be regarded as the original object of the presence of the armed host. The permission supposed to be allowed an intruder to take away a reasonable quantity of the cave gold, I should look at in the light of a sort of protest on the part of the storyteller against the niggardliness of the cave powers. I cannot help suspecting in the same way that the presence of a host of armed warriors to guard some pila of gold and esselvere for unnumbered ages must have struck the fancy of the storytellers as disproportionate. And that this began long ago to cause a modification in the form of the legends. That is to say, the treasure sank into a mere accessory of the presence of the armed men, who are not guarding any such thing so much as waiting for the destined hour when they are to sally forth to make lost causes win. Originally the armed warriors were in some instances presumably the henchmen of a sleeping divinity, as in the story told to Demetrius. But perhaps oftener they were the guardians of treasure, just as much as the invisible agencies are, which bring on thunder and lightning and portents when anyone begins to dig at Dinah's emeries or other spots where ancient treasure lies hidden. There is, it must be admitted, no objection to regarding the attendance of a divinity as at the same time the guardians of his treasure. In none, however, of these cave stories probably may we suppose the principal figure to have originally been that of the hero expected to return among men, he, when found in them, is presumably to be regarded as a comparatively late interloper. But it is, as already hinted, not to be understood that the notion of a returning hero is itself a late one. Quite the contrary, and the question then to be answered is, where was that kind of hero supposed to pass his time till his return? There is only one answer to which Welsh folklore points, and that is, in fairyland. This is also the teaching of the ancient legend about Arthur, who goes away to the Isle of Avalon to be healed of his wounds by the fairy maiden Morgan. And, according to an anonymous poet 255, it is in her charms that one should look for the reason why Arthur tarries so long. Immodis laces eri huris tendit ad allum. Regis Avalonis, ubi virgo regia, vulnus. Ilias Trelins. Sanali member reservat. Ipsa Sibi, vivunc simul, si credcrafas est. Avalon's court see suffering Arthur reach. His wounds are healed, a royal made the leech. His pains assuaged, he now with her must dwell. If we hold true what ancient legends tell. Here may be cited by way of comparison Walter Mape's statement as to the Trinio, concerning whom he was quoted in the first chapter, p. 72 above. He says, that as Trinio was never seen after the losing. Battle in which he and his friends had engaged with a neighboring chieftain, it was believed in the district around Lynn Cifidon, that Trinio's fairy mother had rescued him from the enemy and taken him away with her to her home in the lake. In the case of Arthur it is, as we have seen, a fairy also or a lake lady that intervenes. And there cannot be much room for doubt, that the story representing him going to fairyland to be healed is far older than any which pictures him sleeping in a cave with his warriors and his gold all around him. As for the gold, however, it is abundantly represented as nowhere more common than in the home of the fairies, so this metal treated as a test cannot greatly help us in essaying the distinction here suggested. With regard to Owen Logok, however, one is not forced to suppose that he was ever believed to have sojourned in fairy, the legendary precedent of Arthur as a cave sleeper would probably suffice to open the door for him to enter the recesses of Craig Y. Dinas. As soon as the country folk began to grow weary of waiting for his return. In other words, most of our cave legends have combined together two sets of popular belief originally distinct, the one referring to a hero gone to the world of the fairies and expected some day to return and the other to a hero or god enjoying an enchanted sleep with his retinue all around him. In some of our legends, however, such as that of El Lancho Arari, the process of combining the two sets of story has been left to this day incomplete. Chapter 9 Place Name Stories 
The Dindisekas is a collection of stories, Senchasa, in Middle Irish prose and verse, about the names of noteworthy places, dined, in Ireland plains, mountains, ridges, cairns, lakes, rivers, fords, estuaries, islands, and so forth. But its value to students of Irish folklore, romance, sometimes called history, and topography has long been recognized by competent authorities, such as Petrie, O'Donovan, and Mr. Alfred Nutt. Whitley Stokes I in the previous chapter some folklore has been produced in which we have swine figuring, see more especially that concerned with the HWCH do gooda, above. Now I wish to bring before the reader certain other groups of swine legends not vouched for by oral tradition so much as found in manuscripts more or less ancient. The first three to be mentioned occur in one of the triads 256. I give the substance of it in the three best known versions, premising that the triad is entitled that of the three stout swineherds of the Isle of Prydane. I. 38 Drystan 257 Son of Tafwich who guarded the swine of March son of Merchan while the swineherd went to bid Esselt come to meet him, at the same time Arthur sought to have one sow by fraud or force, and failed. 2. 56 B. Drystan son of Talch with the swine of March of Merchan W. H. Lee the swineherd went on a message to Esset. Arthur and March and Kai and Bedwer came all four to him, but obtained from Drystan not even as much as a single porker, whether by force, by fraud, or by theft. 3. 101 C. The third was Tristan son of Talch, who guarded the swine of March son of Merchan while the swineherd had gone on a message to Essel to bid her appoint a meeting with Tristan. Now Arthur and Marcel and Kai and Bedwer undertook to go and make an attempt on him, but they proved unable to get possession of as much as one porker either as a gift or as a purchase, whether by fraud, by force, or by theft. In this story the well-known love of Drystan and Esselt is taken for granted. But the whole setting is so peculiar and so unlike that of the story of Tristan and Isolt or Isut in the romances, that there is no reason to suppose it in any way derived from the latter. The next portion of the triad runs thus. I. 30b and Prittery son of Pool of Anwen who guarded the swine of Pendaren of Dyft in the Glen of the Cooch in Emlyn. 2. 56a, Prittery son of Pool head of End with the swine of Pendaren of Dyft his foster father. The swine were the seven brought away by Pool head of Anne and given by him to Pendaren of Dyft his foster father, and the Glen of the Cooch was the place where they were kept. The reason why Prittery is called a mighty swineherd is that no one could prevail over him either by fraud or by force 258. 3. 101a, the first was Prittery son of Pool of Pendaren in Dyft 259, who guarded his father's swine while he was in Anne, and it was in the Glen of the Cooch that he guarded them. The history of the pigs is given, so to say, in the Mabinogen. Poole had been able to strike up a friendship and even an alliance with Aran King of Anwen 260 or An, which now means Hades or the other world. And they kept up their friendship partly by exchanging presents of horses, greyhounds, falcons, and any other things calculated to give gratification to the receiver of them. Among other gifts which Prittery appears to have received from the king of N were hobu or mach, pigs, swine, which had never before been heard of in the island of Prydain. The news about this new race of animals, and that they formed sweeter food than oxen, was not long before it reached Gwynet. And we shall presently see that there was another story which flatly contradicts this part of the triad, namely to the effect that Gwydion, nephew of Math king of Gwynet and a great magician, came to Prittery's court at Rudlin. Near Dolobach or High Mead on the Tiafi in what is now the county of Cardigan, and obtained some of the swine by deceiving the king. But, to pass by that for the present, I may say that Dyft seems to have been famous for rearing swine. And at the present day one affects to believe in the neighboring districts that the chief industry in Dyft, more especially in South Cardiganshire, consists in the rearing of parsons, carpenters, and pigs. Perhaps it is also worth mentioning that the people of the southern portion of Dyft are nicknamed by the men of Glamorgan to this day Mach Sir Benfro, the pigs of Pembrokeshire. But why so much importance attached to pigs? I cannot well give a better answer than the reader can himself supply if he will only consider what role the pig plays in the domestic economy of Modem Ireland. 
But, to judge from old Irish literature, it was even more so in ancient times, as pig's meat was so highly appreciated, that under some one or other of its various names it usually takes its place at the head of all flesh meats in Irish stories. This seems the case, for instance, in the medieval story called The Vision of Mackinglin 261, and, to go further back, to the Feast of Bricriu. For instance, one finds it decidedly the case with the champion's portion 262 at that stormy banquet. Then one may mention the story of the fatal feast on Mac D. ADH 6 Great Swine 263, where that beast would have apparently sufficed for the braves both of Connaught and Ulster had Connall Cernak carved fair. And not given more than their share to his own Ultonian friends in order to insult the Connaught men by leaving them nothing but the forelegs. It is right, however, to point out that most of the stories go to show, that the Germans of ancient Erin laid great stress on the pig being properly fed, chiefly on milk and the best kind of meal. It cannot have been very different in ancient Wales. For we read in the story of Perita that, when he sets out from his mother's home full of his mother's counsel, he comes by and by to a pavilion, in front of which he sees food, some of which he proceeds to take according to his mother's advice. Though the gorgeously dressed lady sitting near it has not the politeness to anticipate his wish. It consisted, we are told, of two bottles of wine, two loaves of white bread, and collops of a milk-fed pig's flesh 264. The home of the fairies was imagined to be a land of luxury and happiness with which nothing could compare in this world. In this certain Welsh and Irish stories agree. And in one of the latter, where the king of the fairies is trying to persuade the queen of Ireland to elope with him, we find that among the many inducements offered her are fresh pig, sweet milk, and ale. 265 Conversely, as the fairies were considered to be always living and to be a very old-fashioned and ancient people, story in the matter of the derivation of the pig from men, see the last chapter. The next story in the triad is, if possible, wilder still, it runs as follows. I. 30C Call son of Calrui 266 who guarded Henwin 267, Dalwir Dalben Sow, which went burrowing as far as the headland of Austin in Kearney and then took to the sea. It was at Abertorogi in Gwent is Coed that she came to land, with Cot keeping his grip on her bristles whatever way she went by sea or by land. Now in May's Gwenith, wheat field, in Gwent she dropped a grain of wheat and a bee, and thenceforth that has been the best place for wheat. Then she went as far as Lonwen in Penfro and there dropped a grain of barley and a bee, and thenceforth Lonwen has been the best place for barley. Then she proceeded to Rye Gyferthuch in Ararai and dropped a wolf cub and an eagle chick. These call gave away, the eagle to the Goidel Brynach from the north, and the wolf to Menwade of Arlichwed, and they came to be known as Menwade's wolf and Brynach as eagle. Then the sow went as far as the main dew at Lanfair in Arfon, and there she dropped a kitten, and that kitten colt cast into the Manai, that came later to be known as Cath Palak, Palak's cat. 2. 56 C. The third was Kal son of Kaluri with the swine of Dafwer Daltben in Dalwer's Glen in Kearney. Now one of the swine was with young Henwen was her name, and it was foretold that the Isle of Prydain would be the worse for her litter. And Arthur collected the host of Prydain and went about to destroy it. Then one sow went burrowing, and at the headland of Hostin in Kearney she took to the sea with the swineherd following her. And in May's Gwenith in Gwent she dropped a grain of wheat and a bee, and ever since May's Gwenith is the best place for wheat and bees. And at Lonian in Penfro she dropped a grain of barley and another of wheat, therefore the barley of Lonian has passed into a proverb. And on Rye Gyferthuch in Arfon she dropped a wolf cub and an eagle chick. The wolf was given to Murgid and the eagle to break a prince from the north, and they were the worse for having them. And at Manfair in Arfon, to wit below the main dew, she dropped a kitten, and from the main dew the swineherd cast it into the sea, but the sons of Palak reared it to their detriment. It grew to be Cath Palak, Palak's cat, and proved one of the three chief molestations of Mona reared in the island, the second was Darenwy, and the third was Edwin King of England. 3. 101b, the second was Kof son of Kalfrui who guarded Dalwaran Dalben Sow, that came burrowing as far as the headland of Penwetic in Kearney and then took to the sea. 
and she came to land at Abertarogi in Gwent is co-ed with Colt keeping his hold of her bristles whithersoever she went on sea or land. At May's Gwyneth in Gwent she dropped three grains of wheat and three bees, and ever since Gwent has the best wheat and bees. From Gwent she proceeded to Dyft and dropped a grain of barley and a porker, and ever since Dyft has the best barley and pigs, it was in Lanio Lan when these were dropped. Afterwards she proceeded to Arfon, Sik, and in Lane she dropped the grain of rye, and ever since Lane and Iphionid have the best rye. And on the side of Rai Gyferthuch she dropped a wolf cub and an eagle chick. Colt gave the eagle to Brynak the goidel of Dinah's Afrin, and the wolf to Menwade lord of Arltechwed, and one often hears of Brynak's wolf and Menwade's eagle, the rider was careless, he has made the owners exchange pests. Then she went as far as the main do in Arfon, where she dropped a kitten and Kal cast it into the Manai. That was the Kath Bollock, sick, Palag's cat, it proved a molestation to the Isle of Mona subsequently. Such are the versions we have of this story, and a few notes on the name seem necessary before proceeding further. Kal is called Kal son of Kaluri in I, 3 O, and Kal son of Kaluri in 2. 56, all that is known of him comes from other triads, I, 32 to 3, 2. 20, and 3. 90. The first two tell us that he was one of the three chief enchanters of the Isle of Prydain, and that he was taught his magic by Rud Iwan the giant learned his magic from Eid, Il, Ig the dwarf and from Kal's son of Kalfri. Nothing is known of Dalwer's Glen in Kearney, or of the person after whom it was named. Kearney is the Welsh for Cornwall, but if Penryn Austin or Hoston is to be identified with Ostcliffe on the Severn Sea in Gloucestershire, the story would seem to indicate a time when Cornwall extended northeastwards as far as that point. The later triad, 3. IOI, avoids Penryn Austin and substitutes Penwedic, which recalls some such a name as Penwade 268 or Penwith in Cornwall, elsewhere Penwedic 269 is only given as the name of the most northern hundred of Caradigion. Gwent is coed means Gwent below the wood or forest, and Aber Tarogi or Tarogi omitted, probably by accident, in 2. 56, is now called Akot Pill, where the small river Tarogi, now called Tragi, discharges itself not very far from Portsquet. May's Gwyneth in the same neighborhood is still known by that name. The correct spelling of the name of the place in Penfro was probably Lonian, but it is variously given as I Lonwen, Lonian, and Lonian, not to mention the Lonio. Lonwen of the later form of the triad, should this last prove to be based on any authority one might suggest Lonian Henwen, so called after the Sow, as the original. The modern Welsh spelling of Lonian would be Lonian, and it is identified by Mr. Edgerton Fillimore with Lonion near Pembroke 270. Rai Gyferthuch, 19, is guessed to have been one of the slopes of Snowdon on the Bejlert side. But I have failed to discover anybody who has ever heard the name used in that neighborhood. Arlichwed was, roughly speaking, that part of Carnarvonshire which drains into the sea between Conway and Bangor. Brynak and Menwade or Mengwade 271 seem to be the names underlying the misreadings in 2. 56. But it is quite possible that Brynak, probably for an Irish Bronak, has here superseded an earlier Urnak or Urnak also a Goidel, to whom I shall have to return in another chapter. Dinah's Afrin 272 is the place called Dinah's Foray on Dand in the story of Lud and Leavelys, where we are told that after Lud had had the two dragons buried there, which had been dug up at the center of his realm, to wit at Oxford, Foray on. After whom the place was called, died of grief. Later it came to be called Dinah's Emrys from Merton Emrys, Merlinus Ambrosius, who induced Vortigern to go away from there in quest of another place to build his castle 273. So the reader will see that the mention of this Dinah's brings us back to a weird spot with which he has been familiarized in the previous chapter, see above. Landfair in Arfon is Landfair is Geir near Port Dinorwig on the Manai Straits, and the main dew should be a black rock or black stone on the southern side of those straits. Darenwi and Kath Palak are both personages on whom light is still wanted. Lastly, by Edwin King of England is to be understood Edwin King of the Angles of Dara and Bernish Nisha, whom Welsh tradition represents as having found refuge for a time in Anglesey.
Now this story as a whole looks like a sort of device for stringing together explanations of the origin of certain place names and of certain local characteristics. Leaving entirely out of the reckoning the whole of mid Wales, that is to say, the more Brythonic portion of the country, it is remarkable as giving to South Wales credit for certain resources, but to North Wales for pests alone and scourges. Except that the writer of the late version bethought himself of Lane and Ify and I as having good land for growing rye. But he was very hazy as to the geography of North Wales both he and the redactors of the other triads equally belonged doubtless to South Wales. Among the place names, Mays Gwenith, the wheat field, is clear. But hardly less so is the case of Aber Tarogi, mouth of the Trogi, where Tarogi is, the pregnancy of animals, from Torig, being with young. So with Rai Gyferthuch, the hillside or ascent of Cypherthuch, where Cypherthuch means, pantings, pangs, labor. The name Main Dew, Black Rock, is left to explain itself. And I am not sure that the original story was not so put as also to explain FF Onion, to wit, as a sort of plural of lawn, full, in reference, let us say, to the full ears of the barley grown there. But the reference to the place names seems to have partly escaped the later tellers of the story or to have failed to impress them as worth emphasizing. They appear to have thought more of explaining the origin of Menwade's wolf and Brynak as eagle. Whether this means in the former case that the district of Aritequi, I was more infested by wolves than any other part of Wales, or that Menwade, lord of Artlechwed, had a wolf as his symbol, it is impossible to say. In another triad, however, I. 23 equals 2, 57, he is reckoned one of the three battle knights who were favorites at Arthur's court, the others being Karadog Freichfras and Llyrl Fuddog or Lud Luragog, while in 3. 29 Menwade's place is taken by a son of his called male here. Similarly with regard to Brynaka's eagle one has nothing to say, except that common parlance some time or other would seem to have associated the eagle in some way with Brynak the goidel. The former prevalence of the eagle in the Snowden district seems to be the explanation of its Welsh name of Ararai as already suggested above and the association of the bird with the goidelic chieftain who had his stronghold under the shadow of. Snowden seems to follow naturally enough. But the details are conspicuous by their scarcity in Welsh literature, though Brynaka's eagle is probably to be identified with the Aquila fabulosa of Ararai, of which Geraldus makes a curious mention 274. Perhaps the final disuse of goidelic speech in the district is to be, to some extent, regarded as accounting for our dearth of data. A change of language involved in all probability the shipwreck of many a familiar mode of thought. And many a homely expression must have been lost in the transition before an equivalent acceptable to the goidel was discovered by him in his adopted idiom. This question of linguistic change will be found further illustrated by the story to which I wish now to pass, namely that of the hunting of TWRCHTRWYTH. It is one of those incorporated in the larger tale known as that of Coolhuchin Owen, the hero and heroine concerned, see the Oxford Mabinogen, pages 135-41, and Guest's Translation, 3, 306-16. TWRCHTRWYTH is pictured as a formidable boar at the head of his offspring, consisting of seven swine, and the TWRCH himself is represented as carrying between his ears a comb, a razor, and a pair of shears. The plot of the cool which renders it necessary that these precious articles should be procured, so cool which prevails on his cousin Arthur to undertake the hunt. Arthur began by sending one of his men, to wit, Men 275 son of Tirgwade, to see whether the three precious things mentioned were really where they were said to be, namely, between TWRCHTRWYTH's ears. Men was a great magician who usually formed one of any party of Arthur's men about to visit a pagan country. For it was his business to subject the inhabitants to magic and enchantment, so that they should end nine T see Arthur's men, while the latter saw them. Men found TWRCHTRWYTH 20, and his offspring at a place in Ireland called Esgir Erbil 276, and in order to approach them he alighted in the form of a bird near where they were. He tried to snatch one of the three precious articles from TWRCHTRWYTH, 
but he only succeeded in securing one of his bristles, whereupon the TWRCH stood up and shook himself so vigorously that a drop of venom from his bristles fell on men. Who never enjoyed a day's health afterwards as long as he lived. Men who now returned and assured Arthur at the treasures were really about the TWRCH's head as it was reported. Arthur then crossed to Ireland with a host and did not stop until he found TWRCH TRWYTH and his swine at Eskir Erval. The hunt began and was continued for several days, but it did not prevent the TWRCH from laying waste a fifth part of Ireland, that is in medieval Irish Coist, a province of the island. Arthur's men, however, succeeded in killing one of the TWRCH's offspring, and they asked Arthur the history 277 of that swine. Arthur replied that it had been a king before being transformed by God into a swine on account of his sins. Here I should remark by the way, that the narrator of the story forgets the death of this young boar, and continues to reckon the TWRCH's herd as seven. Arthur's next move was to send one of his men, GWRHYR, interpreter of tongues 278, to parley with the boars. GWRHYR, in the form of a bird, alighted above where TWRCH TRWYTH and his swine lay, and addressed them as follows, For the sake of him who fashioned you in this shape, if you can speak, I ask one of you to come to converse with Arthur. Answer was made by one of the boars, called Grudgen GWRYCH arraigned, that is, Grudgen Silver Bristle, for like feathers of silver, we are told, were his bristles wherever he went, and whether in woods or on plains, one saw the gleam of his bristles. The following, then, was Grudgeon's answer, by him who fashioned us in this shape, we shall not do so, and we shall not converse with Arthur. Enough evil has God done to us when he fashioned us in this shape, without your coming to fight with us. GWRHYR replied, I tell you that Arthur will fight for the comb, the razor, and the shears that are between the ears of TWRCHTRWYTH. Until his life has first been taken, said Grudgeon, those trinkets shall not be taken, and tomorrow morning we set out hence for Arthur's own country, and all the harm we can, shall we do there. The boars accordingly set out for Wales, while Arthur with his host, his horses, and his hounds, on board his ship Pridwen, kept within sight of them. TWRCHTRWYTH came to land at Porth Clays, a small creek south of Esti. David's, but Arthur went that night to MYNYW, which seems to have been Menevia or St. David's. The next day Arthur was told that the boars had gone past, and he overtook them killing the herds of Kinwas Curvigil, after they had destroyed all they could find in Dugalcliff, whether man or beast. Then the TWRCH went as far as Presalu, a name which survives in that of Preseli or Preseli, as in Preseli Top and Preseli Mountains in North Pembrokeshire. Arthur and his men began the hunt again, while his warriors were ranged on both sides of the Nifer or the river Nevum. The TWRCH then left the glen of the Nevern and made his way to Kuni Kerwin, the name of which survives in that of Mol Kum Kerwin, one of the Preseli Heights. In the course of the hunt in that district the TWRCH killed Arthur's four champions and many of the people of the country. He was next overtaken in a district called Puliniac 279 or Puliniac, which appears to have occupied a central area between the mountains, Landui Velfri, Henlin Amgod, and Lafarn, it probably covered portions of the parish of Whitland and of that of Landisilio, the church of which is a little to the north of the railway station of CLYN Derwin on the Great Western Line. Leaving Puliniac for the Lafarn boroughs, he crossed, as it seems, from Ginst Point to Aber Toei or Toei Mouth 280, which at low water are separated mostly by tracks of sand interrupted only by one or two channels of no very considerable width. For Aber Toei would seem to have been a little southeast of St. Ishmael's, on the eastern bank of the Toei. Thence the TWRCH makes his way to Glyn Istu, more correctly perhaps CLYN Istan, now written Clun YSTYN 281, the name of a farm between Carmarthen and the junction of the Amman with the LLYCHWR. More exactly about six miles from that junction and about eight and a half from Carmarthen as the crow flies. The hunt is resumed in the valley of the LLYCHWR or Lutter 282, where Grudgen and another young boar, called Lwydok Gwiniat 283, committed terrible ravages among the huntsmen. 
This brought Arthur and his host to the rescue, and TWRCHTRWYTH, on his part, came to help his boars. But as a tremendous attack was now made on him he moved away, leaving the LLYCHWR, and making eastwards for MYNYDD a man, or the mountain of Amon. 284 for a man was plentifully preserved in that neighborhood in the shortened form of Amon or Amon. On MYNYDD a man one of his boars was killed, but he is not distinguished by any proper name, he is simply called a ban, a young boar. The TWRCH was again hard pressed, and lost another called TWRCH Ilon. Then a third of the swine is killed, called GWIS, whereupon TWRCHTRWYTH went to DYFFRYN a man, or the Vale of Amon, where he lost a ban and a Benwick, boar, and a sow. All this evidently takes place in the same district, and MYNYD a man was, if not Bryn Amon, probably one of the mountains to the south or southeast of the river Amon, so that DYFFRYN Amon may have been what is still called DYFFRYN Amon. Or the valley of the Amon from Bryn Amon to where the river Amon falls into the LLYCHWR. From the Amon the TWRCH and the two remaining boars of his herd made their way to LLWCHUN, the lake or pool of Yuan, which is now represented by a bog mere above a farmhouse called LLWCH in the parish of Betus, which covers the southern slope of the Amon Valley. I have found this bog called in a map LLWCH is all, pool below breeze, whatever that may mean. We find them next at LLWCH Toy, the position of which is indicated by that of YNYS Pen LLWCH, Pools and Isle, some distance lower down the Taw than Pont Ar Dal. At this point the boars separate, and Grudgen goes away to Din Taiwi, Toi Fort, an unidentified position somewhere on the Toi, possibly Granger Hill near Landilo, and thence to a place in Karadijan where he was killed, namely, Garth Grudgen. I have not yet been able to identify the spot, though it must have once had a castle, as we read of a castle called Garth Grudgen being strengthened by Mailgun Viking in the year 1242, the brutes located in Karadijan 285. But this part of the story is obscured by careless copying on the part of the scribe 286 of the Red Book. After Grudgen's death we read of Wydok having made his way to Istrad YW, and, after inflicting slaughter on several of his assailants, he is himself killed there. Now Istrad YW, which our mapsters, would have us call Istrad Way, as if it had been on the Y287, is supposed to have covered till Henry VIII's time the same area approximately as the Hundred of Crickhowl has since, namely. The parishes of, I, Crickhowl, 2, Landbedre Istrad YW with Patrishow, 3, I Lanthahangel Cum Du with Trey Tower and Penyarth, 4, Langatok with Langeny, 5, Planetli with Brynmaur, and, 6, Langenard. Of these I Landbedre perpetuates the name of Istrad YW, although it is situated near the junction of the greater and lesser GRWYND and not in the strath of the YW, which Istrad YW means. So one can only treat Landbetter Istrad YW as meaning that particular Landbetter or St. Peter's Church which belongs to the district comprehensively called Istrad YW. Now if one glances at the Red Book list of Cantarts and CYMWDS, dating in the latter part of the 14th century, one will find Istrad YW and Kruk Howell existing as separate CYMWDS. So we have to look for the former in the direction of the parish of Kumdu, and on going back to the taxatio of Pope Nicholas for dating about 1291, we find that practically we have to identify with Coombe, do a name Stratton, p. 273 inch, which one is probably to treat as Strat D U E 288 or some similar Norman spelling, for most of the other parishes of the district are mentioned by the names which they still bear. That is not all. For from Coombe do a tributary of the Usk called the Ryangol comes down and receives at Trey Tower the waters of a smaller stream called the YW. The land on both sides of that YW burn forms the Istrad or Strath of which we are in quest. The chief source of this water is called Ligad YW. And gives its name to a house of some pretensions bearing an inscription showing that it was built in its present form about the middle of the 17th century by a member of the Gunter family well known in the history of the county. Near the house stands a yew tree on the boundary line of the garden, and close to its trunk, 
but at a lower level, is a spring of bubbling water, this is Ligad YW, the eye of the YW. For Ligad YW is a succinct expression for the source of the YW burn 289, and the stream retains the name YW to its fall into the Ryangol, but besides the spring of Ligad YW it has several other similar sources in the fields near the house. There is nothing, however, in this brook to account for the name of Istrad YW having been extended to an important district, but if one traces its short course one will at once guess the explanation. For a few fields below Ligad YW is the hamlet of the Geyer or fortress, consisting of four farmhouses called the Upper, Middle, and Lower Geyer, and Pen Y Geyer, through this hamlet of the Geyer flows the YW. These, and more especially Pen Y Geyer, are supposed to have been the site of a Roman camp of considerable importance, and close by it the YW is supposed to have been crossed by the Roman road proceeding towards Brecon 290. The camp in the strath of the YW was the headquarters of the ruling power in the district, and hence the application of the name of Istrad YW to a wider area. But for our story one has to regard the name as confined to the land about the YW burn, or at most to a somewhat larger portion of the parish of Coombe Du, to which the YW and Trey Tower belong. The position of the Geyer in Istrad YW at the foot of the BWLCH or the gap in the difficult mountain spur stretching down towards the Usk is more likely to have been selected by the Romans than by any of the Celtic inhabitants. Whose works are to be found on several of the neighboring hills, such as Miarth 291 between the YW and the Usk. We next find TWRCHTRWYTH, now the sole survivor, making his way towards the Severn, so Arthur summons Cornwall and Devon to meet him at Aberhaffron or Severn Mouth. Then a furious conflict with the TWRCH takes place in the very waters of that river, between LLYN Lewin and Aber GWY or the mouth of the Y. After much trouble, Arthur's men succeed in getting possession of two out of the three treasures of the boar, but he escapes with the third, namely, the comb, across the Severn 292. Then as soon as he gets ashore he makes his way to Cornwall, where the comb is at length snatched from him. Chased thence, he goes straight into the sea, with the hounds Anet and Ethlem after him, and nothing has ever been heard of any of the three from that day to this. That is the story of TWRCHTRWYTH and DR. Stokes calls my attention to a somewhat similar hunt briefly described in the Ren Din Senkas in the Review Celtique, 15. 474 to 5. Then, as to the precious articles carried by the TWRCH about his head and ears, the comb, the razor, and the shears. Two out of the three, the comb and the razor, belong to the regular stock of a certain group of tales which recount how the hero elopes with the daughter of a giant who loses his life in the pursuit 293. In order to make sure of escaping from the infuriated giant, the daughter abstracts from her father's keeping a comb, a razor, and another article. When she and her lover fleeing on their horse are hard-pressed, the latter throws behind him the comb, which at once becomes a rough impenetrable forest to detain the giant for a while. When he is again on the point of overtaking them, the lover throws behind him the razor, which becomes a steep and sharp mountain ridge through which the pursuing giant has to waste time tunneling his way. The third article is usually such as, when thrown in the giant's way, becomes a lake in which he is drowned while attempting to swim across. In the cool hooch. Story, however, as we have it, the allusion to these objects is torn away from what might be expected as its context. The giant is espatted in Pencor, whose death is effected in another way. But before the giant is finally disposed of he requires to be shaved and to have his hair dressed. His hair, moreover, is so rough that the dressing cannot be done without the comb and shears in the possession of TWRCHTRWYTH, whence the hunt. And for the shaving one would have expected the TWRCH's razor to have been requisite. But not so, as the shaving had to be done by means of another article, namely, the tusk of Iskatherwin Penbade, white tusk chief of boars, for the obtaining of which one is treated briefly to another boar hunt. The Coolwich story is in this respect very mixed and disjointed, owing, it would seem, to the determination of the narrator to multiply the number of things difficult to procure, each involving a separate feat to be described. Let us now consider the hunt somewhat more in detail, 
with special reference to the names mentioned. And let us begin with that of TWRCHTRWYTH, the word TWRCH means the male of a beast of the swine kind, and TWRCH coed, a wood pig, is a wild boar, while TWRCH deer, an earth pig, is the word in North Wales for a mole. In the next place we can practically equate TWRCHTRWYTH with a name at the head of one of the articles in Cormac's Irish Glossary. There the exact form is Orc Treath, and the following is the first part of the article itself as given in a Donovan's translation edited by Stokes Orc Treath i.e. No men for a king's son, triathenim rex vocator, unde dixit poela oinac in York Treath, fair of a king's son, i.e. Food and precious raiment, down and quilts, ale and flesh meat, chessmen and chessboards, horses and chariots, greyhounds and playthings besides. In this extract the word orc occurs in the genitive as yurk, and it means a pig or boar. In fact it is, with the usual Celtic loss of the consonant p, the exact goidelic equivalent of the Latin porcus, genitive porci. From another article in Cormac's glossary, we learn that treath is the genitive of triath, which has been explained to mean a king. Thus, orc treath means triathas orc, triathas boar, or the king's boar. So we take TWRCH TRWYTH in the same way to mean TRWYTH's boar. But we have here a discrepancy, which the reader will have noticed, for TWRCH is not the same word as Irish orc, the nearest form to be expected in Welsh being WRCH, not TWRCH. But such a word as WRCH does not, so far as I know, exist. Now did the Welsh render orc by a different word unrelated to the goidelic one which they heard? I think not. For it is remarkable that Irish has besides orc a word torque, meaning of boar, and torque is exactly the Welsh TWRCH. So there seems to be no objection to our supposing that what Cormac calls orc treath was known in the goidelic of Wales as torque treath, which had the alliteration to recommend it to popular favour. In that case one could say that the goidelic name torque treath appears in Welsh with a minimum of change as TWRCH TRWYTH, and also with the stamp of popular favour more especially in the retention of the goidelic TH. Just as in the name of an ancient camp or fortification on the Withy Bush estate in Pembrokeshire, it is called the Rath, or the Rath Ring. Here Rath is identical with the Irish word Rath, a fortification or earthworks, and we seem to have it also in Sil Rath 4, the name of a farm in the neighbourhood of Narberth. Now the Goidelic word treath appears to have come into Welsh as treth i, the long vowel of which must in Welsh have become oi or ui by about the end of the 6th century. And if the th had been treated on etymological principles its proper equivalent in the Welsh of that time would have been d or t. The retention of the th is a proof, therefore, of oral transmission. That is to say, the goidelic word passed bodily into Brythonic, to submit afterwards to the phonological rules of that language. A little scrutiny of the tale will, I think, convince the reader that one of the objects of the original storyteller was to account for certain place names. Thus Grudgen was meant to account for the name of Garth Grudgen where Grudgen was killed. GWIS, to account similarly for that of GWIS, a tributary of the TWRCH, which gives its name to a station on the line of railway between Istalifera and Brynamon. And TWRCH Lawan to account for the name of the river TWRCH, which receives the GWIS, and falls into the Taw some distance below Istrad Ginlis, between the counties of Brecknock and Glamorgan. Besides Grudgen and TWRCH Lawan, there was a third brother to whom the story gives a special name, to wit, Wydok Guiniat, and this was, I take it, meant also to account for a place name, which, however, is not given, it should have been somewhere in Istrad YW, in the county of Brecknock. Still greater interest attaches to the swine that have not been favoured with names of their own, those referred to simply as Ban, a young boar, and Benwick, a young sow. Now Ban has its equivalent in Irish in the word Ban, which O'Reilly explains as meaning a sucking pig, and that is the meaning also of the Manx Banu but formerly the word may have had a somewhat wider meaning. The Welsh appellative is introduced twice into the story of TWRCH TRWYTH, 
once to account, as I take it, for the name MYNYDD a man, Amon Mountain, and once for DYFFRYN a man, Amon Valley. In both instances a man was meant, as I think, to be accounted for by the ban killed at each of the places in question. But how, you will ask, does the word ban account for a man, or throw any light on it at all? Very simply, if you will just suppose the name to have been Goidelic. For then you have only to provide it with the definite article and it makes in ban, the pig or the boar, and that could not in Welsh yield anything but a man or Amanu 294, which with the accent shifted backwards. Became Amanu and Amon or Amon. Having premised these explanations let us, before we proceed further, see to what our evidence exactly amounts. Here, then, we have a mention of seven swine, but as two of them, a Ban and a Benwick, are killed at one and the same place, our figure is practically reduced to 6295. The question then is, in how many of these six cases the story of the hunt accounts for the names of the places of the deaths respectively, that is to say, accounts for them in the ordinary way with which one is familiar in other Welsh stories. They may be enumerated as follows. 1. A ban was killed at MYNYD a man. 2. A TWRCH is killed in the same neighborhood, where there is a river TWRCH. 3. A swine called GWIS is killed in the same neighborhood still, where there is a river called GWIS, falling into the TWRCH. 4. A ban and a Benwick are killed in DYFFRY and a man. 5. Grudgen is killed at a place called Garth Grudgen. 6. A swine called Wydock is killed at a spot, not named, in Istrad YW or not far off point 296. Thus in five cases out of the six, the story accounts for the place name, and the question now is, can that be a mere accident? Just think what the probabilities of the case would be if you put them into numbers, South Wales, from St. David's to the Vale of the Usk, would supply hundreds of place names as deserving of mention, to say the least, as those in this story. Is it likely then that out of a given six among them no less than five should be accounted for or alluded to by any mere accident in the course of a story of the brevity of that of TWRCHTRWYTH? To my thinking such an accident is inconceivable, and I am forced, therefore, to suppose that the narrative was originally so designed as to account for them. I said, originally so designed, for the scribe of the Red Book, or let us say the last redactor of the story as it stands in the Red Book, shows no signs of having noticed any such design. Had he detected the play on the names of the places introduced, he would probably have been more inclined to develop that feature of the story than to efface it. What I mean may best be illustrated by another swine story, namely, that which has already been referred to as occurring in the Mabinogi of Matt the Refined Prittery, King of Dyfed, holding his court at Rucklin on the Tiafi. But though he had become the proud possessor of a new race of animals, given him as a present by his friend Aran, King of Anne, he had made a solemn promise to his people. That he should give none of them away until they had doubled their number in Dyfed, these animals were the hobu or pigs to which reference was made at p. 69 above. Now Gwydion, having heard of them, visited Prittery's court, and by magic and enchantment deceived the king. Successful in his quest, he sets out for Gwynect with his hobu, and this is how his journey is described in the Mabinogi, and that evening they journeyed as far as the upper end of Caradigion, to a place which is still called, for that reason, Mokdref, Swine Town or Pig's Stead. On the morrow they went their way, and came across the Elenid Mountains, and that night they spent between Kerry and Arwisley, in the stead which is also called for that reason Mokdref, thence they proceeded. And came the same evening as far as a comet in Powys, which is for that reason called Mokdnan Swineburn. 297 Thence they journeyed to the Cantard of Rose, and spent that night within the town which is still called Mokdref 298. Ah, uh, my men, said Gwydion, let us make for the fastness of Gwine with these beasts, the country is being raised in pursuit of us. So this is what they did, they made for the highest town of Artfetchwecht, and there built a crow or sty for the pigs, and for that reason the town was called Kruirian, that is, perhaps, Wirian sty. In this, it is needless to state, 
we have the Korean above the name is variously pronounced also Surian and Kryan. That is how a portion of the math story is made to account for a series of place names, and had the editor of the Kulch understood the play on the names of places in question in the story of TWRCHTRWYTH. It might be expected that he would have given it prominence, as already suggested. Then comes the question, how it came to pass that he did not understand it. The first thing to suggest itself as an answer is, that he may have been a stranger to the geography of the country concerned. That, however, is a very inadequate explanation, for his being a stranger, though it might account for his making blunders as to the localities, would not be likely to deter him from venturing into geography which he had not mastered. What was it, then, that hid from him a portion of the original in this instance? In part, at least, it must have been a difficulty of language. Let us take an illustration, GWIS has already been mentioned more than once as a name applied to one of TWRCHTRWYTH's offspring, and the words used are very brief. To the following effect and then another of his swine was killed, GWIS was its name. As a matter of fact, the scribe was laboring under a mistake, for he ought to have said rather, and then another of his swine was killed, it was a sow, since GWIS was a word meaning a sow, and not the name of any individual hog. The word has, doubtless, long been obsolete in Welsh, but it was known to the poet of the Little Pig's Lullaby, in the Black Book of Carmarthen, where one of the stanzas begins, F.O. 29a, with the line. Oyen Aperkellen. Aparchel. Gwyn Guis. The late Dr. Pug translated it thus. Listen, little porkling. Thou forward little white pig. I fear I should be obliged to render it less elegantly. Lullaby, little porker, white sow porker. For the last four words Stokes suggests O oh, pigling of a white sow, but perhaps the most natural rendering of the words would be O oh, white porker of a sow. Which does not recommend itself greatly on the score of sense, I must admit. The word occurs, also, in Breton as GWIS or Gouis, Trui, Femel du Pork, and as GWIS or Gouis in Old Cornish, while in Irish it was Faze. Nevertheless, the editor of the TWRCHTRWYTH story did not know it. But it would be in no way surprising that a Welshman, who knew his language fairly well, should be baffled by such a word in case it was not in use in his own district in his own time. This, however, barely touches the fringe of the question. The range of the hunt, as already given, was mostly within the boundaries, so to say, of the portion of South Wales where we find Goidelic inscriptions in the Ogham character of the 5th or 6th century. And I am persuaded that the Goidelic language must have lived down to the 6th or 7th century in the south and in the north of Wales 299, a tract of mid Wales being then, probably. The only district which can be assumed to have been completely Brythonic in point of speech. In this very story, probably, such a name as Garth Grugen is but slightly modified from a Goidelic Gort Grukend, the enclosure of Grucken 300 or Grugen, compare Kvishalaind or Kvishalaind made in Welsh into Cochlan. But the capital instance in the story of TWRCHTRWYTH as has already been indicated is that of a man, which I detect also as Ammon, probably to be Red Amanu, in the Book of Land DAV, or Liber Land Avensis, p. 199, it is there borne by a lay witness to a grant of land called Tyr de Muner, which would appear to have been in what is now Monmouthshire. Interpreted as standing for in Bamb, I the boar, it would make a man's name of the same class as Ibliad, found elsewhere in the same manuscript, pp. 178, l84, meaning evidently I blade, now why blade, the wolf, but observe that the latter was Welsh and the former Goidelic, which makes all the difference for our story. The Goidel relating the story would say that a boar, Bamb, was killed on the mountain or hill of in Bamb or of the boar, and his Goidelic hearer could not fail to associate the place name with the appellative. But a Brython could hardly understand what the words in Bamb meant, and certainly not after he had transformed them into Aminu, with the NB assimilated into MM, and the accent shifted to the first syllable. It is needless to say that my remarks have no meaning unless Goidelic was the original language of the tale in the summary I have given of the hunt. 
I omitted a number of proper names of the men who fell at the different spots where the TWRCH is represented brought to bay. I wish now to return to them with the question, why were their names inserted in the story at all? It may be suspected that they also, or at any rate some of them, were intended to explain place names. But I must confess to having had little success in identifying traces of them in the ordnance maps. Others, however, may fare better, who have a better acquaintance with the districts in point, and in that hope I append them in their order in the story. 1. Arthur sends to the hunt on the banks of the Nevern, in Pembrokeshire, his men, Eli and Trachmer, Wardiget son of Caw, and Bedwer. Also try Meeb Clet of Divulch, three sons of the gapless sword the dogs are also mentioned, Drudwin, great son of Ares Welp, led by Arthur himself, Glythmyr Leadwig's two dogs, led by Gwardiget son of Ka. And Arthur's dog Caval, led by Bedwer. 2. Twrchtrwyth makes for Coon Kerwin in the Preseli Mountains, and turns to bay, killing the following men, who are called Arthur's for Rhwswyr 301 or Champion S. Gwardiget son of Ka, Tarag of Alt Clwyd, Rydwin son of Eli Atver, and Iskavan Hale. 3. He turns to bay a second time in Coombe Kerwin, and kills Gwydra son of Arthur, Garslid Wydal, Glue son of Iscot, and Iskowin son of Bannon or Pannon. 4. Next day he is overtaken in the same neighborhood, and he kills Glowid Gavilva's three men, Wanda, Dogiger, and Pen Pingan, many of the men of the country also, and Gwlydyn Sar, one of Arthur's chief architects. 5. Arthur overtakes the TWRCH next in Kulinioch, above, and the TWRCH there kills Madoc son of Tythian, Gwyn son of Tringad son of Nuid, and Irion Pen one Torn. 6. TWRCH TRWYTH next turns to bay at Abertoi, Toi Mouth, and kills Sinla's son of Sinan, and G. Wylanhin, king of Frank. 7. The next occasion of his killing any men whose names are given, is when he reaches LLWCHUN, near which he killed Echol Vordwit TWLL, Rwylai Isle Gwyklog GWIR, and many men and dogs besides. 8. Grudgen, one of the TWRCH's offspring, goes to Garth Grudgen in Keradigen with Eli and Trachmer pursuing him, but what happened to them we are not told in consequence of the omission mentioned above, page 515, as occurring in the manuscript. 9. Wydok at bay in an uncertain locality kills Rudview Riss 302 and many others. 10. Wydok goes to Istrad YW, where he is met by the men of Lida, and he kills Herpesok, king of Lida, also Ligatrud Emmys and Gerbethu Hen, maternal uncles to Arthur. By way of notes on these items, I would begin with the last by asking, what is one to make of these men of Lido? First of all, one notices that their names are singular, thus Herpesok, long-coated or long-robed, is a curious name for their king, as it sounds more like an epithet than a name itself. Then Ligatrud, also Liskatrud, which I cannot understand, except as, as a scribal error, Emmys is also unusual, one would have rather expected Emmys Ligatrud, Emmys the Red-Eyed. As it stands it looks as if it meant the red-eyed one of Emmys. Moreover Emmys reminds one of the name of Amir Lida, the ancestor in Welsh hagiology of a number of Welsh saints. It looks as if the redactor of the Red Book had mistaken an R for an S in copying from a pre-Norman original. That he had to work on such a manuscript is proved by the remaining instance, Gubothu Hen, G. The ancient, in which we have undoubtedly a pre-Norman spelling of Gerfadsv, the same redactor having failed to recognize the name, left it without being converted into the spelling of his own school. In the Book of Land DAV it will be found variously written Gerbudu, Geruadu, and Geruadu. Then the epithet hen, old or ancient, reminds one of such instances as Math hen and Gofinian hen, to be noticed a little later in this chapter. Let us now direct the reader's attention for a moment to the word Lido, in order to see whether that may not suggest something. The etymology of it is contested, so one has to infer its meaning, as well as one can, from the way in which it is found used. Now it is the ordinary Welsh word for Brittany or Little Britain, and in Irish it becomes Letha, 
which is found applied not only to Armorica but also to Latium. Conversely one could not be surprised if a goidel, writing Latin, rendered his own Letha or the Welsh Lydaw by Latium, even when no part of Italy was meant. Now it so happens that Lydaw occurs in Wales itself, to wit in the name of one Lynn one Lydaw, a Snowdonian lake already mentioned. It is thus described by Pennant, too. 339, we found, on arriving at the top, an hollow a mile in length, filled with Lynn el Elida, a fine lake, winding beneath the rocks, and vastly indented by rocky projections, here and there jutting into it. In it was one little island, the haunt of black-backed gulls, which breed here, and, alarmed by such unexpected visitants, broke the silence of this sequestered place by their deep screams. But since Pennant's time mining operations 303 have been carried on close to the margin of this lake. And in the course of them the level of the water is said to have been lowered to the extent of 16 feet, when, in the year 1856, an ancient canoe was discovered there. According to the late Mr. E. L. Barnwell, who has described it in the Archaeologia Cambrensis for 1874, pages 150 to 1, it was in the possession of Dr. Griffith Griffith of Tau Y. Truden, near Harlech, who exhibited it at the Cambrian Archaeological Association's meeting at McKintfeth in 1866 304. It measures, Mr. Barnwell says, 9 feet 9 inches a not uncommon length in the Scotch early canoes and has been hollowed out of one piece of wood, as is universally the case with these early boats. He goes on to surmise that this canoe may have been used to reach the island, for the sake of birds or eggs, or what is not impossible, the island may have been the residence of someone who had reasons for preferring so isolated an abode. It may, in fact, have been kind of small natural crannock, and, in one sense, veritable lake dwelling, access to and from which was easy by means of such a canoe. Stokes conjectures. Lydaw to have meant coastland, and Thurnison connects it with the Sanskrit Prahivi in Old Saxon Folda 305, Earth, and, so far as I can see, one is at liberty to assume a meaning that would satisfy Lydaw, Armorica, and the Lydaw of Lly and Lydaw. The Lake of Lydaw, namely that it signified land which one had to reach by boat, so that it was in fact applicable to a lake settlement of any kind, in other words, that Lydaw on Snowdon was the name of the lake dwelling. So I cannot help suggesting, with great deference, that the place whence came the men of Lydaw in the story of the hunting of TWRCHTRWYTH was the settlement in Sifidon Lake, and that the name of that stronghold, whether it was a Cranagh or a stockade islet, was also Lydaw. For the power of that settlement over the surrounding country to have extended a few mademoiselles around would be but natural to suppose the distance between the YW and LLYN Sifidon is, I am told, under three miles. Should this guess prove well founded, we should have to scan with renewed care the allusions in our stories to Lydaw, and not assume that they always refer us to Brittany. That the name Lydaw did on occasion refer to the region of Lly and Sifiklon admits of indirect proof as follows the Church of Langors on its banks is dedicated to a St. Paulinus, after whom also is called Capel Pulin. In the upper course of the Toei, adjacent to the Cardiganshire parish of Langtoe Brefi. Moreover, Tradition makes Paulinus attend a synod in 519 at Landui Brefi, where St. David distinguished himself by his preaching against Pelagianism. Paulinus was then an old man, and as T. David had been one of his pupils at the Ty Gwyn, Whitland, on the TAF, where Paulinus had established a religious house 306. And some five miles up a tributary brook of the TAF is the Church of Landis Lyo, where an ancient inscription mentions a Paulinus. These two places, Whitland and Landis Lyo, were probably in the CYMWD of Puliniac, which is called after Apollinus, and through which we have just followed the hunt of TWRCHTRWYTH. Now the inscription to which I have referred reads 307. With ligatures, 21. Culturigi. FLLI Pavlini. Marinlatio. This probably means, the monument, of Cloterix, son of Paulinus from Latium in the marsh. Unless one ought rather to treat Marini as an epithet to Pauline. In either case Latio has probably to be construed, of or from Latium, 
compare a Roman inscription found at Bath, Hubner's number 48, which begins with C. Murius. I. C. E. F. Arniensis I. Foro. Yuli. M. O. Destis 308, and makes in English, according to Mr. Haverfield, Gaius Murius Modestus, son of Gaius, of the tribe Arniensis, of the town Forum Iulii. The easiest way to explain the last line as a whole is probably to treat it as a compound with the qualifying word deriving its meaning, not from mare, the sea, but from the late Latin mara, a marsh or bog. Thus marini latium would mean marshy latium, to distinguish it from latium in Italy, and from letha or lida in the sense of Brittany, which was analogously termed in medieval Irish armuric letha 309, that is the armorica of letha. This is borne out by the name of the Church of Paulinus, which is in Welsh Lanwygors, anglicized Langors, the Church of the Marsh or Bog, and that is exactly the meaning of the name given it in the Taxatio of Pope Nicholas. Which is that of Ecclesia de Mara. In other terms, we have in the qualified Latium of the inscription the Latium or Letha which came to be called in Welsh Lydaw. It is, in my opinion, from that settlement as their headquarters, that the men of El Lydaw sallied forth to take part in the hunt in Istrad Y.W., where the Borl Wydog was killed. The idea that the story of TWRCHTRWYTH was more or less topographical is not a new one. Lady Charlotte Guest, in her Mabinogen, 2. 363-5, traces the hunt through several places called after Arthur, such as Barth Arthur, Arthur's Cattle Pen, and BWRDD Arthur, Arthur's Table, besides others more miscellaneously named, such as TWINY Mach. The Swine's Hill, near the source of the Amon, and LLWINY Mach, the Swine's Grove, near the foot of the same eminence. But one of the most remarkable statements in her note is the following, an other singular coincidence may be traced between the name of a brook in this neighbor. Hood, called Echol, and the Echol Forkowild who is recorded in the tale as having been slain at this period of the chase. I have been unable to discover any clue to a brook called Echol, but one called Egel occurs in the right place. So I take it that Lady Charlotte Guest's informants tacitly identified the name with that of Echol. Substantially they were probably correct, as the Egel, called Essel in the dialect of the district, flows into the upper Clydac, which in its turn falls into the Ta near Pont Ar Dal. As the next pool mentioned is LLWCH Ta, I presume it was some water or other which drained into the Ta in this same neighborhood. The relative positions of LLWCH Uin, the Egel, and LLWCH Ta as indicated above offer no apparent difficulty. The Goidelic name underlying that of Echel was probably some such a one as Exel or Isel, and Isel occurs, for instance, in the Book of the Dun Cow, F.O. 80b, as the name of a noble or prince. In rendering this name into Welsh as Echel, due regard was had for the etymological equivalence of Goidelic C.C. or C. to Welsh C.H. But the unbroken oral tradition of a people changing its language by degrees from Goidelic to Welsh was subject to no such influence, especially in the matter of local names. So the one here in question passed into Welsh as Exel, liable only to be modified into Egel. In any case, one may assume that the death of the hero Echel was introduced to account for the name of the brook Egel. Indications of something similar in the linguistic sense occur in the part of the narrative relating the death of Grudgen, at Garth Grudgen. This boar is pursued by two huntsmen called Eli and Trachmer, the name of the former of whom reminds one of Garth Eli, in the parish of Lankawi Brefi. Possibly the original story located at Garth Eli the death of Eli, or some other incident in which Grudgen was concerned, but the difficulty here is that the exact position of Garth Grudgen is still uncertain. Lastly, our information as to the hunting of TWRCHTRWYTH is not exclusively derived from the Coolhooch, for besides an extremely obscure poem about the TWRCH in the Book of Anurin, a manuscript of the 13th century, we have one item given in the Mirablilia associated with the Historia Britannum of Nennius, section 73, and this carries us back to the 8th century. It reads as follows. Est aliad mirabile in region cux dissiter belt. Est ibi cumulus lapidum, e unis latis suter positus super congestum, cum vestigo canis in eo. 
Quando vinatus est porcum troit, impresit cabal, ca erat canis arthuri melitis, vestigium in lapide, et arthur postia congregabit congestum lapidum sub labide in quo erat vestigium canis sue, e vocator carn cabal. E divinient homines et tolent lapidem in manibus sui per spatium die et noctis, et in crestino die in venator super congestum sum. Another wonder there is in the district called Bult, there is there a heap of stones, and one stone is placed on the top of the pile with the footmark of a dog in it. Kafal, the dog of the warrior Arthur, when chasing the pig TRWID printed the mark of his foot on it, and Arthur afterwards collected a heap of stones underneath the stone in which was the footmark of his dog, and it is called Kafal's cairn. And men come and take the stone away in their hands for the space of a day and a night, and on the following day the stone is found on the top of its heap 310. Lady Charlotte Guest, in a note to the Coolwich story in her Mabinogen, 2. 360, appears to have been astonished to find that Carn Caval, as she writes it, was no fabulous mound but an actual eye mountain in the district of Buellth, to the south of Raider Gwi, and within sight of that town. She went so far as to pour. Swad one of her friends to visit the summit, and he begins his account of it to her with the words, Cam Cavalt, or as it is generally pronounced Corn Cavalt, is a lofty and rugged mountain. On one of the caves on the mountain he discovered what may have been the very stone to which the Mirabilia story refers. But the sketch with which he accompanied his communication cannot be said to be convincing, and he must have been drawing on his imagination when he spoke of this somewhat high hill as a lofty mountain. Moreover his account of its name only goes just far enough to be misleading, the name as pronounced in the neighborhood of Raider is Korngefault by Welsh-speaking people, and Korngefault by monoglot Englishmen. So it is probable that at one time the pronunciation was Korngefault 311. But to return to the incident recorded by Nennius, one has to remark that it does not occur in the Kulch. Nor, seeing the position of the HLLL, can it have been visited by Arthur or his dog in the course of the TWRCHTRWITH hunt as described by the redactor of the story in its present form? This suggests the reflection not only that the TWRCH story is very old, but that it was put together by selecting certain incidents out of an indefinite number, which, taken all together, would probably have formed a network covering the whole of South Wales as far north as the boundary of the portion of Mid Wales occupied by the Brythons before the Roman occupation. In other words, the goidals of this country had stories current among them to explain the names of the places with which they were fam liar, and Iphis known that was the case with the goidals of Ireland. Witness the place name legends known in medieval Irish as Din Senkas, with which the old literature of Ireland abounds. On what principle the narrator of the cool which made his selection from the repertoire I cannot say. But one cannot help seeing that he takes little interest in the Dita LLS, and that he shows STLLL less insight into the etymological moths, are of the incidents which he mentions. However, this should be laid mainly to the charge, perhaps, of the early medieval redactor. Among the reasons which have been suggested for the latter overlooking the facing the play on the place names, I have hinted that B did not always understand them, as they sometimes involved a language which may not have been his. This raises the question of translation, if the story was originally in Goidelic, what was the process by which it passed into Brythonic? Two answers suggest themselves, and the first comes to this, if the story was in writing, we may suppose a literary man to have sat down to translate it word for word from Goidelic to Brythonic, or else to adapt it in a looser fashion. In either case, one should suppose him a master of both languages, and capable of doing justice to the play on the place names. But it is read LLY conceivable that the fact of his understanding both languages might lead him to miscalculate what was exactly necessary to enable a monoglot Brithon to grasp his meaning clearly. Moreover, if the translator had ideas of his own as to style, he might object on principle to anything like an explanation of words being interpolated in the narrative. In short, one could see several loopholes through which a little confusion might force itself in, and prevent the monoglot reader or hearer of the translation from correctly grasping the story at all points as it was in the original. The other view, and the more natural one, as I think, is that we should postulate the interference of no special translator, but suppose the story, 
or rather a congeries of stories. To have been current among the natives of a certain part of South Wales, say the Lover Valley, at a time when their language was still Goidelic, and that, as they gradually gave up Goidelic and adopted Brythonic. They retained their stories and translated the narrative, W. H. Lee they did not always translate the place names occurring in that narrative. Thus, for instance, would arise the discrepancy between Banwen and a man, the latter of which to be well should have been rendered Y. Ban, the boar. If this is approximately what took place, it is easy to conceive the possibility of many points of nicety being completely effaced in the course of such a rough process of transformation. In one or two small matters it happens that we can contrast the community as translator with the literary individual at work, I allude to the word TRWITH. That vocable was not translated, not metaphoned, if I may so term it, at all at the time, it passed, when it was still trethi, from goidelic into brythonic, and continued in use without a break. For the changes whereby trethi has become trwith have been such as other words have undergone in the course of ages, as already stated. On the other hand, the literary man who knew something of the two languages seems to have reasoned, that where a goidelic th occurred between vowels, the correct etymological equivalent in brythonic was t, subject to be mutated to d. So when he took the name over he metaphoned trethi into tredi, whence we have the porcus troid of Nennius, and twrch trwyd in Welsh poetry, these troit and trwyd were the literary forms as contrasted with the popular trwyth. Now, if my surmises as to Echol and Egel are near the truth, their history must be similar, that is to say, Echol would be the literary form and Essel, Egel the popular one respectively of the Goideliki cell. A third parallel offers itself in the case of the personal name Arwylai, borne by one of Echol's companions, the Arwil of that name has its etymological equivalent in the Arwistal, of Arwisli. The name of a district comprising the eastern slopes of Plinlimon, and represented now by the deanery of Arwisli. So Arwisli challenges comparison with the Irish Ergiala or Ergyle, anglicized Oriel, which denotes, roughly speaking, the modern counties of Armagh, Louth, and Monaghan. For here we have the same prefix AR placed in front of one and the same vocable, which in Welsh is WISTL, a hostage, and in Irish Gile, of the same meaning and origin. The reader will at once think of the same word in German as Geisel, a hostage, Old High Germangisel. But the divergence of sound between Arwistali and Arwilai arises out of the difference of treatment of SL in Welsh and Irish. In the Brythonic district of Mid Wales, we have Arwisli with SL treated in the Brythonic way, WH Lee and Arwilai, we have the combination treated in the Goidelic way. The result being left standing when the speakers of Goidelic in South Wales learnt Brythonic 312. Careful observation may be expected to add to the number of these instructive instances. It is, however, not to be supposed that all double forms of the names in these stories arido be explained in exactly the same way. Thus, for instance, corresponding to lug, genitive loga, we have the two forms leu and lu, of which the former alone matches the Irish. But it is to be observed that leu remains in some verses 313 in the story of math, whereas in the prose he appears to be called lu. It is not improbable that the editing which introduced Lu dates comparatively late, and that it was done by a man who was not familiar with the Venedotian place names of which El Lu formed part, namely, Dinlu and Nantlum, now Danlu and Nantel. Similarly, the two brothers, Gofanon and Amathon, as they are called in the Mabinogi of Math and in the Coolwich story, are found also called Gofinion and Amatheon. The former agrees with the Irish form Goibniu, genitive Goibnan, whereas Gofanon does not. As to Amathon or Arnathan the Irish counterpart has, unfortunately, not been identified. Gofanon and Amathon have the appearance of being etymologically transparent in Welsh, and they have probably been remodeled by the hand of a literary redactor. There were also two forms of the name of Manawyden in Welsh. For by the side of that there was another, namely, Manawyden, liable to be shortened to Manawid, both occur in Old Welsh poetry 314. But Manawid or Minawid is the Welsh word for an all, which is significant here, as the Mabinogi called after Manawidden makes him become a shoemaker on two occasions. 
whence the triad style him one of the three golden shoemakers of the Isle of Prydain, see the Oxford Mabinogen, p. 308. What has happened in the way of linguistic change in one of our stories, the Kulhuch, may have happened in others, say in the four branches of the Mabinogi, namely, Poole, Prince of Dived, Branwen, daughter of Llyr, Math, son of Mathenry. And Manawicton, son of Llyr. Some time ago, endeavored to show that the principal characters in the Mabinogi of Math, namely, the sons and daughters of Don, are to be identified as a group with the Tuatha de Danann, tribes of the goddess Danu or Donu, of Irish legend. I called attention to the identity of our Welsh Don with the Irish Donu, genitive Donan, Gofinian or Gofanan with Goibniu, genitive Goibnan, and of Leu or Lu with Lug. Since then Professor Zimmer has gone further, and suggested that the Mabinogen are of Irish origin, but that I cannot quite admit. They are of Goidelic origin, but they do not come from the Irish or the Goidels of Ireland, they come rather, as I think, from this country's Goidels, who never migrated to the sister island, but remained here eventually to adopt Brythonic speech. There is no objection, however, so far as this argument is concerned, to their being regarded as this country's goidels descended either from Nat V. goidels or from early goidelic invaders from Ireland. Or else partly from the one origin and partly from the other. This last is perhaps the safest view to accept as a working hypothesis. Now Professor Zimmer fixes on that of Mathenwy, among other names, as probably the Welsh adaptation of some such an Irish name as the genitive Mathcom Nye 315, now anglicized Mahoney. This I am also prepared to accept in the sense that the Welsh form is a loan from a Goidelic one current some time or other in this country, and represented in Irish by Mathcom Nye. The preservation of Goidelic th in Mathenwy stamps it as ranking with trwyth egel and rwyli, as contrasted with a form etymologically more correct, of which we seem to have an echo in the Breton names Magino and Madgon 316. Another name which I am inclined to regard as brought in from Goidelic is that of Gilvathwy, son of Don, it would seem to involve some such a word as the Irish Gila, a youth, an attendant or servant. And some form of the Goidelic name Maudius or Makla, so that the name Gilamoctament the attendant of Makta. This last vocable appears in Irish as the name of several saints, but previously it was probably that of some pagan god of the Goidels, and its meaning was most likely the same as that of the Irish participial Makta. Which Stokes explains as, magnified, glorified see his calendar of Iengus, p. 6 and compare the name male Makta. Adamnan, in his Vita S. Columbi, writes the name Moctius in the following passage, Pref. 2, p. 6, 22. Nam quidem proselytis brito, homo sanctus, sancti patriciae episcopi discipulus, mactius nomini, ita de nostro prophetis avit patrono, secutiae nobis ab antiquis tradatum expertus compertum habitor. This saint, who is said to have prophesied of Saint Columba and died in the year 534, is described in his life, August I.G., as Ortis ex Britannia 317 foot, which, coupled with Adamnan's brito, probably refers him to Wales. But it is remarkable that nevertheless he bore the very unbrithonic name of Makta or Mauchta 318. To return to the Mabinogen, I have long been inclined to identify Llwyd, son of Kilcoed, with the Irish Lyoth 319, son of Selcher, of Kualu in the present county of Wicklow. Lyoth, whose name means, Grey, is described as the comeliest youth of noble rank among the fairies of Erin. And the only time the Welsh Llwyd, whose name also means, Grey, appears in the Mabinogen he is ascribed, not the comeliest figure, it is true, or the greatest personal beauty. But the most imposing disguise of a bishop attended by his suite, he was a great magician. The name of his father, Kilcoet, seems to me merely an inexact popular rendering of Sefchar, the name of Lyatha's father, at any rate one falls here to detect the touch of the skilled translator or literary redactor but the Mabinogi of Manawidden in which Llwyd figures, is also the one in which Prittery King of Dyke's wife is called Kikua or Sigfa, a name which has no claim to be regarded as Brythonic. It occurs early, however, in the legendary history of Ireland, the Four Masters, 
under the year AM 2520, mention Asayakba as wife of a son of Partholon. And so it seems probable that the Welsh LLYR 320 is no other word than the Goidelic genitive liar, retained in use with its pronunciation modified according to the habits of the Welsh language. And in that case 321 it forms comprehensive evidence, that the stories about the LLYR fam LLY in Welsh legend were Goidelic before they put on a Brythonic garb. 23. As to the Mabinogen generally, one may say that they are devoted to the fortunes chiefly of three powerful houses or groups, the children of Don, the children of LLYR, and Poole's family. This last is brought into contact with the LLYR group, which takes practically the position of superiority. Poole's family belonged chiefly to Dyfed. But the power and influence of the sons of LLYR had a far wider range, we find them in Anglesey, at Harlech, in Wales, or the Isle of Graholm off Pembrokeshire, at Aberhenvillen somewhere south of the Severn Sea, and in Ireland. But the expedition to Ireland under Bran, usually called Bendigetrin, Bran 322 the Blessed, proved so disastrous that the LLYR group, as a whole, disappears, making way for the children of Don. These last came into collision with Poole's son, Prittery, in whose country Manawidden, son of LLYR, had ended his days. Prittery, in consequence of Gwydion's deceit, makes war on Math and the children of Don, he falls in it, and his army gives hostages to Math. Thus after the disappearance of the sons of LLYR, the children of Don are found in power in their stead in North Wales 323. And that state of things corresponds closely enough to the relation between the Tuatha de Dan and, and the Lyre family in Irish legend. Their Lyre and his fam LLY are reckoned in the number. The whole cycle of the Mabinogen must have appeared strange to the storyteller and the poet of medieval Wales, and far removed from the world in which they lived. We have possibly a trace of this feeling in the epithet Hen, old, ancient, given to Math in a poem in the Red Book of Her Jest, where we meet with the line 324. Gan yuth hen gax guanan. With Math the ancient, with Gofanon. Similarly in the confused list of heroes which the storyteller of the Kulhuch, Mabinogen, page 108, was able to put together, we seem to have Gofanon, Math's relative, referred to under the designation of Gawanyan hen, Gofinian the ancient. To these might be added others, such as Gerbethu hen, mentioned above, and from another source Leu Hen 325, Elu the Ancient. So strange, probably, and so obscure did some of the contents of the stories themselves seem to the storytellers, that they may be now and then suspected of having effaced some of the features which it would have interested us to find preserved. This state of things brings back to my mind words of Matthew Arnold's, to which I had the pleasure of listening more years ago than I care to remember. He was lecturing at Oxford on Celtic literature, and observing, how evidently the media wall storyteller is pillaging an antiquity of which he does not fully possess the secret. He is like a peasant, Matthew Arnold went on to say, building his hut on the site of Halicarnassus or Ephesus. He builds, but what he builds is full of materials of which he knows not the history, or knows by a glimmering tradition merely stones, not of this building, but of an older architecture, greater, cunninger, more majestical. In the Medawal stories of no Latin or Teutonic people does this strike one as in those of the Welsh. This becomes intelligible only on the theory of the stories having been in Goidelic before they put on a Welsh dress. When saying that the Mabinogen in some of the stories contained in the Kulhuch, such as the hunting of TWRCHTRWYTH, were Goidelic before they became Brythonic, I wish to be understood to use the word Goidelic in a qualified sense. For TLLL the Brythons came, the Goidels were, I take it, the ruling race in most of the southern half of Britain, with the natives as their subjects, except in so far as that statement has to be limited by the fact. That we do not know how far they and the natives had been amalgamating together. In any case, the hostly advent of a Nalha race, the Brythons, would probably tend to hasten the process of amalgamation. That being so, the stories which I have loosely called Goidelic may have been largely aboriginal in point of origin, and by that I mean native, pre-Celtic and non-Aryan. It comes to this, then, we cannot say for certain whose creation Bran, for instance, should be considered to have been that of Goidels or of non-Aryan natives. He sat, 
As the Mabinogi of Branwen decribs him, on the rock of Harlech, a figure too colossal for any house to contain or any ship to carry. This would seem to challenge comparison with Sernanos, the squatting god of ancient Gaul, around worn the other gods appear as mere striplings, as proved by the monumental representations in point. In these 326 he sometimes appears antlered like a stag, sometimes he is provided either with three normal heads or with one head furnished with three faces. And sometimes he is reduced to a head provided with no body, which reminds one of Bran, who, when he had been rid of his body in consequence of a poisoned wound inflicted on him in his foot in the slaughter of the mealbag Pavlion, was reduced to the Erddal Ben, venerable or dignified head, mentioned in the Mabinogi of Bran 1 327. The Mabinogi goes on to relate how Bran's companions began to enjoy, subject to certain conditions, his venerable head society which involved banquets of a fabulous duration and of a nature not readily to be surpassed by those around the Holy Grail. In fact here we have beyond all doubt one of the heathen originals of which the Grail is a Christian version. But the multiplicity of faces or heads of the Gaulish divinity find their analogues in a direction hitherto unnoticed as far as I know, namely, among the Letoslavic peoples of the Baltic seaboard. Thus the image of Svatovit in the island of Reagan is said to have had four faces 328, and the life of Otto of Bamberg relates 329 how that high-handed evangelist proceeded to convert the ancient Prussians to Christianity. Among other things we are told how he found at Stettin an idol called Trigloss, a word referring to the three heads for which the god was remarkable. The saint took possession of the image and hewed away the body, reserving for himself the three heads, which are represented adhering together, forming one piece. This he sent as a trophy to Rome, and in Rome it may be still. Were it perchance to be found, it might be expected to show a close resemblance to the tricepal of the Gaulish altar found at Bone in Burgundy. Before closing this chapter a word may be permitted as to the goidelic element in the history of Wales, it wll come again before the reader in a later chapter. But what has already been advanced or implied concerning it may here be recapitulated as follows. It has been suggested that the hereditary dislike of the Brython for the Goidal argues their having formerly lived in close proximity to one another, see above. The tradition that the cave treasures of the Snowden district belong by right to the Goidals, means that they were formerly supposed to have hidden them away when hard pressed by the Brythons, see above. The sundry instances of a pair of names for a single person or place, one goidelic, brythonicized, still in use, and the other brythonic, suggested by the goidelic one, literary mostly and obsolete, go to prove that the goidels were not expelled. But allowed to remain to adopt brythonic speech. Evidence of the indebtedness of storytellers in Wales to their brethren of the same profession in Ireland is comparatively scarce and almost in every instance of recent research establishing a connection between topics or incidents in the Arthurian romances and the native literature of Ireland. The direct contact may be assumed to have been with the folklore and legend of the Goidelic inhabitants of Wales, whether before or after their change of language. Probably the folklore and mythology of the Goidels of Wales and of Ireland were in the mass much the same. Though in some instances they reach us in different stages of development, Thus in such a case as that of Don and Danu, genitive Dan N, the Welsh allusions in point refer to Don at a conspicuously earlier stage of her role than that represented by the Irish literature touching the Tuatha de Dan An. 330. The common point of view from which our ancestors like to look at the scenery around them is well illustrated by the fondness of the Goidel, in Wales and Ireland alike, for incidents to explain his place names. He required the topography indeed he requires it stlll, and hence the activity of the local etymologist to connote story or history, he must have something that wll impart the cold light of physical nature, river and lake, moor and mountain. A warmer tint, a dash of the pathetic element, a touch of the human, borrowed from the light and shade of the world of imagination and fancy in which he lives and dreams. Chapter 10. Difficulties of the Folklorist for priests, with prayers and other godly gear, have made the merry goblins disappear. And, where they played their merry pranks before, have sprinkled holy water on the floor at Dryden. 
The attitude of the Kimri towards folklore and popular superstitions varies according to their training and religious views, and I distinguish two classes of them in this respect. First of all, there are those who appear to regret the ebb of the tide of ancient beliefs. They maintain that people must have been far more interesting when they believed in the fairies. And they rave against Sunday schools and all other schools for having undermined the ancient superstitions of the peasantry, it all comes, they say, of over-educating the working classes. Of course one may occasionally wish servant maids still believed that they might get presents from the fairies for being neat and tidy. And that, in the contrary case of their being sluts, they would be pinched black and blue during their sleep by the little people, there may have been some utility in beliefs of that kind. But, if one takes an impartial view of the surroundings in which this kind of mental condition was possible, no sane man could say that the superstitious beliefs of our ancestors conduced on the whole to their happiness. Fancy a state of mind in which this sort of thing is possible a member of the family is absent, let us say, from home in the evening an hour later than usual. And the whole household is thrown into a panic because they imagine that he has strayed on fairy ground, and has been spirited away to the land of fairy twilight, whence he may never return. Or at any rate only to visit his home years, or maybe ages, afterwards, and then only to fall into a heap of dust just as he has found out that nobody expects or even knows him. Or take another instance, a man sets out in the morning on an important journey, but he happens to sneeze, or he sees an ill-omened bird, or some other dreaded creature, crossing his path, he expects nothing that day but misfortune. And the feeling of alarm possibly makes him turn back home, allowing the object of his journey to be sacrificed. That was not a satisfactory state of things or a happy one, and the unhappiness might be wholly produced by causes over which the patient had absolutely no control, so long at any rate as the birds of the air have wings. And so long as sneezing does not belong to the category of voluntary actions. Then I might point to the terrors of magic, but I take it to be unnecessary to dwell on such things, as most people have heard about them or read of them in books. On the whole it is but charitable to suppose that those who regret the passing away of the ages of belief and credulity have not seriously attempted to analyze the notions which they are pleased to cherish. Now, as to the other class of people, namely, those who object to folklore in every shape and form, they e may be roughly distinguished into different groups, such as those to whom folklore is an abomination. Because they hold that it is opposed to the Bible, and those who regard it as too trivial to demand the attention of any serious person. I have no occasion for many words with the former, since nearly everything that is harmful in popular superstition has ceased in Wales to be a living force influencing one's conduct, or if this be not already the case, it is fast becoming so. Those therefore who condemn superstitions have really no reason to set their faces against the student of folklore, it would be just as if historians were to be boycotted bemused they have, in writing history frequently. The more the pity to deal with dark intrigues, cruel murders, and sanguinary wars. Besides, those who study folklore do not thereby help to strengthen the hold of superstition on the people. I have noticed that any local peculiarity of fashion, the moment it becomes known to attract the attention of strangers, is, one may say, doomed, a Celt, like anybody else. Does not like to be photographed in a light which may perchance show him at a disadvantage. It is much the same, I think, with him as the subject of the studies of the folklorist, hence the latter has to proceed with his work very quietly and very warily. If, then, I pre. Tended to be a folklorist, which I can hardly claim to be, I should say that I had absolutely no quarrel with him who condemns superstition on principle. On the other hand, I should not consider it fair of him to regard me as opposed to the progress of the race in happiness and civilization, just because I am curious to understand its history. With regard to him, however, who looks at the collecting and the studying of folklore as trivial work and a waste of time, I should gather that he regards it so on account, first perhaps. Of his forgetting the reality their superstitions were to those who believed in them. And secondly, on account of his ignorance of their meaning. As a reality to those who believed in them, the superstitions of our ancestors form an integral part of their history. However, I need not follow that topic further by trying to show how the proper study of mankind is man, 
and how it is a mark of an uncultured people not to know or care to know about the history of the race. So the ancient Roman historian, Tacitus, evidently thought, for, when complaining how little was known as to the original peopling of Britain, he adds the suggestive words ut inter barbaros, as usual among barbarians. Conversely, I take it for granted that no liberally educated man or woman of the present day requires to be instructed as to the value of the study of history in all its aspects, or to be told that folklore cannot be justly called trivial. Seeing that it has to do with the history of the race in a wider sense, I may say with the history of the human mind and the record of its development. As history has been mentioned, it may be here pointed out that one of the greatest of the folklorists' difficulties is that of drawing the line between story and history. Nor is that the worst of it. For the question as between fact and fiction, hard as it is in itself, is apt to be further complicated by questions of ethnology. This may be illustrated by reference to a group of legends which project a vanishing distinction between the two kindred races of Brythons and Goidals in Wales, and into the story of some of them Arthur is introduced playing a principal role. They seem to point to a time when the Goidals had as yet wholly lost neither their own language nor their own institutions in North Wales for the legends belong chiefly to Gwynd, and cluster especially around Snowdon. Where the characteristics of the Goidal as the earlier Celt may well have lingered latest, thanks to the comparatively inaccessible nature of the country. One of these legends has already been summarized as representing Arthur marching up the side of Snowdon towards BWLCHY Sethow, where he falls and is buried under a cairn named from him Carned Arthur. We are not told who his enemies were. But with this question has usually been associated the late triad, 3. 20, which alludes to Arthur meeting in Nanhwinan with Medrod or Medrod, Modred, and Idoc, Com Prydane, and to his being betrayed for the benefit and security of the Saxons in the island. An earlier reference to the same story occurs in the dream of Ronabwy in the Red Book of Hergest 331, in which Idoc describes himself as Idoc son of Minio. And as nicknamed Idwak Cord Priden which means Idoc the churn staff of Priden in reference presumably to his activity in creating dissension. He confesses to having falsified the friendly messages of Arthur to Medrod, and to succeeding thereby in bringing on the fatal Battle of Camlin, from which Idoc himself escaped to do penance for seven years on the Lech Loss. Grey Stone 332 inch, 24, in Prydain or Picked Land. Another story brings Arthur and the giant Rida into collision, the latter of whom has already been mentioned as having, according to local tradition, his grave on the top of Snowdon, the story is a very wild one. Two kings who were brothers, Ninia or Ninio and Pibia or Pebio, quarreled thus, one moonlight night, as they were together in the open air, Ninio said to Pebio, See, what a fine extensive field I possess. Where is it? asked Pebio. There it is, said Ninio, the whole Fremariant. See, said Pebio, what innumerable herds of cattle and sheep I have grazing in thy field. Where are they? asked Ninio. There they are, said Pebio, the whole host of stars that thou sayest, each of golden brightness, with the moon shepherding them. They shall not graze in my field, said Ninio. But they shall, said Pebio. And the two kings got so enraged with one another, that they began a war in which their warriors and subjects were nearly exterminated. Then comes Rydagor, king of Wales, and attacks them on the dangerous ground of their being mad. He conquered them and shaved off their beards 333. But when the other kings of Prydain, 28 in number, heard of it, they collected all their armies together to avenge themselves on Rida for the disgrace to which he had subjected the other two. But after a great struggle Rida conquers again, and has the beards of the other kings shaved. Then the kings of neighboring kingdoms in all directions combined to make war on Rida to avenge the disgrace to their order. But they were also vanquished forthwith, and treated in the same ignominious fashion as the thirty kings of Prydain. With the beards he had a mantle made to cover him from head to foot, and that was a good deal, we are told, since he was as big as two ordinary men. Then Rida turned his attention to the establishment of just and equitable laws as between king and king and one realm with another 334. But the sequel to the shaving is related by Geoffrey of Monmouth, X. 
3. Where Arthur is made to tell how the giant, after destroying the other kings and using their beards in the way mentioned, asked him for his beard to fix above the other beards, as he stood above them in rank. Or else to come and fight a duel with him. Arthur, as might be expected, chose the latter course, with the result that he slew Rida, there called Ritho, at a place said to be in Aravio Monte, by which the Welsh translator understood the chief mountain of Ararai 335 or Snowdon. So it is but natural that his grave should also be there, as already mentioned. I may here add that it is the name Snowdon itself, probably, that underlies the Synodon or Synodon of such Arthurian romances as the English version of Le Beaux de Sconus. Though the place meant has been variously supposed to be situated elsewhere than in the Snowdon district, witness Sihadon Hill in Berkshire 336. The story of Rida is told also by Mallory, who calls that giant Ryans and Rients, and there the incident seems to end with Ryans being led to Arthur's court by knights who had overcome him. Ryan's challenge, as given by Mallory 337, runs thus. This meanwhile came a Messager from Kinge Ryan's of Northwellies. And Kinge he was of all Ireland and of many isles. And this was his message Gritinge Wel Kinge Arthur in this manier wise sayenge. That Kinge Ryan's had discomfite and workum xj Kinge's. And Eurish of him did hym homage. And that was this. They gafhym their birdies clean flain of. As mosh as there was. Werfer the Messager came for Kwenji Arthur's bird. For Kwenji Ryans had perfiled a mantle with Kinja's birdes. And there lacked one place of the mantle. Werfer he sente for his bird or else he wold entre into his landis. And Bren and Slee. And Neuer Louis till he haw the huda and the bird. Rida is not said, it is true, to have been a guidle, goidle. But he is represented ruling over Ireland, and his name, which is not Welsh, recalls at first sight those of such men as Boya the Pict or Scott figuring in the life of Esti. David, and such as Lyag Vittel, Lya the Goidle, mentioned in the stanzas of the graves in the Black Book of Carmarthen as buried in the seclusion of Ardedwy. 338 Mallory's Ryans is derived from the French romances, where, as for example in the Merlin, according to the Huth MS, it occurs as Ryan S in the nominative, and Ryan in regime. The latter, owing to the old French habit of alighting DD or TH, derives regularly enough from such a form as the accusative written M 339, which is the one occurring in Geoffrey's text. And we should probably be right in concluding therefrom that the correct old Welsh form of the name was written. But the Goidelic form was at the same time probably Rida, with a genitive written, for an earlier written. Lastly, that the local legend should perpetuate the Goidelic Rida slightly modified, has its parallel in the case of TRWID and TRWITH, N of Echel and Egel or Essel, pages. 541 to 2 and 536 to 7. The next story 340 points to a spot between Y Dinas or Dinas Emrys and LLYN Y Dinas as containing the grave of Owen Y Maxon, that is to say, Owen son of Maxon. Owen had been fighting with a giant whose name local tradition takes for granted with balls of steel, and there are depressions, Panelo 341, still to be seen in the ground where each of the combatants took his stand. Some, however, will have it that it was with bows and arrows they fought, and that the hollows are the places they dug to defend themselves. The result was that both died at the close of the conflict. And Owen, being asked where he wished to be buried, ordered an arrow to be shot into the air and his grave to be made where it fell. The story is similarly given in the Lolo Mises, pp. 81-2, where the combatants are called Owen Findu of Maxon Liedig, Owen of the Dark Face, son of Prince Maxon, and Yurnak Hen, E, the Ancient, one of the GWIDDYL or Goidles of North Wales, and otherwise called Ernak Whittle. He is there represented as father, one, of the Sarajit defeated by Kalwalon or Cadwallon Lahir, c. The long-handed, at Sarajit Gwiddyl, the stones of the Goidles, near Maldray 342, in Anglesey, where the great and final rout of the Goidles is represented as having taken place 343. 2. 
of Darrenly, an infant spared and brought up in Anglesey to its detriment, as related in the other story, page 504, and, 3, of Solar, who commands one of the three cruising fleets of the Isle of Prydain 344. The stronghold of Urnak or Urnak is said to have been Dinas Phoreon, which was afterwards called Din Emrius and Dinas Emrys. The whole story about the Goidals in North Wales, however, as given in the Lolo Mises, pp. 78-80, is a hopeless jumble, though it is probably based on old traditions. In fact, one detects Urnak or Urnak as Runach or Gurnak in the story of Kulhuch and Olwen 345 in the Red Book, where we are told that Kay or Kai, and others of Arthur's men, got into the giant's castle and cut off his head in order to secure his sword, which was one of the things required for the hunting of TWRCHTRWITH. In an obscure passage, also in a poem in the Black Book, we read of Kai fighting in the hall of this giant, who is then called a Warnock 346. Some such a feat appears to have been commemorated in the place named GWRYD Kai, Kai's feat of arms, which occurs in Luland's grant of certain lands on the Bedgelert and Penn GWRYD side of Snowden in 1198 to the monks of Aberkenry. Or rather in an inspeximus of the same, see Dugdale's Monasticon, v. 673a, where it stands printed GWRYT, k. Nor is it unreasonable to guess that Pen GWRYD is only a shortening of Pen GWRYD Kai, Kai's feet knoll or terminus, but compare above. Before leaving Kai I may point out that tradition seems to ascribe to him as his residence the place called Kair Gai, 26, Kai's fort, between Bala and Lenuchlin. If one may treat Kai as a historical man, one may perhaps suppose him, or some member of his family, commemorated by the vocable Burgokavi on an old stone found at Kair Gai. And said to read, I see Iasit Salvianus Burgacavi Filius Cupitiani 347 foot, here lies Salvianus Burgacavis, son of Cupitianus. The reader may also be referred back to such non brythonic and little known figures as Darrenly, Cathbaluk, and Brynach, together perhaps with Mainwade, the wolf lord of Arlichwed, pages 504 to 5. It is worthwhile calling attention likewise to goidelic indications afforded by the topography of Ararai, to wit such cases as BWLCH Merchan or Mulchan, Merchan's Pass, sometimes made into BWH Mwilkan or even BWLCH Y Fwilkan. The Uzzles Gap, near LLYN Gwynane. The remarkable remains called Murio Ardre, the town walls otherwise known as Treyar Gwydalod 348, the Goidal's town on the land of Gwastad Anas at the top of Nanlwanane. And BWHY Gwydal, still higher towards Pen GWRYD, may have meant the Goidal's Pass. Probably a study of the topography on the spot would result in the identification of more names similarly significant. But one will call attention to only one of them, namely Bejlert or, as it is locally pronounced, Bethjelart, though the older spellings of the name appear to be Beth Kellerth and Beth Kellert. Those who are acquainted with the story, as told there, of the man who rashly killed his hound might think that Bejlert, Jellert or Kellert's grave, refers to the hound. But there is a complete lack of evidence to show this widely known story to have been associated with the neighborhood by Antiquity 349. And the compiler of the notes and pedigrees known as Bonnet Y. Saint was probably right in treating Kellert as the name of an ancient saint, see the MYVYR. Arch, 2. 36. In any case, Kellert or Jellert with its RT cannot be a genuine Welsh name, the older spellings seem to indicate two pronunciations a Goidelic one, Kellert, and a Welsh one, Kellarth or Kellerth, which has not survived. The documents, however, in which the name occurs require to be carefully examined for the readings which they supply. Lastly, from the goidels of Arfon must not be too violently severed those of Mona, among whom we have found, pp. 504-5, the mysterious Cathbaluk, whose name, still half unexplained, reminds one of such Irish ones as Cathbwadak, battle victorious or conquering in war, and to the same stratum belongs Darrenly, p. 504, which survives as the name of a farm in the parish of Lanfacrath. The record of Carnarvon, p. 59, speaks both of a Melendinum de Darrenly e de Cornu, 
mill of Darenwee 315 Cornwee, and of Ville de Dornwee Etikuf Dornach, bills of Darenwee and of the CNWCH Dernog, which has been mentioned as now pronounced CLWCH Dernog. It is situated in the adjoining parish of Landuzent. The name is given in the same record as Dernock, and is doubtless to be identified with the Turnock not very uncommon in Irish hagiology. With these names the record further associates a holding called Wilconus, and Conus survives in Wiengans, the name of a field on the farm of Braun Hulog, adjoining CLWCH Dernog. That is not all, for Cons turns out to be the Welsh pronunciation of the Goidelic name Cunigusus, of which we have the Latinized genitive on the Bodf clan Menhir, some distance north cast of the railway station of Ty Crows. It reads, Cnog chic iasit, here lies, the body, of Cunigusus, and involves a name which has regularly become in Irish Congus, while the native Welsh equivalent would be CYNWST 351. These names, and one 352 or two more which might be added to them, suggest a very goidelic population as occupying, in the 5th or 6th century, the part of the island west of a line from Amlu to Maldraith. Lastly, the chronological indications of the crushing of the power of the goidels, and the incipient merging of that people with the Brythons into a single nation of Kimri or compatriots, are worthy of a passing remark. We seem to find the process echoed in the triads when they mention as a favorite at Arthur's court the lord of Artechwed, named Menwade, who has been guessed, above, to have been a goidel. Then Sarajee and Darenwi are signalized as contemporaries of Cadwal and Lahir, who inflicted on the former, according to the later legend, the great defeat of Sarig YGWYCLYL 353. The name, however, of the leader of the Goidels arrayed against Cadwadden may be regarded as unknown, and Sarigi as a later name, probably of Norse origin. Introduced from an account of a 10th century struggle with invaders from the Scandinavian Kingdom of Dublin 354, 26. In this conqueror we have probably all that can be historical of the Castleton of the Mabinogen of Branwen and Manawiden, that is, the Caswatlan who ousts the Goidelic family of Ilyr from power in this country. And makes Prittery of Dyfed pay homage to him as supreme king of the island. His name has there undergone assimilation to that of Casavalanos, and he is furthermore represented as son of Beli, king of Prydain in the days of its independence, before the advent of the legions of Rome. But as a historical man we are to regard Caswallan probably as Cadwallan Lahir, grandson of Cuneta and father of Maelgun of Gwynet. Now Cuneta and his sons, according to Nennius, section 62, expelled the goidels with terrible slaughter. And one may say, with the triads, which practically contradict Nennius' statement as to the goidels being expelled, that Cuneta's grandson continued the struggle with them. In any case there were goidels still there, for the Book of Taliesin seems to give evidence 355 of a persistent hostility on the part of the Goidelic bards of Gwynet. To Mailgun and the more Brythonic institutions which he may be regarded as representing. This brings the Goidelic element down to the 6th century 356. Mailgun's death took place, according to the oldest manuscript of the Annals Cambrii, in the year 547, or ten years after the Battle of Camlin in which, as it says, Arthur and Medrod fell. Now some of this is history and some is not, where is the line to be drawn? In any case, the attempt to answer that question could not be justly met with contempt or treated as trivial. The other cause, to which I suggested that contempt for folklore was probably to be traced, together with the difficulty springing there from to beset the folklorists' paths is one's ignorance of the meaning of many of the superstitions of our ancestors. I do not wish this to be regarded as a charge of willful ignorance, for one has frankly to confess that many old superstitions and superstitious practices are exceedingly hard to understand. So much so, that those who have most carefully studied them cannot always agree with one another in their interpretation. At first sight, some of the superstitions seem so silly and absurd, that one cannot wonder that those who have not gone deeply into the study of the human mind should think them trivial, foolish, or absurd. It is, however, not improbable that they are the results of early attempts to think out the mysteries of nature. And our difficulty is that the thinking was so infantile, comparatively speaking, 
that one finds it hard to put oneself back into the mental condition of early man. But it should be clearly understood that our difficulty in ascertaining the meaning of such superstitions is no proof whatsoever that they had no meaning. The chief initial difficulty, however, meeting anyone who would collect folklore in Wales arises from the fact that various influences have conspired to laugh it out of court, so to say. So that those who are acquainted with superstitions and ancient fads become ashamed to own it, they have the fear of ridicule weighing on their minds, and that is a weight not easily removed. I can recall several instances, among others I may mention a lady who up to middle age believed implicitly in the existence of fairies, and was most anxious that her children should not wander away from home at any time when there happened to be a mist, lest the fairies should carry them away to their home beneath a neighboring lake. In her later years, however, it was quite useless for a stranger to question her on these things, fairy lore had been so laughed out of countenance in the meantime, that at last she would not own, even to the members of her own family, that she remembered anything about the fairies. Another instance in point is supplied by the story of Castlemarch, and by my failure for a whole fortnight to elicit from the old blacksmith of Abersock the legend of March of Merchant with horse's ears. Of course I can readily understand the old man's shyness in repeating the story of March. Science, however, knows no such shyness, as it is her business to pry into everything and to discover, if possible, the why and wherefore of all things. In this context let me for a moment revert to the story of March, silly as it looks, March was lord of Castlemarch in Lane, and he had horse's ears, so lest the secret should be known, every one who shaved him was killed forthwith. And in the spot where the bodies were buried there grew reeds, which a bard cut in order to provide himself with a pipe. The pipe when made would give no music but words meaning March has horse's ears. There are other forms of the story, but all substantially the same as that preserved for us by LLWID, except that one of them resembles more closely the Irish version about to be summarized. It occurs in a manuscript in the Peniarth collection, and runs thus, March had horse's ears, a fact known to nobody but his barber, who durst not make it known for fear of losing his head. But the barber fell ill, so that he had to call in a physician, who said that the patient was being killed by a secret, and he ordered him to tell it to the ground. The barber having done so became well again, and fine reeds grew on the spot. One day, as the time of a great feast was drawing nigh, certain of the pipers of Mailgun Gwine coming that way saw the reeds, some of which they cut and used for their pipes. By and by they had to perform before King March, when they could elicit from their pipes no strain but horses' ears for March of Merchin, Kultstiaf March I Varch of Merchin. Hence arose the saying that is gone on horns and pipes, Bthwnnyargyrn of Fibav, which was as much as to say that the secret is become more than public 357. The story, it is almost needless to say, can be traced also in Cornwall and in Brittany 358, and not only among the Brythonic peoples of those countries, but among the goidels of Ireland likewise. The Irish story runs thus 359, once on a time there was a king over Ireland whose name was Labraid Lork, and this is the manner of man he was he had two horses ears on him. And every one who shaved the king used to be slain forthwith. Now the time of shaving him drew nigh one day, when the son of a widow in the neighborhood was enjoined to do it. The widow went and besought the king that her son should not be slain, and he promised her that he would be spared if he would only keep his secret. So it came to pass. But the secret so disagreed with the widow's son that he fell ill, and nobody could divine the cause until a druid came by. He at once discovered that the youth was ill of an uncommunicated secret, and ordered him to go to the meeting of four roads. Let him, said he, turn sunwise, and the first tree he meets on the right side let him tell. The secret to it, and he will be well. This you might think was quite safe, as it was a tree in not his mother, his sister, or his sweetheart. But you would be quite mistaken in thinking so. The tree to which the secret was told was a willow, and a famous Irish harper of that day, finding he wanted a new harp, came and cut the makings of a harp from that very tree. But when the harp was got ready and the harper proceeded to play on it, not a note could he elicit but Labraid Lork has horse's ears. As to the barber's complaint, 
that was by no means unnatural, it has often been noticed how a secret disagrees with some natures, and how uneasy and restless it makes them until they can out with it. The same thing also, in an aggravated form, occurs now and then to a public man who has prepared a speech in the dark recesses of his heart, but has to leave the meeting where he intended to have it out, without finding his opportunity. Our neighbors on the other side of the channel have a technical term for that sort of sufferer, they say of him that he is malade dun discars rentre, or ill of a speech which has gone into the patient's constitution. Like the measles or the smallpox when it fails to come out. But to come back to the domain of folklore, I need only mention the lovelorn knights in Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, who details their griefs in doleful strains to solitary fountains in the forests, it seems to have relieved them greatly. And it sometimes reached other ears than those of the wells. Now with regard to him of the equine ears, someone might thoughtlessly suggest, that, if it ever became a question of improving this kind of story, one should make the ears into those of an ass. As a matter of fact there was a Greek story of this kind, and in that story the man with the abnormal head was called Midas, and his ears were said to be those of an ass. The reader will find him figuring in most collections of Greek stories. So I need not pursue the matter further, except to remark that the exact kind of brute ears was possibly a question which different nations decided differently. At any rate Stokes mentions a Serbian version in which the ears were those of a goat. What will, however, occur to everybody to ask, is what was the origin of such a story? What did it mean, if it had a meaning? Various attempts have been made to interpret this kind of story, but nobody, so far as I know, has found a sure key to its meaning. The best guess one can make has been suggested in a previous chapter, comma, from which it will be seen that the horse fits the Welsh context, so to say, best, the goat less well, and the ass probably least of all, see above. Supposing, then, the interpretation of the story established for certain, the question of its origin would still remain. Did it originate among THD Celts and the Greeks and other nations who relate it? Or has it simply originated among one of those peoples and spread itself to the others? Or else have they all inherited it from a common source? If we take the supposition that it originated independently among a variety of people in the distant past, then comes an interesting question as to the conditions under which it arose. And the psychological state of the Hernan race in the distant past. On the other supposition one is forced to ask, did the Celts get the story from the Greeks, or the Greeks from the Celts, or neither from either, but from a common source? Also when and how did the variations arise? In any case, one cannot help seeing that a story like the one I have instanced raises a variety of profoundly difficult and interesting questions. Hard as the folklorist may find it to extract tales and legends from the people of Wales at the present day, there is one thing which he finds far more irritating than the taciturnity of the peasant. And that is the hopeless fashion in which some of those who have written about Welsh folklore have deigned to record the stories which were known to them. Take as an instance the following, which occurs in Howell's Cambrian Superstitions, pages 103-4. In Cardiganshire there is a lake, beneath which it is reported that a town lies buried. And in and in summer, when the water is low, a wall, on which people may walk, extending across the lake is seen, and supposed to appertain to the inundated city or town. On one side is a gigantic rock, which appears to have been split, as there is a very extensive opening in it, which nearly divides it in twain. And which tradition relates was thus occasioned, once upon a time there was a person of the name of Panic, who had two oxen, so large that their like was never known in any part of the world, and of whom it might be said. They ne'er will look upon their like again. It chanced one day that one of them, and it appears that they were not endued with a quantum of sense proportionate to their bulk, was grazing near a precipice opposite the rock, and whether it was his desire to commit suicide. Or to cool his body by laving in the lake below, one knows not, but certain it is that down he plunged, and was never seen more his partner searching for him a short time after, and not perceiving any signs of his approach. Bellowed almost as loud as the father of the gods, who when he spake, earth to his center shook. However, the sound of his bleeding, sick, split the opposite rock, which from the circumstance is called Euchain Panic, Panic's oxen. These oxen were said to be two persons, 
called in Wales, Niniaf and Phoebeaf, whom God turned into beasts for their sins. Here it is clear that Mr. Howells found a portion, if not the whole, of his story in Welsh, taken partly from the Coolwich story, and apparently in the old spelling. For his own acquaintance with the language did not enable him to translate Ninia 6 of Fiba 6 into Ninio and Pebio. The slenderness of his knowledge of Welsh is otherwise proved throughout his book, especially by the way in which he spells Welsh words, in fact one need not go beyond this very story with its Uchain panic. But when he had ascertained that the lake was in Cardiganshire he might have gone a little further and have told his readers which lake it was. It is not one of the lakes which I happen to know in the north of the county Llyn Ligad y Rido L on Plinlimon, or the lake on Mol y Llyn to the north of Coombe Sullen, or either of the Ewan lakes which drain into the Marin, or Mary. A tributary of the Minac. Which flows under Pont Ar Finac, called in English the Devil's Bridge. From inquiry I cannot find either that it is any one of the pools in the east of the county, such as those of the Teafi, or Island Ferwin, not far from the gorge known as Coombe. Berwin, mentioned in Edward Richard's well-known lines, p. 43. May N B W R Z V N G H W M Bimin A R Sikadin Estin. Xna Hino F Y M W T H Y N Y N Durfin D Y Daith. It rains in Coombe Berwin, the shadows are growing. Tonight make my cabin the end of thy journey. There is, it is true, a pool at a place called Maze Yllyn in the neighborhood of Tregeron, as to which there is a tradition that a village once occupied the place of its waters, otherwise it shows no similarity to the Lake of Howell story. Then there is a group of lakes in which the river Aaron takes its rise, they are called Llyn Idwen, Llyn Fanad, and Llyn Farch. As to Llyn Idwen, I had it years ago that at one time there was a story current concerning wild cattle, which used to come out of its waters and rush back into them when disturbed. In the middle of this piece of water, which has a rock on one side of it, is a small island with a modern building on it, and one would like to know whether it shows any traces of early occupation. Then as to Llyn Farch, there is a story going that there came out of it once on a time a wonderful animal, which was shot by a neighboring farmer. Lastly, at Llyn Fanad the Vri are boundary walls which go right out into the lake. And my informant thinks the same is the case with Llyn Edwin 360. One of these walls is probably what in Howell's youthful hands developed itself into a causeway. The other part of his story, referring to the lowing of the Bannock oxen, comes from a well-known doggerel which runs thus. Land Dewey Freyfi Freyth 361 Lindui we of Brefi the spotted. Lu Brefid year YCH Nagwaith. Where bellowed the ox nine times. Ness Hoffity Craig Y Folalt. Till the Folaft rock split in two. Brefi is the name of the river from which this Landui takes its distinctive name, and it is pronounced there much the same as Brefu, the act of lowing, bellowing, or bleeding. Now the Brefi runs down through the Foelidit farm which lies between two very big rocks popularly fancied to have been once united, and treated by Howells, somewhat inconsistently, as the permanent forms taken by the two oxen. The story which Howells seems to have jumbled up with that of one or more lake legends, is to be found given in Samuel Rush Merrick's County of Cardigan, see above. Where one reads of a wild tradition that when the church was building there were two oxen to draw the stone required and one of the two died in the effort to drag the load, while the other bellowed nine times and thereby split the hill, which before presented itself as an obstacle. The single ox was then able to bring the load unassisted to the site of the church. It is to this story that the doggerel already given refers, and, curiously enough, most of the district between Landui and Istrad Fleur, or Strait of Florida, is more or less associated with the Icon Banag, 27. Thus a ridge running east and west at a distance of some three miles from Tregeron, and separating Upper and Lower Karen from on another, bears the name of CWIS your Eichenbanach, or the furrow of the Eichenbanach. It somewhat resembles in appearance an ancient dike, but it is said to be nothing but a long bank of glacial till 362. Dot. Moreover there used to be preserved within the church of Landui a remarkable fragment of a horn commonly called Madcorn year YCH Banach, 
the mabcorn or core of the bannock ox's horn. It is now in the possession of Mr. Perry of Lydiardow, near Aberystwyth, and it has been pronounced by Professor Boyd Dawkins to have belonged to, the great Urus, Bos Primogenius, that Charlemagne hunted in the forests of Aachen, and the monks of St. Gall ate on their feast days. He adds that the condition of the horn proves it to have been derived from a peat bog or alluvium 363. On the whole, it seems to me probable that the wild legends about the Iken Bannock 364 in Cardiganshire have underlying them a substratum of tradition going back to a time when the Urus was not as yet extinct in Wales. How far the Urus was once treated in this country as an emblem of divinity, it is impossible to say, but from ancient Gaul we have such a name as Eurigino Nerdus 365, meaning a man of the strength of an Eurigen, that is, of the offspring of a Urus. Not to mention the Gaulish Tarvos Digeranus, or the bull with three cranes on his back. With this divine animal M. Darbois de Juba. In Ville would identify the Donos underlying such Gallo Roman Narns as Donatorus, and that of the wonderful bull called Don in the principal epic story of Ireland 366. Where we seem to trace the same element in the river name given by Ptolemy as Imodonos, one of the streams of Wicklow, or else the Slaney. This would be the earliest instance known of the prefixing of the pronoun mo, my, in its reverential application, which was confined in later ages to the names of Goidelic saints. To return, however, to the folklorist's difficulty yes, the first thing to be done is to get as ample a supply of folklore materials as possible, and here I come to a point at which some of the readers of these pages could probably help. For we want all our folklore and superstitions duly recorded and rescued from the yawning gulf of oblivion, into which they are rapidly and irretrievably dropping year by year, as the oldest inhabitant passes away. Some years ago I attempted to collect the stories still remembered in Wales about fairies and lake dwellers, and I seem to have thrown some amount of enthusiasm into that pursuit. At any rate, one editor of a Welsh newspaper congratulated me on being a thorough believer in the fairies. Unfortunately, I was not nearly so successful in recommending myself as a believer to the old people who could have related to me the kind of stories I wanted. Nevertheless, the best plan I found was to begin by relating a story about the fairies myself, if that method did not result in eliciting anything from the listener, then it was time to move on to try the experiment on another subject. Among the things which one then found was the fact, that most of the well-known lakes and tarns of Wales were once believed to have had inhabitants of a fairy kind, who owned cattle that sometimes came ashore and mixed with the ordinary breeds. While an occasional lake lady became the wife of a shepherd or farmer in the neighborhood. There must, however, be many more of these legends lurking in out-of-the-way parts of Wales in connection with the more remote mountain tarns, and it would be well if they were collected systematically. One of the most complete and best known of these lake stories is that of Llyny Fan Fock in the Beacons of Camothensha, called in Welsh Beno Sir Geir. The story is so much more circumstantial than all the others, that it has been placed at the beginning of this volume. Next to it may be ranked that of the Istrad Daifadu Pool, now known as Llyny Forwin, the details of which have only recently been unearthed for me by a friend, see above. Well, in the Fan Fock legend the lake lady marries a young farmer from Emmet Fai, on the Camothensha side of the range, and she is to remain his wife so long as he lives without striking her three times without cause. When that happens, she leaves him and calls away with her all her live stock, down to the little black calf in the process of being flayed, for he suddenly dons his hide and hurries away after the rest of the stock into the lake. The three blows without cause seem to belong to a category of very ancient determinants which have been recently discussed, with his usual acumen and command of instances from other lands, by Mr. Hartland, in the chapters on the Swan Maidens in his Science of Fairy Tales. But our South Welsh story allows the three blows only a rinimurn of force. And in North Wales the determinant is of a different kind, though probably equally ancient for there the husband must not strike or touch the fairy wife with anything made of iron, a condition which probably points back to the Stone Age. For archaeologists are agreed, that before metal, whether iron or bronze, was used in the manufacturing of tools, stone was the universal material for all cutting tools and weapons. 
But as savages are profoundly conservative in their babbits, it is argued that on ceremonial and religious occasions knives of stone continued to be the only ones admissible long after bronze ones had been in common use for ordinary purposes. Take for example the text of Exodus 4. 25, where Zipporah is mentioned circumcising her son with a flint. From instances of the kind one may comprehend the sort of way in which iron came to be regarded as an abomination and a horror to the fairies. The question will be found discussed by Mr. Hartland at length in his book mentioned above, see more especially pages 305-9. Such, to my mind, are some of the questions to which the fairies give rise, I now wish to add another turning on the reluctance of the fairies to disclose their names. There is one story in particular which would serve to illustrate this admirably. But it is one which, I am sorry to say, I have never been able to discover complete or coherent in Wales. The substance of it should be, roughly speaking, as follows. A woman finds herself in great distress and is delivered out of it by a fairy, who claims as reward the woman's baby. On a certain day the baby will inevitably be taken by the fairy unless the fairy's true name is discovered by the mother. The fairy is foiled by being in the meantime accidentally overheard exulting, that the mother does not know that his or her name is Rumpelstiltchen, or whatever it may be in the version which happens to be in question. The best known version is the German one, where the fairy is called Rumpelstiltchen, and it will be found in the ordinary editions of Grimm's Merkin. The most complete English version is the East Anglian one published by Mr. Edward Claude, in his recent volume entitled Tom Tit Tot, pages 8 to 16, and previously in an article full of research headed The Philosophy of Rumpelstiltskin, in Folklore for 1889, pp. 138-43, it is first to be noted that in this version the fairy's name is Tom Tit Tot, and that the German and the East Anglian stories run parallel. They agree in making the fairy a male, in which they differ from our Welsh silly frit and silly go dwt, in what other respect the story of our silly differed from that of Rumpelstiltchen and Tom Tit Tot it is. In the present incomplete state of the Welsh one, impossible to say. Here it may be found useful to recall the fragments of the Welsh story, one, a fairy woman used to come out of Corian Pool to spin on fine summer days, and whilst spinning she sang or hummed to herself silly frit. Silly Fridit does not rise even to a doggerel couplet, above. 2. A farmer's wife in Lane used to have visits from a fairy woman who came to borrow things from her. And one day when the good wife had lent her a troll bock, or wheel for spinning flax, she asked the fairy to give her name, which she declined to do. She was, however, overheard to sing to the whir of the wheel as follows, p. 229. By Hana Widda High. Little did she know. My silly go DWT. That silly go DWT. YWFENWI. Is my name. This throws some light on silly frit, and we know where we are, but the story is inconsequent, and far from representing the original. We cannot, however, reconstruct it quite on the lines of Grimm's or Claude's version. But I happened to mention my difficulty one day to Dr. J. A. H. Murray, when he assured me of the existence of a Scottish version in which the fairy is a female. He learnt it when he was a child, he said, at Denholm, in Roxburghshire, and he was afterwards charmed to read it in Robert Chambers' Popular Rhymes of Scotland, Edinburgh, 1858, pages 221-5, whence Mr. Claude has given an abstract of it in his Philosophy of Rumpelstiltskin. Among those popular rhymes the reader will find it as related at length by Nurse Jenny in her inimitable fashion. But the scotch is so broad, that I think it advisable, at the risk of some havoc to the local colouring, to southernize it somewhat as follows. I see that you are fond of talks about fairies. Children and a story about a fairy and the good wife of Kittlerumpet has just come into my mind. But I can't very well tell you now whereabouts Kittlerumpet lies. I think it is somewhere in the debatable ground, anyway I shall not pretend to know more than I do, like everybody nowadays. I wish they would remember the ballad we used to sing long ago. Moni Ain sings the jerse, the jerse. And Moni Ain sings the corn. And Moni Ain clatters, oh, bold Robin Hood. 
near Kent where he was born. But howsoever about Kittlerumpet, the goodman was a rambling sort of body, and he went to a fair one day, and not only never came home again, but never more was heard of. Some said he'd listed, and others that the tiresome press gang snatched him up, though he was furnished with a wife and a child to boot. Alas! That wretched press gang! They went about the country like roaring lions, seeking whom they might devour. Well do I remember how my eldest brother Sandy was all but smothered in the meal chest, hiding from those rascals. After they were gone, we pulled him out from among the meal, puffing and crying, and as white as any corpse. My mother had to pick the meal out of his mouth with the shank of a horn spoon. Ah well, when the goodman of Kittlerumpet was gone, the goodwife was left with small means. Little resources had she, and a baby boy at her breast. All said they were sorry for her, but nobody helped her which is a common case, sirs. Howsoever the goodwife had a sow, and that was her only consolation, for the sow was soon to Pharaoh, and she hoped for a good litter. But we all know hope is fallacious. One day the woman goes to the sty to fill the sow's trough, and what does she find but the sow lying on her back, grunting and groaning, and ready to give up the ghost. I trow this was a new pang to the goodwife's heart, so she sat down on the knocking, stone 367, with her bairn on her knee, and cried sorer than ever she did for the loss of her own goodman. Now I premised that the cottage of Kittlerumpet was built on a bray, with a large firwood behind it, of which you may hear more ere we go far on. So the goodwife, when she was wiping her eyes, chances to look down the bray. And what does she see but an old woman, almost like a lady, coming slowly up the road. She was dressed in green, all but a short white apron and a black velvet hood, and a steeple-crowned beaver hat on her head. She had a long walking staff, as long as herself, in her hand the sort of staff that old men and old women helped themselves with long ago, I see no such staffs now, sirs. Ah well, when the good wife saw the green gentlewoman near her, she rose and made a curtsy, and, Madam, quoth she, weeping, I am Ani of the most misfortunate women alive. I don't wish to hear Piper's news and Fiddler's tales, good wife, quoth the green woman. I know you have lost your goodman we had worse losses at the Sheriff Muir 368, and I know that your sow is unco sick. Now what will you give me if I cure her? Anything your ladyship's madam likes, quoth the witless good wife, never guessing whom she had to deal with. Let us wet thumbs on that bargain, quoth the green woman. So thumbs were wetted, I warrant you, and into the sty madam marches. She looks at the sow with a long stare, and then began to mutter to herself what the good wife couldn't well understand. But she said it sounded like pitter-patter, holy water. Then she took out of her pocket a wee bottle, with something like oil in it, and she rubs the sow with it above the snout, behind the ears, and on the tip of the tail. Get up, beast, quoth the green woman. No sooner said than done up jumps the sow with a grunt, and away to her trough for her breakfast. The good wife of Kittlerumpet was a joyful good wife now, and would have kissed the very hem of the green woman's gown tail, but she wouldn't let her. I am not so fond of ceremonies, quoth she. But now that I have righted your sick beast, let us end our settled bargain. You will not find me an unreasonable, greedy body one like ever to do a good turn for a small reward, all I ask, and will have, is that baby boy in your bosom. The good wife of Kittlerumpet, who now knew her customer, gave a shrill cry like a stuck swine. The green woman was a fairy, no doubt, so she prays, and cries, and begs, and scolds, but all wouldn't do. You may spare your din, quoth the fairy, screaming as if I was as deaf as a doornail, but this I'll let you know minus one cannot, by the law we live under, take your bairn till the third day, and not then, if you can tell me my right name. So madam goes away round the pigsty end, and the good wife falls down in a swoon behind the knocking stone. M. Well, the good wife of Kittlerumpet could not sleep any that night for crying, and all the next day the same, cuddling her bairn till she nearly squeezed its breath out, but the second day she thinks of taking a walk in the wood I told you of. And so with the bairn in her arms, she sets out, and goes far in among the trees, where was an old quarry hole, grown over with grass, 
and a bonny spring well in the middle of it. Before she came very near, she hears the whirring of a flax wheel, and a voice singing a song, so the woman creeps quietly among the bushes, and peeps over the brow of the quarry. And what does she see but the green fairy tearing away at her wheel, and singing like any presenter? Little Ken's our G-U-I-D dame at hame. That whoopity story is my name. Ha, ha. Thinks the woman, I've got the mason's word at last. The devil give them joy that told it. So she went home far lighter than she came out, as you may well guess laughing like a madcap with the thought of cheating the old green fairy. Ah well, you must know that this good wife was a jocose woman, and ever merry when her heart was not very sorely overladen. So she thinks to have some sport with the fairy. And at the appointed time she puts the bairn behind the knocking stone, and sits on the stone. Herself. Then she pulls her cap over her left ear and twists her mouth on the other side, as if she were weeping. And an ugly face she made, you may be sure. She hadn't long to wait, for up the bray climbs the green fairy, neither lame nor lazy. And long ere she got near the knocking stone she screams out, Good wife of Kittlerumpet, you know well what I come for stand and deliver. The woman pretends to cry harder than before, and wrings her hands, and falls on her knees, with, Ach, sweet madam mistress, spare my only bairn, and take the wretched so. The devil take the sow, for my part, quoth the fairy. I come not here for swine's flesh. Don't be contramoshous, huzzy, but give me the child instantly. Akon, dear lady mine, quoth the crying goodwife, forgo my poor bairn, and take me myself. The devil is in the daft jade, quoth the fairy, looking like the far end of a fiddle, I'll bet she is clean demented. Who in all the earthly world, with half an eye in his head, would ever meddle with the likes of thee? I trow this set up the woman of Kittlerumpet's bristle, for though she had two blear eyes and a long red nose besides, she thought herself as bonny as the best of them. So she springs off her knees, sets the top of her cap straight, and with her two hands folded before her, she makes a curtsy down to the ground, and, in troth, fair madam, quoth she. I might have had the wit to know that the likes of me is not fit to tie the worst shoestrings of the high and mighty princess, Wuppity Stewie. If a flash of gunpowder had come out of the ground it couldn't have made the fairy leap higher than she did. Then down she came again plump on her shoe heels. And whirling round, she ran down the bray, screeching for rage, like an owl chased by the witches. The good wife of Kittlerumpet laughed till she was like to split. Then she takes up her bairn, and goes into her house, singing to it all the way. A goo and a giddy, my bonny we tyke. Ye s e no o ha e your forories. Sin, we've jean nick a bane to pike. Why, his wheels and his whoppity stories. That is practically Chambers' version of this Scottish story. And as to the name of the fairy whoppity slurry, the first syllable should be the equivalent of English whip. While stewer is a Scotch word for dust in motion, so the editor asks in a note whether the name may not have originated in the notion that fairies were always present in the whirls of dust occasioned by the wind on roads and in streets 369 but he adds that another version of the story calls the green woman Fultetalot. Which ends with the same element as the name Tom Tit Tot and Silly Go DWT. Perhaps, however, the Welsh versions of the story approached nearest to one from Mockdrum in Wigtownshire, published in the British Association's Papers of the Liverpool Meeting, 1896, page 613. This story was contributed by the Rev. Walter Greger, and the name of the fairy in it is Margaret Tots, in this we have a wife, who is in great distress, because her husband used to give her so much flax to spin by such and such a day, that the work was beyond human power. A fairy comes to the rescue and takes the flax away, promising to bring it back spun by the day fixed, provided the woman can tell the fairy's name. The woman's distress thereupon becomes as great as before, but the fairy was overheard saying as she span, little does the gidwife ken it, my name is Margaret Tots. So the woman got her flax returned spun by the day. And the fairy, Margaret Tots, went up the chimney in a blaze of fire as the result of rage and disappointment. Here one cannot help seeing that the original, of which this is a clumsy version, must have been somewhat as follows. 
little does the gidwife wot. That my name is Margaret Tot. To come back to Wales, we have there the names Silly Frit and Silly Go DWT, which are those of females. The former name is purely English Silly Frit, which has been already guessed to mean a silly sprite, or silly apparition. With the idea of its being a fright of a creature to behold, compare the application elsewhere to a fairy changeling of the terms Crimble and Surfaglock or Cryfaglack. Which is explained as implying a haggard urchin that has been half starved and stunted in its growth. Leaving out of the reckoning this connotation, one might compare the term with the Scottish habit of calling the fairies silly whites, the happy whites. C.J. Jameson Scottish Dictionary, where S.V. Sailey, Seely, happy, he purports to quote the following lines from The Legend of the Bishop of St. Androids in a collection of Scottish poems of the 16th century, Edinburgh. 1801, pp. 320-1. For oat the kirk could him forbid. He sped him sown, and gat the thrid. Ain carling of the queen of Farius. That uify win gare to elfine carius. Through all braid albane sco he's been a. On horseback on hallow ewan. And I in seeking certain nidus. As sco sais, with sir, read our, silly wicks. Similarly, he gives the fairies the name of Seely Court, and cites as illustrating it the following lines from Arthur Jameson's popular ballads, I. 236, and, 2. 1890, 28. But as it fell out on last Halloween, when the Seely Court was ridden, by. The queen lighted down on a gowan bank. Nay far fray the tree where I won't to lie. Into Welsh, however, the designation Silly Frit must have come, not from Scotland, but from the marches, and the history of Silly Go DWT must be much the same. For, though construed as Welsh, the name would mean the Silly who is Go DWT 370, somewhat tidy or natty, but the DWT, mutated from TWT, was suggested doubtless by the tot of such fairy names as Tom Tit Tot. That brings me to another group, where the syllable is trot or trut, and this we have in the Welsh doggerel, as follows. Bike in a VVYDA, hi. Little did she know. My TRWTYX Stratton. That TRWTYN Stratton. YWFENWI. Is my name. But this name TRWTYN Stratton sounds masculine, and not that of a she fairy such as Silly Frit. The feminine would have been Triton Triton in the Carnarvonshire pronunciation, and in fact Triton is to be heard there. But more frequently a kind of derivative Tridlin, meaning an ungainly sort of woman, a drudge, a short-legged or deformed maid of all work. Some Teutonic varieties of this group of stories will be found mentioned briefly in Mr. Claude's article on the th philosophy of Rumpelstiltskin 371 Thus from the debatable ground on the borders of England and Scotland there comes a story in which the fairy woman's name was Habitrot. And he alludes to an Icelandic version in which the name is Gilatra, but for us still more interest attaches to the name in the following rhyme 372. Little does my lady what? That my name is Tritatrot. This has been supposed to belong to a story coming from Ireland but whether that may prove true or not, it is hardly to be doubted that our TRWTYN Tratton is practically to be identified with Trititrot, who is also a he-fairy. That is not all. For since the foregoing notes were penned, a tale has reached me from Mr. Craig Fryn Hughes about a fairy who began by conducting himself like the brownies mentioned above. The passages here in point come 373 from the story of which a part was given above and they are to the following effect. Long ago there was in service at a Monmouthshire farm a young woman who was merry and strong. Who she was or whence she came nobody knew, but many believed that she belonged to the old breed of Bendith Y. Mamal. Some time after she had come to the farm, the rumor spread that the house was sorely troubled by a spirit. But the girl and the elf understood one another well, and they became the best of friends. So the elf proved very useful to the maid, for he did everything for her washing, ironing, spinning and twisting wool. In fact they say that he was remarkably handy at the spinning wheel. Moreover, he expected only a bowlful of sweet milk and wheat bread, or some flummery, for his work. 
so she took care to place the bowl with his food at the bottom of the stairs every night as she went to bed. It ought to have been mentioned that she was never allowed to catch a sight of him, for he always did his work in the dark. Nor did anybody know when he ate his food, she used to leave the bowl there at night, and it would be empty by the time when she got up in the morning, the buka having cleared it. But one night, by way of cursedness, what did she do but fill the bowl with some of the stale urine which they used in dyeing wool and other things about the house. But heavens one it would have been better for her not to have done it. For when she got up next morning what should he do but suddenly spring from some corner and seize her by the neck. He began to beat her and kick her from one end of the house to the other, while he shouted at the top of his voice at every kick. Ifaden din dwmp. The idea that the thick buttock glass. Yn Roy Barra Haid a thrown ir buka. Should give barley bread and pea to the boge. Meanwhile she screamed for help, but none came for some time, when, however, he heard the servant men getting up, he took to his heels as hard as he could, and nothing was heard of him for some time. But at the end of two years he was found to be at another farm in the neighborhood, called Half a Year Yns, where he at once became great friends with the servant girl, for she fed him like a young chicken by giving him a little bread and milk all the time. So he worked willingly and well for her in return for his favorite food. More especially, he used to spin and win the yarn for her, but she wished him in time to show his face, or to tell her his name, he would by no means do either. One evening, however, when all the men were out, and when he was spinning hard at the wheel, she deceived him by telling him that she was also going out. He believed her. And when he heard the door shutting, he began to sing as he plied the wheel. Hi ward en yon pe guipa hai. How she would laugh, did she know? Ta gwaren a throt y w m e n w i. That gwaren a throt is my name. Ha. Ha. Said the maid at the bottom of the stairs, I know thy name now. What is it, then, he asked. She replied, gwaren a throt and as soon as she uttered the words he left the wheel where it was, and off he went. He was next heard of at a farmhouse not far off, where there happened to be a servant man named Moses, with whom he became great friends at once. He did all his work for Moses with great ease. He once, however, gave him a good beating for doubting his word, but the two remained together afterwards for some years on the best possible terms, the end of it was that Moses became a soldier. He went away to fight against Richard Crookback, and fell on the field of Bosworth. The bogey, after losing his friend, began to be troublesome and difficult to live with. He would harass the oxen when they ploughed, and draw them after him everywhere, plough and all, nor could any one prevent them. Then, when the sun set in the evening he would play his pranks again, and do all sorts of mischief about the house, upstairs, and in the cowhouses. So the farmer was advised to visit a wise man, Dine Sinnel, and to see if he could devise some means of getting rid of the bogey. He called on the wise man, who happened to be living near Curlean on the Usk. And the wise man, having waited till the moon should be full, came to the farmer's house. In due time the wise man, by force of maneuvering, secured the bogey by the very long nose which formed the principal ornament of his face, and earned for him the name of Bukar Trwin, the bogey of the nose. Whilst secured by the nose, the bogey had something read to him out of the wise man's big book. And he was condemned by the wise man to be transported to the banks of the Red Sea for fourteen generations, and to be conveyed thither by, the upper wind, Yer Yuchwind. No sooner had this been pronounced by the cunning man than there came a whirlwind which made the whole house shake. Then came a still mightier wind, and as it began to blow the owner of the big book drew the all out of the bogey's nose. And it is supposed that the bogey was carried away by that wind, for he never troubled the place any more. Another version of the story seems to have been current, which represented the bogey as in no wise to blame, but I attach some importance to the foregoing tale as forming a link of connection between the Rumpelstiltchen group of fairies. Always trying to get hold of children. The brownie kind, ever willing to serve in return for their simple keep, and the troublesome bogey, that used to haunt Welsh farmhouses and delight in breaking crockery and frightening the inmates out of their wits. In fact, 
the brownie and the bogey reduce themselves here into different humors of the same uncanny being. Their appearance may be said to have differed also, the bogey had a very long nose, while the brownie of Blednock had only a hole where a nose should have been. But one of the most remarkable points about the brownie species is that the Lincolnshire specimen was a small creature, a weeny bit of a fellow which suggests a possible community of origin with the banshee of the Irish. And also of the Welsh, witness the wee little woman in the story of the curse of Pentanas, pp. 188-9, who seems to come up out of the river. All alike may perhaps be said to suggest various aspects of the dead ancestor or ancestress. But Buca I, T R W I N is not to be severed from the fairy woman in the Pennant Valley, who undertakes some of the duties, not of a dairymaid, as in other cases mentioned, but those of a nurse. Her conduct on being offered a gown is exactly that of the brownie similarly placed, see above. But she and Buca are T R W I N are unmistakably fairies who take to domestic service, and work for a time willingly and well in return for their food, which, as in the case of other fairies, appears to have been mostly milk. After this digression I wish only to point out that the Welsh bogey's name, Gwarwinathrot, treated as Welsh, could only mean white-necked and, or with, a trot, for a throt could only mean, and, or with, a trot. So it is clear that a throt is simply the equivalent of a trot, borrowed from such an English combination as tritotrot, and that it is idle to translate Gorwinathrot. Now trot and chwi are not native Welsh words. And the same remark applies to trwtyn traden, and of course to silly frit and silly go dwt. Hence it is natural to infer that either these names have in the Welsh stories merely superseded older ones of Welsh origin, or else that there was no question of name in the Welsh stories till they had come under English influence. The former conjecture seems the more probable of the two, unless one should rather suppose the whole story borrowed from English sources. But it is of no consequence here as regards the reluctance of fairies to disclose their names. For we have other instances to which the reader may turn above. It attaches itself to the pool of Corian in the neighborhood of Bangor. And it relates how a man married a fairy on the express condition that he was neither to know her name nor to touch her with iron, on pain of her instantly leaving him. Of course in the lapse of years the conditions are accidentally violated by the luckless husband, and the wife flies instantly away into the waters of the pool, her name turned out to be Baleen. Thus far of the unwillingness of the fairies to tell their names, I must now come to the question, why that was so. Here the anthropologist or the student of comparative folklore comes to our aid. For it is an important part of his business to compare the superstitions of one people with those of another. And in the case of superstitions which have lost their meaning among us, for instance, he searches for a parallel among other nations, where that parallel forms part of living institutions. In this way he hopes to discover the key to his difficulties. In the present case he finds savages who habitually look at the name as part and parcel of the person. These savages further believe that any part of the person, such as a hair off one's head or the parings of one's nails, if they chance to be found by an enemy, would give that enemy magical power over their lives, and enable him to injure them. Hence the savage tendency to conceal one's name. I have here, as the reader will perceive, crowded together several important steps in the savage logic. So I must try to illustrate them, somewhat more in detail, by reference to some of the survivals of them after the savage has long been civilized. To return to Wales, and to illustrate the belief that possession of a part of one's person, or of anything closely identified with one's person, gives the possessor of it power over that person, I need only recall the Welsh notion. That if one wished to sell oneself to the devil one had merely to give him a hair of one's head or the tiniest drop of one's blood, then one would be forever his for a temporary consideration. Again, if you only had your hair cut, it must be carefully gathered and hidden away, by no means must it be burnt, as that might prove prejudicial to your health. Similarly, you should never throw feathers into the fire. For that was once held, as I infer, to bring about death among one's poultry, and an old relative of mine, Madrib Mari, Aunt Mary, set her face against my taste for toasted cheese. She used to tell me that if I toasted my cheese, my sheep would waste away and die, 
strictly speaking, I fancy this originally meant only the sheep from whose milk the cheese had been made. But I was not well versed enough in the doctrines of sympathetic magic to reply, that it did not apply to our cheese, which was not made from sheep's milk. So her warning used to frighten me and check my fondness for toasted cheese, a fondness which I had doubtless quite innocently inherited, as anybody will see who will glance at one of the hundred Mary Tollies. Printed by John Rastell in the sixteenth century, as follows, I find written among old jests, how God made Saint Peter Porter of Huon, and that God of High Scudens, sown after his passion. Suffered many men to come to the kingdom of Huon with small desarrange. At Wyche time there was in Huon a great company of Welchmen, Wyche with their Krakenj and Babyenj troubled all the other. Wherefore God said to St. Peter that he was wary of them, and that he wolde a fain haw them out of Huon. To whom St. Peter said, Good Lord, I warrant you, that shall be done. Wherefore St. Peter went out of Huon gates and cried with a loud voice cause Bob 374, that is as mosh to say as rosted cheese, which thinge the Welchman Horinge, ran out of Huon a great pace. And when St. Peter saw them all out, he suddenly went into Huon, and locked the door, and so sparred all the Welchman out. By this ye may see, that it is no wisdom for a man to lo or to set his mind to mosh upon any delicate or worldly pleasure, where be he shall lose the celestial and eternal Ioe. To leave the merry Tollis and come back to the instances mentioned, all of them may be said to illustrate the way in which a part, or an adjunct, answered for the whole of a person or thing. In fact, having due regard to magic as an exact science, an exceedingly exact science, one may say that according to the wisdom of our ancestors the leading axiom of that science practically amounted to this, the part is quite equal to the whole. Now the name, as a part of the man, was once probably identified with the breath of life or with the soul, as we shall see later, and the latter must have been regarded as a kind of matter. For I well remember that when a person was dying in a house, it was the custom about Ponterwit, in North Cardiganshire, to open the windows. And a farmer near Istrad Murig, more towards the south of the county, told me some years ago that he remembered his mother dying when he was a boy, a neighbor's wife who had been acting as nurse tried to open the window of the room. And as it would not open she deliberately smashed a pane of it. This was doubtless originally meant to facilitate the escape of the soul, and the same idea has been attested for Gloucestershire, Devon, and other parts of the country 375. This way of looking at the soul reminds one of Professor Tyler's words when he wrote in his work on primitive culture, I. For 40, and he who says that his spirit goes forth to meet a friend, can still realize in the phrase a meaning deeper than metaphor. Then if the soul was material, you may ask what its shape was. And even this I have a story which will answer, it comes from the same Madrib Mari who set her face against cause Poby, and cherished a good many superstitions. Therein she differed greatly from her sister, my mother, who had a far more logical mind and a clearer conception of things. Well, my aunt's story was to the following effect, a party of reapers on a farm not far from Ponterwood I have forgotten the name sat down in the field to their midday meal. Afterwards they rested a while, when one of their number fell fast asleep. The others got up and began reaping again, glancing every now and then at the sleeping man, who had his mouth wide open and breathed very loudly. Presently they saw a little black man, or something like a monkey, coming out of his mouth and starting on a walk round the field, they watched this little fellow walking on and on till he came to a spot near a stream. There he stopped and turned back, then he disappeared into the open mouth of the sleeper, who at once woke up. He told his comrades that he had just been dreaming of his walking round the field as far as the very spot where they had seen the little black fellow stop. I am sorry to say that Madrib Mari had wholly forgotten this story when, years afterwards, I asked her to repeat it to me, but the other day I found a Welshman who still remembers it. I happened to complain, at a meeting of kindred spirits. How I had neglected making careful notes of bits of folklore which I had heard years ago from informants whom I had since been unable to cross-examine, I instanced the story of the sleeping reaper. When my friend Professor Sace at once said that he had heard it. He spent part of his childhood near Ilanover in Monmouthshire, and in those days he spoke Welsh, which he learned from his nurse. 
He added that he well remembered the late Lady Ilanover rebuking his father for having his child, a Welsh boy, dressed like a little Highlander, and he remembered also hearing the story here in question told him by his nurse. So far as he could recall it, the version was the same as my aunt's, except that he does not recollect hearing anything about the stream of water. Several points in the story call for notice, among others, one naturally asks at the outset why the other reapers did not wake the sleeping man. The answer is that the Welsh seem to have agreed with other peoples, such as the Irish 376, in thinking it dangerous to wake a man when dreaming, that is, when his soul might be wandering outside his body. For it might resvilt in the soul failing to find the way back into the body which it had temporarily left. To illustrate this from Wales I produce the following story, which has been written out for me by Mr. J. G. Evans. The SCNE of it was a field on the farm of Catabowan, Nea Dutter Lan Y Biddare, in the Vale of the Tiafi. The chief point of the Madfall incident, which happened in the early 60s, was this. During one mid morning ho hogi, that is to say, the usual rest for sharpening the reaping hooks, I was playing among the thirty or forty reapers sitting together, my movements were probably a disturbing element to the reapers. As well as a source of danger to my own limbs. In order, therefore, to key me, as seems probable, one of the men directed my attention to our old farm laborer, who was asleep on his back close to the uncut corn, a little apart from the others. I was told that his soul, eend, had gone out of his mouth in the form of a black lizard, madfall ddu, and was at that moment wandering among the standing calm if I woke the sleeper, the soul would be unable to return. And old Thomas would die, or go crazy or something serious would happen. I will not trust my memory to fill in details, especially as this incident once formed the basis of what proved an exciting story told to my children in their childhood. A generation hence they may be able to give an astonishing instance of genuine Welsh folklore. In the meanwhile, I can bear testimony to that black lizard being about the most living impression in my memory. I see it, even now, wriggling at the edge of the uncut corn. But as to its return, and the waking of the sleeper, my memory is a blank. Such are the tricks of, memory. And we should be charitable when, with bated breath, the educated no less than the uneducated tell us about the uncanny things they have, seen with their own eyes. They believe what they say, because they trust their memory, I do not. I feel practically certain I never saw a lizard in my life, in that particular field in which the reapers were. Mr. Evans' story differs, as it has been seen, from my aunt's version in giving the soul the shape of a lizard. But the little black fellow in the one and the black lizard in the other agree not only in representing the soul as material, but also as forming a complete organism within a larger one. In a word, both pictures must be regarded as the outcome of attempts to depict the sleeper's inner man. If names and souls could be regarded as material substances, so could diseases. And I wish to say a word or two now on that subject, which a short story of my wife's will serve to introduce. She is a native of the island Barris side of Snowdon. And she remembers going one morning, when a small child, across to the neighborhood of RHYDDDU with a servant girl called Cotty, whose parents lived there. Now Cotty was a very good servant, but she had little regard for the more civilized manners of the island Barris folk. And when she returned with the child in the evening from her mother's cottage, she admitted that the little girl was amazed at the language of Cotty's brothers and sisters. For she confessed that, as she said, they swore like colliers, whereas the little girl had never before heard any swearing worth speaking of. Well, among other things which the little girl saw there was one of Cotty's sisters having a bad leg dressed, when the rag which had been on the wound was removed. The mother made one of her other children take it out and fix it on the thorn growing near the door. The little girl being inquisitive asked why that was done, and she was told that it was in order that the wound might heal all the faster. She was not very satisfied with the answer, but she afterwards noticed the same sort of thing done in her own neighborhood. Now the original idea was doubtless that the disease, or at any rate a part of it and in sua matters it will be remembered that a part is quite equal to the whole was attached to the rag. So that putting the rag out, with a part of the disease attached to it, 
to rot on the bush, would bring with it the disappearance of the whole disease. Another and a wider aspect of this practice was the subject of notice in the chapter on the folklore of the wells, pages 359 to 60, where Mr. Hartland's hypothesis was mentioned. This was to the effect that if any clothing, or anything else which had been identified with your person, were to be placed in contact with a sacred tree, sacred well, or sacred edifice. It would be involved in the effluence of the divinity that imparts its sacred character to the tree, well, or temple. And that your person, identified with the clothing or other article, would also be involved or soaked in the same divine effluence, and made to benefit thereby. We have since had this kind of reasoning illustrated, pp. 405 to 7 above, by the modem legend of CRYMLYN, and the old one of Eileen Eileywan. But, the difficulty which it involves is a very considerable one, it is the difficulty of taking seriously the infantile order of reasoning which underlies so much of the philosophy of folklore. I cannot readily forget one of the first occasions of my coming, so to say, into living contact with it. It was at Tuin in Connaught, whither I had gone to learn modern Irish from the late canon Ulick J. Burke. There one day in 1871 he presented me with a copy of the Bull Ineffabilis, in four languages, Dublin, 1868, containing the Irish version which he had himself contributed. On the blue cover was a gilt picture of the Virgin, inscribed Sign Laib Concepta. No sooner had I brought it to my lodgings than the woman who looked after the house caught sight of it. She was at once struck with awe and admiration. So I tried to explain to her the nature of the contents of the volume. I so the Father has given you that holy book one foot she exclaimed, and you are now a holy man. I was astonished at the simple and easy way in which she believed holiness could be transferred from one person or thing to another. And it has always helped me to realize the fact that folklorists have no occasion to invent their people, or to exaggerate the childish features of their minds. They are still with us as real men and real women, and at one time the whole world belonged to them. Not to mention that those who may, by a straining of courtesy, be called their leaders of thought, hope speedily to re-annex the daring few who are trying to tear asunder the bonds forged for mankind in the obscurity of a distant past. I shall never forget the impression made on my mind by a sermon I heard preached some years later in the Cathedral of St. Stephen in Vienna. That magnificent edifice in a great center of German culture was crowded with listeners, who seemed thoroughly to enjoy what they heard. Though the chief idea which they were asked to entertain could not possibly be said to rise above the level of the philosophy of the Stone Age. Chapter 11 Folklore Philosophy To look for consistency in barbaric philosophy is to disqualify ourselves for understanding it, and the theories of it which aim at symmetry are their own condemnation. Yet that philosophy, within its own irregular confines, works not illogically Edward Claude. It will be remembered that in the last chapter a story was given which represented the soul as a little fellow somewhat resembling a monkey. And it will probably have struck the reader how near this approaches the idea prevalent in medieval theology and Christian art, which pictured the soul as a pygmy or diminutive human being. I revert to this in order to point out that the Christian fancy may possibly have given rise to the form of the soul as represented in the Welsh story which I heard in Cardiganshire and Professor Sace in Monmouthshire. But this could hardly be regarded as touching the other Cardiganshire story, in which the soul is likened to a mad fall or lizard. Moreover I would point out that a belief incompatible with both kinds of story I as suggested by one of the uses of the Welsh word for soul, namely, in aid. I heard my father, a native of the neighborhood of Egoese Fock, near the estuary of the DYFL, use the word of some portion of the inside of a goose, but I have forgotten what part it was exactly. Professor Anwell of Aberystwyth, however, has sent me the following communication on the subject I am quite familiar with the expression urinade, the soul, as applied to the soft flesh sticking to the ribs inside a goose. The flesh in question has somewhat the same appearance and structure as the liver. I have no recollection of ever hearing the term year in aid used in the case of any bird other than a goose. But this may be a mere accident, inasmuch as no one ever uses the term now except to mention it as an interesting curiosity. This application of the word in aid recalls the use of the English word soul in the same way. 
and points to a very crude idea of the soul as material and only forming an internal portion of the body, it is on the low level of the notion of an English pagan of the 17th century who thug, ht his soul was, a great bone in his body. 377 it is, however, not quite so foolish, perhaps, as it looks at first sight. And it reminds one of the Mohammedan belief that the O.S. coccygis is the first formed in the human body, and that it will remain uncorrupted till the last day as a seed from which the whole is to be renewed in the resurrection. 378. On either savage theory, that the soul is a material organism inside a bulkier organism, or the still lower one that it is an internal portion of the larger organism itself, the idea of death would be naturally much the same, namely, that it was what occurred when the body and the soul became permanently severed. I call attention to this because we have traces in Welsh literature of a very different notion of death, which must now be briefly explained. The Mabinogi of Math of Mathenwy relates how Math and Gwydion made out of various flowers a most beautiful woman whom they named Blodiud 379 that is to say New Theta Delta Eta, or flower-like, and gave to wife to Lulogifs. How she, as it were to prove what consummate artists they had been, behaved forthwith like a woman of the ordinary origin, in that she fell in love with another man named Granu Peber of Pentland. And how she plotted with Granu as to the easiest way to put her husband to death. Pretending to be greatly concerned about the welfare of Lu and very anxious to take measures against his death, Angu, she succeeded in finding from him in what manner one could kill, lad, him. His reply was, Unless God kill me. It is not easy to kill me. And he went on to describe the strange attitude in which he might be killed, namely, in a certain position when dressing after a bath, then, he said, if one cast a spear at him it would affect his death, and you. But that spear must have been a whole year in the making, during the hour ONL when the sacrifice was proceeding on Sunday. Blodud thanked heaven, she said, to find that all this was easy to avoid. But still her curiosity was not satisfied, so one day she induced Ai Lu to go into the bath and show exactly what he meant. Of course she had Granu with his enchanted spear in readiness, and at the proper moment, when Ai Lu was dressing after the bath, the paramour cast his spear at him. He hit him in the side, so that the head of the spear remained in El Lu, whilst the shaft fell off, Ai Lu flew away in the form of an eagle, uttering an unearthly cry. He was no more seen until Guidian, searching for him far and wide in Powys and Guinect, came to Arfon, where one day he followed the lead of a mysterious sow, until the beast stopped under an oak at Nant 1 Te. There Guidian found the sow devouring rotten flesh and maggots, which fell from an eagle whenever the bird shook himself at the top of the tree. He suspected this was Ai Lu, and on singing three Englands to him the eagle came lower and lower, till at last he descended on Gwydion's lap. Then Gwydion struck him with his wand, so that he assumed his own shape of Lulogifs, and nobody ever saw a more wretched-looking man, we are told, he was nothing but skin and bones. But the best medical aid that could be found in Gwynet was procured, and before the end of the year he was quite well again. Here it will be noticed, that though the fatal wounding of El Lu, at any rate visibly, means his being changed into the form of an eagle, it is treated as his death. When the Mabinogen were edited in their present form in a later atmosphere, this sort of phraseology was not natural to the editor, and he shows it when he comes to relate how Gwydion punished Blodud, as follows, Gwydion. Having overtaken her in her flight, is made to say, I shall not kill thee, New York lad fid I shall do what is worse for thee, and that is to let thee go in the form of a bird. He let her go in fact in the form of an owl. According to the analogy of the other part of the story this meant his having K-led her, it was her death, and the words, I shall not K-L-L-L thee, are presumably not to be regarded as belonging to the original story. To come back to the eagle, later Welsh literature, re-echoing probably an ancient notion, speaks of a nephew of Arthur, called Eliolod, appearing to Arthur as an eagle seated likewise among the branches of an oak. He claims acquaintance and kinship with Arthur, but he has to explain to him that he has died, they have a dialogue 380 in the course of which the eagle gives Arthur some serious Christian advice. But we have in this sort of idea doubtless the kind of origin to which one might expect to trace the prophesying eagle, such as Geoffrey mentions more than once, 
see his Historia, 2. 9 and 12. 18,381. Add to these instances of transformation the belief prevalent in Cornwall almost to our own day, that Arthur himself, instead of dying, was merely changed by magic into a raven, a form in which he still goes about. So that a Cornish man will not wittingly fire at a raven 382. This sort of transformation is not to be severed from instances supplied by Irish literature, such as the story of Tuan Mac Carroll, related in the Book of the Dun Cow, F.O. 15a, 16b. Tuan relates to St. Finan of Magblee, in the 6th century, the early history of Ireland from the time of Partholan down, which he was enabled to do because he had lived through it all, passing from one form to another without losing his memory. First of all he was a man, and when old age had come upon him he was transformed into a stag of the forest. For at W. H. Lee he was youthful and vigorous, but again old age overtook him, and he next became a W. L. L. D. Boar. When old age and decrepitude overcame him next he was renewed in the form of a powerful bird, called in the original Sikh. The next renewal was in the form of a salmon, here the manuscript falls us. The form of a salmon was also the one taken by the woman Liban when she was overwhelmed by the flood, which became the body of water known as Loch Nee, her handmaid at the same time became an otter, F.O. 40b. There was an ancient belief that the soul leaves the body like a bird flying out of the mouth of the man or woman dying, and this may be said to approach the favorite Celtic notion illustrated by the transformations here instanced, to which may be added the case of the children of Lyre, pp. 93549. Changed by the stroke of their wicked stepmother's wand into swans, on Loch Ern. The story has, in the course of ages, modified itself into a belief that the swans haunting that beautiful water at all seasons of the year, are the souls of holy women who fell victims to the repeated visitations of the pagan Norsemen. When Ireland was at their cruel mercy 383. The Christian form which the Irish peasant has given the legend does not touch its relevancy here. Perhaps one might venture to generalize, that in these islands great men and women were believed to continue their existence in the form of eagles, hawks or ravens, swans or owls. But what became of the souls of the obscure majority of the people? For an answer to this perhaps we can only fall back on the psyche butterfly, which may here be illustrated by the fact that Cornish tradition applies the term pisky both to the fairies and to moths. Believed in Cornwall by many to be departed souls 384. So in Ireland, a certain reverend gentleman named Joseph Ferguson, writing in 18 I.O. a statistical account of the parish of Ballymoyer, in the county of Armagh, states that one day a girl chasing a butterfly was chid by her companions. Who said to her, that may be the soul of your grandmother 385. This idea, to survive, has modified itself into a belief less objectionably pagan, that a butterfly hovering near a corpse is a sign of its everlasting happiness. The shape-shifting is sometimes complicated by taking place on the lines of rebirth, as cases in point may be mentioned Lug, reborn as Cuchulain 386, and the repeated births of Tain. This was rendered possible in the case of Cuchulain, for instance, by Lug taking the form of an insect which was unwittingly swallowed by Dectyr, who thereby became Cuchulain's mother. And so in the case of Etain 387 and her last recorded mother, the Queen of Aether King of Eocrade. On Welsh ground we have a combination of transformations and rebirth in the history of Gwyan Bach in the story of Taliesin. Gwyan was in the service of the witch Siridwen, but having learned too much of her arts, he became the object of her lasting hatred, and the incident is translated as follows in Lady Charlotte Guest's Mabinogen, 3. 358-9, and she went forth after him, running. And he saw her, and changed himself into a hare and fled. But she changed herself into a greyhound and turned him. And he ran towards a river, and became a fish. And she in the form of an otter bitch chased him under the water, until he was fain to turn himself into a bird of the air. Then she, as a hawk, followed him and gave him no rest in the sky. And just as she was about to swoop upon him, and he was in fear of death, he espied a heap of winnowed wheat on the floor of a barn, and he dropped amongst the wheat, and turned himself into one of the grains. 
Then she transformed herself into a high-crested black hen, and went to the wheat and scratched it with her feet, and found him out and swallowed him. And, as the story says, she bore him nine months, and when she was delivered of him, she could not find it in her heart to kill him, by reason of his beauty. So she wrapped him in a leathern bag, and cast him into the sea to the mercy of God on the twenty-ninth day of April LL. And at that time the weir of Gwydno was on the strand between Divai and Aberystwyth, near to his own castle, and the value of an hundred pounds was taken in that were every May Eve. The story goes on to relate how Gwydno's son, Elfin, found in the weir the leathern bag containing the baby, who grew up to be the bard Taliesin. But the 14th century manuscript called after the name of Taliesin teems with such transformations as the above, except that they are by no means confined to the range of the animal and vegetable kingdoms. I heard an amusing suggestion of metempsychosis the other day, it is related of a learned German, who was sitting at table, let us say, in an Oxford hotel, with most of his dinner in front of him. Being, however, a man of immediate foresight, and anxious to accustom himself to fine English, he was not to be restrained by scruples as to any possible discrepancy between words like become and become. So to the astonishment of everybody he gravely called out to the waiter, hereafter I wish to become a Welsh rabbit. This would have done admirably for the author of certain poems in the book of Taliesin, where the bard's changes are dwelt upon. From them it appears that the transformation might be into anything that the mind of man could in any way individualize. Thus Taliesin claims to have been, some time or other, not only a stag or a salmon, but also an axe, a sword, and even a book in a priest's hand, or a word in writing. On the whole, however, his history as a grain of corn has most interest here, as it differs from that which has just been given, the passage 388 is sadly obscure, but I understand it to say that the grain was duly sown on a hill. That it was reaped and finally brought on the hearth, where the ears of corn were emptied of their grains by the ancient method of dexterously applying a flame to them 389. But W. H. Lee the light was being applied the grain which was Taliesin, falling from the operator's hand, was quickly received and swallowed by a hostile hen, in whose interior it remained nine nights. But though this seemingly makes Taliesin's mother a bird, he speaks of himself, without mentioning any inter. Venning transformation, as a guas or young man. Such an origin was perhaps never meant to be other than incomprehensible. Lastly as to rebirth, I may say that it has often struck me that the Welsh habit, especially common in Carnarvonshire and Anglesey, of one child in a family being named, partially or wholly, after a grandparent, is to be regarded as a trace of the survival from early times of a belief in such atavism as has been suggested above. 390. The belief in transformations or transmigrations, such as have been mentioned, must have lent itself to various developments, and two at least of them are deserving of some notice here. First may be mentioned one which connects itself intimately with the druid or magician, he is master of his own transformations, as in the case of Siridwin and Gwyan. For he had acquired his magic by tasting of the contents of Siridwin's cauldron of sciences, and he retained his memory continuously through his shape shiftings, as is best illustrated, perhaps, by the case of Tuan Mac Carroll LL. The next step was for him to realize his changes, not as matters of the past but as present and possible, in fact, to lay claim to being anybody or anything he likes at any moment. Of this we have a remarkable instance in the case of A.M. Ergen, seer and judge of the Milesians or Sons of Mill, in the story of their conquest of Ireland, as told in the Book of Leinster, F.O.12b. As he first sets his right foot on the land of Aaron he sings a lay in which he says, that he is a boar, a bull, and a salmon, together with other things also, such as the sea breeze, the rolling wave, the roar of the billows, and a lake on the plain. Nor does he forget to pretend to wisdom and science beyond other men, and to hint that he is the divinity that gives them knowledge and sense. The similarity between this passage and others in the Book of Taliesin has attracted the attention of scholars, C. M., Darbois de Jubinville's Psychomythologique Erlande, pages 242 e On the whole, Taliesin revels most in the side of the picture devoted to his knowledge and science, he has passed through so many scenes and changes that he has been an eyewitness to all kinds of events in Celtic story. 
Thus he was with Bran on his EXP addition to Ireland, and saw when Morkel Attilian was slain in the great slaughter of the Mealbag Pavilion. This, however, was not all. He represents himself as also a Siwadid 391, Valez or Prophet, Astrologer and Astronomer, a sage who boasts his knowledge of the physical world and propounds questions which he challenges his rivals to answer concerning earth and sea, day and night, sun and moon. He is not only Taliesin, but also Guayan, and hence one infers his magical powers to have been derived. If he regards anybody as his equal or superior, that seems to have been Talhern, to whom he ascribes the greatest science. Talhern is usually thought of only as a great bard by Welsh writers, but it is his science and wisdom that Taliesin admires 392, whereby one is to understand, doubtless, that Talhern, like Taliesin, was a great magician. To this day Welsh bards and bardism have not been quite dissociated from magic, in so far as the witch Seridwen is regarded as their patroness. The boasts of Emergen are characterized by M. Darbois de Jubinville as a sort of pantheism, and he detects traces of the same doctrine, among other places, in the teaching of the Irishman, known as Scotus Origina. At the court of Charles the Bald in the 9th century see the Psychomythologique, p. 248, in any case, one is prepared by such utterances as those of Emergen to understand the charge recorded in the Sentius Moore, I. 23, as made against the Irish druids or magicians of his time by a certain Conla Cainberthac, one of the remarkable judges of Aaron, conjectured by Okary on what grounds I do not know to have lived in the first century of our era. The statement there made is to the following effect after her came Conla Cainberthac, chief doctor of Connaught, he excelled the men of Aaron in wisdom, for he was filled with the grace of the Holy Ghost. He used to contend with the Druids, who said that it was they that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and k, and the sun and moon, and k. This view of the pretensions of the Druids is corroborated by the fact that magic, especially the power of shape-shifting at will, was regarded as power par excellence 393 and by the old formula of wishing one well. Which ran thus, Bendak d Aucus Andy Fort, the blessing of gods and not gods upon thee. The term gods in this context is explained to have meant persons of power 394, and the term not gods farmers or those connected with the land, probably all those whose lives were directly dependent on farming and the cultivation of the soul. As distinguished from professional men such as druids and smiths. This may be further illustrated by a passage from the account of the Second Battle of Moitura, published by Stokes with a translation, in the Review Celtique, 12. 52 to 130, see more especially pp. 74 to 6, where we find Lug offering his services to the king, Nuada of the Silver Hand. Among other qualifications which Lug possessed, he named that of being a sorcerer, to which the porter at once replied, We need thee not. We have sorcerers already. Many are our wizards and our folk of might that is, those of our people who possess power, ar lucked kumaktai. Wizards, druth, and lucked kumaktai came, it is observed, alike under the more general designation of sorcerers, korgani. One seems to come upon traces of the same classification of a community into professionals and non-professionals, for that is what it comes to, in an obscure Welsh term, tulu oth ac anoeth which may be conjectured to have meant, the household of Oath and Anoeth, in the sense of power and not, power 395. However none of these stories of shape-shifting, and of being born again, make any allusion to a soul. To revert, for instance, to Lologifs, it is evident that the eagle cannot be regarded as his soul. The decayed state of the eagle's body seems to imply that it was somehow the same body as that of Lu at the time when he was wounded by Grana's poison spear the festering of the eagle's flesh looks as if considered a continuation of the wound. It is above all things, however, to be noted that none of the stories in point, whether Irish or Welsh, contain any suggestion of the hero's life coming to an end, or in any way perishing. Elu lives on to be transformed, under the stroke of Gwydion's wand, from being an eagle to be a man again, and Tuan Mac Carroll persists in various forms till he meets Saint Finan in the 6th century. Then in the case of Attain, we are told in the Book of the Dun Cow, F.O. 
129a, that her first mentioned birth and the next one were separated by more than a thousand years. So practically we may say that these stories implied that men and women were imperishable, that they had no end necessarily to their existence. This sort of notion may be detected in Lu's words when he says, Unless God kill me. It is not easy to kill me. The reference to the Almighty may probably be regarded as a comparatively late interpolation due to Christian teaching. A similar instance seems to occur in a poem in the Black Book of Carmarthen, Foss 47b, 8b, where Arthur loudly sings the praises of his friend Kai. The couplet in point runs thus. New York Bay Dove A E Diconii. Oat thy head agev K. Unless it were God that wrought it. Hard to effect were the death of Kai. I am not sure, however, of the meaning. For, among other things, thy height, which I am inclined to interpret as hard to reach or not easy to effect, has been rendered otherwise by others 396. In any case, the other instance seems to imply that at one time the heroes of Lu's world were not necessarily expected to die at all. And when they happened to do so, it was probably regarded, as among savages at the present day, as a result brought about by magic. Any reader who may feel astonished at such a crudeness of belief, will find something to contrast and compare in the familiar doctrine, that but for the fall of Adam and Eve we should have never heard of death, whether of man or of beast. But if he proceeds to ask questions about the economy of our world in case nobody died, he must be satisfied to be told that to ask any such question is here not only useless but also irrelevant. Now, suppose that in a society permeated by the crude kind of notions of which one finds traces in the Mabinogen and other old Welsh literature, a man arose who had a turn for philosophizing and trying to think things out, how would he reason? It seems probable that he would argue, that underneath all the change there must be some substratum which is permanent. If Tuan, he would say, changed from one form to another and remembered all that he had gone through, there must have been something which lasted, otherwise Tuan would have come to an end early in the story. And the later individual would not be Tuan at all. Probably one thing which, according to our folklore Ph. philosopher's way of thinking, lasted through the transformations, was the material of Tuan's body, just as one is induced to suppose that Lu's body, and that of the eagle into which he was transformed, were considered to be one and the same body laboring under the mortifying influence of the wound inflicted on Ffeu by Granu's enchanted spear. Further, we have already found reasons to regard the existence of the soul as forming a part of the creed of some at any rate of the early inhabitants of this country. Though we have no means of gathering what precise attributes our philosopher might ascribe to it besides the single one, perhaps, of continuing to exist. In that case he might otherwise describe Tuan's shape-shifting as the entrance of Tuan's soul into a series of different bodies. Now the philosopher here sketched agrees pretty closely with the little that is known of the Gaulish Druid, such as he is described by ancient authors 397. The latter seem to have been agreed in regarding him as believing in the immortality of the soul, and several of them appear to have thought his views similar to those of Pythagoras and his school. So we may perhaps venture to suppose that the Druids, like Pythagoras, believed in the transmigration of souls, including that from the human to an animal form and the reverse. If, in the absence of an explicit statement, one may ascribe this latter form of that belief to the Druids, the identity of their creed becomes almost complete with that of our conjectured folklore philosopher. At one time I was inclined to fancy that the Druids of Gaul had received no unimportant part of their teaching from Greek philosophy by way of Maslaya, but I am now more disposed to believe their doctrines to have been gradually developed. In the way above suggested, from the unfailing resources of that folklore which reveled in scenes of shape-shifting and rebirth. Possibly the doctrines of Pythagoras may have themselves had a like origin and a somewhat parallel development, or let us say rather that the Orphic notions had, which preceded Pythagoreanism. But as to Gaul generally, it is not to be assumed that the Gaulish Druids and all the other Gauls held the same opinion on these questions, we have some evidence that they did not. Thus the Gauls in the neighborhood of Massilia 398, who would accept a creditor's promise to pay up in the next world, can hardly have contemplated the possibility of any such creditor being then a bird or a moth. 
should it be objected that the transformations, instanced above as brythonic and goidelic, were assumed only in the case of magicians and other professional or privileged persons. And that. We are not told what was held to happen in the case of the rank and file of humanity, it is enough to answer that neither do we know what the Druids of Gaul held to be the fate of the common people of their communities. No lever can be applied in that direction to disturb the lines of the parallel. In previous chapters, instances from Welsh sources have been given of the fairies concealing their names. But Wales is not the only Celtic land where we find traces of this treatment of one's name, it is to be detected also on Irish ground. Thus, when a herald from an enemy's camp comes to parley with Cuchulain and his charioteer, the latter, being first approached, describes himself as the man of the man down there, meaning Cuchulain, to whom he pointed. And when the herald comes to Cuchulain himself, he asks him whose man he is, Cuchulain describes him. Self as the man of Concobar Mac Nessa. The herald then inquires if he has no more definite designation, and Cuchulain replies that what he has given will suffice, 399 neither of the men gives his name. Thus Celts of both groups, Brythons and Goidals, are at one in yielding evidence to the same sort of cryptic treatment of personal names, at some stage or other in their past history. The student of man tells us, as already pointed out, that the reason for the reluctance to disclose one's name was of the same nature as that which makes savages. And some men belonging to nations above the savage state feel anxious that an enemy should not get possession of anything identified with their persons, such as a lock of one's hair, a drop of one's blood, or anything closely connected with one's person, lest it should give the enemy power over one's person as a whole, especially if such enemy is suspected of possessing any skill in handling the terrors of magic. In other words, the anthropologist would say that the name was regarded as identified with the person, and, having said this, he has mostly felt satisfied that he has definitively disposed of the matter. Therein, however, he is possibly wrong. For when he says that the name was probably treated as a part of the man, that only leads one to ask the question, what part of the man? At any rate, I can see nothing very unreasonable in such a question, though I am quite willing to word it differently, and to ask, is there any evidence to show with what part of a man his name was associated? As regards the Aryan nations, we seem to have a clue to an answer in the interesting group of Aryan words in point, from which I select the following, Irish Ain, a name, plural Anman, Old Welsh Anu, now ENW, also, a name. Old Bulgarian Iman, for Yenman, Anman, Old Prussian Emnes, Emmons, Accusative Emnon, and Armenian Anwen, for a stem Anman, all meaning a name. To these some scholars 400 would add, and it may be rightly, the English word name itself, the Latin nomen, the Sanskrit nomen, and the Greek delta nu omicron nu alpha. But, as some others find a difficulty in thus grouping these words, I abstain from laying any stress on them. In fact, I have every reason to be satisfied with the wide extent of the Aryan world covered by the other instances enumerated as Celtic, Prussian, Bulgarian, and Armenian. Now, such is the similarity between Welsh ENW, name, and innate, soul, that I cannot help referring the two words to one and the same origin, especially when I see the same or rather greater similarity illustrated by the Irish words, aim, name, and anim, soul. This similarity between the Irish words so pervades the declension of them, that a beginner frequently falls into the error of confounding them in medieval texts. Take, for instance, the genitive singular, anma, which may mean either anime or nominis, the nominative plural, anmend, which may be either anime or nomina, and the gen. Anmend, either animarum or nominum, as the dative anmenabe may likewise be either animibus or nominibus. In fact, one is at first sight almost tempted to suppose that the partial differentiation of the Irish forms was only brought about under the influence of Latin, with its distinct forms of anima and nomen. That would be pressing the point too far. But the direct teaching of the Celtic vocables is that they are all to be referred to the same origin in the Aryan word for, breath or breathing, which is represented by such words as Latin anima, Welsh anatal, breath, and a Gothic anim. Blow or breathe, whence the compound preterite usian, twice used by Ulflas in the fifteenth chapter of Esti. Mark's Gospel to render Zeta Pi Nu Epsilon Nu Epsilon, 
gave up the ghost. Now the lessons which the words here group together contain for the student of man is, that the Celts, and certain other widely separated Aryans, unless we should rather say the whole of the Aryan family, were once in the habit of closely associating both the soul and one's name with the breath of life. The evidence is satisfactory so far as it goes, but let us go a little more into detail, and see as exactly as we can to what it commits us. Commencing at the beginning, we may set out with the axiom that breathing is a physical action, and that in the temperate zone one's breath is not unfrequently visible. Then one may say that the men who made the words Welsh, innate, for an earlier innatio s, soul, Irish, anim, from an earlier stem, animon, Latin, anima, also animus, feeling, mind, soul. And Greek, pneumuomicron, air, wind must have in some way likened the soul to one's breath, which perhaps first suggested the idea. At all events they showed not only that they did not contemplate the soul as a bone, or any solid portion of a man's frame, or even as a mannequin residing inside it, in fact they had made a great advance in the direction of the abstract notion of a spirit, in which some of them may have been helped by another association of ideas, namely, that indicated by speaking of the dead as shades or shadows, umbri, sigma kappa iota alpha iota. Similarly, the words in point four, name, seem to prove that some of the ancient Aryans must have, in some way, associated one, s name with the breath of life. On the other hand, we find nothing to show that the name and the soul were directly compared or associated with one another, while the association of the name with the breath represents, probably, a process as much earlier as it is cruder. Then likening the soul to the breath and naming it accordingly. This is countenanced to some extent by the general physiognomy, so to say, of words like inade, anima, as contrasted with enw, ain, nomen, name. Speaking relatively, the former might be of almost any date. In point of comparative lateness, while the latter could not, belonging as they do to a small declension which was not wont to receive accessions to its numbers. In what way, then, or in what respect did early folklore identify the name with the breath? Before one could expect to answer this question in anything like a convincing fashion, one would have to examine the collector of the folklore of savages, or rather to induce him to cross-examine them on the point. For instance, among the Singhalese 401, when in the ceremony of name. Giving the father utters the baby's name in a low whisper in the baby's ear, is that called breathing the name? And is the name so whispered called a breath or a breathing? In the case of the savages who name their children at their birth, is the reason ever advanced that a name must be given to the child in order to make it breathe, or, at least, in order to effacilitate its breathing? Some such a notion of reinforcing the child's vitality and safety would harmonize well enough with the fact that, as Mr. Claude 402 puts it, barbaric, pagan, and Christian folklore is full of examples of the importance of naming and other birth ceremonies, in the belief that the child's life is at the mercy of evil spirits watching the chance of casting spells upon it. Of demons covetous to possess it, and of fairies eager to steal it and leave a changeling in its place. Provisionally, one must perhaps rest content to suppose the association of the name to have taken place with the breath regarded as an accompaniment of life. Looked at in that sense, the name becomes associated with one's life, and, speaking roughly, with one's person, and it is interesting to notice that one seems to detect traces in Welsh literature of some confusion of the kind. Thus, when the hero of the story of Coolhuch and Olwen was christened he was named Coolhuch, which is expressed eja Welsh as, forcing or driving Coolhuch on him, Jiru Col 6 ch Arna 6 403, Col 6 ch, be it noticed, not the name Coolhuch. Similarly when Bran, on the eve of his expedition to Ireland, left seven princes, or knights as they are also called, to take charge of his dominions, we have an instance of the kind. The stead or town was named after the seven knights, and it is a place which is now known as Bryn Y. Seth Mark Hogg, I the hill of the seven knights, near Gwiddelwern, in Merionethshire. But the wording of the Mabinogi of Branwen is O A C H A six S H N Y Y Dodet Seath Marka six C A R Y Dref four hundred and four, meaning for that reason the stead was called seven knights, literally for that reason one put seven knights on the stead. In guests Mabinogen three. 
116, this will be found rendered wrongly, though not wholly without excuse for this reason were the seven knights placed in the town. It is probable that the redactor of the stories from which the two foregoing instances come and more might be cited was not so much courting ambiguities as adhering to an old form of expression which neglected from the first to distinguish. In any formal way, between names and the persons or things which they would, in modern phraseology, be said to represent 405. An instance has been already mentioned of a man's name being put or set on him, or rather forced on him, at any rate, his name is on him both in Welsh and Irish, and the latter language also speaks of it as cleaving or adhering to him. Neither language contemplates the name, however closely identified with him, as having become an inseparable part of him, or else as something he has secured for himself in the Neo-Celtic tongues, both Welsh and Irish, all things which a man owns. And all things for which he takes credit, are with him or by him. But all things which he cannot help having, whether creditable or discreditable, if they are regarded as coming from without are on him, not with him. Thus, if he is wealthy there is money with him. But if he is in debt and owes money, the money is on him. Similarly, if he rejoices there is joy with him, whereas if he is ashamed or afraid, shame or fear is on him. This is a far-reaching distinction, of capital importance in Celtic phraseology, and judged by this criterion the name is something from without the man. Something which he cannot take credit to himself for having acquired by his own direct willing or doing. This is to be borne in mind when one speaks of the name as identified or closely bound up with one's life and personality. But this qualified identification of the name with the man is also what one may infer from savage folklore. For many, perhaps most, of the nations who name their children at their birth, have those names changed when the children grow up. That is done when a boy has to be initiated into the mysteries of his tribe or of a guild, or it may be when he has achieved some distinction in war. In most instances, it involves a serious ceremony and the intervention of the wise man, whether the medicine man of a savage system, or the priest of a higher religion 406. In the ancient Wales of the Mabinogen, and in pagan Ireland, the name-giving was done, subject to certain conditions, at the will and on the initiative of the Druid, who was at the same time tutor and teacher of the youth to be renamed 407. Here I may be allowed to direct attention to the two following facts, the Druid, recalling as he does the magician of the Egypt of the Pentateuch and the shaman of the Mongolian world of our own time, represented a profession probably not of Celtic origin. In the next place, his method of selecting names from incidents was palpably incompatible with what is known to have been the Aryan system of nomenclature, by means of compounds. As evinced by the annals of most nations of the Aryan family of speech, such compounds, I mean, as Welsh Penwin, Whiteheaded, Gaulish XXXXXXXXXX, or Greek XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
which the satire had raised, to wit, disgrace, blemish, and defect, in colors of crimson, green, and white. So Kyer fleeing, that his plight might not be seen of his friends, came to Dun Sermna, now the old head of Kinsale, in County Gork, the residence of Kakir, chief of that district. There Kyer was well received as a stranger of unknown quality, while Need assumed the sovereignty of Connaught. In time, Need came to know of Kyer being there, and rode there in Kyer's chariot. But as Need approached Kyer escaped through his host's house and hid himself in the cleft of a rock, whither Mead followed Kyer's greyhound, and when Kyer saw N. Sixta, the former dropped dead of shame 409. This abstract of the story as told by Okari, will serve to show how the words of the satirist were dreaded by high and low among the ancient Irish, and how their demands had to be at once obeyed. It is a commonplace of Irish literature that the satirist's words unfailingly raised blisters on the face of him at whom they were aimed. A portion at least of the potency of the poet's words seems to have been regarded as due to their being given a certain metrical form. That, however, does not show how the poet had acquired his influence, and one cannot shut one's eyes to the fact that the means he might adopt to make his influence felt and his wishes instantly attended to. Implied that the race with which he had to deal was a highly sensitive one, I may perhaps apply to it the adjective thin-skinned, in the literal sense of that word. For the blisters on the face are only an exaggeration of a natural phenomenon. On this point my attention has been called by a friend to the following passages in a review of a work on the pathology of the emotions 410. To both the hurtful and curative effects of the emotions m. Fear devotes much attention, and on these points makes some interesting remarks. That the emotions act on the body, more by their effects on the circulation than by anything else, is no new thesis, but M. Fear is developing some new branches of it. That the heart may be stopped for a few seconds, and that there may be localized flush and pallor of the skin, owing to almost any strong emotion, whether it be joy, anger, fear, or pain, is a matter of common observation. And that there may be many changes of nutrition due to vasomotor disturbance is a point easy to establish. The skin is particularly easily affected, passion and pain may produce a sweat that is truly hemorrhagic, parrot. And the scientific world is obliged to admit that in the stigmata of Louise Lato the blood vessels were really broken, and not broken by anything else than an emotional state as cause. In a shipwreck Fallen tells us that the pilot was covered in an hour with pustules from his fear, and the doctor sees many dermatoneuroses, such as nettle rash, herpes, pemphigus, vitiligo, and from the chalk moral. I can illustrate this from my own observation, when I was an undergraduate there was with me at college a Welsh undergraduate, who, when teased or annoyed by his friends, was well known to be subject to a sort of rash or minute pustules on his face, it would come on in the course of an hour or so. There is a well-known Welsh line on this subject of the face which is to the point. Ni chel grud gistud calen. The cheek hides not the heart's affliction. So a man who was insulted, or whose honor was assailed, might be said to be thereby put to the blush or to be otherwise injured in his face, and the Irish word anek, face, is found commonly used as a synonym for one's honor or good name. The same appears to have been the case with the Welsh equivalent, wyneb, face, and dyne de wyneb, literally a faceless man, appears to be now used in Carnarvonshire and Glamorgan in the sense of one who is without a sense of honor an unprincipled fellow. So when Welsh law dealt with insults and attacks on one's honour the payment to be made to the injured person was called Gwynborth, the price of one's face, Gwynborth, the payment for disgracing one's face. Irish law arranged for similar damages, and called them by analogous names, such as Inek Gri, a fine for injuring or raising a blush on the face, and Inek Log or Inek Lon for eleven honour price. Compare also a necros, a face reddening or blushing caused by some act or scandal which brought shame on a family. Possibly one has to do with traces of somewhat the same type of face, though it has faded away to the verge of vanishing, when one speaks in English of keeping another in countenance. It has been suggested that if a magician got a man's name he could injure him by means of his arts, now the converse seems to have been the case with the Irish der or satire, for to be effective it had, as in the instance of Kyer. To mention the victim's name. 
And a curious instance occurs in the Book of Leinster, F.O. 117, where the poet Athern failed to curse a person whose name he could not manipulate according to the rules of his satire. This man Athern is described as inhospitable, stingy, and greedy to the last degree. So it is related how he sallied forth one day, taking with him a cooked pig and a pot of mead, to a place where he intended to gorge himself without being observed. But no sooner had he settled down to his meal than he saw a man approaching, who remarked to him on his operating on the food all alone, and unceremoniously picked up the porker and the pot of mead. As he was coolly walking away with them, Athern cried out after him, I what is thy name T the stranger replied that it was nothing very grand, and gave it as follows. Sither. Ether. Author. Seal. Delhi. Drong Jers. Mech Jerlus. Ger Dar. Der Dar I Seed Moens. Sether Ether Author Seal Delhi Drang Jers. Son of Jerlus Ger Ger Dar Dyer that is my name. The story goes on to say that Athern neither saw his meal any more nor succeeded in making a satire on the name of the stranger, who accordingly got away in scathe. It was surmised, we are told, that he was an angel come from God to teach the poet better manners. This comic story brings us back to the importance of the name, as it implies that the cursing poet, had he been able to seize it and duly work it into his satire, could not have failed to bring about the intruder's discomfiture. The magician and folklore philosopher, far from asking with Juliet, what's in a name T would have rather put it the other way, what's not in a name. At any rate the ancients believed that there was a great deal in a name. And traces of the importance which they gave it are to be found in modern speech, witness the article on name or its equivalent in a big dictionary of any language possessed of a great literature. It has been seen that it is from the point of view of magic that the full importance of one's name was most keenly realized by our ancient selves. That is, of magic more especially in that stage of its history when it claimed as its own a certain degree of skill in the art of verse-making. Perhaps, indeed, it would be more accurate to suppose that verse-making appertained from the outset to magic, and that it was magicians, medicine men, or seers, who, for their own use, first invented the aids of rhythm and meter. The subject, however, of magic and its accessories is far too vast to be treated here, it has been touched upon here and there in some of the previous chapters, and I may add that wizardry and magic form the machinery, so to say. Of the stories called in Welsh the four branches of the Mabinogi, namely those of Pool, Branwen, Manawidden, and Math. Now these four, together with the adventure of Lefict and Leavelys, and, in a somewhat qualified sense, the story of Coolhuch and Olwen, represent in a Brythonicized form the otherwise lost legends of the Welsh goidels. And, like those of the Irish goidels, they are remarkable for their wizardry. Nor is that all, for in the former the kings are mostly the greatest magicians of their time, or shall I rather put it the other way, and say that in them the greatest magicians function as kings. Witness Math son of Mathenwy king of Gwynet, and his sister's son, Gwydion of Don, to whom as his successor he duly taught his magic. Then come the arch-enchanter Aroun, king of Anne, and Caswallon of Belly, represented as winning his kingdom by the sheer force of magic. To these might be added other members of the kingly families whose story shows them playing the six lu of magicians, such as Rhiannon, who by her magic arts foiled her powerful suitor, Gwal of Clud, and secured as her consort the man of her choice. PWIL Prince of Dyft. Here also, perhaps, one might mention Manawidden of LLYR, who, as Manan and Mac Lyre, figures in the stories of the Goidels of Aaron and Man as a consummate wizard and first king of the Manx people, see above. In the Mabinogi, however, no act of magic is ascribed to Manawiklan, though he is represented successfully checkmating the most formidable wizard arrayed against him and his friends, to wit, LLWID of Kilcoet. Not only does one get the impression that the ruling class in these stories of the Welsh goidels had their magic handed down from generation to generation according to a fixed rule of maternal succession, but it supplies the complete answer to and full explanation of questions as to the meaning of the terms already mentioned, Tuatha de Aucas Andi, and Lucht Cumacti, together with its antithesis. Within the magic-wielding class exercising dominion over the shepherds and tillers of the soil of the country, 
it is but natural to suppose that the first king was the first magician or greatest medicine man, as in the case of Manan. And in the Isle of Man. This must of course be understood to apply to the early history of the Goidelic race, or, perhaps more correctly speaking, to one of the races which had contributed to its composition, to the Aborigines, let us say. By whatsoever name or names you may choose to call them, whether Picts or Ivernians. It is significant, among other things, that our traditions should connect the potency of ancient wizardry with descent in the female line of succession, and, in any case. One cannot be wrong in assuming magic to have begun very low down in the scale of social progress, probably lower than religion, with which it is essentially in antagonism. As the crude and infantile pack of notions, collectively termed sympathetic magic beginning with the belief that any effect may be produced by imitating the action of the cause of it, or even doing anything that would recall it, a.k. grew into the panoply of the magician, he came to regard himself, and to be regarded by others, as able for his own benefit and that of his friends to coerce all possible opponents. Whether men or demons, heroes or gods. This left no room for the attitude of prayer and worship, religion in that sense could only come later. Chapter 12 Race in Folklore and Myth The method of philological mythology is thus discredited by the disputes of its adherents. The system may be called orthodox, but it is an orthodoxy which alters with every new scholar who enters the sacred enclosure, Andrew Lang. It has been well said, that while it is not science to know the contents of myths, it is science to know why the human race has produced them. It is not my intention to trace minutely the history of that science, but I may hazard the remark, that she could not be said to have reached years of discretion till she began to compare one thing with another. And even when mythology had become comparative mythology, her horizon remained till within recent years comparatively narrow. In other words, the comparisons were wont to be very circumscribed, you might, one was told, compare the myths of Greeks and Teutons and Hindus, because those nations were considered to be of the same stock. But even within that range comparisons were scarcely contemplated, except in the case of myths enshrined in the most classical literatures of those nations. This kind of mythology was eclectic rather than comparative, and it was apt to regard myths as a mere disease of language. By and by, however, the student showed a preference for a larger field and a wider range. And in so doing he was, whether consciously or unconsciously, beginning to keep step with a larger movement extending to the march of all the kindred sciences, and especially that of language. At one time the student of language was satisfied with mummified speech, wrapped up, as it were, in the musty coils of the records of the past, in fact, he often became a mere researcher of the dead letter of language. Instead of a careful observer of the breath of life animating her frame. So long as that remained the case, glottology deserved the whole irony of Voltaire's well-known account of etymology as being in fact, on science oii less boils any font rain, e less consans fort pu de chose. In the course, however, of recent years a great change has come over the scene, not only have the laws of the Aryan consonants gained greatly in precision, but those of the Aryan vowels have at last been discovered to a considerable extent. The result for me and others who leer it that the Aryan peasant of idyllic habits harped eternally on the three notes of A, I, U, is that we have to unlearn this and a great deal more, in fact. The vowels prove to be far more troublesome than the consonants. But difficult as these lessons are, the glottologist must learn them, unless he is content to remain with the stragglers who happen to be unable to move on. Now the change to which I allude, in connection with the study of language, has been inseparably accompanied with the paying of increased attention to actual speech, with a more careful scrutiny of dialects. Even obscure dialects such as the literary man is wont to regard with scorn. Similarly the student of mythology now seeks the wherewithal of his comparisons from the mouth of the traveller and the missionary, wherever they may roam. Not from the Rig Veda or the Iliad alone, but from the rude stories of the peasant, and the wild fancies of the savage from Tierra del Fuego to Greenland's icy mountains. The parallel may be drawn still closer. Just as the glottologist, fearing lest the written letter may have slurred over or hidden away important peculiarities of ancient speech, resorts for a corrective to the actuality of modern Aryan, so the mythologist. 
apt to suspect the testimony of the highly respectable bards of the Rig Veda, may on occasion give ear to the fresh evidence of a savage, however inconsequent it may sound. The movements to which I allude in glottology and mythology began so recently that their history has not yet been written. Suffice it to say that in glottology, or the science of language, the names most intimately connected with the new departure are those of Ascoli, J. Schmidt, and Fick, those of Leskian, Brugman, Osthoff, and de Saussure. While of the names of the teachers of the anthropological method of studying myths, several are by this time household words in this country. But, so far as I know, the first to give a systematic exposition of the subject was Professor Tyler, in his work on primitive culture, published first in 1871. Such has been the intimate connection between mythology and glottology that I may be pardoned for going back again to the latter. It is applicable in its method to all languages, but, as a matter of fact, it came into being in the domain of Aryan philology, so that it has been all along principally the science of comparing the Aryan languages with one another. It began with Sir William Jones' discovery of the kinship of Sanskrit with Greek and Latin, and for a long time it took the lead of the more closely related sciences, this proved partly beneficial and partly the reverse. In the case of ethnology, for instance, the influence of glottology has probably done more harm than good, since it has opened up a wide field for confounding race with language. In the case of mythology the same influence has been partly helpful, and it has partly fallen short of being such. Where names could be analyzed with certainty, and where they could be equated, leaving little room for doubt, as in the case of that of the Greek Zepsilanu, the Norse Tyr, and the Sanskrit Yaush. The science of language rendered a veritable help to mythology. But where the students of language, all pointing in different directions, claimed each to hold in his hand the one safety lamp, beyond the range of which the mythologist durst not take a single step except at the imminent risk of breaking his neck. The help may be pronounced, to say the least of it, as somewhat doubtful. The anthropological method of studying myths put an end to the unequal relation between the students of the two sciences, and it is now pretty well agreed that the proper relationship between them is that of mutual aid. This will doubtless prove the solution of the whole matter, but it would be premature to say that the period of strained relations is quite over. Since the mythologist has so recently made good his escape from the embarrassing attentions of the students of language, that he has not yet quite got out of his ears the bewildering notes of the chorus of discordant cries of, Dawn, Sun, and, Storm Cloud. Now that I have touched on the friendly relations which ought to exist between the science of language and the science of myth, I may perhaps be allowed to notice a point or two where it is possible or desirable for the one to render service to the other. The student of language naturally wants the help of the student of myth, ritual, and religion on matters which most immediately concern his own department of study. And I may perhaps be excused for taking my stand on Celtic ground, and calling attention to some of my own difficulties. Here is one of them, when one would say in English, it rains, or, it freezes, I should have to say in my own language, why may hnbwrw gla and why may hn rui, which literally means, she is casting rain, and, she is freezing. Nor is this sort of locution confined to weather topics, for when you would say, he is badly off, or, he is hard up, a Welshman might say, why may h in d d r w g arno, or why may h in gailed arno, that is literally. She is evil on him or, she is hard on him. And the same feminine pronoun fixes itself in other locutions in the language. Now I wish to invoke the student of myth, ritual, and religion to help in the identification of this ubiquitous, she, of the Welsh. Whenever it is mentioned to Englishmen, it merely calls to their minds the highland she, of English and Scotch caricature, as for instance when Sir Walter Scott makes Donald appeal in the following strain to Lord Mentite's man, Anderson, who had learnt manners in France, what the deal, man, can she no drink after her iron master without washing the cup and spilling the ale, and be tam ned to her. The Highlander denies the charge which our caricature tries to fasten on him. But even granting that it was once to some extent justified, it is easy to explain it by a reference to Gaelic, where the pronouns se and sil, for he and you respectively, approach in pronunciation the sound of the English pronoun she. 
This may have led to confusion in the mouths of Highlanders who had but very imperfectly mastered English. In any case, it is far too superficial to be quoted as a parallel to the high, she, in question in Welsh. A cautious Celtist, if such there be, might warn us, before proceeding further with the search, to make sure that the whole phenomenon is not a mere accident of Welsh phonetics, and that it is not a case of two pronouns. One meaning, she and the other it, being confounded as the result merely of phonetic decay. The answer to that is, that the language knows nothing of any neuter pronoun which could assume the form of the high which occupies us. And further, that in locutions where the legitimate representative of the neuter might be expected, the pronoun used is a different one, ef, e, meaning both, he, and hit, as in ie for ief, it is he, she, it, or they, nagi, not he, she. It or they, ef, a, a lie or a lie, perhaps, peradventure, putetri, il est possible. The French sentence suggests the analogous question, what was the original force of denotation of the il, in such sentences as, il fate bow, il plut, and il nedge. In such cases it now denotes nobody in particular, but has it always been one of his names? French historical grammar may be able, unaided, to dispose of the attenuated fortunes of M. I.L., but we have to look for help to the student of myth and allied subjects to enable us to identify the great, she persistently eluding our search in the syntax of the Welsh language. Only two feminine names suggest themselves to me as in any way appropriate, one is Stingid, fate or fortune, and the other is Dawn, mother of some of the most nebulous personages in Celtic literature. There is, however, no evidence to show that either of them is really the she of whom we are in quest, but I have something to say about both as illustrating the other side of the theme, how the study of language may help mythology. This I have so far only illustrated by a reference to the equation of XXXXX with Jiaosh and their congeners. Within the range of Celtic legend the case is similar with Don, who figures on Welsh ground, as I have hinted, as mother of certain heroes of the oldest chapters of the Mabinogen. For it is from her that Gwydion, the bard and archmagician, and Gofanon the smith his brother, are called sons of Don. And so in the case of Arianrod, daughter of Don, mother of Lu, and owner of the sea-laved castle of Caer Arianrod, not far distant from the prehistoric mound of Dinah's Diphite, near the western mouth of the Menai Straits. As already mentioned above, in Irish legend, we detect Don under the Irish form of her name, Danu or Donu, genitive Dan Ann or Don Ann, and she is almost singular there in always being styled a divinity. From her, the great mythical personages of Irish legend are called Tuatha de Dan Ann, or the goddess Danu's tribes, and sometimes for Dea, or the men of the divinity. The last stage in the Welsh history of Don consists of her translation to the skies where the constellation of Cassiopeia is supposed to constitute LLYS Dawn or Dawn's Court. As the Corona Borealis is identified with Caer Arianrod or the Castle of Dawn's Daughter. But, as was perhaps fitting, the dimensions of both are reduced to comparative littleness by Caer Gwydion, the magician Gwydion's battlements, spread over the radiant expanse of the whole Milky Way 412. Now the identification of this ancient goddess Danu or Don as that in whom the oldest legends of the Irish goidels and the Welsh goidels converge, has been the work not so much of mythology as of the science of language. For it was the latter that showed how to call back a little colouring into the vanishing lineaments of this faded ancestral divinity. 413. For my next illustration, namely Tinged, Fate, I would cite a passage from the opening of one of the most Celtic of Welsh stories, that of Coolhuch and Olwen. Coolhuch's father, after being for some time a widower, marries again, and conceals from his second wife the fact that he has a son. She finds it out and lets her husband know it. So he sends for his son Coolhuch, and the following is the account of the son's interview with his stepmother, as given in Lady Charlotte Guest's translation, too. 252 His stepmother said unto him, It were well for thee to have a wife, and I have a daughter who is sought of every man of renown in the world. I am not of an age to wed, answered the youth. Then said she unto him, I declare to thee, that it is thy destiny not to be suited with a wife until thou obtain 011, the daughter of Espadadon Pencor. 
And the youth blushed, and the love of the maiden diffused itself through all his frame, although he had never seen her. And his father inquired of him, What has come over thee, my son, and what aileth thee? My stepmother has declared to me, that I shall never have a wife until I obtain 011, the daughter of Espadadan Pencor. That will be easy for thee, answered his father. Arthur is thy cousin. Go, therefore, unto Arthur to cut thy hair, and ask this of him as a boon. The physical theory of love for an unknown lady at the first mention of her name, and the allusion to the Celtic tonsure, will have doubtless caught the reader's attention, but I only wish to speak of the words which the translator has rendered. I declare to thee, that it is thy destiny not to be suited with a wife until thou obtain Owen. More closely rendered, the original might be translated thus, I swear thee a destiny that thy side touch not a wife till thou obtain Owen. The word in the Welsh for destiny is tingit, for an earlier tunset, and the corresponding Irish word is attested astacat. Both these words have a tendency, like fate, to be used mostly in pyrem partem. Formerly, however, they might be freely used in an auspicious sense likewise, as for instance in the woman's name Tunxetase, on an early inscribed stone in Pembrokeshire. If her name had been rendered into Latin she would have probably been called Fortunata, as a namesake of good fortune. I render the Welsh me a ting half dingit itt 414 into English, I swear thee a destiny. But, more literally still, one might possibly render it, I swear thee a swearing, that is, I swear thee an oath, meaning I swear for thee an oath which will bind thee. The stepmother, it is true, is not represented going through the form of words, for what she said appears to have been a regular formula, just like that of putting a person in medieval Irish story under Jessa or bonds of magic. But an oath or form of imprecation was once doubtless a dark reality behind T formula. In the southern part of my native county of Cardigan, the phrase in question has been in use within the last thirty years, and the practice which it denotes is still so well known as to be the subject of local stories. A friend of mine, who is not yet fifty, vividly remembers listening to an uncle of his relating how narrowly he once escaped having the oath forced on him. He was in the hilly portion of the parish of Lanwinog, coming home across country in the dead of a midsummer's night, when leaping over a fence he unexpectedly came down close to a man actively engaged in sheep stealing. The uncle instantly took to his heels, while the thief pursued him with a knife. If the thief had caught him, it is understood that he would have held his knife at his throat and forced on him an oath of secrecy. I have not been able to ascertain the wording of the oath, but all I can learn goes to show that it was dreaded only less than death itself. In fact, there are stories current of men who failed to recover from the effects of the oath, but lingered and died in a comparatively short time. Since I got the foregoing story I have made inquiries of others in South Cardiganshire, and especially of a medical friend of mine, who speaks chiefly as to his native parish of Lanjinlo. I found that the idea is perfectly familiar to him and my other informants. But, strange to say, from nobody could I gather that the illness is considered to result necessarily from the violent administration of the ing to the victim. Or from the latter's disregarding the secrecy of it by disclosing to his friends the name of the criminal. In fact, I cannot discover that any such secrecy is emphasized so long as the criminal is not publicly brought before a court of justice. Rather is it that the four ing defects blindly the ruin of the sworn man's health, regardless of his conduct. At any rate, that is the interpretation which I am forced to put on what I have been told. The phrase Tingu Ting 415, 29, intelligible still in Wales, recalls another instance of the importance of the spoken word, to wit, the Latin fatum. Nay, it seems to suggest that the latter might have perhaps originally been part of some such a formula as alicui fatum fari, to say one a saying, in the pregnant sense of applying to him words of power. This is all the more to the point, as it is well known how closely Latin and Celtic are related to one another, and how every advance in the study of those languages goes to add emphasis to their kinship. From the kinship of the languages one may expect, to a certain extent, a similarity of rites and customs, and one has not to go further for this than the very story which I have cited. When Kulch's father first married, he is said to have sought a great Kwanmwitacef 416, 
which means, a wife of the same food with him. Thus the wedded wife was she, probably, who ate with her husband, and we are reminded of the food ceremony which constituted the aristocratic marriage in ancient Rome, it was called conferiatio, and in the course of it an offering of cake. Called ferium libum, used to be made to Jupiter. A great French student of antiquity, M. Fustel de Colanges, describes the ceremony thus 417, Les du six pou, come in Greece, font un sacrifice, bursent la libation, pronounce en quelques prières, et mangent ensemble un gâteau de fleur de farine, panis farius, dot. Lastly, my attention has been directed to the place given to bread in the stories of Llyny Fan Fock and Llyn Elfarch. For on turning back the reader will find too much made of the bread to allow us to suppose that it had no meaning in the courtship. The young farmer having fallen in love at first sight with the lake maiden, it looks as if he wished, by inducing her to share the bread he was eating. To go forth with through a form of marriage by a kind of conferiation that committed her to a contract to be his wife without any tedious delay. To return to the Latin fatum, I would point out that the Romans had a plurality of fata, but how far they were suggested by the Greek XXXX is not quite clear, nor is it known that the ancient Welsh had more than one ting. In the case, however, of Old Norse literature, we come across the fate there as one bearing a name which is perhaps cognate with the Welsh tinged. I allude to a female figure, called Pock, who appears in the touching myth of Baldur's death. When Baldur had fallen at the hands of Loki and Hodr, his mother Frigg asked who would like to earn her good will by going as her messenger to treat with Hel for the release of Baldur. Hermeter the Swift, another of the sons of Woden, undertook to set out on that journey on his father's charger Sleipnir. For nine dreary nights he pursued his perilous course without interruption, through glens dark and deep, till he came to the river called Yell, when he was questioned as to his errand by the maid in charge of the Yell Bridge. On and on he rode afterwards till he came to the fence of Hell's abode, which his horse cleared at full speed. Hermadr entered the hall, and there found his brother Balder seated in the place of honor. He abode with him that night, and in the morning he asked Hell to let Balder ride home with him to the Ansas. He urged Hell to consider the grief which everybody and everything felt for Balder. She replied that she would put that to the test by letting Balder go if everything animate and inanimate would weep for him but he would be detained if anybody or anything declined to do so. Perm 6 CTR made his way back alone to the Ansas, and announced to Frigg the answer which Hel had given to her request. Messengers were sent forth without delay to bid all the world beweep Woden's son out of the power of Hel. This was done accordingly by all, by men and animals, by earth and stones, by trees and all metals, as you have doubtless seen these things weep, says the writer of the Prose Edda, when they pass from frost to warmth. When the messengers, however, were on their way home, after discharging their duty, they chanced on a cave where dwelt a giantess called Pock, whom they ordered to join in the weeping for Balder. But she only answered. Pock will weep dry tears. At Balder's bale fire. What is the son of man, quick or dead, to me? Let hell keep what she holds for eighteen. In this ogress Pock, deaf to the appeals of the tenderer feelings, we seem to have the counterpart of our Celtic tokad and tinged. And the latter's name as a part of the formula in the Welsh story, while giving us the key of the myth, shows how the early Aryan knew of nothing more binding than the magic force of an oath. On the one hand, this conception of destiny carries with it the marks of its humble origin, and one readily agrees with Cicero's words, the divination, too. 7. When he says, Anile sane et plenum superstitionis fatti nomen ipsum. On the other hand, it rises to the grim dignity of a name for the dark, inexorable power which the whole universe is conceived to obey, a power before which the great and resplendent Zeus of the Aryan race is a mere puppet. Perhaps I have dwelt only too long on the policy of give and take which ought to obtain between mythology and glottology. Unfortunately, one can add without fear of contradiction, that, even when that policy is carried out to the utmost, both sciences will still have difficulties more than enough. In the case of mythology these difficulties spring chiefly from two distinct sources, from the blending of history with myth, and from the mixing of one race with another. Let us now consider the latter, the difficulties from this source are many and great, 
but every fresh acquisition of knowledge tending to make our ideas of ethnology more accurate. Gives us a better leverage for placing the myths of mixed peoples in their proper places as regards the races composing those peoples. Still, we have far fewer propositions to lay down than questions to ask, thus to go no further afield than the well-known stories attaching to the name of Heracles, how many of them are Aryan, how many Semitic. And how many Aryan and Semitic at one and the same time? That is the sort of question which besets the student of Celtic mythology at every step, for the Celtic nations of the present day are the mixed descendants of Aryan invaders and the native populations which those Aryan invaders found in possession. So the question thrusts itself on the student, to which of these races a particular myth, rite, or custom is to be regarded as originally belonging. Take, for instance, Brand's colossal figure, to which attention has already been called, pp. 552-3 above. Bran was too large to enter a house or go on board a ship, is he to be regarded as the outcome of Celtic imagination, or of that of a people that preceded the Celts in Celtic lands? The comparison with the Gaulish tricephal would seem to point in the direction of the South Eden seaboard of the Baltic, what then? The same kind of question arises in reference to the Irish hero Cuchulain, take, for instance, the stock description of Cuchulain in a rage. Thus when angered he underwent strange distortions, the calves of his legs came round to where his shins should have been, his mouth enlarged itself so that it showed his liver and lungs swinging in his throat. One of his eyes became as small as a needle's, or else it sank back into his head further than a crane could have reached, while the other protruded itself to a corresponding length. Every hair on his body became as sharp as a thorn, and held on its point a drop of blood or a spark of fire. It would be dangerous then to stop him from fighting, and even when he had fought enough, he required for his cooling to be plunged into three baths of cold water. The first into which he went would instantly boil over, the second would be too hot for anybody else to bear, and the third only would be of congenial warmth. I do not ask whether that strange picture betrays a touch of the solar brush, but I should be very glad to know whether it can be regarded as an Aryan creation or not. It is much the same with matters other than mythological, take, for instance, the Bedlamite custom of the Kavad 419, which is presented to us in Irish literature in the singular form of a cess, suffering or indisposition. Simultaneously attacking the braves of ancient Ulster. We are briefly informed in the Book of the Dun Cow, F.O. 60a, that the women and boys of Ulster were free from it. So was any Ultonian, we are told, who happened to be outside the boundaries of his country, and so were Cuchulain and his father, even when in Ulster. Anyone who was rash enough to attack an Ultonian warrior during this his period of helplessness could not, it is further stated, expect to live afterwards either prosperously or long. The question for us, however, is this, was the Kavad introduced by the Aryan invaders of Ireland, or are we rather to trace it to an earlier race? I should be, I must confess, inclined to the latter view, especially as the Kavad was known among the Iberians of old, and among the ancient Corsicans 420. It may, of course, have been both Aryan and Iberian, but it will all the same serve as a specimen of the sort of question which one has to try to answer. Another instance, the race origin of which one would like to ascertain, offers itself in the curious belief, that, when a child is born, it is one of the ancestors of the family come back to live again. Traces of this occur in Irish literature, namely, in one of the stories about Cuchulain. There we read to the following effect, the Ultonians took counsel on account of Cuchulain, because their wives and girls loved him greatly. For Cuchulain had no consort at that time. This was their counsel, namely, that they should seek for Cuchulain a consort pleasing to him to woo. For it was evident to Thurn that a man who has the consort of his companionship with him would be so much the less likely to attempt the ruin of their girls and to receive the affection of their wives. Then, moreover, they were anxious and afraid lest the death of Cuchulain should take place early, so they were desirous for that reason to give him a wife in order that he might leave an heir. For they knew that it was from himself that his rebirth, Athgian, would be. That is what one reads in the 11th century copy of the ancient manuscript of the Book of the Dun Cow, F.O. 121b. And this atavistic belief, 
which was touched upon in connection with the transformations discussed in the last chapter, I need scarcely say, is well known elsewhere to the anthropologist, as on E will find on consulting the opening pages of Dr. Tyler's second volume on primitive culture. He there mentions the idea as familiar to American Indians, to various African peoples, to the Maoris and the Aborigines of Australia, to Cherimis Tartars and Laps. Among such nations the words of Don Deed to his victorious son, the Cid, could hardly fail to be construed in a sort of literal sense when he exclaims. Ton luster audac. Fate bien revivire en toy les heroes de ma race. Let us return to Cuchulain, and note the statement, that he and his father, Swaldame, were exempt from the Kavad, which marks them out as not of the same race as the Oltonians, that is to say, as the Fur Olade. Or true Oltonians, presumably ancient inhabitants of Ulster. Furthermore, we have an indication whence his family had come, for Cuchulain's first name was Satanta Beg, the little Satanchan, which points to the coast of what is now Lancashire, as already indicated at p. 385 above. Another thing which marks Cuchulain as of a different racial origin from the other Oltonians is the belief of the latter, that his rebirth must be from himself. The meaning of this remarkable statement is that there were two social systems face to face in Ulster at the time represented by the Cuchulain story, and that one of them recognized fatherhood, while the other did not. Thus for Cuchulain's rebirth to be from himself, he must be the father of a child from whom should descend a man who would be a rebirth or avatar of Cuchulain. The other system implied was one which reckoned descent by birth alone 421. And the Cuchulain story gives one the impression that it contemplated this system as the predominant one, while the Syachulain family, with its reckoning of fatherhood, comes in as an exception. At all events, that is how I now understand a passage, the full significance of which had till recently escaped me. Allusion has already been made to the story of Cuchulain being himself a rebirth, namely, of Lug, and the story deserves still further consideration in its bearing on the question of race, to which the reader's attention has been called. It is needless, however, to say that there are extant fragments of more stories than one as to Chulain's origin. Sometimes, as in the Book of Leinster, F.O. 119a, he is called Gain Loga, or Lug's offspring, and in the epic tale of the tame Bo Quaelmge, Lug as his father comes from the Cid or Fairy to take Cuchulain's place in the field, when the latter was worn out with sleeplessness and toil. Lug sings over him Eli Loga, or Lug's enchantment, and Cuchulain gets the requisite rest and sleep 422, this we read in the Book of the Dun Cow, F.O. 78a. In another version of the story, Cuchulain is an incarnation of Lug, the narrative relates how a foster son was accepted by Dectir, sister to Conchobar Mac Nessa, king of Ulster. But her foster son died Yug, to the great grief of Dectir. And her lamentations for him on the day of his funeral having made her thirsty, she inadvertently swallowed with her drink a diminutive creature which sprang into her mouth. That night she had a dream, in which a man informed her that she was pregnant, that it was he who was in her womb, that he had been her foster son, and that he was Lug, also that when his birth should take place, the name was to be Satanta. After an incident which I can only regard as a clumsy attempt to combine the more primitive legend with the story which makes him son of Swaldame, she gives birth to the boy, and he is duly called Satanta 423, that was Cathalane's first name. Now compare this with what Dr. Tyler mentions in, Text Missing. Here let it suffice to say, that the similarity is so close between the Irish and the Lap idea, and so unlike anything known to have been Aryan, that it is well worth bearing in mind. The belief in rebirth generally seems to fit as a part of the larger belief in the transmigration of souls which is associated with the teachings of the ancient Druids, a class of shamans or medicine men who were probably, as already hinted, not of Celtic or Aryan origin. And probably the beliefs here in question were those of some non Aryan people of these islands, rather than of any Aryans who settled in them. This view need hardly be regarded as incompatible with the fact that Lug's name, Genitive Loga, would seem to have meant light, and that Lug was a sun god, very possibly a Celtic sun god, or more correctly speaking, that there was a series of Lugs. So to say, or sun gods, called in ancient Spain, Switzerland, 
and on the banks of the Rhine, Lugos 424. For one is sorely tempted to treat this much as a rescue from the wreckage of the solar myth theory, as against those who, having regard mainly to Lug's professional skill and craft as described in Irish story, make of him a kind of Hermes or Mercury. In other words, we have either to regard a Celtic Lug as having become the center of certain non-Celtic legends, or else to suppose neither Lug nor his name to be of Aryan origin at all. It is hard to say which is the sounder view to take. The next question which I wish to suggest is as to the ethnology of the fairies, but before coming to that, one has to ask how the fairies have been evolved. The idea of fairies, such as Welsh men have been familiar with from their childhood, clearly involves elements of two distinct origins. Some of those elements come undoubtedly from the workshop of the imagination, as, for example, the stock notion that their food and drink are brought to the fairies by the mere force of wishing, and without the ministration of servants. Or the notion, especially prevalent in Arfon, that the fairies dwell in a country beneath the lakes of Snowdon. Not to mention the more general connection of a certain class of fairies with the world of waters, as indicated in Chapter 7. Add to this that the dead ancestor has also probably contributed to our bundle of notions about them. But that contains also an element of fact or something which may at any rate be conceived as historical. Under this head I should place the following articles of faith concerning them, the sallowness of their skins and the smallness of their stature, their dwelling underground, their dislike of iron, and the comparative poverty of their homes in the matter of useful articles of furniture, their deep-rooted objection to the green sward being broken up by the plough, the success of the fairy wife in attending to the domestic animals and to the dairy, the limited range generally of the fairy's ability to count. And lastly, one may perhaps mention their using a language of their own, p. 279, which would imply a time when the little people understood no other, and explain why they should be represented doing their marketing without uttering a syllable to anybody. The attribution of these and similar characteristics to the fairies can scarcely be all mere feats of fancy and imagination, rather do they seem to be the result of our ancestors projecting on an imaginary world a primitive civilization through which tradition represented their own race as having passed. Or, more probably, a civilization in which they saw, or thought they saw, another race actually living. Let us recur for examples also to the two lake legends which have just been mentioned, p. 65o. In both of them a distinction is drawn between the lake fairy's notion of bread and that of the men and women of the country. To the fairy the latter's bread appeared crimped or overbaked, possibly the backward civilization, to which she was supposed to belong, was content to support itself on some kind of unleavened bread. If not rather on a fare which included nothing deserving to be called bread at all. Witness Geraldus Cambrensis' story of Eliodorus, in which bread is conspicuous by its absence, the nearest approach to it being something of the consistency of porridge, cp. 270 above. Then. Take another order of ideas, the young man in both lake legends lives with his mother, pages 3, 27 there is no father to advise or protect him, he is in this respect on a level with Undine, who is the protege of her tiresome uncle, Colborn. Seemingly, he belongs to a primitive society where matriarchal ideas rule, and where paternity is not reckoned 425. This we are at liberty at all events to suppose to have been the original, before the narrator had painted the mother a widow, and given the picture other touches of his later brush. To speak, however, of paternity as merely not reckoned is by no means to go far enough, so here we have to return to take another look at the imaginary aspect of the fairies, to which a cursory allusion has just been made. The reader will possibly recall the sturdy smith of Istrad Murig, who would not reduce the notions which he had formed of the fairies when he was a child to conformity with those of a later generation around him. In any case, he will remember the smith's statement that the fairies were all women. The idea was already familiar to me as a Welshman, though I cannot recollect how I got it. But the smith's words brought to my mind at once the story of Condla Road or the Red, one of the fairy tales first recorded in Irish literature. There the damsel who takes Condla away in her boat of glass to the realm of the ever-living sings the praises of that delectable country, and uses, among others, the following words, which occur in the book of the Dun Cow, F.O. 120. 
Ni fil senel and na mid act mona aucus in Gina 426. There is no race there but women and maidens alone. Now what people could have come by the idea of a race of women only? Surely no people who considered that they themselves had fathers, it must have been some community so low in the scale of civilization as never to have had any notion whatsoever of paternity, it is their ignorance that would alone render possible. The notion of a race all women. That this was a matter of belief in the past of many nations, is proved by the occurrence of widely known legends about virgin mothers 427. Not to mention that it has been lately established, that there are savages who to this day occupy the low place here indicated in the scale of civilization. Witness the evidence of Spencer and Gillen in their recently published work on the native tribes of Central Australia, and also what Fraser, author of The Golden Bough, says of a passage in point, in the former, as follows. Thus, in the opinion of these savages, every conception is what we are wont to call an immaculate conception. Being brought about by the entrance into the mother of a spirit apart from any contact with the other sex. Students of folklore have long been familiar with notions of this sort occurring in the stories of the birth of miraculous personages. But this is the first case on record of a tribe who believe in immaculate conception as the sole cause of the birth of every human being who comes into the world. A people so ignorant of the most elementary of natural processes may well rank at the very bottom of the savage scale 428. Nevertheless, it is to some population in that low position, in the remote prehistory of this country, that one is to trace the belief that the fairies were all women. It is to be regarded as a position distinctly lower than that of the Ultonians in the time of Cuchulain. For the Kavad seems to me to argue a notion of paternity perhaps, in their case, as clear a notion of paternity as was possible for a community which was not quite out of the promiscuous stage of society. The Neo-Celtic nations of these islands consist, speaking roughly, of a mixture of the invading Celts with the earlier inhabitants whom the Celts found in possession. These two or more groups of peoples may have been in very different stages of civilization when they first came in contact with one another. They agreed doubtless in many things, and perhaps, among others, in cherishing an inherited reluctance to disclose their names, but the Celts as Aryans were never without the decimal system of counting. Like the French, the Celtic nations of the present day show a tendency, more or less marked, to go further and count by scores instead of by tens. But the Welsh are alone among them in having, in certain instances, gone back from counting by tens to counting by fives, which they do when they count between ten and twenty, for sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, and nineteen are in Welsh one on fifteen, two on fifteen, three on fifteen, and four on fifteen respectively. And similarly with 13 and 14429. We have seen how the Lake Fairy reckoned by fives all the livestock she was to have as her dowry, and one otherwise notices that the fairies deal invariably in the simplest of numbers. Thus, if you wish, for example, to find a person who has been led away by them, ten to one you have to go, this day next year, to the spot where he disappeared. Except in the case of the alluring light of the full moon, it is out of the question to reckon months or weeks, though it is needless to say that to reckon the year correctly would have been in point of fact far more difficult. But nothing sounds simpler than, this day next year. In that simple arithmetic of the fairies, then, we seem to have a trace of a non-Aryan race, that is to say, probably of some early inhabitants of these islands. Unfortunately, the language of those inhabitants has died out, so that we cannot appeal to its numerals directly. And the next best yours to adopt is to take as a sort of substitute for their language that of possible kinsmen of a pre-Celtic race in this country. Now the students of ethnology, especially those devoted to the investigation of skulls and skins, tell us that we have among us, notably in Wales and Ireland, living representatives of a dark-haired, long-skulled race of the same description as one of the types which occur, as they allege, among the Basque populations of the Pyrenees. We turn accordingly to Basque, and what do we find? Why, that the first five numerals in that language are Bat, Bai, Iru, Lao, Bost, all of which appear to be native. But when we come to the sixth numeral we have Say, which looks like an Aryan word borrowed from Latin, Gaulish, or some related tongue. The case is much the same with Seven, 
for that is in Basque Zazbi, which is also probably an Aryan loanword. Basque has native words, Zortzi and Bedarazzi, for eight and nine, but they are longer than the first five, and appear to be of a later formation affecting, in common with Say and Zazbi, the termination I. I submit, therefore, that here we have evidence of the former existence of a people in the west of Europe who at one time only counted as far as five. Some of the early peoples of the British Isles may have been on the same level, so that our notions about the fairies have probably been derived, to a greater or less extent, from ideas formed by the Celts concerning those non-Celtic, non-Aryan natives of whose country they took possession. As regards my appeal to the authority of craniology, I have to confess that it is made with a certain amount of reservation, since the case is far less simple than it looks at first sight. Thus, in August, 1891, the Cambrian Archaeological Association, including among them Professor Sace, visited the southwest of Ireland. During our pleasant excursions in Kerry, the question of race was one of our constant topics. And Professor Sace was reminded by what he saw in Ireland of his visit to North Africa, especially the hilly regions of the country inhabited by the Berbers. Among other things, he used to say that if a number of Berbers from the mountains were to be brought to an Irish village and clad as Irishmen, he felt positive that he should not be able to tell them from the Irishmen themselves. Such as we saw on our rambles in Kerry. This struck me as all the more remarkable, since his reference was to fairly tall, blue-eyed men whose hair could not be called black. On the other hand, owing perhaps to ignorance and careless ways of looking at things around me, I am a little skeptical as to the swarthy long skulls, they did not seem to meet us at every turn in Ireland. And as for Wales, which I know as well as most people do, I cannot in my ignorance of craniology say with any confidence that I have ever noticed vast numbers of that type. I should like, however, to see the heads of some of the singers whom I have noticed at our Eisteddfada at Cardiff, Aberdare, and Swansea, placed under the hands of an experienced skullman. For I have long suspected that we cannot regard as of Aryan origin the vocal talent so general in Wales, and so conspicuous in our choirs of working people as to astonish all the great musicians who have visited our national festival. Beyond all doubt, race has not a little to do with the artistic feelings, a short skull may be as unmusical, for example, as I am, but has anybody in this country ever known a narrow long skew h to be the reverse of unmusical? Or has anyone ever considered how few clergymen of the tall, fair-haired, blue-eyed type have been converted to the ritualistic and aesthetic movement in the Church of England? As it seems to me that the bulk of the Welsh people would have to be described as short skulls. It would be very gratifying to see those who are wont to refer freely to the dark-complexioned long skulls of Wales catch a respectable number of specimens. I trust there are plenty to be found, and of course I do not care how they are taken, whether it be by an instantaneous process of photography or in the meshes of some anthropometric sportsman, like Dr. Beto. Let them be secured anyhow, so that one may rest assured that the type is still numerically safe, and be able to judge with one's own eyes how heads long and swarthy look on the shoulders of living Welshmen. We might then be in a position also to compare with them the prevalent description of fairy changelings. For when the fairies steal nice, blonde babies, they usually place in their stead their own aged-looking brats with short legs, sallow skins, and squeaky voices. Unfortunately for me, all the adult changelings of whom I happened to have heard any account had died some years before I began to turn my attention to the population of fairy, with the exception, perhaps, of one whose name I obtained under the seal of secrecy. It was that of the wife of a farmer living near Nefin, in West Carnarvonshire. It was whispered that she was a changeling, so I am inclined to regard her as no other than one of the representatives of the same aboriginal stock to which one might conjecture some of her neighbors also to belong. She ought to be an extreme specimen of the type. It is to be hoped that the photographer and his anthropometric brother have found her out in time and in good humor, but it is now many years since I heard of her. To return again to the fairies, some of them are described as more comely and good-looking than the rest but the fairy women are always pictured as fascinating. Though their offspring as changelings are as uniformly presented in the light of repulsive urchins. But whole groups of the fairy population are sometimes described as being as ugly of face as they were thievish in disposition those, for instance, of Lanthabon, 
in Glamorganshire. There is one district, however, which is an exception to the tenor of fairy physiognomy, it is that of the Pennant neighborhood, in Carnarvonshire, together with the hills and valleys, roughly speaking. From Coombe Strawland to Whitmore and from DRWSY Coed to Dalbanmain. The fairies of that tract are said to have been taller than the others, and characterized by light or even flaxen hair, together with eyes of clear blue. Nor is that all, for we are told that they would not let a person of dark complexion come near them. The other fairies, when kidnapping, it is true, preferred the blonde infants of other people to their own swarthy brats, which, perhaps, means that it was a policy of their people to recruit itself with men of the superior physique of the more powerful population around them. The supposed fairy ancestress of the people of the Pennant Valley bears, in the stories in point, such names as Penelope, Bella, Pelisha, and Sibi, while her descendants are still taunted with their descent a quarrel which, within living memory, used to be fought out with fists at the fairs at Penmorpha and elsewhere. This seems to indicate a comparatively late settlement 430 in the district of a family or group of families from without, and an origin, therefore, somewhat similar to that of the Symikiade and Cowperiade of a more eastern portion of the same county, rather than anything deserving to be considered with the rest of the annals of fairy. Passing by this oasis, then, such snapshot photographs as I have been able to take, so to speak, of fairyland cleared of the glamour resting on its landscape, seem to disclose to the eye a swarthy population of short stumpy men occupying the most inaccessible districts of our country. They appear to have cared more for soap than clothing 431, and they lived on milk taken once a day, when they could get it. They probably fished and hunted, and kept domestic animals, including, perhaps, the pig. But they depended largely on what they could steal at night or in misty weather. Their thieving, however, was not resented, as their visits were believed to bring luck and prosperity. Their communities formed as it were islands, owing to the country round about them having been wrested from them by later corners of a more warlike disposition and provided with better weapons. But the existence of the scattered groups of the fairies was in no danger of coming to a violent end, they were safe in consequence of the superstitious beliefs of their stronger neighbors, who probably regarded them as formidable magicians. Powerful, among other things, to cause or to cure disease as they pleased. Such, without venturing to refresh my memory by perusing what has been written about dwarf races in other parts of the world, are the impressions made on my mind in the course of analyzing and sifting the folklore materials crowded into this volume. That applies, of course, in so far only as regards the fairies in their character of a real people as distinguished from them as creatures of the imagination. But, as I have no wish to earn the displeasure of my literary friends, let me hasten to say that I acknowledge the latter, the creatures of the imagination, to he the true fairies. The admiration of one's childhood and the despair of one's later years, the other folk the aborigines whom I have been trying to depict form only a sort of substratum, a kind of background to the fairy picture. Which I should be the last man to wish to mar. It is needless to say that we have no trace of any fairies approaching the minute dimensions of Shakespeare's Queen Mab. For, after all, our fairies are mostly represented as not extravagantly unlike other people in personal appearance not so unlike, in fact. That other folk might not be mistaken for them now and then as late as the latter part of the 15th century. Witness the following passage from Sir John Wynne's History of the Guider Family, p. 74. Having purchased this lease, he removed his dwelling to the castle of Dalwitheland, which at that time was in part thereof habitable, where one Howell A. P. Javon A. P. Riss get him, in the beginning of Edward IV his reign. Captain of the Count Ray and an outlaw, had dwelt. Against this man David A. P. Jenkin rose, and contended with him for the sovereignty of the Count Ray. And being superior to him, in the end he drew a draft for him, and took him in his bed at Penanman with his concubine, performing by craft, what he could not by force, and brought him to Conway Castle. Thus, after many bickerings between Howell and David A. P. Jenkin, he being too weak, was fain to fly the Count Ray, and to go to Ireland, where he was a year or thereabouts. In the end he returned in the summer time, having himself, and all his followers clad in green, who, being come into the Count Ray, he dispersed here and there among his friends. 
lurking by day and walking in the night for fear of his adversaries. And such of the Count Ray as happened to have a sight of him and his followers, said they were the fairies, and so ran away. But what has doubtless helped, above all other things, to perpetuate the belief in the existence of fairies may be said to be the popular association with them of the circles in the grass, commonly known in English as fairy rings. This phenomenon must have answered for ages the purpose for our ancestors, practically speaking, of ocular demonstration, as it still does no doubt in many a rustic neighborhood. The most common name for the fairies in Welsh is Ytylwyth Teg, the fair. Or beautiful family. But in South Cardiganshire we have found them called Plant Rhys Dwfn, the children of Rhys the Deep, while in Gwent and Morganwg they are more usually known as Bendith Y Mamal, the blessing of the mothers. Our 14th century poet, D. Ub Gwilym, uses the first mentioned term, Tylwyth Teg, in poem 39, and our prose literature has a word sorar, soar in the sense of a dwarf, and cores for a she dwarf. The old Cornish had also cor, which in Breton is written cor 432, with a feminine caress, and among the other derivatives one finds coric, a dwarf, a fairy, a wee little sorcerer, and corages or corrigan, a she dwarf, a fairy woman. A diminutive sereris. The use of these words in Breton recalls the case of the cor, called Rud Iwin or else Idalic, teaching his magic to Colt, son of Colfrey. Then we have uncanny dwarfs in the romances, such, for example, as the rude cor in the service of Edurne of Nud, as described in French in Cretine's romance of Eric E. Enid and in Welsh in that of Durant Vab Urban. Also the cor and cores who figure in the story of Pereter. The latter had belonged to that hero's father and mother till the breakup of the family, when the dwarfs went to Arthur's court, where they lived a whole year without speaking to anybody. When, however, Pereter made his rustic appearance there, they hailed him loudly as the chief of warriors and the flower of knighthood, which brought on them the wrath of Kai, on whom they were eventually avenged by Pereter. In the case 433 of both Edurne and Pereter we find the dwarfs loyally interested in the fortunes of their masters and their masters' friends. With Thurn also the shape-shifting men, though not found placed in the same unfavorable light, is probably to be ranged, as one may gather from his name and his role of wizard scout for Arthur's men. In the like attachment on the part of the fairies, which was at times liable to develop into devotedness of an embarrassing nature, we seem to have one of the germs of the idea of a household fairy or banshee. As illustrated by the case of the ugly wee woman in the Pantana's legend. And it seems natural to regard the interested voices in the Kenfig legend, and other stories of the same kind, as instances of amalgamating the idea of a fairy with that of an ancestral person. At all events, we have obtained something to put by the side of the instances already noticed of the fairy girl who gives, against her will at first, her services in the dairy of her captor, pages 45, 87. Of the other fairy who acts as a nurse for a family in the Pennant Valley, Till she is asked to dress better, and of Bukar Trwin who works willingly and well, both at the house and in the field, till he has tricks played on him. To make this brief survey complete, one has to mention the fairies who used to help Eileen with her spinning, and not to omit those who were found to come to the rescue of a woman in despair and to assist her on the condition of getting her baby. The motive here is probably not to be confounded with that of the fairies who stealthily exchanged babies. The explanation seems in this case to be that the fairies, or some of the fairies, were once regarded as cannibals. Which is countenanced by such a story as that of Canrig Bwt, Canrig the Stumpy. At Lanberis the latter is said to have lived beneath the huge stone called Y. Gromlech, the dolmen, opposite Cumblas and near the high road to the pass. When the man destined to dispatch her came, she was just finishing her dinner off a baby's flesh. 30. There are traces of a similar story in another district, for a writer who published in the year 1802 uses the following words There was lately near Sarig y Drudion, in Mirionefshire, a subterraneous room composed of large stones, which was called Karchar Sinric Rwth I. E. The prison of Sinric Rwth, which has been taken notice of by travellers. Sinric Rwth may be rendered Sinric the greedy or broadmouthed. 
A somewhat similar ogress is located by another story on the high ground at BWHY Rai Felon, on the way from Langalan to Landegla, and she is represented by the local tradition as contemporary with Arthur 434. I am inclined to think the Kumla's Cromlech natural rather than artificial. But I am, however, struck by the fact that the fairies are not unfrequently located on or near ancient sites, such as seem to be Corian, the margin of Llyn Erdin, Bryn Y Pibian, Dinlane, Karn Bodchen, on which there are, I am told. Walls and hut foundations similar to those which I have recently seen on Karn Fadrun in the same district, Modin Camp, and, perhaps, Wanyas Gemin Rock in the immediate vicinity of Craig Y Nos, neither of which, however, have I ever visited. Local acquaintance with each fairy center would very possibly enable one to produce a list that would be suggestive. In passing one may point out that the uncanny dwarf of Celtic story would seem to have served, in one way or another. As a model for other dwarfs in the French romances and the literatures of other nations that came under the influence of those romances, such as that of the English. But the subject is too large to be dealt with here, so I return to the word Sioar, in order to recall to the reader's mind the allusion made to a certain people called Coroniate or Coroniate, pronounced in later Welsh Coraniade, Coranians. They come in the adventure of Lyacle and Leavelys, and there they have ascribed to them one of the characteristics of consummate magicians, namely, the power of hearing any word that comes in contact with the wind. So it was, we are told, impossible to harm them. Lud, however, was advised to circumvent them in the following manner, he was to bruise certain insects in water and sprinkle the water on the Koranians and his own people indiscriminately. After calling them together under the pretense of making peace between them. For the sprinkling would do no harm to his own subjects, while it would kill the others. This unholy water proved effective, and the Koranians all perished. Now the magic power ascribed to them, and the method of disposing of them, combined to lend them a fabulous aspect, while their name, inseparable as it seems from Siar, a dwarf, warrants us in treating them as fairies. And in regarding their strange characteristics as induced on a real people. If we take this view, that Coraniade was the name of a real people, we are at liberty to regard it as possible, that their name suggested to the Celts the word Cor for a dwarf, rather than that Cor has suggested the name of the Coranians. In either case, I may mention that Welsh writers have sometimes thought and they are probably right that we have a closely related word in the name of Talamis Coritani or Coritavi. He represents the people so called as dwelling, roughly speaking, between the Trent and Norfolk, and possessed of the two towns of Lindham, Lincoln, and Rady, supposed to have been Leicester. There we should have accordingly to suppose the old race to have survived so long and in such numbers, that the Celtic lords of southern Britain called the people of that area by a name meaning dwarfs. There also they may be conjectured to have had quiet from invaders from the continent, because of the inaccessible nature of the fens. And the lack of inviting harbours on the coast from the country of the Icy Night up to the neighbourhood of the Humber. How far their territory extended inland from the Fens and the sea one cannot say, but it possibly took in one half of what is now Northamptonshire, with the place called Pychley, from an older Pites Leah, meaning the meadow of the Pict. Or else of a man named Pict. In any case it included Croyland in the Fens between Peterborough and the Washington. It was there, towards the end of the 7th century, that is t. Guthlac built his cell on the side of an ancient mound or tumulus, and it was there he was assailed by demons who spoke Britisk or Brythonic, a language which the saint knew, as he had been in exile among Brythons. For this he had probably not to travel far, and it is remarkable that his father's cognomen or surname was Penwall, which we may regard as approximately the Brythonic for Wall's End. That is to say, he was so and so of the Wall's End, and had got to be known by the latter designation instead of his ownament, which is not recorded, for the reason, possibly, that it was so Brythonic as not to admit of being readily reduced into an Anglian or Latin form. It is not quite certain that he belonged to the royal race of Mercia, whose genealogy, however, boasts such un-English names as Piba, Penda, and Piata. But the life 435 states, with no little emphasis, that he was a man whose pedigree included the most noble names of illustrious kings from the ancient stock of Isil, 
that is, he was one of the Eklingas or Eklings 436. Here one is tempted to perpetrate a little glottologic alchemy by changing I into N, and to suppose Eklingas the form taken in English by the name of the ancient people of the Iceni. In any case, nothing could be more reasonable to suppose than that some representatives of the royal race of Prasutagus and Boudicca, escaping the sword of the Roman, found refuge among the Coritanians at the time of the final defeat of their own people, it is even possible that they were already the ruling family there. At all events several indications converge to show that communities speaking Brythonic were not far off, to wit, the P names in the Mercian genealogy, Guthlac's father's surname, Guthlac's exile among Brythons. And the attack on him at Croyland by Brythonic speaking foes. Portions of the Coritanian territory were eminently fitted by nature to serve as a refuge for a broken people with a belated language, witness as late as the 11th century the stand made in the Isle of Ely by Hereward against the Norman. Conqueror and his mail clad knights 437. Among the speakers of Goidelic in Ireland and the highlands of Scotland the fairies take their designation chiefly from a word Sid or Sith, genitive side or Sida, which one may possibly consider as of a common origin with the Latin word Sids. And as originally meaning a seat or settlement, but it sooner or later came to signify simply an abode of the fairies, whence they were called in medieval Irish Aes side, fairy folk, fair side, a fairy man, and ben side a fairy woman or banshee. By the side of Sid, an adjective side, of or belonging to the Sid, appears to have been formed, so that they are found also called simply side, as in Phyaxim, where we are told that before the advent of Asti. Patrick the pagan tribes of Aaron used to worship side or fairies 438. Borrowed from this, or suggested by it 439, we have in Welsh Care Sidi, the fortress of the fairies, which is mentioned twice in the book of Taliesin 440. It first occurs at the end of poem 14, where we have the following lines, which recall Irish descriptions of Thr Nan Og or the land of the young. Ys Kywir Vyg Kader A Kair Sidi. Nice Pla 6 D Hainta Hainay 6 St A Uo Indi. Ys Gwir Mana 6 Yt A Frittery. Tir Orion Y M 10 Agon Recti. ACMY Banyu Fridu G6 ILG. AR Finha 6N FFR 6 Illa 6N YSSY DO Ducti. YS Wegek Nor G6 in G6 YN YLLYN Indi. Perfect is my seat in the fort of Sidi. Nor pest nor age plagues him who dwells therein. Mana Widden and Prittery know it. Three organs play before it about a fire. Around its corners ocean's currents flow. And above it is the fertile fountain. And sweeter than white wine is the drink therein. The wine is elsewhere mentioned, but the arrangement of the organs around a fire requires explanation, which I cannot give. The fortress is on an island, and in poem triple X of the book of Taliesin we read of Arthur and his men sailing thither in his ship Pridwen. The poem is usually called the Spoils of Anne. And the lines in point run thus. Bukaiwar Karcher G6 EIR 8 KR CD. TR6 Y Ebestal P6 Y L L Fritteri. Neb KYN NOC EF NYT E THD. Year Gad 6 Y N Tromlas Kiwurwas A E Ketwi. Eric Pridu and 6 Foon Tossed Y T Jenny. A C Y T Ura 6 T Parha 6 T Inbard Wedi. Tri Loni at Pritwin Y D Etham N I E D. Nam Seath New York Dirith O Gayer Sidi. Perfect was the prison of Guer in Care Sidi. Thanks to Poole and Prittery's emissary. Before him no one entered into it. To the heavy, dark chain held by a faithful youth. And before the spoils of and sorely he sang. And thenceforth remains he till Duma Bard. Three freights of Pridwin went we thither. But only seven returned from Care Sidi. The incidents in these lines are mostly unintelligible to me, but the incarceration of Guir or Guer, together with other imprisonments, including that of Arthur in Care Oath and Anoeth, are mentioned also in the triads, CI 52. 7, 49, 3. 61. It is not improbable that the legend about Guer located his prison on Lundy, 
as the Welsh name of that island appears to have been Wyanwyes Ware, Ware's Isle. Poole and Prittery did not belong to Anne, nor did Prittery's friend Manawyclan. But the Mabinogi of Poole relates how for a whole year Pwylt exchanged crown and kingdom with Aran King of Anne, from whom he obtained the first breed of domestic pigs for his own people. In the lowlands of Scotland, together with the Orkneys and Shetlands, the Picts have to a certain extent taken the place of our fairies, and they are colloquially called Pecks. Now judging from the remains there ascribed to the Pecks, their habitations were either wholly underground or else so covered over with stones and earth and grass as to look like natural hillocks and to avoid attracting the attention of strangers. This was helped by making the entrance very low and as inconspicuous as possible. But one of the most remarkable things about these SIDS is that the cells within them are frequently so small as to prove beyond doubt, that those who inhabited them were of a remarkably short stature. Though it is demonstrated by the weight of the stones used, that the builders were not at all lacking in bodily strength 441. Here we have, accordingly, a small people like our own fairies. In Ireland one of the most famous kings of the fairies was called Mitter of Bree Leith, where he resided in a cid or mound in the neighborhood of Ardaw, in the county of Longford. And thither Irish legend represents him carrying away Etain, Queen of Eacade Aram, King of Ireland during a part of Conchobar Mac Ness's time. Now Eacade was for a whole year unable to find where she was, but his druid, Dallin, wrote Ogham's and at last found it out. Eacade then marched to Breildith, and began to demolish Mitter Cid, whereupon Mitter was eventually so frightened that he sent forth the queen to her husband, who then went his way, leaving the mound folk to digest their wrath. For it is characteristic of them that they did not fight, but chose to bide their time for revenge. In this instance it did not arrive till long after Eacade's day 442. I may add that Etain was herself one of the side or fairies. And one of Mitter's reasons for taking her away was, that she had been his wife in a previous stage of existence. Now it is true that the fairy Mitter is described as resembling the other heroes of Irish story, in having golden yellow hair and bright blue eyes 443, but he differs completely from them in being no warrior but a great wizard. And though he is not said to have been of small stature, the dwarfs were not far off. For in describing the poet Athern, who was notorious for his stinginess, the storyteller emphasizes his words by representing him taking from Mitter three of his dwarfs and stationing them around his own house. In order that their truculent looks and rude words might drive away anybody who came to seek hospitality or to present an unwelcome request 444, a role which recalls that of Edirne of Nudd's dwarf already mentioned. Here the Irish word used is Sorar, which is probably to be identified with the Brythonic Sorar, a dwarf, though the better known meaning of Sorar in Irish is crane or heron. From the former also is hardly to be severed the Irish Corgani, sorcerers, and Corgwin Act 445, or the process of cursing to which the Corgani resorted, as, for instance, when N6 de called forth the fatal blisters on Kyer's face. The role would seem exactly to suit the little people, who were consummate magicians. Let me for a moment leave the little people, in order to call attention to another side of this question of race. It has recently been shown 446 by Professor J. Morris Jones, of the University College of North Wales, that the non-Aryan traits of the syntax of our insular Celtic point unmistakably to that of Old Egyptian and Berber. Together with kindred idioms belonging to the southern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. He has thereby reduced to articulate speech, so to say, the physiognomical convictions of Professor Sace, to which the reader's attention has been called. To the linguistic argument he appends a statement cited from a French authority in bearing on the question of descent by birth, to the effect, that when among the Berbers the king dies or is deposed, as happens often enough. It is not his son that is called to succeed, but the son of his sister, as in the case of the historical Picts of Scotland down to the 12th century or thereabouts. Here I would add, that my attention has been called by Professor Says to old Egyptian monuments representing the Libyan chiefs with their bodies tattooed, a habit which seems not to be yet extinct among the Tuaregs and Kabyles 447. Lastly, Mr. 
Nicholson has recently directed attention to the fact that some princes of ancient Gaul are represented with their faces tattooed on certain coins found in the west of France so far south as the region once occupied by the ancient Pictons. We have a compendious commentary on this in the occurrence of a word cortonicum in a high German manuscript written, before the year 814, one allude to the Wessebrunn Codex at Munich, in which among a number of geographical names connected with Gaul and other countries, that vocable is so placed as to allow of our referring it to Poitou or to all Gaul as the country once of the ancient Pictons. The great German philologist Pott, who called attention to it, brought it at once into relation with Cruthn, plural Cruithni, the Picts of Britain and Ireland, a word which has been explained above 448. Now at last I come to the question, what pre-Celtic race or races make themselves evident in the mass of things touched on in this and the foregoing chapters? The answer must, I think, recognize at least two. First comes the race of the mound folk, consisting of the short swarthy people variously caricatured in our fairy tales. They formed isolated fractions of a widely spread race possessed of no political significance whatsoever. But, with the inconsistency ever clinging to everything connected with the fairies. The weird and uncanny folk emerging from its underground lairs seems to have exercised on other races a sort of permanent spell of mysteriousness amounting to adoration. In fact, Irish literature tells us that the side were worshipped. Owing to his faculty of exaggeration, combined with his inability to comprehend the little people, the Celt was enabled to bequeath to the great literatures of Western Europe a motley train of dwarfs and brownies. A whole world of wizardry and magic. The real race of the little people forms the lowest stratum which we can reach, to wit, at a level no higher, seemingly, than that of the present-day natives of Central Australia. Thus some of the birth stories of Cuchulainn and Lane seem to have passed through their hands, and they bear a striking resemblance to certain notions of the lapse. In fact, the nature of the habitations of our little people, together with other points which might be mentioned, would seem at first sight to betoken affinity with the Laps. But I am warned by experts 449 that the other race may be called Picts, which is probably the earliest of the names given it by the Celts, and their affinities appear to be Libyan, possibly Iberian. It was a warlike stock, and stood higher altogether than the mound inhabitants, for it had a notion of paternity, though, on account of its promiscuity, it had to reckon descent by birth. To it probably belonged all the great family groups figuring in the Mabinogen and the corresponding class of literature in Irish, this would include the Dan and D6N group and the Lyre LLYR group. Together with the families represented by PWILT and Rhiannon, who were inseparable from the ILYR group in Welsh, just as the Lyre group was inseparable from the Tuatha de Dan and in Irish Legend. The Picts made slaves and drudges of the mound haunting race, but how far any amalgamation may have taken place between them it is impossible to say. Even without any amalgamation, however, the little people, if employed as nurses to their Pictish lord's children, could not help leaving their impress in time on the language of the ruling nationality. But it may be that the treatment of the Picts, by Scottish legend, as a kind of fairies really points to amalgamation, though it is not impossible that archaeology may be able to classify the remains of the dwellings ascribed to the Pex, that is. To assign a certain class to the warlike Pex of history and another to the dwarf race of the SIDS. A certain measure of amalgamation may also, be the meaning of the Irish tradition, that when the Milesian Irish came and conquered, the defeated Tuatha D6 Dan and gave up their life above ground and retired inside the hills like the fairies. This account of them may be as worthless as the story of the extermination of the Picts of Scotland, both peoples doubtless lived on to amalgamate in time with the conquering race. But it may mean that some of them retreated before the Celts, and concealed themselves after the manner of the little people in underground dwellings in the less accessible parts of the country. In any case, it may well be that they got their magic and druidism from the dwellers of the SIDS. In the next place, it has been pointed out how the adjective hen, old, ancient, is applied in Welsh to several of the chief men of the Don group. And by this one may probably understand that they were old and not merely to those who told the stories about them in Welsh, but to those who put those stories together in Goidelic ages earlier. The geography of the Mabinogen gives the prehistoric remains of Penmin Mar and Treyar Siri to the Don group. 
But by its name, Traer Siri should be the town of the Kiri, a word probably referring to the Picts, this, so far as it goes, makes the sons of Don belong by race to the Picts. Lastly, it is the widely spread race of the Picts, conquered by the Celts of the Celtican or Goidelic branch and amalgamating with their conquerors in the course of time. That has left its non-Aryan impress on the syntax of the Celtic languages of the British Isles. These, it is needless to say, are conjectures which I cannot establish, but possibly somebody else may. For the present, however, they cannot fail to suggest a moral, habitually ignored with a light heart by most people including the writer of these words that men in his plight, men engaged in studies which, owing to a rapid accumulation of fresh facts or the blossoming of new theories, are in a shifting condition, should abstain from producing books or anything longer than a magazine article now and then. Even such minor productions should be understood to be liable to be cast into a great bonfire lit once a year, say on Halloween. This should help to clear the air of mistaken hypotheses, whether of folklore and myth or of history and language, and also serve to mark Nos Galangif as the commencement of the ancient Celtic year. The business of selecting the papers to be saved from the burning might be delegated to an academy constituted, roughly speaking, on the lines of Plato's aristocracy of intellect. Such academy, once in the enjoyment of its existence, would also find plenty of work in addition to the inquisitional business which I have suggested, it should, for example, be invested with summary jurisdiction over fond parents who venture to show any unreasonable anxiety to save their mental progeny from the annual bonfire. The best of that class of writers should be ordered by the academy to sing songs or indite original verse. As for the rest, some of them might be told off to gesticulate to the gallery, and some to administer the consolations of platitude to stragglers tired of the march of science. There is a mass of other useful work which would naturally devolve on an academy of the kind here suggested. I should be happy, if space permitted, to go through the particulars one by one. But let a single instance suffice, the academy might relieve us of the painful necessity of having seriously to consider any further the proposal that professors found professing after sixty should be shot. This will serve to indicate the kind of work which might advantageously be entrusted to the august body which is here but roughly projected. There are some branches of learning in the happy position of having no occasion for such a body academical. Thus, if a man will have it that the earth is flat, as flat in fact as some people do their utmost to make it, he will most likely, as the late Mr. Freeman in the Saturday Review once put it, make few converts, and will be forgotten after at most a passing laugh from scientific men. If a man insists that the sum of two and two is five, he will probably find his way to a lunatic asylum, as the economy of society is, in a manner, self-acting. So with regard to him who carries his craze into the more material departments of such a science as chemistry, he may be expected to blow out his own eyes, for the almighty molecule executes its own vengeance. But, to quote again from Mr. Freeman, if that man's craze had been historical or philological, and above all if it had to do with the science of man or of myth he might have put forth notions quite as absurd as the notion that the earth is flat and many people would not have been in the least able to see that they were absurd. If any scholar had tried to confute him we should have heard of controversies and differences of opinion. In fact, the worst that happens to the false prophet who shines in any such a science is, that he has usually only too many enthusiastic followers. The machinery is, so to say, not automatic, and hence it is that we want the help of an academy. But even supposing such an academy established, no one need feel alarmed lest opportunities enough could no longer be found for cultivating the example of those of the early Christians who had the rare grace to suffer fools gladly. Personally, however, I should be against doing anything in a hurry. And, considering how little his fellows dare expect from the man who is just waiting to be final and perfect before he commit himself to type, the establishment of an academy invested with the summary powers which have been briefly sketched might. Perhaps, after all, conveniently wait a while, my own feeling is that almost any time, say in the latter half of the twentieth century, would do better than this year or the next. In the meantime one must be content to entrust the fortunes of our studies to the combined forces of science and common sense. 
judging by what they have achieved in recent years, there is no reason to be uneasy with regard to the time to come, for it is as true today as when it was first written, that the best of the prophets of the future is the past. Additions and Corrections 01. I learned that the plural of Bodak glass was in Welsh Bodaca Gentian, a term which Ellis or Nant remembers his mother applying to a kind of fairies dressed in blue and fond of leading people astray. She used to relate how a haymaking party once passed a summer's night at the cowhouse, beauty, of Bryn Bijlift, also Bryn Mygelt, and how they saw in the dead of night a host of these dwarfs, Corinid, in blue dancing and capering about the place. The beauty in question is not very far from Dalwithalan, on the way to Capel Curig. A different picture of the Bodak is given in Jenkins' Bed Jellert, page 82. And lastly one may contrast the Highland Bodak glass, not to mention still another kind, namely the one in Scott's Waverley. 02. To Sarn Yerafank ad Llyn Yerafank, near Landenham, Beauties of Wales, n. Wales, p. 841, and Bed Yerafank, the Afank's grave, the name of some sort of a tumulus, I am told, on a knoll near the Pembrokeshire stream of the Nevern. Mr. J. Thomas, of Bancaw Bryn Berrien close by, has communicated to me certain echoes of a story how an Afank was caught in a pool near the bridge of Bryn Berrien, and how it was taken up to be interred in what is now regarded as its grave. A complete list of the Afank place names in the principality might possibly prove instructive. As to the word Afank, what seems to have happened is this, 1, from meaning simply a dwarf it came to be associated with water dwarfs. 2, the meaning being forgotten, the word was applied to any water monster, and, 3, where a fank occurs in place names the whose story has been introduced to explain it, whether it fitted or not. This I should fancy to be the case with the Bryn Berrien Barrow, and it would be satisfactory to know whether it contains the remains of an ordinary dwarf. Peridor's Lake of Fank may have been a dwarf. But whether that was so or not, it is remarkable that the weapon which the Afank handled was a fetchway or flake spear, that is, a missile tipped with stone. 03. With the role of the girl in the Afank story compare that of Tegau, wife of Karadog Freichfers, on whom a serpent fastens and can only be allured away to seize on one of Tegau's breasts. Of which she loses the nipple when the beast is cut off. The defect being replaced with gold, she is ever after known as Tegau Yufran, or Tegau of the Golden Breast, that is a version inferred of a story which is discussed by M. Gaston Paris in an article, on Caradoc e Tilo Serpent, elicited by a paper published, in the November number of Modern Language Notes for 1898, by Miss C. A. Harper, of Bryn Mawr College, U.S., see the Romania, 28. 214-31 one of Miss Harper's parallels, mentioned by M. Paris at p. 220, comes from Campbell, it is concerning a prince who receives from his stepmother a magic shirt which converts itself into a serpent coiled round his neck, and of which he is rid by the help of a woman acting in much the same way as Tegel. We have an echo of this in the pedigrees in the Jesus College MS 2O, see the Simrador, 8. 88 where one reads of G6GA6N Kenu Menrata VU Nieder VL6YDYN MY Vaughn 6GYL, Gugan the Whelp of Menrat. Who was a year with a snake round his neck his pedigree is also given. In M. Paris suggested reconstruction of the story from the different versions, he represents the maiden who is to induce the serpent to leave the man on whom it has fastened, as standing in a vessel filled with milk. While the man stands in a vessel filled with vinegar. The heroine exposes herself to the reptile, which relinquishes his present victim to seize on one of the woman's breasts. Now the appropriateness of the milk is explained by the belief that snakes are inordinately fond of milk, and that belief has, I presume, a foundation in fact, at any rate I am reminded of its introduction into the plot of more than one English story, such as Stanley Wayman's book from the memoirs of a minister of France, London, 1893, p. 445, and A. Conan Doyle's Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, London, 1893, pp. 199-209. In Wales, however, it is to a woman's milk that one's interest attaches, I submit two references which will explain what I mean. 
The first of them is to Owen's Welsh folklore, p. 349, where he says that, traditions of flying snakes were once common in all parts of Wales, and adds as follows, the traditional origin of these imaginary creatures was that they were snakes, which by having drunk the milk of a woman, and by having eaten of bread consecrated for the Holy Communion, became transformed into winged serpents or dragons. The other is to the Brython for 1861, page 190, where one reads in Welsh to the following effect if a snake chances to have an opportunity to drink of a woman's milk it is certain to become a guiber. When a woman happens to be far from her child, and her breasts are full and beginning to give her pain, she sometimes milks them on the ground in order to ease them. To this the peasantry in parts of Cardiganshire have a strong objection, lest a snake should come there and drink the milk, and so become a guiber. The word guiber is used in the Welsh Bible for a viper, but the editor of the Brython explains. That in our folklore it means a huge kind of snake or dragon that has grown wings and has its body cased in hard scales, for a noted instance in point he refers the reader to the first number of the Brython, p. 3. It is believed still all over Wales that snakes may, under favourable circumstances, develop wings, in fact, an Anglesey man strongly wished, to my knowledge, to offer to the recent Welsh Land Commission. As evidence of the wild and neglected state of a certain farm. That the gorse had grown so high and the snake so thriven in it that he had actually seen one of the latter flying right across a wide road which separated two such gorse forests as be described, surprised and hurt to find that this was not accepted. He inferred that the commissioners knew next to nothing about their business. 04. With, the spell of security, by catching hold of grass may perhaps be compared a habit which boys in Cardiganshire have of suddenly picking up a blade of grass when they want a truce or stoppage in a sort of game of tig or touchwood. The grass gives the one who avails himself of it immunity for a time from attack or pursuit, so as to allow him to begin the game again just where it was left off. 05. Bottermud would probably be more correctly written Bottermid and analyzed possibly into Bod Dermot, involving the name which appears in Irish as Diarmate and Dermot. 06. Since this was printed I have been assured by Mr. Thomas Pritchard of Widiarth Escob, in Anglesey, that the dolor BYR is more commonly called CLWY BYR, and that it is the disease known in English as Black Quarter. 07. I am assured on the part of several literary natives of Glamorgan that they do not know dar for deer, ground, earth. Such negative evidence, though proving the literary form deer to prevail now, is not to be opposed to the positive statement, sent by Mr. Hughes to me, as to the persistence in his neighborhood of dar and cldr, for clear, lukewarm, to which one may add, as unlikely to be challenged by anybody, the case of harn for hern, iron. The intermediate forms have to be represented as Dayer, Clare, and Hern, which explain exactly the game of the Book of St. Chad, for which modern literary Welsh has Geef, Winter, see the preface to the Book of Land DDV, P. XIV. 08. It ought to have been pointed out that the fairies, whose food and drink it is death to share, represent the dead. 09. For Conla Red Conla or Condla, the later form is Kala. The Kondla in question is called Kondla Road in the story, but the heading to it has Ektra Kondla Heim, I the adventure of C, the dear one. 10. I am now inclined to think that Butch was produced out of the northern pronunciation of which by regarding its W as a mutation consonant and replacing it, as in some other instances, by B as the radical. 11. With the Manx use of Rowan on May Day compare a passage to the following effect concerning Wales I translate it from the faulty Welsh in which it is quoted by one of the competitors for the folklore prize at the Liverpool Estethvod. 1900, he gave no indication. Of its provenance another bad papistic habit which prevails among some Welsh people is that of placing some of the wood of the Rowan tree, coed certain or cryophol, in their corn lands, La Firu, and their fields on May Eve, no sclamo, with the idea that such a custom brings a blessing on their fields. A proceeding which would better become atheists and pagans than Christians. 12. In the comparison with the brownie the fairy nurse in the Pennant Valley has been overlooked. 13. With the story of Finn and Jywer and the other fairy wells, also with the wells which have been more especially called sacred in this volume, 
compare the following paragraph from Martin's description of the Western Islands of Scotland, London. 1703, pp. 229-30, it is concerning Gigae, now more commonly written Gia, the name of an island near the west coast of Kintyre, there is a well in the north end of this I'll call Tubermore, i.e. a great well, because of its effects, for which it is famous among the islanders, do together with the inhabitants use it as a catholicon for diseases. It's covered with stone and clay, because the natives fancy that the stream that flows from it might overflow the isle, and it is always opened by a die rock, see, an inmate, else they think it would not exert its virtues. They ascribe one very extraordinary effect to it, and tis this. That when any foreign boats are wind-bound here, which often happens, the master of the boat ordinarily gives the native that lets the water run a piece of money. And they say that immediately afterwards the wind changes in favor of those that are thus detained by contrary winds. Every stranger that goes to drink of the water of this well, is accustomed to leave on its stone cover a piece of money, a needle, pin, or one of the prettiest vadiated stones they can find. Last September I visited Gia and saw a well there which is supposed to be the one to which Martin refers. It is very insignificant and known now by a name pronounced Tobar Avayak, possibly for an older Mobique, in Scotch Gaelic Beach, written Beathag, is equated with the name Sophia. The only tradition now current about the well is that emptying it used to prove the means of raising a wind or even of producing great storms, and this appears to have been told Pennant, see his tour in Scotland and voyage to the Hebrides. MDCCLXXA, Chester, 1774, p. 226 I visit the few wonders of the isle, the first is a little well of a most miraculous quality, for in old times, if ever the chieftain lay here wind-bound, he had nothing more to do than cause the well to be cleared. And instantly a favorable gale arose. But miracles are now ceased. 14. A similar rhyme is current in the neighborhood of Dolgely, as Miss Lucy Griffith informs me, as follows. Dolgal Dola Galler. Dear A I L L W N C D W R N I Lee. Dolgelty, a dale to be lost. Earth will swallow it and water take its place. 15. With regard to wells killing women visiting them, I may mention a story, told me the other day by Professor Mahaffrey after a friend whose name he gave. Concerning the inhabitants of one of the small islands on the coast of Mayo I understood him to say off the mullet. It was this, all the men and boys, having gone fishing, were prevented by rough weather from returning as soon as they intended, and the women left alone suffered greatly from want of water, as not one of them would venture to go to the well. By and by, however, one of them gave birth to a boy, whereupon another of them carried the baby to the well, and ventured to draw water. 16. As to Clichot Abortify I am now convinced that the CHWCH and Seth are entirely due to the published versions, the editors of which seem to have agreed that they will have as much as possible for their money, so to say. I find that Mrs. Reese learnt in her childhood to end the words with pump, and that she cannot now be brought to sing the melody in any other way, I have similar testimony from a musical lady from the neighborhood of Wrexham. And, doubtless, more evidence of the same sort could be got. 17. For Lywellyn of Gruffied Red Lywellyn of Ireworth. 18. Some additional light on the doggerel dialogue will be found thrown by the following story which I find cited in Welsh by one of the Liverpool Estevvod competitors, there is in the parish of YSPYTTY Eiffen, in Carnarvonshire. A farm called TRWINSWCH, where eighty years ago lived a man and his wife, who were both young, and had twins born to them. Now the mother went one day to milk, leaving the twins alone in the cradle the husband was not at home and who should enter the house but one of the TYLWYTH tag. He took the twins away and left two of his own breed in the cradle in their stead. Thereupon the mother returned home and saw what had come to pass. She then in her excitement snatched the Tyluith Teg twins and took them to the bridge that crosses the huge gorge of the river Conwy not very far from the house, and she cast them into the whirlpool below. By this time the TYLWYTH Teg had come on the spot, some trying to save the children, and some making for the woman. Seize the old hag. 
Crap AR your hen ratch, said one of the chiefs of the TYLWYTH tag. Too late. Cried the woman on the edge of the bank, and many of them ran after her to the house. As they ran three or four of them lost their pipes in the field. They are pipes ingeniously made of the blue stone, carriage loss, of the gully. They measure three or four inches long, and from time to time several of them have been found near the cave of TRWI and SWCH, this is the first indication which I have discovered, that the fairies are addicted to smoking. 19. A Rkil Geiferthuch, printed Rilgiverth, occurs in the record of Carnanvon, page 200, but it seems to have been in Mirionefshire, and far enough from Arfon. 20. In the article already cited from the Romania, M. Paris finds TWRCH TRWYTH in the Boer Tortine of a French Romance, C28217, where he mentions a legend concerning the strange pedigree of that beast. The subject requires to be further studied. 21. A less probable explanation of Laetio would be to suppose Ordi understood. This has been suggested to me by Mr. Nicholson's treatment of the Lanel Heron inscription as Ali Ortis El Mediaco Hikayaset, where I should regard A as standing for an earlier nominative Alex E. And intended as the Celtic equivalent for Cephas or Peter, Ali would be the word which is in Med. Irish ale, genitive alec, a rock or stone. 22. We have the Maithwi of Gilvathwai possibly still further reduced to Ethwi in Porth Ethwi, the village of Manai Bridge, in spite of its occurring in the record of Carnarvon p. 77, as Pothatho. 23. To the reference to the Simrador, 9, 170, as to Beli being called son of Anna, add the Welsh Elucidarium, page 27, with its Belim Vab Anna, and the Canberra Tittish Saints, page 82, where we have Anna, Genuate Beli. 24. Two answers to the query as to the Lech loss are now to be found in the Scottish Antiquary, 15. 41 to 3. 25. Kair Guy is called also Kair Gwenyr, after Kai's father Cwenyr, to wit in a poem by William Lane, who died in 1587. This I owe to Professor J. Morris Jones, who has copied it from a collection of that poet's works in the possession of Merton Fard, F.O. 119. 26. Here it would, perhaps, not be irrelevant to mention care DWRG when, given S.V. DWR in Morris Celtic remains, as a name of Kerjibi, or Holyhead. His authority is given in parenthesis thus, T.H. Williams, Cattle. I should be disposed to think the name based on some such an earlier form as Caer D6 Bint, the fortress of the Danes, who were called in Old Welsh Dubgent, Annals Cambri A, D 866, in the Simrador, 9. X 65. That is to say, Gentis Nigri or Black Pagans, and more simply Gent or Gent, Gentis or Heathens. 27. The word Banna 6C, whence the later Bannock, seems to be the origin of the name Benoic given to the famous horn in the Lie du Corn, from which M. Paris in his Romania article, 28. 229, cites Sest Cor Ca Benoic Anon, this horn which is called Benoic. The Welsh name would have to be Corn, Year, Ych Banna 6C, the horn of, the, Banagox, with or without the article. 28, one of the Liverpool Eisteddfod competitors cites W.O. Pug to the following effect in Welsh, LLYN Dawa Chain, the lake of two oxen, is on Hyrethog Mountain, and near it is the footmark of one of them in a stone or rock, Carreg, where Le rested when seeking his partner, as the local legend has it. Another cites a still wilder story, to the effect that there was once a wonderful cow called Wyfuch Fraith, the party colored cow. To that cow there came a witch to get milk, just after the cow had supplied the whole neighborhood. So the witch could not get any milk, and to avenge her disappointment she made the cow mad. The result was that the cow ran wild over the mountains, inflicting immense harm on the country. But at last she was killed by who near Hyrethog, in the county of Denby. 29. With Trutton, T-R-W-L-Y-N, Tratton, and Tittitrot should doubtless be compared the English use of trot as applied contemptuously to a woman, as when Grumio, in Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, Act I, S.C. 
2, speaks of one an old trot with ne'er a tooth in her head, the word was similarly used by Thomas Haywood and others. 30. I find that Professor Zimmer is of opinion in fact he is quite positive, that Tingu and Tingd are in no way related, see the Gottingish Jalert and Zine for 1900, number 5, pages 371-2. 31. I am tempted to rank with the man-eating fairies the Atticati, who are known to have been cannibals, and whose name seems to mean the ancient race. Should this prove tenable, one would have to admit that the little people, or at any rate peoples with an admixture of the blood of that race, could be trained to fight. Further, one would probably have to class with them also such non-cannibal tribes as those of the Fir Bog and the Galiflin of Irish story. Information about both will be found in my Hibbert lectures, in reading which, however, the mythological speculations should be brushed aside. Lastly, I anticipate that most of the peoples figuring in the oldest class of Irish story will prove to have belonged either, I, to the dwarf race, or, two, to the Picts, and that careful reading will multiply the means of distinguishing between them. Looking comprehensively at the question of the early races of the British Isles, the reader should weigh again the concluding words of Professor Haddon's theory.